from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Tim Connors, John Boy. Congratulate me. Congratulations, Tim. What for? I just had another boy. Seven pounds, 12 ounces. Hey, you like cigars? Sure. Well, come on down and pick one up. Oh, maybe you better pack a suitcase, too. I got one for you out in Culver, Montana. Where is that? I just told you. Out in Montana somewhere. We have a debt policy holder there named Henderson. Henderson, huh? Yeah. Now, we don't know if he was murdered, committed suicide, or had an accident. Well, what does it look like? All three. Okay, Tim, be there in an hour. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter, whatever it's going to be. Expense account item one, dollar and a quarter for a detailed map. I had an idea that Culver, Montana was a place that only Rand McDally might know about. They did. I found it tucked up in the high northern corner of the state near Great Falls. Hey, where's your bag? Home. Oh. I told you to pack it. Now, look. Give me a cigar, Tim. Tell me about the new boy in the new case. Okay, have a chair. There you are. I wouldn't smoke it if I were you. Terrible. Cost me two bucks a box. Hey, you know something? I'm thinking of naming the new boy Johnny. Oh, tough case, huh? Yeah. Hmm? Look, look. We're in the same sweet old spot, Johnny. Same old problem. One of our policyholders is dead, and for looking into the circumstances of his death... The insurance company is no longer a friend of the widow and orphan, but a big, bad monster trying to weasel out of a just claim. All claims are just claims, or are they? Well, of course they are. No one ever tried to pull a fast one on an insurance company. Well, the world's full of nice, honest, straight-playing people. Uh Uh-huh. Now tell me about getting sandbagged in a poker game. Look, I want to get this out of the way and get back over to the hospital and see my wife. Now, John, this claim came into the insurance office yesterday afternoon, airmail special. The insurance company turned it over to me today. What company? Western. The policy's worth $25,000 face value, double indemnity if death was by accident. No payment for suicide. Uh Uh-huh. You say the man's name was Henderson? Yeah, it says here, George Walter Henderson, Montana rancher. Last Thursday, he fell four stories out of a hotel window in Culver and died instantly. At least that's what we have in this report here. Somebody could have shoved him, or he could have taken the leap. Now, we have to know for certain. Well, what's on the claim report? Accidental. There was no inquest, no police investigation, and that's not good enough for us. Uh-huh. This Henderson prominent? Well, he was big enough, Johnny. Cattleman, rancher. He was also a major stockholder and the only newspaper in cover, so I doubt if his paper suggests suicide or anything else. Do you? I don't know, Tim. I never met the editor. Well, meet him if you like. Talk to him. Talk to anybody in cover. Find out what was what. <laughs> this is a lousy cigar. Johnny... You know how to handle these things. We have to have more information than this. Have you tried to do anything on it at all? Yeah, I phoned the sheriff's office long distance and talked to a man named Holton, Eve Holton. He said he'd be happy to cooperate. Well, what else? I phoned the beneficiary to get some information. Name's Pauline Henderson, his widow. Is she going to cooperate, too? I don't think so, pal. Huh? She hung up on me. We will continue with the Henderson matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. First, you get Bounzo the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo. Third, there's Roscoe the Roller Skating Bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the Fat Indoor Snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the Giant Mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus. Guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. 
one. He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored preformed sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost, just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 90, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. Expense account item two, $185.65. Airfare, Hartford, Connecticut to Great Falls, Montana. The nearest point I could make to Culver by air. Item three, three bucks. I took the train to Culver. Sometimes when I'm having nightmares, I dream about the smelter stack standing up against the cadaverous hills that lie to the south of town. Everything, including the three or four feet of snow covered with a uniform dinginess, made Culver an ugly little town set in an ugly notch between two ugly mountains. The only hotel in town was the Butte. It happened to be four stories high. It also happened to be the place where George Henderson had met his death. Okay, just a minute. Mr. Dollar? Yeah. I'm Eve Holton, sheriff here. Huh? You're from the insurance people, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Been expecting that you'd be in sooner or later. Well, I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Holton. Call me Eve, son. Everybody does. Uh, hey, uh, got a drink on you? And uh, No, I haven't. Well, I got one on me. <laughs> nice and chilly, too. <laughs> well, I'll see if there's some glasses around here, Sheriff. You didn't waste any time looking me up. No, I guess I didn't, son. Thought it'd save a little time this way. Knew you'd be looking me up sooner or later. Really thought we ought to have this drink together. Private. May not have any more together while you're here. Uh-huh. Well, health and happiness, boy. Uh, same to you. <clears throat> now, this drink we're having. This is in your room, and I'm just a fellow welcoming you to Culver. In my office or on that street out there, I'm a sheriff. And I'm going to be real official. All right, go on. I want you to notice I'm not asking any questions of you, son. I'm just answering anything that you might want to ask me right now. All right. You're going to have to plow ahead yourself on this one pretty much alone. And let me tell you what kind of plowing you got in store for you. Excuse me. <clears throat> now, first off, this is a little burg like you ain't used to. We got 3,500, 4,000 people living here. Some of them work in that mine you've seen on your way into town. Others hire out to work on the ranches around here. Some in business. Uh Uh-huh. Very tight little place. We hardly ever fool around with anybody else. Sure. Now, you're here because your insurance company don't like to pay off on a policy without knowing whys and wherefores. They don't like the word accident without knowing some of the details. No, they don't. There's a lot of people here, most people, who don't care about those details. As a matter of fact, son, they'd all just as soon put old George Henderson down on the ground and say it was an accident and let it go with that. Well, maybe it was, Sheriff. I don't know. But I'm going to find out. Yeah, well, now, let me go on. Those people who don't like the details don't like detail getters. You understand? Uh, yeah. Scare you any? Not yet. <laughs> you do all right, son. So, maybe you'd kind of like to get your coat on and come to your funeral with me. Starts at three. Henderson's? Yeah, give you a chance to look around, get the lay of the land. Okay, good idea. 
I wondered what kind of bull workers insurance companies turned out. I like you, Dollar. You're all right. You ain't bothering with any questions till you got some worthwhile asking. You tired? A little. Well, this won't take too long. A half hour later, I was standing beside Sheriff Eve Holton on a flat top hillside that served as a cemetery. The snow was white and gleaming under the winter sun of the mid-afternoon skies. The air cold and crisp. To thee, our Heavenly Father, who knoweth all things, we commit the body of our beloved to thy eternal care. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Trusting ever in thy mercy, we invoke the consolation of thy sheltering wing. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Ensure and certain hope of resurrection into eternal life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here. Oh, that's that. Yeah. Poor George. Eve. Hmm? Which one is Mrs. Henderson? There. That's Pauline Henderson? Yeah, that's her. Well, she can't be more than 25. 26, to be exact, Dollar. I went to her birthday party two months ago. Well, how old was George Henderson? 59. Went to his party, too. Yeah. Pretty thing, hmm? Very. Any other family? Nope. No other wife, huh? Nope. Want to meet her? No, not right now. Mm-hmm. Well, suit yourself. Kind of thought you might start thinking when you got a look at her. Hmm? Now, now, just keep on the way you're doing. You're doing fine. When there's something you got to know, you'll find out. Well, Leif, I already know one thing. Yeah? What's that? I'm going to ask for a coroner's inquest. Just from seeing her? Just from seeing her. Mm Mm-hmm. You're a sly one, Johnny. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode... Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar, some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa, a roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today, you may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address to Giant Animals, Box 90, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of The Henderson Matter. Tomorrow, I find out how hard it is to believe what I see. And I see plenty. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Keith Holden. How are you this morning? Oh, pretty good, Sheriff. How about yourself? Oh, I'm fine, Dandy. You were over at the city hall this morning, huh? Yeah, that's right. I requested the coroner to conduct an inquest into the death of George Henderson. Yeah, I know. The coroner left it up to me. Huh? Yeah, came into my office and asked me if I had any reason to conduct an inquest into the death of George Henderson. I told him I didn't have any reason, but I'd do it if I was ordered to. Well, what happens now? Well, somebody will have to decide whether there's going to be an inquest or not. Who? Mayor, I guess. I don't know. Anyhow, you stirred up some action, and you'll be getting it. Yeah, where? Just stay where you are, son. My guess is it'll come right to you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. The death of George Henderson of Culver, Montana, where I am today. A casual certification announced the death is accidental, having been received by a fall from a hotel window. No one in Culver seemed to be too worried about any of the details. But details are my job. That's why I requested the coroner's office to conduct an inquest. I took Sheriff Holton's suggestion and waited to see what my request flushed up in the dingy colored mountains of Culver. An hour later, my first bird winged up to my hotel room. He was a tall, gray haired man in a Stetson, earmuffs, and the western version of a Chesterfield. His honor, Mayor Newton. Mr. Dollar. I want to talk to you about this request you made for an inquest into George Henderson's death. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. You are aware, of course, that George's death, and he was one of my beloved and personal friends for many, many years, was a great blow to the entire community. No, I didn't know that, Mayor Newton. Huh? Only the smallest part of the community were at his funeral yesterday afternoon. His widow and, I'd say, not more than half a dozen other people. Uh. <clears throat> Well, I understand that your insurance company is not quite satisfied with the certification. Is that correct? Uh, more or less. What would they need to be satisfied, sir? An exact knowledge of how Mr. Henderson fell out that hotel window. I would rather no inquest were held into Mr. Henderson's death. Why? Why, sir, George Henderson is dead and buried. It should remain that way. If an inquest were to be held, it would only prove that George fell out of a window... I beg you to consider that, Mr. Dollar. You seem very certain that an investigation would prove that death was accidental. It was accidental. George fell out the window. Well, no, I can't just tell that to my insurance company, can I? Uh, We are a small community with a rudimentary police force, not equipped in any way for an exhaustive investigation, nor for the financial burden of such an investigation. I strongly urge you to reconsider this request for a coroner's inquest. You do? I do indeed. His untimely death was an unfortunate occurrence, outside the pale of any of our poor abilities to foresee. A terrible, terrible accident. I'd like proof of that. Proof? An inquest, Mr. Mayor. An inquest. All right. We will continue with the Henderson matter in a moment. Friends, how'd you like to thrill your favorite youngster with some of the most exciting toys of the year? Picture the breathless excitement of any child surrounded by six gaily colored balloon-like giant animals up to three feet long, and all for the low, low price of just one dollar. First, you get Bounce the Clown with round pot belly and funny nose. Next comes Hoppy the Australian kangaroo. Third, there's Rusko the roller skating bear. He's two feet tall and looks almost like real. Fourth, there's Whitey the fat indoor snowman. And fifth, Mortimer the giant mouse, 18 inches long and sure to scare the whiskers off any cat. That's five different giant animals. But now hold your breath for the most sensational toy of all, the star of the whole Christmas season, the jolly giant talking Santa Claus. Guaranteed to make everybody's Christmas a merrier one. 
He's a big roly-poly happy Santa. He stands erect on two legs, is actually over three feet tall and 32 inches around. Best of all, he actually talks. Just pull the tape and he says, Merry Christmas for all to hear. He's the biggest, merriest talking as Santa ever. Sure to please your youngsters and spread good cheer. Yes, giant Santa proves there really is a Santa Claus. That's a total of six giant animals made of brightly colored preformed sturdy latex, which the kids can easily inflate. And the cost, just one dollar, not for each. Just one dollar for all six of these lovable giants who'll turn your home into a circus parade. And here's a surprise. Mail your order today and you'll also receive absolutely free Peter the Rabbit, actually over two feet tall with big red ears almost nine inches long. But you must send now. Rush $1 plus 10 cents for packing and mailing for each set you want to Giant Animals Box 46 Grand Central Station, New York City. If not delighted with every one of your seven giant animals, return them to the Super Animals Company for a full refund, but keep the giant talking Santa as our gift. Order now. Supplies are limited. Rush $1.10 for packing and mailing for each set in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's $1 plus 10 cents with your name and address. Mail to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. My interview with Mayor Newton had convinced me that I'd get no real help from him in the Henderson matter. Quite the contrary. Expense account item three, 20 cents, coffee. Myself and Sheriff Eve Holton. Well, you got it. Huh? At the direction of Mr. Jackson. That's our coroner. He deputized me temporarily to conduct an inquest. It's going to take place tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, City Hall. Tomorrow, Sheriff? Room 207. Well, Eve, you won't have time to do anything. No, I guess I won't. Not much, anyhow. Oh, brother... The mayor pitched me pretty hard for not having the inquest. Knew he would. Any idea why? Nope. You think somebody asked him to stop it? Yep. Who? Don't know, Johnny. Honest. The next morning, I struggled my way against a belligerent north wind to City Hall and the inquest, if you could call it that. I sat in the back of the room and listened while a Dr. Horace Nam assured the six-man jury that George Henderson was quite dead when he was called out of his office and examined him on the street. Dr. Nam reckoned George had died from a broken neck. An ancient bellhop, a desk clerk, and a chambermaid gave their versions of what had happened the day Henderson fell out the window. Now, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, so help you, God. I do, Sheriff. I'm the acting coroner today, Miss Cubley. Sit down. Now... When did you see Mr. Henderson last? Last Thursday morning. Where was this, Miss Cubley? At the Butte Hotel. Mm hmm. You know what time of the morning it was? About 10 o'clock. I went in to make his bed and straighten up his room. I see. I made his bed while he worked on some papers there, and then I left. Did you see him after that? No, sir. You didn't see him come downstairs for breakfast or anything? No, sir. Do you know if anybody went up to see him? I believe I saw Mrs. Henderson in the lobby after that. Do you see Mrs. Henderson in this room? Yes, sir. I, I believe that's Mrs. Henderson over there. No, that's Mrs. Henderson. Now, do you know if Mrs. Henderson visited Mr. Henderson in his room? No, sir. I don't know that. Miss Cubley, did you happen to notice if anyone else went up to Mr. Henderson's room that morning? No, sir. It went on all morning long. Sheriff Holton, acting in the coroner's position, questioned person after person. All had more or less the same vague knowledge concerning George Henderson's death. I was most interested in Pauline Henderson's testimony. Now then, Mrs. Henderson, when did you last see your husband? Thursday. I went to see him about noon, maybe a little before. Where did you see him, Miss Henderson? At the Butte Hotel, in his room there. The same room he occupied prior to his death? Of course. The same room from which he fell? Yes. Were you alone when you went to see him, Mrs. Henderson? Yes. I must have left before 12.30. I had an appointment at the dentist. And that was the last time you saw your husband alive? Yes. I was still in the dentist's chair when they told me he'd fallen out the window. What, uh, what did you and your husband talk about, Mrs. Henderson? Must I answer that? Well, we're trying to determine something here. I'd appreciate it. George and I discussed our divorce. Could you tell us about that? George and I decided to part about a month ago. He moved out of the house and moved into the hotel. Mm-hmm. 
Outside of the divorce, were you on good terms? Oh, yes, we've always been on good terms. Mrs. Henderson, do you think there's a chance that he might have thrown himself out that window? Mrs. Mrs. Henderson, do you think he might have thrown himself out that window? No, at least not over us, if that's what you mean. As far as you knew, was your husband in good health? Yes, he was. You happen to know when he was examined last? Oh, a month or so ago. He was in perfect health. Uh, One more thing. Did Mr. Henderson drink? Yes. Did he drink that morning with you? I think he had a couple of drinks. Yes, yes, he had a drink or two while we were talking. He could have stumbled at that window. The clothes were New York, the perfume Paris, the jewelry Tiffany's. The look you might expect it on the Riviera, where everybody tries to act bored with too many good things in life. Her dress, black for the occasion of death, was cut too well and too carefully for her to pass as a grieving widow. She answered the questions without hesitation or emotion. Fifteen minutes later, the jury brought in the expected verdict. Therefore, it is the opinion of this jury that the said deceased George Walter Henderson came to his death as a result of injuries incurred in a fall from the fourth floor of the Butte Hotel at or about 12.45 p.m. on the 19th day of this month. No evidence to the contrary. It is deemed and declared that the manner of death was accidental. Adjourned. As far as Culver's people, its police and its mayor were concerned. Yeah, the mayor. Well, Mr. Dollar, I hope you're satisfied. It was a pretty good inquest, Mayor Newton. I trust the official verdict of the jury will answer any questions your insurance company might have had on their minds and clear this whole matter up. Hmm? I'll forward it to them and tell them the circumstances under which the inquest was conducted, Mr. Mayor. Satisfactory, I trust. No. But it served a purpose. Now that everybody thinks it was an accident, everybody will breathe easier. Certainly. Yeah. If everybody's relaxing like that, somebody's going to get careless. See you, Mr. Mayor. Johnny Dollar will be back in a moment to tell you about tomorrow's episode. Friends, send for your set of some of the most exciting toys of the year. Six giant inflatable toys for only one dollar, some up to three feet tall. You get Bounceo the Happy Clown, Hoppy the Australian Kangaroo, Roscoe the two feet long roller skating bear, Whitey the fat indoor snowman, Mortimer the giant mouse 18 inches long, and last but not least, the great giant talking Santa, a roly-poly giant over three feet tall and 32 inches around the belly that actually says Merry Christmas out loud when you pull the tape. That's six sensational giant toys for only one dollar, made of sturdy, gaily colored latex that the kids can easily inflate. Send one dollar for each set to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. And if you order right now, you get Peter the Rabbit over two feet tall absolutely free. If not delighted with your giant animals, your money refunded immediately. Order today. You may never hear this offer again. Rush one dollar plus ten cents for packing and mailing in cash, check, or money order to Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. That's one dollar plus ten cents for each set with your name and address. To Giant Animals, Box 46, Grand Central Station, New York City. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of The Henderson Matter. People do get careless tomorrow, all over Culver, Montana. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Eve Holden, son. Hi, Sheriff. You put in a call for me, did you? Yes, I'm ready to go to work. Now that the inquest's been held and George Henderson's death is officially an accident, I might be able to move around your little town a little easier. 
What can I do for you? Help me to move around. Uh, case is closed, as far as I'm concerned. Eve, what's the matter with you? That inquest was a farce. For all I know, Henderson could have been pushed out of that hotel window. The attitude of different people in this town makes that whole oh, thing... Hold on now, son. Hold on. I meant to say it's closed as far as my office is concerned. Personally, I think it needs investigating. We can help each other, maybe, you and me. Can I come over? Oh, I better come there. You know how folks are around here. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Culver, Montana. To Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. The question, accident, suicide, or murder? Expense account item four, $3.48. One day later to Tim Connors' office in Hartford explaining the situation in Culver. I'll, uh, I'll read it back to you, Mr. Dollar. Mr. Tim Connors, Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. Coroner's inquest into death of George Henderson, policy number EMP-19667, found death to be accidental. In my opinion, the inquest was not thorough. Have decided to stay on in Culver and conduct my own investigation. If any change, please advise via Western Union, Butte Hotel, Culver. Am forwarding copy of coroner's verdict this date. Best regards, Dollar. Correct? Okay. Oh, uh, Mr. Dollar. Hmm? Good luck. Hmm. Yeah, sure. Expense account item five, 68 cents, postage. I mailed a copy of the coroner's verdict to Hartford Airmail Special. After that, I went back to my hotel to wait for the sheriff, Eve Holton. Come on in, Eve. I... Oh. Hello. Hello. Uh, Mr. Dollar, my name's Porter. I'm the manager of this hotel. Oh, well, come in, Mr. Porter. I I can't right now. I've got some other things to attend to. Well, anything I can do for you, Mr. Porter? I'm going to have to ask you for your room, Mr. Dollar. Oh, when? Uh, Today. Any particular reason? We're all filled up. Uh, the, The room's been reserved for six weeks. By whom? What? Who reserved it? Why, uh, a man from Bozeman. It's a sort of convention. Sort of convention. What kind of convention is that, Mr. Porter? Look, Mr. Dollar, you'll have to leave this room today. The man's coming in tonight. Uh Aha. And there's no other hotel in town. That's the way it is, Mr. Dollar. No other place to stay. No. So I have to pack my bags and get out of town, is that it? I must have the room, Mr. Dollar. Who asked you to say you wanted the room, Mr. Porter? Who asked you to come here and kick me out? Why, no one, I... Well, you go back to no one, Mr. Porter, and you tell no one that I'm staying right here in this room here in Culver until I finish what I have to do here. You tell that to no one, will you? Mr. Dollar, I'd I'd hate to call the police. Go ahead, Mr. Porter. Be sure and tell them about the sort of convention you're having and how all the rooms are sold out. Tell them about Mr. No One and tell them I called your bluff. Anything else, Mr. Porter? I was at the stage where I was beginning to take notes for myself. Note one, the mayor didn't want to have an inquest into the death of George Henderson. Note two, when they did have an inquest, they didn't want to really find out anything. Note three, Mr. Hotel Manager wanted me to keep on not finding out anything by getting me out of town. I explained all of this to Eve Holton when he showed up a half an hour later. Well, kind of tight, isn't it? I don't know what that means, Sheriff, but it's pretty stupid. (laughs) Yeah, it's stupid, son, but it could be effective. Now, I'll tell you what. If Porter calls the police, I'm the police, so don't worry about that. I'll hem him and haw him. All right, thanks. Now then, uh, tell me how much your insurance company's stuck for. $50,000 if Henderson's death goes by as an accident. The good book says that's what it was. I know, I know. There's a chance, too, he had a heart failure and fell out of that window. No, sure. Always a chance. We might have to dig him up and find out, Sheriff. Oop, no, hold on. 
Autopsies and digging people up is one thing you'd have a hard time doing around here. I might insist on it. I don't know. Well, let that go for now. Say, tell me about Mrs. Henderson. Where's she from? Here. Right here in Culver. Now, she didn't get that mink coat and those diamonds she was wearing at the inquest in Culver. More important, she didn't get that continental look here either. So what's the story? Well, her name was Pauline Underwood before she married George. Born and raised right here in Culver. Of course, she went to school in the East, and she's been in Europe a couple of times, but most of her life's been right here. She is a mighty pretty widow. And a mighty rich one, too. Henderson had it. I know. This divorce she talked about at the inquest yesterday. Well, everybody in town knew they weren't getting along, never did get along. How could they? Pauline's 26 and George is 59. He could have been her father. As a matter of fact, he almost was. Well, tell me about that. You got a drink? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Well, George raised Pauline from the time she was 14. He paid for all her schooling and growing up. She didn't have any folks after her old man died. George was pretty good to her. He sure was. <laughs> Was he a friend of her parents? Well, Tom Underwood worked out at the ranch for George. When he died, there was Pauline standing there. Oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. And she eventually married him and his money, huh? Well, I, I wouldn't put it that way exactly. I, I think she liked him. Now, I, I've gone over what you're thinking, son. Those two were talking about divorce for some time. The papers had been drawn up for a settlement. She'd have got a lot of alimony and so on. Oh, Pauline had no call to push him out that window or have him pushed out. At least not for money. All right. Suppose he didn't want a divorce. Suppose he loved her and she came to the hotel room that morning and he pleaded with her to try all over again. Suppose she said no. Suppose she said no in a great big cold way. And George Henderson sat there and thought about it after she left. And he got sick all over and he walked over to that window and... Suicide? What do you think? You know him. Uh, he wasn't a suicide type. So. Oh, nobody's the suicide type until they come to the end of the line, Eve. Then it's too late to interview them and ask them how they got there. Everybody seems to think it was an accident, so I'm just throwing words around. Well, you have a right to do that if you aren't satisfied, son. Hey, getting back to this hotel again. Who might want me to get out of town and not ask any questions? Anybody. Well, who? No idea. But it's somebody who has some feelings in this. Hey, who owns this hotel, Eve? Noah Baxter. Who's Noah Baxter? Rancher. Got a place about 15 miles from here. Pretty big man. Uh-huh. Friend of Henderson's? Yeah. Hmm. And let me put that question a little different. Baxter, a friend of Mrs. Henderson's? I don't know. Can you find out? I can try. Well, find out about him and any other friends, Eve. Friends that might be younger, that might have gone to Europe or school in the East. Yeah. <sighs> sure. What are you thinking now, son? Well, now, if I were Mrs. Henderson and my husband fell out of a window in this hotel and killed himself, I'd hire a lawyer and I'd sue the hotel for damages. If the insurance company didn't pay off my claim, I'd hire a lawyer and insist that they pay that claim. I'd do those things right away, Sheriff, especially if I thought it was all legitimate. Yeah. Yeah. Two hours later, I received a wire from Tim Connors. He requested me to look up a man named Thurber, an insurance broker living in Great Falls. Expense account item six, $4.92, tank of gas. I borrowed Sheriff Holton's car and drove the 80-odd miles to Great Falls that afternoon. Mr. Thurber bought lunch. My Lord, I hope there isn't anything to all this, Mr. Dollar. I just hope there isn't. George Henderson. My... Yeah, well, there isn't anything to anything yet, Mr. Thurber. I'm... Still trying to find out the facts. Oh, I knew you were over in Culver. I tried to call you there a couple of times. You were out both times. Finally, I put in a call to the home office in Hartford. I talked to this man, Connors, with the adjustment agency. Yeah. You see, Mr. Dollar, it's like this. I've been over in Jackson Hole for five days now hunting duck. We were way in, and I didn't hear about Henderson's death until I got back yesterday. Uh-huh. Now, uh, look, Mr. Dollar, I don't know what reflection this will have on your attitude toward this case. But two days before I left, Mr. Henderson telephoned me here in Great Falls... He said he wanted to change the beneficiary on his policy. Oh, in other words, he was going to cut his wife out. Huh? Yes, I suppose so. I know they weren't getting along. There'd been talk of divorce. Yes, I guess so. Uh-huh. Did he name a new beneficiary? Yes, a schoolteacher in Culver named Matilda Knickerbocker. Everybody calls her Maddie. What was his connection with her? None that I know of. I think it was just a name for him to throw in until he could decide on another beneficiary why he didn't have... Wait a minute. Maddie Knickerbocker... 
just a school teacher. Everybody knows her. He was awful mad when he talked to me that day. I could tell it in his voice. Now, here's what might interest you just a little more. The day I left on my hunting trip, Mr. Henderson phoned me again. He said to never mind. Mrs. Henderson was still his beneficiary. Had you changed the policies yet? No. Are you sure it was Henderson who telephoned you? Well, yes, if... I, I think it was him. Do you remember when you got the call? Oh, somewhere around noon, a little later, I guess. He died between 12.30 and 1. And it must have been just before he fell out the window. He phoned you long distance from cover, huh? Yes, sir. Well, he was supposed to have been in the hotel all morning, so he had to phone from his room. Well, you can check that, can't you? <laughs> You'd be surprised how hard it is to check simple things like that around the Butte Hotel. Did you know Henderson very well, Mr. Thurber? He was a customer. I wrote a lot of insurance for him. Know his wife? Oh, yes. Well, tell me about them. Well, go ahead, Mr. Thurber. Uh, now, look, accidents rarely have reason behind them. Suicides and murders always do. You don't think it was an accident? Well, let's say I've heard enough and seen enough to make it a draw so far. Go ahead, tell me about them. And I wish I was married to Mrs. Henderson. I mean, I wish she could see me. I think most any man who's ever met her hoped the same thing. Young men, old men, any kind. But she picked George. George was as tough and leathery as these mountains around us, exactly her opposite. But Pauline married him. He raised her. He was close to her all her adult life. Yes. But Mr. Dollar, you know and I know she didn't have to marry him. She could have married anybody here in Culver or anybody in London or Paris. You see what I mean? And not quite. Well... I always had the idea that after she married him, she kept letting him know she could have had anybody else she wanted. Go ahead, Thurber. I think she married him for his money. I think she would have killed him for his money. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Henderson matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the whole affair becomes a town issue, and I become the town goat. Incidentally, let me take a moment to say thanks for the many kind letters you've sent. We appreciate them more than you know. And I only wish it were possible to answer them all personally. Again, thank you. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. Henderson. You asked me to call, Mr. Dollar? Yes, Mrs. Henderson. I'm with Paramount Insurance Adjusters. Oh, yes. You probably know we asked for the inquest into your husband's death. Yes, I know. We're trying to clear up the entire matter as quickly as we can, Mrs. Henderson. I'd like to talk to you. Oh? Hate to trouble you at a time like this. Well, that's all right, Mr. Dollar. When do you want to talk? May I come out to the house this afternoon? There's a nice restaurant called Big Horn Lodge on the highway. How about meeting you there at, say, uh, four o'clock? Good. I'll be there. Tonight and every weekday night, 
Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. Expense account continued. Item seven, five bucks. One pair of galoshes, believe it or not. It snowed in Culver, Montana during the night, all night. By morning, 14 inches of fine new snow covered everything in sight. After my phone call to Mrs. Henderson, I spent the morning trying to rent an automobile. There was none to be had, so that afternoon I dropped over to see Eve Holton, my sheriff friend. Well, son, you're going to catch your death unless you start wearing this car. Everybody. Yeah, I'll remember that, Eve. But maybe I won't need one. Oh? Yeah, I think I'll be leaving Culver pretty soon. Well, I hope you don't mean that, son. I'm afraid I do. I'll have to tie this case up one way or another pretty quick. Why? My company wants me to get back home. I got a letter this morning. Oh, well, how can I help you? Well, for one thing, you can lend me your car again. I, uh, I have a date with a lady out at the Bighorn Lodge. <laughs> pretty fancy. You can have the old thing anytime you want it. You know that, son. Who's the lady? George Henderson's widow. Oh. Now, I know what you're going to say. Why go after her? Why bother her until I have something to go on? Well, I got to do something, Eve. I'm no nearer now to knowing whether Henderson was pushed out that hotel window, fell, or jumped. I think I have enough of an idea of Henderson and his wife to pick up some valuable information from her. Any objections? Nope. Johnny, a couple of days ago, you asked me to look up people who might have been especially friendly to Mrs. Henderson. You still want to know about them? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm working on it. Anyone so far? Nobody I'd put in that category. What time you have to be at the Bighorn? Four. It'll take you a while. Wouldn't hurt to start right now. He's, uh, she's parked out back. Okay, thanks, Eve. Good luck. And don't let her wrangle you, son. She could do it if she wanted to. Goodbye, Eve. Ten minutes later, I was on the road to Bighorn Lodge, which also happened to be the same road I'd traveled two days before to attend George Henderson's funeral. As I drove past the graveyard, white and stark against the blue winter sky, I noticed a car parked along the side of the road, a little Chevy Coupe, about 1952. There was the figure of a woman, all alone, standing by George Henderson's fresh grave. Her head was bowed. She didn't notice me as I walked up. A gray-haired woman, about 45, slight, delicate, gentle. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to start it. Oh, that's all right. Must be getting late. Dear, it is. Uh, do I know you? Why, I don't know. I'm Maddie Knickerbocker. The name had startled me. The day before, an insurance broker in Great Falls had mentioned her, told me that George Henderson had named her his beneficiary, then changed his mind a few minutes before he died. Your name's not Campbell, is it? No. Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar. You remind me of a boy I had in one of my classes once, Tory Campbell. Oh, you're a teacher, Miss Knickerbocker? (laughs) Yes, yes. Everybody knows me, I think. Or at least I flatter myself that way. (laughs) Well, I should be going. I, uh... I knew Mr. Henderson, too. Oh? He was a wonderful man, George. He was very dear to me. I'll find it difficult getting used to the fact that he'll never be around anymore. George had a wonderful laugh, didn't he? Yes. Yes, he did, Mrs. Knickerbocker. I never really thought that he ever grew up. Of course, you knew him in a business way, and I'm sure he was very, very grown up in business. But it doesn't hurt to think of him this way now, does it? I don't think so, Miss Knickerbocker. I didn't come to his funeral. I didn't think I could bear it. I thought I'd just drive out this afternoon and say goodbye by myself. Well, I apologize for interrupting you. Not at all, please. (laughs) Funny little things. Hmm? The birds in the snow. Such tiny, wonderful little things. A little bit of God in each of them, Mr. Dollar, wouldn't you say? 
Yes, ma'am. I don't know why. I think George would like to know they're here, near him. Miss Knickerbocker, I have to tell you... No, you don't, Mr. Dollar. I know who you really are. Everyone in town knows. You seem like a nice young man. Was it curiosity that made you stop your car? Yeah, I suppose so. I apologize. Oh, you needn't. I'm just an old friend of George's saying goodbye to him. Good afternoon, Mr. Dollar. Goodbye. Talking to Maddie Knickerbocker, I felt that for the first time, somebody, namely Maddie, had talked frankly and truthfully about George Henderson. I was still thinking of the frail, drab little woman with the nice blue eyes when I met Pauline Henderson at the Bighorn Lodge. What are these matters you want to clear up, Mr. Dollar? Oh, just some doubts in my mind about your husband's death. What do you drink? Pernod. Pernod. I learned to like it in France. All right. Uh, one perno, bourbon, a little water on the side. Yes, sir. You sound like George when you order. Hey, I like your Bighorn Lodge. And I have to say, when it's elegant in the West, it's elegant. I'd like a light, please. Oh, sorry. Sure. Thank you. Mrs. Henderson, do you mind if I don't stall any longer with the drinks, the smokes, and the compliments? I'm surprised you've stalled this long. I've heard you're a very blunt and impulsive man. I spoke to an insurance agent named Thurber yesterday in Great Falls. Your husband's agent. Mr. Thurber told me that your husband wanted to name a new beneficiary last week. Really? Yeah. He named Matilda Knickerbocker. Matty Knickerbocker. I'm not surprised, I suppose. Matty's a lovely woman. I know George was very fond of her. Mr. Thurber also told me that Mr. Henderson changed his mind about that the day he died. In fact, he phoned Mr. Thurber in Great Falls and told him to leave the policy as it was. He did that a few minutes after you left his hotel room, a few minutes before he died. Can you explain any of that, Mrs. Henderson? Why don't you ask Mary Knickerbocker? Because I don't think she'd know. I ran into her this afternoon and I talked to her. Or not about this, just about other things. I'll look her up again if I have to. But it's you I want information from now. Then why don't you ask what you mean, Mr. Dollar? All right. Did something happen in that hotel room that made him change his mind about you? That's better. I do wish that ridiculous little man would bring our drinks. He will. Don't misunderstand what happened in the hotel room. George and I were going to be divorced. He moved out of the house a month ago. We went to his attorneys and drew up a tentative property settlement. You mean... Dunlap, Edder, Reardon, and Blake, Great Falls... They have a copy of that settlement. George was quite generous to me. So I didn't kill him for his money, if that's what you're thinking. Here we are, sir. Fair no bourbon. Thank you. I didn't see George for mm, three weeks or so after we made the settlement. Then we happened to meet one day in Culver, and... Well, we had a rather bitter argument. It was one of those ridiculous things. We quarreled and parted very angrily. The whole thing was childish. My first impulse was to go right back to the lawyers and demand every unreasonable thing I could on the divorce settlement. I guess George's first impulse was to cancel me out as his beneficiary. Did you go to a lawyer, Mrs. Henderson? No. No, I cooled off. I cooled off considerably, Mr. Dollar. After all, George had been everything to me most of my life. I was truly sorry we never got along as man and wife. I'm glad that we made it up before he died. That morning... He apologized when I came by the hotel. I apologized. After I left, he fell out the window. Then I can assume that this business with the policies had to do with the argument. Assume what you like, Mr. Dollar. I can understand why you're annoyed by me and my questions. It's just that it's kind of hard for us to believe that a man involved in divorcing his wife would still name her as his beneficiary. I say that because of past experience. Oh, it's happened. But as usual. I could have told you that we were reconciled that day in the hotel, that we were going to drop the whole divorce matter, and that George was coming back to the house to live. Yes, you could have told me that, Mrs. Henderson. Mr. Connors in our home office in Hartford called you a few days ago. You hung up on him. Why? Well, I was very upset. I've never been a widow before. Uh Uh-huh. I believe you, Mrs. Henderson, sitting here like this. You're a lovely person, and I know it, and you know it. And this is a pretty nice place to conduct business. Why didn't you ask me to your home? 
I preferred to talk to you here. That's what I thought. I saved all the... Did your husband have any enemies? And did he seem depressed questions for another time? But before I went to bed that night, I read and reread Mrs. Henderson's testimony given at the coroner's inquest. The next morning, I interviewed all of the people at the Butte Hotel who'd been on duty the day Henderson fell out the window. After that, I dropped in to see Eve Holton. Here, here it is, Johnny, right here. Personal effects of the deceased included four suits of men's clothing, 14 shirts, five pairs of holders. Was there a bottle in that room, Sheriff? Liquor? Yeah. No, no bottle. Nothing like it, son. All right. He didn't call down and have a bellboy bring him a bottle or send him any drinks. The chambermaid swears there was no liquor in his room all the time he lived at the hotel. You say he was a light drinker. Now, what light drinker takes a nip before he has his breakfast? Who said he had a drink that morning? Mrs. Henderson. What? On the witness stand, under oath at the inquest. She testified that her husband had a drink before she came up to the room and while she was there. Now, mind you, she didn't say he was drunk. But she did say he had been drinking. You read over that transcript. So? So I think she threw that in, made sure it got in, because it's sometimes hard to believe that a cold, sober man will walk out of a hotel window and kill himself accidentally. A drunk or a drinker might do it. You and I and everybody at that inquest somehow got the impression that Henderson was slightly tipsy that morning. And Mrs. Henderson saw to that. Now then, if Henderson had a drink, I want to know where he got it. Tell me, Eve, no bottle in the room, no bottle brought up to the room. Where did he get that drink? That's a pretty good question, son. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Henderson matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the wind-up. Yeah, the whole case blows sky high. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. I have a call for you from Hartford. Go ahead, please. Johnny? Right here. Connors at Paramount Adjusters. Say, what was this wire, Johnny? You serious about denying liability to Mrs. Henderson? I sure am. I think it'll bring the whole thing out in the open. This is pretty serious. Have you got any concrete evidence death wasn't accidental? Jim, I have a copy of the coroner's inquest. Concrete evidence that Mrs. Henderson lied under oath. She said her husband was drinking the morning he died. Everybody here believed he was a little crocked when he fell out that hotel window. I've got proof that he didn't have a drink that morning. What proof? No bottle in his room. No bottle brought there. Nothing. What do you say? Don't make a move, kiddo. I'll get the first plane. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> X-23 
expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Paramount Insurance Adjusters, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Henderson matter. Sheriff Holton agreed that there was enough of a doubt about the circumstances prior to George Henderson's accidental death to warrant an official re-examination of all the facts. He promised me the police would start an immediate investigation. That was all I needed. I knew Mrs. Henderson would be re-questioned and that the pressure would start to build up. Fourteen hours later, when Tim Connors arrived in Culver, I had some pressure of my own. Well, Johnny, what? Well, the best thing we can do now is move in. Deny liability on the grounds that the accident is not proved. I suppose Mrs. Henderson sues us. All right, let her. Then the burden of proving that her husband's death was accidental would be on her. Look, Tim, contrary to her testimony under oath, Henderson didn't have a drink that morning he died. All right, she made a mistake. He had a heart attack, got dizzy, and tumbled out of the window. He wasn't drunk. Oh, don't talk nonsense, Tim. Listen to me. Mrs. Henderson was ready for the coroner's jury a couple of days ago, and she was ready for my questions when I saw her yesterday. The only one she wasn't ready for was you a few days ago when you phoned a long distance. You said she hung up on you. Well, she half apologized to me for that, but it was because she couldn't think of anything to say. Well, maybe you're right. But suppose he did die accidentally, and suppose it is a just insurance claim. I tell you it isn't. Now, the fact that she made a mistake testifying about him having a drink and... Hey, Johnny, do you have anything else? Three things. Instinct, experience, and statistics. Pauline Henderson's a young woman. She married a wealthy older man. With him out of the way, she has all his money and all her youth. All right, I'm going to phone the company as soon as I can find a phone. Tell them I'm working for evidence, and the best way to get it is to bring Mrs. Henderson out in the open. File a complaint against her. What charge? Suspected murder. Oh, no, Johnny, that'd get us in all kinds of trouble. Remember the drink, Tim. Henderson didn't have the drink. Now, we'll have to have more than that. I'm sorry, Johnny. All right, I'll get you more. An hour later, I was with Sheriff Holden comparing notes. He reported that after questioning Mrs. Henderson, she admitted she might have been mistaken about Henderson drinking the morning of his death. She wasn't sure. But Eve Holton said what we both were thinking. He went in front of the coroner's jury and gave a misleading impression, son. Made us think that George was drunk and stumbled out the window. Well, we better find out who helped her pull this off. Sheriff Holton had every man in his office working on the case by then. It was a long, tedious job of combing over everything in Pauline Henderson's background to find a possible accomplice. About five in the afternoon, I drove to the Henderson Ranch with Holton. Mrs. Henderson was out, but we interviewed one of the servants. That's right, sir. Once, twice a week. Uh Uh-huh. You know where she drove to on these trips? I have no idea. Mrs. Henderson would get up early in the morning be gone all day. How do you know she went out of town? Well... She'd generally take a small suitcase with her, change of clothes. You don't take those when you're visiting a friend in town, do you? Tell us what car she'd use on these trips. A Cadillac. Always come back covered with mud and ice. Always have to be washed up. Mr. Henderson used to complain about that. About the car being dirty? Uh, about the trips, mostly. He and Mrs. Henderson had some pretty good arguments about him. He'd say Mrs. Henderson shouldn't visit that man. What man? Just that man. I never knew who it was they argued about. You've known Mrs. Henderson quite a long time, huh? Yes, sir. Know her when she was a little girl, when she first came here. Saw her grow up, go away to school, go away to Europe, come back a little more grown up, a little different every time. Were you surprised when Mr. Henderson married her? Well, no. Well, yes, guess I was. Because she was so much younger? Not that so much. I mean, well, Mr. Henderson... He had something about the plains and cattle and mountains about him. When he moved, it was as big as all them things. Mrs. Henderson was different. She didn't fit in here? Is that what you're trying to say? I think she fit. Not like him, though. Before they were married, they were sort of like good friends. I mean, they'd ride horses and go hunting and laugh and talk about different things. Mrs. Henderson, she traveled to Europe, saw so many things and places in the world... She fit here, but then she didn't belong here. I feel awful about Mr. Henderson's being dead. If there was anything wrong with the way he died, I'd like it to be fixed. Mrs. Henderson would probably fire me for talking like this, but I don't care. This house isn't the same no more. By 
By the time we got back into town, Sheriff Holton's boys had discovered the names of three men who had been seen at various places around Culver in the company of Mrs. Henderson. Rod Tyler. Oh, who's he? Mining engineer. He's been away from here for over a year now. See, now here's another one, Sam Pollard. Sam died six months ago. Hey. What? Noah Baxter. Noah Baxter. That name's vaguely familiar. Yeah, he owns a hotel you're staying in. A couple of ranches, too. Well, he might have been the one who tried to have you thrown out. Oh. He also owns the mayor. Young man? About 30, 35. Let's go see him. Another drive. This time north of Culver to the Baxter Ranch. We found Noah Baxter busy with his help shoring horns on cattle. A lean, tall man with thin features. If you're trying to find out if I haven't seen Pauline on the sly while she'd been married to George, why didn't you come right out and ask? All right, have you? No. Not on the sly. There's nothing between us. George knew any time she came over here to see me. He was a good friend of mine. I'm sorry he's dead. Pauline's a good friend of mine, too. I'm sorry you people are thinking what you are about us. Let's go up the house. It's getting cold. All right, Stan, that's enough for today. No, I got to ask you this. Where were you last Thursday? The day George died, Sheriff? Yeah. I was right here. Can you prove that? Sure. Ask anybody. You boys want a drink? No, thanks. No, thanks. No. Well, I do. Mac! Mac! I can get it myself. When was the last time you were in cover, Mr. Baxter? Three, four weeks ago. My cook and the others handle what supplies we need. Do you mind if we talk to some of your help around here? No. Nope. What do you want to talk to him about? About last Thursday? About what happened when Mrs. Henderson came here to visit? It wouldn't look good if she came here to visit me, would it? Well, that depends on the circumstances, no? Huh. She'd come and sit there and read and look at some of those paintings. We'd talk when I had time. Anything wrong with that? No. Mr. Baxter, I think I ought to tell you. I've asked my company to file a complaint against Mrs. Henderson. Suspicion of murder. Oh. I'd like to tell you something. She didn't kill him and she didn't have him killed. She loved him a lot more than George loved her, I think. Both of you know her. Her dad was a drunken cowhand. When he died, George took her over, gave her everything. So you see, you're wrong. She loved George for giving her what he gave her and mostly for being the kind of a man he was. I lied to you a couple of minutes ago. There was something between us. It was bound to happen sooner or later. She'd come here to cry on my shoulder and... I... I let her. Cry? About George. He wanted to divorce her. Didn't you know that? I had the idea it was the other way around. <laughs> You're all wrong. George raised her, educated her, made her into a woman, and then he married her. And she wasn't what he wanted at all. <laughs> you know who George wanted to marry? Matty Knickerbocker, the schoolmarm. Go on. Oh, there was nothing between George and Matty, but there would have been if he'd lived. What about you and Mrs. Henderson? Yeah. And the thing that was between us was that I wanted her. She didn't want me, but I wanted her. I was glad when she told me about the divorce coming up. I really think she would have listened to me. But she wanted to be married to George. She really loved him. Sure you don't want one of these? No. No. And I really loved her. I went to see George last Thursday at his hotel. You know why? To tell him to go back to Pauline. Yeah. Because I knew what he meant to her. <laughs> you can talk to my people around here. They'd lie for me and say I was here last Thursday all day. They'd tell you that Pauline never came to see me. They'd lie right down the line for me. But, Mr. Dollar, I can't let you get out that complaint and take her in. One of my trucks was taking some beef to the hotel last Thursday. I rode in with the driver and went in the back way. I went right up to George's room to talk to him. Pauline had just left. 
I wanted to talk to him about the same things I've been telling you. I didn't want to hurt him. I loved him, the same as everybody loved him. When I got to his room, he wouldn't let me talk at all. He was mad that I interfered. He tried to swing on me. I shoved him once. He went out the window. That's all. I killed him. Expense account, item eight. Fifty-eight dollars and fifteen cents. Hotel and food while in Culver, Montana. Item nine, same as item two. Transportation by train and plane back to Hartford. Item ten, eighty-eight dollars. Miscellaneous. Expense account total, eight hundred and two dollars and fifty cents. Remarks. We still had to pay double indemnity. Maddie Knickerbocker, Pauline Henderson, Noah Baxter, they'll pay another way. With the hurt that comes to nice people. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another exciting story beginning next Monday night. Next week, a real mystery complete with plenty of action, a beautiful blonde, and a killer lurking in the shadows. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Irene Tedrow, D.J. Thompson, Herb Ellis, Marvin Miller, Forrest Lewis, Bob Bruce, and Russ Thorson. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story... Of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. W. Fitch Company, makers of those fine Fitch products, presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, I was suffering one of my regular attacks of rigor indolence last year when I decided to commune with nature in a gentle sort of a way. So I made a reservation at the L7 Dude Ranch out in the desert. The afternoon I arrived at the ranch, I was lolling around the swimming pool, exposing my epidermis to the sun and admiring the scenery, when part of the scenery walked up and took a poke at another part of the scenery over some of the most beautiful scenery I've ever seen in or out of a white satin bathing suit. The poker was a paunchy 45, the pokey a very slick 30. And the cause of it all was a lovely, lovely 25, blonde and definitely feminine. I stayed out of it. Come on, Barney. Hey, 
I've told you for the last time, Harding, I want you to stay away from my wife. Brian, please, you've been drinking. This is no place to settle your quarrel with Tom. I'm just as sick of you as you are of me, Mills, and so's Anne. You're no good to anybody. Tom, don't. Not here. Tom. If you don't stay away from my wife, I'll kill you, oh, Harding. please. Come on, Brian. Let's get out of here, please. Tom, I'll see you later. This is the last time I'm going to warn you, Harding. If you don't stay away from oh, me, I'll shut up. You're drunk again. Talking that all. You're not going to kill anybody. I'll see you later, Anne. Come on, Brian. Let's go now. Would you mind talking to me? I'm a little embarrassed. Oh, hello. Why don't you just look the other way? That's what I'm doing. Maybe it's because I want to see Tom Harding get what's coming to him. You don't like Mr. Harding? Well, no. He considers himself the world's most attractive man. Well, that's silly. I'm the world's most attractive man. Uh, How nice. I'm the world's most attractive woman. Well, what a couple we'd make. You'd like to know my name? I know you. You're Richard Rogue. Been reading my mail. No, but you're a very famous person. I've seen your picture in the paper lots of times. Society page, of course. Was it? I don't remember. Well, that's thoughtful of you. What's your name? Lucia Logan. Should I know it? Not unless you're looking for a secretary. That's what I am. Like to ride? Love it. Some of my best friends are horses. You're lucky. Some of my best friends are skunks. Want to go for an early morning ride with me tomorrow? Mm, tomorrow we greet the dawn on horseback and, uh... Yeah? I'll wear a coat to keep me warm, Richard. You know, Lucia, darling, this scene uh, brings out the Gene Autry in me. Yes, sir. If I had my guitar, I'd sing for you. So help me. Oh, bury me not on the lone prairie. <laughs> yeah, this is for me, baby. Yep, someday I'm going to save enough money to buy me a ranch out here, and then I'm through with the crowded city. Yep. Me for the wide open spaces. With my dogs and my horses and... And a pretty little partner to cook and sow. And milk the cows and throw down the hay at the horse's stalls uh, and... I'm not listening anymore. Oh? What's ever happened to the pioneer woman? Richard, look. Hmm? Where? Over there, where I'm pointing. There's a man lying there. Huh? Yeah. Come on. He's hurt. Must have been thrown from his horse or something. Yeah. I can't hang on, Richard. Well, take it easy then. Oh, boy. Whoa, whoa. Set it down. Whoa, whoa. Oh. Oh, no. This couldn't happen to me. Who is it, Richard? It's Tom Harding, baby. Stay on your horse. Is he unconscious? No. He's been shot. He's dead. I'll be back in a moment to tell you the rest of the story of Blood on the Sand, but first here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company, who's going to give you men a shaving tip you can't afford to skip. That's right, Dick. I want to tip you men off to the grandest, smoothest shave you've had in a long time. It's the kind of shave you can have all the time when you use Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. You see, Fitch's No Brush contains not one, but three important shaving ingredients. These three ingredients are blended together in a smooth, rich cream that lubricates your face instantly and prepares it for the shave. Your razor will fairly sail along over those whiskers, cutting them close and clean without nicking or scraping. It's easier on your face, easier on your razor blades, too. When you've finished, your face will have a cool, refreshed feeling that lingers for hours. No fooling, fellas, for a really solid comfort shave. Switch to Fitch. Men who say there's nothing like lather to give a smooth, swell shave will find Fitch's brush cream as tops. It gives a rich lather that stays moist longer, rinses off easier. Next time, make it Fitch's shave cream, either brush or no brush type. Two handy economical sizes, 25 and 50 cents. And now here's Dick Powell again as private detective Richard Rogue. I was saying, before Jim Doyle put in that pitch for Fitch, when the great outdoors called me down to the L7 Dude Ranch on the desert for a two-week vacation, I didn't expect to meet a dream girl like Lucia Logan. And I didn't expect to hear a writer, Brian Mills, threaten to kill his friend, Tom Harding, if he didn't stay away from his wife, Anne. And I didn't expect to make a discovery which Lucia and I made on a sunrise horseback ride the next morning. We were just riding along, enjoying the dawn, 
when we saw the body of a man lying on the floor of the desert. I reached the body first. Who is it, Richard? It's Tom Harding, baby. Stay on your horse. Is he unconscious? No. He's been shot. He's dead. Oh, Richard. He was murdered and there's no gun here. Oh, why do things like this always happen to me? Oh, Richard. Let's get back to the ranch. I'm scared. Well, there's nothing to be scared of. The guy's dead. But whoever shot him might still be around here, Richard. Whoever shot him never was around here, baby. There's not a footprint in sight. And he was shot from long range, if I'm any good at my business. But it's just getting light. You remember last night, baby? Remember the moonlight? <laughs> it didn't even take good shooting to kill this guy. Sheriff Kane, I take it from the badge. That's right. I just got back from looking at that body you found for me this morning. Yeah. He was shot with a thirty-two twenty rifle. A deer gun. No kidding. Ah. Have you figured out where the killer was when he did the shooting? My boys are checking. You, uh, going to help me out on this case, Rogue? I'm on a vacation. I well, don't... I can use any help you want to give me. I'll swear you in as a deputy. No, no, no. No thanks, Kane. Believe me, I want no part of it. I'm up here for a rest, and I'm going to have it. Well, let me know if you change your mind. I sure will. Oh, by the way, any ideas on who would want to kill Hardy? I just got here yesterday afternoon. I don't know anything about the guy. But you heard his life threatened yesterday at the swimming pool, didn't you? Oh, you know about that, huh? Mm-hmm. I just wanted to know how much you weren't going to cooperate, Rogue. Well, I knew somebody would tell you. Now, just leave me out of it, Kane. I pass. Well, sorry. I'll see you later, Rogue. you mind if I sit here with you for dinner, Richard? Well, hello. I've been looking for you, Luscious Lucia. Have a chair. You've been avoiding me. I've been avoiding everybody. I'm on a vacation. I don't want to get mixed up in that murder. You know, everybody thinks Mr. Mills did it. What do you mean, everybody thinks so? Well, I think so. He threatened to kill Tom. You heard him. Well, how about Mrs. Mills? She was having trouble with Harding, too, wasn't she? Yes, but I still think it was that drunken husband of hers. Oh, well, you do, huh? Well, you want a tip from me, baby? What? Don't be going around having hunches about murders, and if you have them, shut up about them. Stay out of it. Well, the sheriff won't let anybody leave the ranch. You came here for a week, didn't you? How about a ride in the morning? We didn't get very far with that one this morning, did we? <laughs> Mr. Rogue? Yeah? Oh, hello, Mills. Could I see you for a moment, Mr. Rogue? Well, I'd like to eat my dinner if they ever serve it. Oh, perhaps later. Huh? Well, what do you want to see me about, Mills? In your professional capacity, Mr. Rogue. I'm not in my professional capacity. Could I drop by your cabin later this evening? Well, sure, if you can walk that far, I'll be there. Thank you. My goodness, you're popular. Just like being with a movie star. Uh, yeah, yeah. So how about that horseback ride in the morning? Want to try it again? Hmm, I'd love to. Such exciting things happen when I go for rides with you. Come in. Oh, hello, Mills. Come in. My wife is with me, Rogue. Huh? Oh. How do you do, Mrs. Mills? Hello. Oh, well, wait a minute, huh? I got these bottles off the chair and we can all sit down. These cabins weren't built for entertaining large parties, were they? No. No, they weren't. Oh. Well, now that we're uh, all comfortable, Mills, what do you want to see me about? And the answer is no. Please, Mr. Rogue, you don't even know what Brian was going to say. You want me to get mixed up with the murder of Tom Harding, right? Yes, I do, Rogue. And I'm willing to pay you well for your time. I'm not interested. You see, this is the first vacation I've taken for about four Rogue, years. I'm being persecuted. That hick sheriff, is he's been hounding me. Sheriff Kane seems to be a pretty astute officer. Did you kill Harding Mills? No, he didn't. He was with me all that evening, all that night. I told the sheriff that. Brian was never out of my sight. My wife can give me a perfect alibi, Rogue. I'm not the sort of man who kills people, and I'm not going to be hounded by a country sheriff. Look, Mills, I'm sorry if you're being hounded, but I'm on a vacation, so you, I don't want... You must protect my husband, Mr. Rogue. He's not a murderer. The sheriff suspects him because... He and Harding had words yesterday. I heard the words. 
One of them was kill. You threatened to kill Harding, didn't you, Mills? He was annoying my wife. I, nobody would have ever heard of him if it hadn't been for me. A writer. <laughs> Couldn't even write home for money. Harding was a horrible pest, Mr. Rogue. He wouldn't let me alone. Yeah, so I've heard. So, uh, just what was the relationship between the two of you and Tom Hart? Uh, he and I have been collaborating on plays for years. He, uh, he was engaged to Anne when I married her a year ago. Since then, he's been giving us nothing but trouble. I never loved him, but I couldn't convince him of that. And I know one thing. My husband didn't kill him. I'll give you $500 to work on this case for me, Rogue. What do you expect me to do? Find the real murderer. Protect me. Convince that stupid sheriff I couldn't have killed Harding. All right, give me the 500. Got it with you? Yeah. Yeah, I got it with me. Okay, now here's what I'll do. I'll try to locate the real murderer, whether it's you or whoever it is. And when I find him, I'll turn him over to the sheriff. Understand? Yes. But, Rogue, I didn't kill Tom Harding. I don't know what it is about money that frays my moral fiber, but when the man handed me those nice, crisp hundred-dollar bills, all my bad intentions about enjoying my vacation disappeared like friends when I'm broke. After Brian Mills and his glamorous wife left, I smoked a cigarette and turned in. I was going riding at dawn. And when I got to the stables next morning, Lucia wasn't there yet, but Mrs. Mills was. She was wearing a riding habit to which no horse nor man would ever say nay, and... Of all things, a pair of pigskin play shoes. Oh, very fetching. And very peculiar. Oh, hello, Mr. Rogue. You off for a morning ride? Yes, I mentioned it last night. Remember? Did you? Oh, I guess you did. I was so upset about Brian's trouble with the sheriff. You, you are going to help him, aren't you, Mr. Rogue? He's such a sweetheart, and scandal would ruin him. Sure. Well, I took his money. I'm going to do what I can for him. Oh, I hope it's taught him a lesson. He has a terrible temper when he's drinking. He should never have caused that scene at the pool. You were the cause of that scene. What did Tom Harding have on you? Nothing. We used to be good friends, that's all. Oh, I see. You're not telling all you know, are you, Mrs. Mills? Mr. Rogue, I want you to promise me something. I'll listen. You said last night that... If you found incriminating evidence on my husband, you'd turn it over to the authorities. Yeah, sure I will. Please, Mr. Rogue, I have some money of my own. I want you to promise me that you'll... You'll tell me first if you find anything which makes you suspicious of Brian. Hey, I don't get it. I thought he had an ironclad alibi. He has. And besides, Brian couldn't kill anybody. I want to do everything I can to protect him from worry and persecution. Look, I know how you feel, Mrs. Mills. If your husband isn't guilty, don't worry. We'll keep him out of it. Richard. Uh, oh, hello there, beautiful. You know Mrs. Mills? Mm, we've met. Oh. Our horses are all ready. I've been out helping to saddle them. Okay, let's go. I don't like this, Richard. Climbing mountains on horseback. What do you think of Mrs. Mills? I don't. There's a method to my madness, baby. I'm a working man today. You are? Who are you working for? Secret. You've decided to get mixed up in that murder, haven't you? Yep, something nice happened to me. That's what we're doing here at the spot where we located that body. I was siding in on this pile of rocks. Are you being mysterious? No, not especially. Today I'm being a detective. You see, Angel, Harding was shot with a deer gun. <laughs> Everybody knows that. I'm no detective and I know that. Okay, but do you know enough to figure out where the shot came from? By the way the body fell? I don't even care. I came out for a horseback ride, and I want to enjoy it. This is no fun, walking a horse up the side of a mountain. Well, uh, we haven't far to go. Just stay with me a little longer. And to think I turned down a date with that nice-looking blonde boy from San Francisco this morning. Oh, look, are you going to stop beefing? Oh, boy. Why are you oh. stopping, Richard? Oh, I just want to look around here a little bit. Oh, boy. What are you looking for? I'm prospecting for lead, maybe with a copper jacket. Come on, we're walking from here. Oh, no. Come on, I... I want 
to take a look behind that big rock up there. I'm going to be so stiff. I won't be able to dance tonight. Good. We'll set them all out someplace near the punch bowl. Oh, no. I'm going to be with that blonde boy from San Francisco. And if you so much as ask me for a dance, I'll... Oh. What's the matter? Look. Look there on the ground behind that bowler. Where? Oh, those little copper things. They're, they're shells, aren't they? They certainly are. Three empty shells. Hmm. 3220s. Look out. Don't touch them. I want them for fingerprints. Do you think they're the shells that killed Tom Harding? Well, I'm willing to bet they are, baby. I think we just put the finger on a murderer. Richard? Yeah? Look down there. Where? Way over there on that next peak. The sun's flashing on something. Hmm? Oh. Oh, yeah, I, I see it. Hmm. Somebody is looking us over with a pair of field glasses, I think. Probably the murderer. He wouldn't like to see us looking around up here. What are you putting in your pocket? Another little souvenir. See? Oh. <laughs> Get on, baby. Get on. That was a rifle bullet. Get on here behind this rock. Our story will continue in just a moment. But first, I'd like to remind you that the holiday season coming up will be the gayest in years, with peace on earth at last to reality. You ladies will undoubtedly want to keep in the spirit of things by accentuating your costumes and hairstyles with gay, sparkling jewelry so popular now. But remember... Dull, drab-looking hair is not the kind of background you want for your jeweled hair accessories. Try using Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo to give your hair luster and a jewel-like sparkle. Fitch's saponified shampoo is made from mild coconut and pure vegetable oils, so it won't dry your hair. Even immediately after washing, your hair will be soft and shiny, easy to set into your favorite holiday hairstyle. Using Fitch's saponified shampoo will take only a few minutes from your busy day, too. Just a little shampoo makes mountains of fluffy, fragrant lather. And since Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent, you won't have to bother with a special after-rinse. To keep your hair looking radiantly lovely at its holiday best, use Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo. Now we return to Rogue's Gallery with Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue. My thoughts were as bitter as a quinine sandwich as I ducked down behind that boulder and listened to the bullets sing. With the whole world to get killed in, why did Tom Harding have to pick out a dude ranch where I was sweating on a vacation? I reached into my pocket where I'd put the empty rifle bullets. The killer had fired at Harding and they were there. I felt in my back pocket and the other clue... I had found was safe. I tried to pull Lucia down beside me just as I heard another bullet sing. Lucia screamed and my heart did a handspring in my throat. Hmm? Oh, I'm shot. Hmm? Richard, oh, why did I ever come with you? Where did you get it? Where would you get it? Let me see. Right here. In the shoulder. Well, well get your hand away from there. Oh, you're not shot, youngster. You're not even bleeding. I'm not? Well, no. You must have just been hit with a chip of a rock or something, that's all. Now, come on, let's get out of here. Stay low now. I'll go first. Oh, if I ever get back to that ranch alive, Richard Rogue, and if you ever speak to me again... Oh, take it easy, baby. This will be something to tell our grandchildren about. <laughs> our grandchildren? Richard Rogue, I never want to see you again. <laughs> We got back to our horses and got back to the ranch house all right. I made Lucia promise not to say a word to anybody until I had a chance to think this thing out. She promised. She would have promised anything to get rid of me. I went to my cabin to look over the stuff I'd found up there behind that boulder, and as I opened the door to my cabin... Oh, 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 I got it. Right behind the ear, as usual. I watched the stars go by for a while, and finally I grabbed on the tail of a comet and didn't let go until I was within dumping distance of cloud number eight. And there he was, my alter enemy, Yugor. <laughs> You're a little late tonight, Rogi. Yeah, oh, oh what happened? <laughs> Somebody wanted to know what you found up there on that mountain. You 
should have stuck to your vacation, Rogie. Uh, well, whoever it was, I... I'm going to have them over a barrel in a few minutes. Oh, i got to get back there. Help me. <laughs> oh, you better rest a while. I can't. So long, Midget. See you next week. So long, Rogie. <laughs> Well, I, I came to and felt my head. It was, oh, it was really caved in. Whoever hit me used a piece of firewood. I looked in my pants pocket. The, the handkerchief I'd wrapped the empty cartridges in was gone. I grabbed it in my back pocket and it was there. That other little clue I'd picked up there behind that boulder. I staggered to my feet and, and I... I headed for the main ranch house. I, I saw the sheriff's car outside. I, I wanted to talk with him. Rogue! Hey, hey, what's the matter? What's happened to you, man? Oh, nothing, nothing much. I Somebody just battered my brains out, that's all. Oh. Yeah, I I want to talk with you, though. Come on. Uh, sure. Well, I, I, I've been working on that murder for you. Oh, swell. Yeah, I, I was hired by one of the suspects. Not Mills. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's that's the guy. Oh, he's guilty as the devil, Rogue. Uh, how do you figure? Motive. Mm. He had a double-barreled one. First, Harding had been making up to his wife. Second, Harding and Mills had drawn up partnership papers, providing that if either one of them died, the other would be sole owner of anything they were working on. Yeah? Sure. I've been checking on them through the L.A. police. They've got a play that every picture company is bidding for and every Broadway producer is interested in, a gold mine. Well, now that Harding's dead, the play is the sole property of Mills. <laughs> Those two motives good enough for you? Well, how about his alibi? His wife said he was never out of her sight. If that's true, he couldn't possibly have killed Harding. Well, I got a call from his wife telling me to meet her at their cabin at noon. That's going to be the end of that alibi, I think. She sounded nervous and scared. Uh, I'm going over there now. Uh, going with me? Sure. Yeah, I'll go. Oh, uh, I found the place where the killer waited for Harding to keep his date to be killed. Oh, you, you did, huh? Yeah, and I also found the casings from the bullets that killed him. Well, where are they? A any fingerprints? Uh, somebody just knocked my brains out and took them from me. Oh, uh, how long ago? Oh, it must have been a half an hour. Oh, uh, that's what you get for not cooperating with me, Rogue. You've cost me... Uh, uh, oh. hey, that came from the mill's cabin. Come on. Right here. Mills. I killed him. I killed my husband. Yeah. Yeah, you sure have. Hey, what, what happened? He had that rifle. He was going to kill me. I Why was he going to kill you? Lock the door, Kane. Huh? Oh, yeah. Now look, Mrs. Mills. You'll have to get a hold of yourself. Why was your husband going to kill you? Because I knew I was going to tell the sheriff he wasn't with me last night. He was drinking. He took that rifle and left before Tom Harding was killed. I told him I couldn't go on lying. Oh, that's why you sent for me. You were going to break his alibi. Yes. He killed Tom. He was boasting about it to me. Oh, poor Brian. I loved him, but I couldn't. Oh, is that, uh, that rifle there, 3220, Sheriff? Mm-hmm. It's the murder gun, all right. Well... Looks like this case is all wrapped up, Rogue. I'm sorry, Mrs. Mills. Now, yeah, look, Sheriff, this case is all wrapped up all right, but not the way you think. Hmm? Mills never killed anybody. Why? Oh, what do you mean? I mean, Mrs. Mills missed something when she beat my brains out and took me down for those cartridges while ago. Me? I don't know what you're talking about. Hey, you I... better have something to back that up, Rogue. If I haven't, I'll take the wrap. Look, Kane. You see those fancy ladies' cowboy boots over there in the corner? Yeah. Get away from them. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I got her. Bring those boots over here, Kane. Let go of me. Okay, Rogue. How about letting me in on it? Well, half the heel's gone off the left boot, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Let go of me. If you don't stand still, Mrs. Mills, they're going to slug you. I've got that broken boot heel right here in my pocket, Kane, and I had a witness when I found it this afternoon. Up there behind that boulder where Mrs. Mills here waited for Tom Harding to keep his date with her and a couple of slugs from a 3220. Well, that's the end of the story. Mrs. Mills didn't want her husband, and she didn't want her old boyfriend. 
Gypsy just wanted to own that play everybody was fighting for. So when her husband threatened her boyfriend, she went into action. She invited Tom Harding to a rendezvous on the desert and shot him to death. And then when her husband was suspected of the crime, she gave him an alibi. So she could kill him later and swear it was self-defense. She would have gotten away with it, too, if it hadn't been for that half of boot heel. The minute I saw it lying there behind that boulder, I thought of her western riding habit that morning and the pigskin play shoes. That started my massive intellect to work, kind of. <laughs> of course, when the, <clears throat> that happened, that was all. I also remembered the faint odor of her expensive perfume just before that log knocked my brains out. And, uh, well, after the excitement was over and I had combed the lump out of my hair, I went over to see Luscious Lucia. Oh, you. Oh, hello, dear. I just thought I'd drop I over. I told you I never wanted to see you again. Oh, well, she was a little on the chubby side anyway. You know what I mean? This is Dick Polligan, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Believe me, Richard Rogue is the only man who ever made money on a dude ranch vacation. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed our story. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music and D. Engelbach produced and directed. Don't forget now, we all have got a date next Thursday night. We're going to do a little story about murder, arson, and a lovely lady. We call it Fortune and Furs. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening and good night, all. Now here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time. Oh, uh, and by the way, be sure to see Dick Powell in his newest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. And as I was saying, don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, barber or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. W. Fitch Company, makers of those fine Fitch products, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Hello, Richard Rogue speaking. Hello, Mr. Rogue. This is Stark McVeigh in Minden, California. Yeah? I want to talk to you, Rogue. Well, you're talking. I want you to come up here to Minden and do a little job for me. I don't want you to let anybody in this town know who you are. Uh, you can register at the hotel as a traveling man, a salesman or something. And I, uh, I... Hold it, hold it, McVeigh. I can't get away right now. I wired you $500 expense money. It should be at your office now. Mm -hmm. We'll talk over the rest of the deal when you get here. Oh, five bills, huh? Well, what kind of a case is it? A case that pays money. You can get out of there at 7 o'clock, and if you want to take a train... I'll I think... drive. I'll leave as soon as the 500 arrive. Take me about two hours to get there, won't it? That's right. I'll contact you at the hotel tonight about nine. Okay. See you then. How are you, Banks, sir? Oh, yeah, yeah. I want to check in. Here. Thanks. Hey, clerk. Yes? You got a room? Well, I don't no, know. I didn't ask the price, did I? I'll take anything from a broom closet to the bridal suite. Here, buy yourself a box of cigars to smoke while you're thinking it over. Oh, thank you, sir. If you'll just register, I think we can take care of you. Hmm, thanks. Have my bag sent up, will you? I'll pick up my key in a minute. Hey, Sonny, got an evening paper? Yes, sir, but all the news isn't in that paper, mister, believe me. What do you mean? There was a murder in town tonight. Just a little while ago, as a matter of fact. 
A man was shot. Killed. Dead. Hmm. All that? Well, Menden is an enterprising community. Who got the business? A fellow by the name of Stark McVeigh. <laughs> We'll return to our story in just a moment, but first here's Jim Doyle to give you some smooth talk on a smooth subject. Yes, smooth is the word for it, Dick. That describes Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream to a T. For it has a rich, creamy consistency that spreads over your face like a cool April breeze. There's nothing heavy or greasy about Fitch's No Brush, yet it does a man-sized job when it comes to wilting a tough beard. You see, Fitch's No Brush is a blend of three important shaving ingredients. These are balanced in such a way that you get efficiency in softening whiskers, plus a skin conditioning action that protects your skin from irritation. Yes, they all add up to a shave that's really solid comfort. You men who say there's nothing like lather for a swell, smooth shave will like Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives lots of dense lather that stays moist all during the shave and rinses off easily. It, too, contains the special skin conditioner for sensitive skins. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush shaving cream come in handy jars, big 25 and 50 cent sizes. For smoother, happier shaves, switch to Fitch. And now we return you to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. case looked like it was officially over before it started. The man I was working for had just been killed. I found that out while I was registering in Menden's, Menden's only hotel with running water. A bellboy gave me the news, and while I was just standing there with my mouth hanging open, a big beefy guy eased up to me and said, You're Richard Rogue, aren't you? Oh, my name's Richard. Yeah, I know you're Rogue. I've seen your picture in the paper too often to be mistaken. I want to talk to you. Why? Because I'm chief of police in this town. Oh, oh, well, you just want to have a social talk, huh? Yeah, about a murder. Come on, Rogue, let's retire to the bar and play questions and answers. What about? About what you're doing in town, among other things. Come on, get moving, big shot. Suppose you start talking. What are you doing in Minden under the name of Richard? Hey, bartender, you put too much sugar in this old fashioned. Oh, so you think I like to hear myself talk? I said, what are you doing here? I'm on a vacation. Does a man named Stark McVeigh always finance your vacations? Hmm, McVeigh. Hmm, yes. Well, the name sounds familiar. I'll bet it does. He had a call in for you all day down at the city. He reached you at the Hunt Bar Room a little before 5 o'clock, and he wired you $500 to your office this afternoon. Huh. <laughs> Maybe that's why his name sounds familiar. Huh? Could be that. Well, what was it that made McVeigh think he'd need you $500 worth of rogue? He didn't say. Uh, who was McVeigh, anyway? I never met the guy. Never heard of him till he called me. You think I'll believe that? How do I know what you believe? I'm telling you the truth. That's all I can be sure of. And what's the idea of the pressure? You got ambitions to hang McVeigh's murder on me? Uh-huh. You know he's been murdered. How did you know that? Well, the bellboy told me. Who did it, Rogue? Who was McVeigh afraid of? I don't know anything about the guy. I didn't murder him. I hardly ever murder strangers. And now, uh, thanks for the drink and so long. Wait a minute. You leaving town, Rogue? I don't think so, no. I like the climate here. It's, uh, it's so peaceful. Well, don't you leave without seeing me. Or you'll come back with your hands cuffed behind you, lying down. <laughs> oh, well, if there's anything I love, it's a clever conversationalist. Huh? Huh? Now, I'll make a rule, egghead. Don't put any of your rural gumshoes on my tail if you like them personally. I don't like to be shattered. <laughs> Here's your ice water, Mr. Rogue. The name is Richard. Skip it, skip it. I heard you talking to Chief Reese. I know who you were anyway. Oh, well, you're a smart lad, huh? <laughs> Did you know Stark McVeigh? Sure. He used to be around here quite a bit. In the bar. What was his racket? What did he do for a living? Uh, how long had he been living here in Menden? Nobody knows where he made his money. He didn't work since he moved here about two years ago. Retired, I guess. That's what everybody thought. Always seemed to have plenty of money. Oh, he did, huh? Well, who were his friends? 
Was he married? Look, if I'm going to answer all of those questions, I want to work on the case with you. You need somebody who knows the town. Well, I'm an ex-GI. I work with intelligence. I can be a big help to you. Okay. <laughs> okay, you're working. Now, was McVeigh married? No. Didn't run around with women much either. I mean, here. Some blonde came down to see him once in a while. Drove a Cadillac convertible. Looked like a movie star. Hmm. Did McVeigh make many trips? Was he uh, out of town much? Yeah, he traveled quite a bit. Hmm. Did he have any enemies in town? Nobody knew him well enough to hate him. He was a kind of a stranger, Mr. Rogue. Nobody got to know him very well. Did he live alone? Yeah. He had a woman come in a couple of times a week to clean up. That's all. Good. Well, who do you think killed him? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Any suspicious-looking characters been seen around town lately? Not that I know of. But they uh, could have been here without me knowing it. Okay. Hey, uh, what's your name? Buzz Walters. What time are you off duty? About an hour, nine o'clock. Good, I'll see you then. In the lobby, right? Yeah. Uh, what are you going to do now? Oh, I'm going out to the house, McVeigh's house, and take a look around. You know where it is? I'll find it. See you at nine. <laughs> Turn on the lights. Who is it? Is, is that you, Hank? Yeah. Turn on the lights. Hey, hey, you're not Hank. Who are you? What are you doing here? Will you turn on the lights so we can talk this thing over, Junior? Oh. Oh, you're the guy who, who bumped McVeigh, huh? Okay, Junior. Stay right where you are. And let you shoot at me? That doesn't sound practical. I've got my gun out now. How about taking another shot so I can spot you? Who are you? The law? Oh, it... Okay, Junior. Throw that gun away. Oh, don't, don't, don't shoot anymore. You, you hit me. Let me hear that gun hit the wall. Throw it. <laughs> okay. Now, maybe we can talk. Keep your hands down to your sides. Look. I'm shot. I'm bleeding. you got to do something for me. Later, later. First, Junior, you're going to answer some questions. I, hey. Did yeah. I startle you? Huh? Just hold that pause. Who is this guy, Shorty? I don't know. He, he came in here and I... I thought it was you. I, I took a shot at him and... But he... But he got me. Yeah. I see. Well? You better get somebody to take care of your friend here. He's got a bad chest. Don't let that worry you. You're gonna have worse before long. And we'll start you out... Like this. <coughs> oh, oh. How's everything on cloud eight? Oh, it's fine, fine. Say, Rogie, I missed you last week. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. I had the flu. Yeah, didn't, uh, didn't Dennis O'Keefe come up to see you? Nah, not that Irishman. He doesn't use his head the way you do, Rogie. <laughs> Say, who did it this time? I don't know, I don't know. But I'm going to get him. If it's the last thing I do. Oh, you better hurry back downstairs then. You're getting further away every minute. Huh? Well, what do you mean? <laughs> you got a surprise coming, Rogie. You're a side door tourist right now. Huh? Oh, well, that settles it. I'm going over the side. So long, you gore. So long, Rogie. <laughs> Come on, uh, fella. Come out of it. Huh? Oh. Oh. Hey. Hey. Hey, this thing's moving. Sure, friend. It's okay. You're in a freight car. Hmm? A freight car? Well, how well it seems somebody wrapped you over the skull and threw you in here. Ooh. Who? I don't know. You were here when I got here. Don't worry. You'll be okay. Yeah. Well, thanks for the first aid. I... Where are we? Well, about uh, ten miles out of Minden, this red ball got a hot box and was held up. We're on the big grade going into the mountains. Yeah. 
Ah, thanks. <sighs> hey. Well, you got around my head. Yeah, you were bleeding. I tore up your shirt and made a bandage of it. Oh, thanks. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Where are you going? I'm... I'm... I'm going to jump out of this thing. Are you crazy? Yeah, it could be. Uh... Hey, look. Hey, look, I, I've still got my wallet. You have? How come you didn't lift it? <laughs> I didn't think of it. Oh, you're an honest man. Here, here's a 20. Thanks. Okay. Well, here, here goes nothing. So long. Hey, driver! Driver! Ride! Driver! You going into Minden? Yeah. What happened to you? Well, I was... I was knocked out and robbed and left on the road. I I, I got to get back to Minden to uh, report it to the cops. Okay, buddy. I wouldn't leave anybody out here. But I got a revolver here and don't try any funny stuff. Uh, well, me? Oh, I don't want to try anything. I, I just want to get back to Minden. I'll take you in a minute. Get in. Thanks. You can let me out here. Oh, no. Just stay right where you are. Hmm? Hey, what's the idea? And will you get that heater out of my face? I'll tell you where to get out. Oh? Well, when will that be? When we get to the police station. That's where you're going, mister. So I brought him in here to the police station, Chief. He looks suspicious to me. Yeah, nice work, Mr. Pollard. We'll take care of him, thanks. I hope I did the right thing. Yeah, you sure did. Thanks for the ride, Mr. Pollard. Goodbye. You just go right ahead, Pollard. I'll see you later. Oh, uh, Chief. Huh? There's no reward, is there? Uh, uh, no, no, no. So long. Oh, so long. Well? Well, I see you're back, Rogue. I told you you'd get in trouble nosing around in this town. Now, you gonna talk? Well, I haven't much to say, Reese. I went out to McVeigh's house. The door was open. I walked in. Some guy took a shot at me. I shot back. Mm. Got him, and while I was trying to find out what it was all about, another guy sneaked up behind me and bent a rod over my head. I woke up in a freight train ten miles out of town. This, uh, this, uh, Pollard, uh, gave me a ride in. And that's the end of the story. Mm. Well, how do you figure it? I don't know. But I want to get back out to that house... You coming with me? Well, what do you expect to find out there? We combed the house from one end to the other. Well, there's something going on in your charming little town that needs taken care of, Chief. And how come you don't have men at that house? There was a murder there a few hours ago. Now, don't you tell me my business, Rogue. Oh, I... something smells. Come on. Let's get out to McVeigh's house. I want to do a little combing myself. Now, you'd better stay in line, Rogue. After all, I'm the chief here, and yeah, I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've read your star. Do. I don't know whether you're a dumb chief or a smart operator. But we're going to McVeigh's house and we're going to tear it to pieces until I get a lead. Now, come on. I'll try the door. Don't knock, it may be open. Okay. Mm. Well, close the door. All right, all right. Lights don't work. The main switch must be pulled. We'll get by with this flashlight. Come on, let's take a look around. Hmm. Hey. Hmm? You see where that lamp is on the floor over there? Uh, yeah. Well, the guy who was shooting at me was lying right by the side of it after I got him. Oh. Look, there's blood on the floor. You see it? What was that? Ah, oh, see to come from that closet. Somebody's in there. Yeah. Well, come on out. Come on out or I'll shoot that door so full of holes we can pull you out through them. Okay. I'll come out. Well, hello, Buzz. Welcome to the party. What are you doing here? Well, Mr. Rogue told me he was coming out here and he was supposed to be back to meet me in the lobby at 9 o'clock. 
He didn't come back, so I decided I'd run out here and look for him. You got here a little late, Buzz. Oh, no, I didn't. Well, it was a little late to do you any good, but I saw plenty. I saw them walking around here. Wait a minute. What do you mean, them? Two men and a girl. The blonde girl that used to come here to see Mr. McVeigh. Oh, oh, you mean she was here? Yep. I hid outside of the window and watched them. They were carrying stuff up from the basement. That is, the girl and this man were, and putting it in the car. Uh, Buzz, did you hear them talk? Did the girl mention his name? No, no, she just called him Sweetheart or Honey or something like that. There was something funny about the other guy. What? He never did come out. The other two came out, got into that Cadillac convertible, and drove away about ten minutes ago. Well, then there must still be a man in the house. Yep, he'd been shot. He had trouble getting around. Must have been the guy I shot. I've been looking for him. Well, why didn't you call me? I was working for Mr. Rogue. Uh, I know he'd be here. Oh, good boy, Buzz. Now, come on, let's shake this house down. If that thug is in here, we better find him before he finds us. Well, this is the best kept basement I ever saw in a bachelor's house, Buzz. How about it? It's sure clean. Hmm. And hey, look, there are a few muddy footsteps going this way. They're going both ways, Mr. Rogue. Ah, yeah, right over here and then back out. Hmm, that's funny. Huh. They walk right up to this blank wall and then back again. Maybe the stuff they were carrying out of the basement was stacked up against the wall. I doubt it. Hey, there's nobody up here. Shook down every room, every closet up here. There's nobody. Well, we're even. There's nobody down here either. I tell you, that guy they called Shorty never came out of the house. I was watching and I know he didn't. Hey, you're imagining things, kid. People don't just disappear. If he was here, we could see him now, couldn't we? If we could find him. Hmm. I've got an idea. Yeah? Well, there must be a hidden door of something in this wall here someplace. Oh, now, wait a minute, Rogie. Okay, okay. So I've been reading too many comic books, but I'm making my guess, and I'm going to see if I'm right. You see these footprints coming over here and going back again? Oh, uh, yeah. Hmm. That's what it is. Maybe there's a loose tile in the wall or something. Yeah. Listen now. <laughs> there it is, Reese, you die hard. You hear that? It's hollow in there. Now, come on, let's figure this thing out. Hey, there is a loose tile right here. Huh? Well, let me see. Yeah. Well, I'll be... Are you a... sure you're surprised, Sheriff? Why, I... There's a regular doorknob in there. Yeah. Yeah, there is. Hmm. Well, it's locked, but I think I can take care of that. Look out. Now, well, that ought to do it. Flash your light in there, Reese. Okay. Hmm? Oh, brother, look at that. Huh? Hey, he's dead. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But now I'd like to ask the ladies a question. Have you ever had the shampoo blues... The shampoo blues, of course, is that dejected feeling you get when your hair becomes dry and unmanageable after a shampoo. If that's been your experience, then here's a way to beat those blues. Try Fitch's Saponified Coconut Oil Shampoo. Use this clear, golden liquid shampoo as often as you like. It will never leave your hair dry or difficult to manage. That's because Fitch's Saponified Shampoo is made from pure, natural oils. Just a little makes oceans of cleansing lather. Rinses out easily, too, for Fitch's Saponified Shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. It leaves your hair soft, lustrous, and easy to manage even right after you shampoo it. Yes, you can always use Fitch's Saponified Shampoo with complete confidence and freedom from the shampoo blues. So use it regularly. Buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter or ask for a professional application at your beauty shop. Now we return to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Well, you could have knocked me down with an atom bomb when we opened that secret door in the basement of McVeigh's house and saw what was inside. It was an air-conditioned room with fluorescent lighting and strictly occupational furniture. And sitting at the table in the swivel chair was the body of the man named Shorty. Buzz, the bellboy, said, Hey! He's dead! 
Yeah, yeah, they let him have one. Right through the temple. Good Lord. Two murders in one day. In Mint. That'll put the place on the map, won't it? I wonder why they killed him. Well, it looks pretty simple to me. I got him through the chest when he shot at me. And a wounded man is kind of a handicap to a mob that's trying to make a getaway with a set of counterfeit plates. Counterfeit? Is that what they were doing? Yeah. This place is one of the best equipped engraving shops I've ever been in. You knew that right away, didn't you, Reese? Mm. Oh, 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 sure. Right there. That's what McVeigh's racket was, huh? Yeah. Come on, let's take a look around. Here. Look here. Hmm? What did you find? Exhibit A. A whole stack of $10 bills. Let me see. Yeah. <laughs> All with the same serial numbers. Oh, there's phonies, the coarse girl's accent. Hmm. Well, Reese... Let's get back to town and get some post-mortem fingerprints off your late pal, McVeigh. And some information on the license number Buzz got off that Cadillac. Do you think we'll get him, Mr. Rogue? Oh, we're a lead pipe cinch, Buzz. You know, if you hadn't been sharp enough to jot down that license number, <laughs> we'd have been out of luck. See, but Reese can trace that. Yeah... I think it could use a guy like me. Regular, Mr. Rogue? Oh, well, I'm sorry, kid. I, I'm a... Well, I'm a lone wolf. But you'll make some dough out of this case. You can bet your shirt there's a reward out for this mob, and we'll split it. Oh. You know, Junior, if you hadn't been around that house and seen those two drive away without Shorty, this crime may have never been solved. That's right, I guess. Nobody would ever have looked for the secret room. You know... I've always wanted to be a detective. Well, Rogie, the Department of Motor Vehicles says this is the address that car is registered to. Miss uh, Sylvia Adams, 1924 Euclid Avenue in Los Angeles. Well, that makes it my meat, Reese. Oh, oh, yeah. Come on, Buzz. You want to drive to L.A. with me? Sure, Mr. Rogue. I want to be in at the kill on this case. Well, this is the house. Oh, Miss Sylvia Adams, 1924 Euclid Avenue. What are we going to do? Well, first you go see if the car's in the garage while I take a look around. Okay. Hey, Buzz, Buzz. Come here. Wait a minute. Yeah? Hey, look in that window out there. Mm -hmm. That man. He's the one who knocked me out. Hmm. Oh, is that the man and the blonde woman you saw leaving McVeigh's house? Yep. That's them. Mm, looks like they're having a beef. Ah, that's good. Buzz, we're going to do a little listening. Oh, how are you going to get in? Back door. Come on. But it's probably locked. Yeah, could be. But if I have a skeleton key on my chain that'll open that door, I'm going to get a new locksmith. Now, quiet. Come on. You didn't have to kill them both, Hank. You're a trigger-happy fool. Will you stop harping on that? They're dead. That's all there is to it. We're rid of them, and we got the counterfeit plates. We got no more troubles, baby. From now on, it's you and me. It is? What do you mean? Just that I don't have to put up with you anymore, either. One word out of me, and the cops will put you under the jail, Hank. That's what they do with killers, you know? I don't like you. I never did like you. But you're going to keep me in money and minks and everything I want as long as I live. Killer. That may not be long, you little double-crossing. put that gun away. Hank. Hank, no. So you were going to double-cross no. me. Hank, no, no. So all that sweet talk no. was just an act. No. Well, here's no. my act. No, no. Hey, conduct your eye, Hank. Drop the gun. Pick it up, Buzz. Yeah. Who are you? Well, now, that's not very flattering. I'm Richard Rogue. But we'll talk about that later, lovely. Right now, get up against that wall, both of you. Start singing and make the lyrics cover a couple of murders. Come on, sing! Well, that was the end of that story. It all happened over a woman, almost everything does. When I got through chatting with Sylvia, I, I had the whole story. McVeigh and Hank had a sweet little counterfeiting deal all set up and running smoothly. McVeigh, a master engraver, made the plates and hand-printed them in his shop in Minden. Hank wholesaled the stuff. Everything was just too, too divine. 
until Hank moved in on McVeigh's girl, Sylvia, and got caught at it. McVeigh wanted to hire me to front for him and exposing Hank as a counterfeiter, and that's what started all of the excitement and the murders. We found the counterfeiting plate in Sylvia's Cadillac, and I collected five grand reward for cracking the case. <laughs> I split it with Buzz. He was a happy kid. Yes, well, as I've always said, sure she left him, to coin a phrase. <laughs> it means find the woman. And by the way, if you have any luck, sure she won for me too, will you? I'm feeling much better and not doing a thing tonight. <laughs> you know what I mean. This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. But don't forget now, you've all got a date with us next Thursday night. We have a story for you about a man with a million dollars, a beautiful wife, and an overpowering jealousy. We call it Best Laid Plans. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time. And be sure to see Dick Powell in his newest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. And remember, tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, barber or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story... By the Whistler. Tonight, the Deadly Innocent. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Have you ever hated a man enough to kill him? No? Well, that's the kind of hate that grows with the years, grows and grows into an all-consuming passion... That's the way it was with Lambert Dean. He has wanted to kill someone for 25 years. That's why he has come down to the offices of the Mammoth Construction Company at 9 o'clock at night. That's why he's chatted casually with the old night watchman who took him up in the elevator. Chatting, oh, so casually. But he thought out every word in advance. The night watchman will remember them later, just a little later. There should be just a crack of light showing under the door of the president's office. Yes, there it is. And Lambert is going toward it. So you've never wanted to kill a man. Mm -hmm. Listen. You may get a few pointers. Hello, Joe. Huh? Oh, 
What are you doing here? Why, did I startle you, Joe? I'm so sorry. What do you mean by busting into my office? Can't you knock? Oh, sure, Joe. I'd never think of walking into the president's office without knocking during working hours. <laughs> I didn't think it'd matter tonight. Any time I'm here is working hours. Remember that if you want to hang on to your job. Now get out. Well, don't you want to know why I came down tonight? I do not. Any fool could take care of the bookkeeping department in the daytime. If you have to work nice to keep up with simple routine, that's your lookout. Oh, I don't have to work on them. They're all fixed up, just the way I want them. I, uh, I came here to tell you about them, Joe. Well, you can keep it. The books will wait till tomorrow. Better listen now, if you want to hear it at all. How many times have I got to tell you to get... What do you mean, better listen? Tomorrow will be too late. You'd better listen, Joe. Yeah, maybe I had. What are you up to? Anything wrong with the books? <laughs> You're a smart guy, Joe. You always were. Even back when you were a kid in Nicker. Oh, for the love of Pete, if you're going to start raking up past history... And... The sooner you let me talk, the sooner you'll get it over with. And if you've got anything to say, say it. My time's valuable. Is it? <laughs> yes, you were smart. Making up to me when we were kids, you were my pal. You looked after me. Never let anybody bully me. Uh, your dad had dough. Mine didn't. Uh-huh. It was worth having you hung around my neck if it got me the kind of life I wanted. And it did, didn't it? Pretty soon you just about moved in on us. When I went to college, Dad sent you too. Good, kind Joe Carson, who always looked after poor little me. All right, all right, so you finally tumbled to it. What of it? When Dad got wiped out and we had to leave school and hunt work, you didn't drop me. <laughs> I'm no fool. You still belonged on the right side of the tracks. You knew the folks that counted. Sure, Joe, sure. You were smart. I knew the men with the jobs to give. I found out about old Jennings needing a bookkeeper down here at Mammoth. Only when I got around to applying, they already had a new bookkeeper. You. Well, if you were dope enough to tell me about it, you deserved what you got. Maybe I wouldn't have seen the future in a piddling little bookkeeping job if you hadn't run off of the mouth about that, too. I'm going to be the bright young man who catches Jennings' eye, Joe. I'm going to marry Betsy Jennings. Someday I'll own Mammoth, lock, stock, and barrel. You haven't got mammoth yet, smart guy. No, just all the rest. Give me time. Old man Jennings is on his last legs, and you know it. Now get out. You're fired. Haven't you forgotten the books, Joe? I'll check them by myself. Now out. No. Get out, or I'll... No, I'm not going. You are. What? This is the end of the line for you, Joe. Tomorrow, I'll move into your office. Pretty soon, I'll move into your house with Betty... Before long, I'll own mammoth. <laughs> You're crazy. Like a fox. I'm going to kill you, Joe. Signal goes as far as before the war. Yes, signal gasoline still goes as far as before the war. But how can it, I hear you asking? How can it when certain gasoline ingredients are reserved for war? Well, that's what I want to tell you. You see, it's true. Certain of the more volatile ingredients, such as isopentane, have been reserved for war. That's why Signal Oil Company is frank to admit no gasoline today can promise you all the pep and anti-knock performance you found in pre-war Signal gasoline, and which you'll be enjoying again in even further improved Signal post-war gasoline. But when it comes to mileage, that's another story. For today's signal formula contains not only all the high-energy components that gave pre-war signal its superior mileage, but in addition, new hydrocarbons rich in mileage have been added. That's why it's a fact. The famous signal formula still places the emphasis on mileage. That's why it's just as true today as it was before the war. You do go farther with signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. say even the humblest worm will turn if you step on him hard enough. You didn't think of that, did you, Joe Carson, when you used your pal for a stepladder, stole his job, his girl, the life he planned. You weren't quite smart enough. You're alone in your office now with the night pressing around you, alone with the turned worm. He's going to kill you, Joe. Sit down, Joe. Drop that gun, you crazy fool. Sit down. That's better. 
<laughs> Wouldn't like you to be uncomfortable. You've got a nice, easy chair to die in, Joe. The president's chair. Now, Lamb. Lamb, listen. Let's talk this thing over. Mm. We're both businessmen. Maybe we can make a deal. <laughs> when old man Jennings kicks off, there'll be plenty for both of us. Now, come on, put down that gun. If we'll put down it. this gun? Why, Joe, I like it. Huh? Feels good in the hand. A sweet gun, Joe. But, uh... The day you bought it, you signed your death warrant. You know that? Would you like to know about it? That's right, Lambert. Tell Joe about it. Don't let him die without knowing how smart you've been for a change. Remind him of the day Mr. Jennings retired from the business. The day Joe put that gun in his desk drawer and bragged that the payroll would be safe. Joe's own gun in Joe's own desk with Mr. Jennings for a witness. Convenient, wasn't it? But don't stop there. Tell him your whole plan. Tell him about that day two months ago when you started on your careful, deadly trail. Hello, Mr. Dean. Have a good lunch? Uh, no, not very, I'm afraid. Nothing seems to agree with me these days. Uh, you may go to your own lunch now, Miss Neal. Okay. If you ask me, your stomach would be a lot better off without all those pills you keep stuffing down your neck. I was not aware that I'd asked you, Miss Neal. Yeah, well, it's your stomach. Bye. Back soon. Uh, Miss Neal. Hmm? Have you seen my tablets? They don't seem to be in my pocket. I'm sure I had them this morning. I remember taking a couple when I got to the office. Oh, sure I've seen them. You left them on the water cooler. Uh, Big boy Carson raised Kane about it when he went out to eat. Say, what's he got against you, anyhow? Against me? Oh, you must be mistaken, Miss Neal. Joe was my friend. We were boyhood friends. Then why is he always picking on you and yelling at you? Looks to me like he wants to run you out of here. Only he doesn't dare as long as the old man's alive. Miss Neal, I cannot allow you to speak like that about my friend. Now that Mr. Carson is in sole charge of the business, he's naturally under a strain. We, we must all make allowances. Oh, yeah... Here, I hid your pills under the stuff on your desk. Oh. How many do you want? Two? Put out your hand. Uh, thank you. Now, you sit still. I'll bring you some water. Uh, that's very... One moment. Hmm? These aren't my tablets. Why, sure they are. They're right out of your bottle. That little brown bottle you're always hauling out. See? Uh, that's my bottle, but the tablets... Uh, mine were white, too, but considerably smaller. I showed you one yesterday. Don't you remember? Remember one tablet from another? Oh, honest, Mr. Dean. Well, gee, you're right. Yours had some kind of trade name stamped on them. These are perfectly plain. Uh, that's... That's strange, isn't it? Somebody's playing a dirty trick on you. Probably thought it'd be a good joke to give you something that'd really upset your tummy. Why, I can't believe it. Say, there's Mr. Carson. What? Joe? That's it. I'll bet you anything. It'd be just like him. Oh, now, Miss Neal, please. <sighs> We have no proof that Mr. Carson had anything to do with this. He saw the bottle, didn't he? He yelled about it, and he hates you. You know he does. Uh, these tablets may be perfectly harmless. Harmless? Oh, golly. You don't suppose Mr. Carson would... Oh, no, 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 no. Don't let your imagination run away with you. But, Mr. Dean, he, he obviously wants to get now, rid please, of you. please, Miss Neal. I forbid you to speak of this to anyone. I'm going to destroy these tablets at once, and uh, we'll forget all about it. Well, it's your funeral. But if it was me, I'd have those pills analyzed. That's right, Lambert. That was step one along the trail leading to Joe's untimely death. But don't stop there. Before you pull the trigger, tell him the whole story. Tell him about step two. Hey, look out! Oh, oh, you going, can't you? Oh, yeah. Hey, you see that? You all right, mister? Uh, yes, I... I think I... It didn't hit me. Boy, you got luck to burn. If you hadn't jumped like a grasshopper, that car made mincemeat out of you. Uh, I was walking along close to the pavement. Uh, somebody shoved me hard. Then I was out in the street in that car. Well, what do you know? Hey, I guess it could happen easy enough with all these crowds on the sidewalk. Yes, easy enough. Uh, you didn't happen to notice who was behind me. <laughs> in all that gang? Look, mister, there were dozens of people. Businessmen and ladies shopping and... Well, I thought you might have seen one special person. He'd, he'd be a big man, a gray hat and top coat. You'd notice him. Wait a minute. You mean that shove wasn't no accident? 
this guy was out to get you? Uh, I'd rather not say any more. Well, that's the way it was. Let me think. Let me think here. Seems to me I do remember a gray hair. A big man, around 45, with a red face. Yeah. Yeah, he'd have to be big to stand out in the crowd, wouldn't he? Red face. Sure, sure, I remember now. Perhaps you saw the face towering over me? Towering over you? Yes. Oh, he must have been for me to pick him out special. Hey, that puts the fella right smack behind you. I thought so. Thank you, Mr... Uh... Robinson's the name. D.L. Robinson. Robinson. Uh, you're going to report this to the police, ain't you? I could go along with you and tell them what i seen. Well, uh, not just yet. I I can't be sure. Uh, if I was in your shoes, I wouldn't wait to be so off-fired sure. Anybody start shoving me under car, well, quiet. Please, please, I'll call on you if I need you. In the meantime, perhaps you'd, you'd better have my name, too. It's Dean Lambert Dean. You remember? In in case of accident. Lambert Dean. Uh, you bet I won't forget Darned if I could take a thing like this in my stride. Hey, if I was you, I'd be yelling for the police so loud they'd hear me in Jericho. Nice work, Lambert. That was step two, and it was easy. All you had to do was plant an idea and watch it grow. Little Miss Neal was already sorry for you because Joe Carson kept bawling you out. Easy to make her think a few soda mint tablets might be poison especially since you destroyed the evidence. Easy to step off the curbing into the path of a car and then convince an excited witness that you were pushed, pushed by a big florid man like Joe Carson. Only what's the motive, Lambert? Why should Joe attempt to kill you? The police will want to know. You waited, didn't you? Waited until this very afternoon when Joe Carson was out and old Mr. Jennings made one of his rare visits to the office. Come in. Well, Lambert, come in, my boy. Uh, Mr. Jennings, uh, may I speak to you privately? Why, certainly. But if it's anything about the business, you'd better wait until Joe gets back. He's in charge now, you know. No, I, I, I'd i rather Joe didn't know about this. Uh, not just yet, Mr. Jennings. Uh, Mr. Jennings, I shall have to ask you to treat this conversation as confidential. Very well. Mr. Jennings, I have reason to believe that two attempts have been made upon my life. What did you say? Somebody's trying to kill me. I'm sure of it. Good heavens, Lambert. Yes, sir. That's just the way I felt. I couldn't believe it the first time, but it happened again. But why should anyone want to kill you? Well, there isn't any reason. Unless unless my death would cover up for someone else. Cover what up? Well, I got to thinking about it, Mr. Jennings. There wasn't any funny business going on around here until after you retired. I got to wondering if somebody had just waited until you were out of the way. And this afternoon, I checked over my books for the last few weeks, and I found discrepancies, sir. Discrep... You mean... Somebody has altered my figures. On several occasions, somebody's done a good job of forging my handwriting. There's a lot more money paid out than I ever handled. How much? Well, so far, I found $17,000. Who did it? Someone in the office? One of the staff? That's just it. The books are locked in the safe right here in your office. Perhaps I should say Joe's office, except when they're actually in my hands. Then it had to be someone who knew the combination of the safe. Well, now you can see why somebody wanted me out of the way, can't you? These altered figures look like mine. If I died, uh, you wouldn't hunt any further, you see. Every, everybody would believe that I took the money, gambled it away, and committed suicide. Someone who knew the combination. Uh, no one knew it except you and me and Joe... That's clear enough for me. What are you going to do? I'm going to call the police. This is my company. Whoever steals from me will pay for it, even if it's a member of my own family. Uh, Mr. Jennings, you promised to keep this confidential. You can't expect me to keep a thing like this to myself. But you can't afford to make a mistake. It might not be the uh, person we think. No. No, I wouldn't want to. What shall I do, Lambert? Leave it to me, sir. I've got an appointment tonight with the person. If he did it, I'll get the proof. You're going to see him alone? Yes, sir. Well, that could be dangerous. You say he's already tried to kill you twice? I know, but I've got to clear my name, sir. If, if anything should go wrong, I've written the whole thing down for you. The attempts on my life, the names of the people who were with me at the time, the altered books, and... Here, here, sir. I thought if you'd put it in your personal lock compartment in the safe, it would give you the whole story. To be opened in case of my death. 
Lambert, the risk, I can't uh, let don't you... Don't worry about me, sir. I can take care of myself. If you just give me the keys to your compartment. The safe's already open. Very well. Take them, Lambert. Put the letter there yourself. I, I think I, I'll rest a few minutes before I go home. <laughs> Mr. Jennings, it's a shock to him to find out his son-in-law is a thief. You forged a fine, strong chain of circumstantial evidence, haven't you, Lambert? Just one more link and you'll be ready to kill. You won't overlook that last link, will you? Not a careful man like you, Lambert. Mr. Dean, uh, you working late tonight? Uh, good evening, Bill. Uh, not exactly working. I have an appointment. Uh, Mr. Carson here yet? Yeah, yep, yep. Took him up about a half hour ago. Uh, come on over the elevator. I'll ride you up. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd uh, sure steer clear of Mr. Carson tonight, though, if I was you. Why? Why, he told me plain as a whistle he didn't want nobody coming near him. Didn't want anybody to come near him except me. Uh, Look here, Mr. Dean. You don't mean... There's been some mighty funny talk going around this building. Talk? That little Miss Neal that works in your bookkeeping department. She's been spreading it around about somebody wanting to bump you off. Of course, I didn't pay no mind to her at the time. But women always... Bill. Bill, I want you to do something for me. Why, sure, Mr. Dean. It's a warm night. The window in Mr. Carson's office on the second floor will probably be open... Uh, now, you stay in your cubby hole on the first floor and keep your window open, too. If you hear anything, well, out of the way... Don't you worry. I'll get up there so fast you can't see me for dust. No, no. Call the police. <laughs> you want to get killed, too? Killed? Me? Oh, Mr. Dean... No, no, no. You'll be all right if you do as I say. Get the police here if you hear anything funny. Yes, sir, Mr. Dean. Oh, sure. Now, well... take me up to the second floor. Yes, sir. Don't forget, Bill. I'll be glued to my window, Mr. Dean. That's right, Lambert. Now you've done it. Now you've told Joe the whole story right up to this minute. Well, it's almost time to pull the trigger, Lambert. But don't be in too much of a hurry. Yeah. Yeah, well, there you are, Joe. That's the whole story. The watchman's waiting downstairs right now. I worked the whole thing out, as you can see. Why, you... You framed me. That's a smart boy, right the first time. <laughs> Why don't you congratulate me? You ought to appreciate smart work. I never stole anything. Just my job, my girl, my whole life. I came up here to check the bids. I didn't make any appointment with you. Who's going to believe that? You plan to kill me. You could claim you discovered a shortage. That when you accused me, I went for you. You had to shoot me in self-defense. But, Lamb, I didn't. I never... Only you won't be around to put in a claim. Old Bill is going to hear something, all right. Just one shot. Just one. When the police get here, they'll find you dead. I accused you, Joe. You see? You went for your gun. And I went for you. In the tussle, the gun went off. <laughs> so sorry, Joe. Oh, you're crazy. You're crazy, Lamb. Am crazy. I? Well, somebody's going to run the business after your uh, regrettable demise. I've been here nearly as long as you have. Who knows it better than me? Somebody's sure to console your widow one of these days. I've known her since I was a kid. I'm stepping into your shoes, Joe. Now. Wait. Wait, Lamb. Listen to me. That letter. You're counting on that? Oh, uh, yes. I'm a careful man. Now, Lamb, the police won't find that letter. It's gone. And you haven't got a case without that letter. Ah, oh, come on, bright boy. Can't you do better than that? But I tell you, it's gone. I destroyed it. I found it tonight. In old man Jennings' compartment? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. But I've got a key to it. He had it made for me when he stopped working. Look, Lamb, I'll show you. Keep your hands out of your pockets. Oh, I only want to show you. I've got it right here. Get your hands up. I want you. Right here in my pocket. <laughs> Did you think you could kid me, Joe? 
think you could stop me with that cock and bull story? Why don't you answer, Joe? Through talking? For good? I'd better get a move on. It'll be a minute or two before the police get here, but I want to be sure. Gun right beside him. Won't matter if my prints are on a tool. We tussle for it. Let's see now. His pockets. Now, what was he going for in his pockets? If he had another gun, better make sure. Keys. He was going after his keys. No, no, no. Don't get excited. He couldn't have had the key to Mr. Jennings' compartment. He couldn't. This one. It can't be. But it looks like... If that letter's gone, it, it can't be the key. But it is. The key to Mr. Jennings' locked compartment in the safe. Now, what about the letter, Lambert? Did Joe find it and destroy it? Take what it easy, that? Lambert. Don't get so excited. Right. Fifteen left. Thirty-five right. Five left. Now, that compartment... It won't fit. The key won't... It does. Well, get it open. Get it open. It's gone. Oh, I put it right on top and it isn't there. Maybe it slid down behind the other stuff. It isn't here. Oh, yes, Lambert. The letter's gone. But there's no reason to get so excited. It doesn't matter. You've still got a case. You've planted the evidence very carefully. Don't lose your head, Lambert. You think your case will sound funny without the letter to back it up? You're getting more upset the more you think of it. And the police will be here any minute. Watch out, you'll ruin everything you've built up so carefully. But you can't see that, can you? Wait, Lambert, wait. Out of my way. Hey, you, stop. The fire escape. He's getting away down the fire escape. Come on, Fred. Okay. Stop, Ross, you. Can you see him? Not halfway. Get your flashlight on him. Yeah. How's that? Okay. Stop, I tell you. Get him, Fred. <laughs> the Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a question for you drivers. Does your windshield look different lately? Has something new been added? <laughs> I'm talking about the new 1945 Federal Use Stamp. It's time for it, you know. And it's also time to pick up one of Signal's free Use Stamp protectors if you want to be sure of getting yours. Signal Oil Company had these neat, transparent little shields made up to protect your Use Stamp from moisture and scuffing so it will stay on without peeling through a whole year of wear and window washing. Every car needs one. But like all things in wartime, quantities are naturally limited. And that's why I'd suggest that you get yours this week, tomorrow if possible. Just drive into any of the friendly stations displaying Signal's yellow and black circle sign and say, I'd like one of Signal's use stamp protectors that was offered free on the Whistler. And now, back to the Whistler. So Lambert's revenge wasn't complete. He killed Joe, but he himself was killed by the police when he ran from them. He'd counted on that letter to prove he'd killed Joe in self-defense. When the letter was gone, he lost his head. You see, the unexpected had happened. It so frequently does. In murders. Remember that when you think you'd like to kill somebody. Poor Lambert. If he'd only had a minute to think. Oh, well, we're through with the books, Mr. Jennings. The figures had been tampered with? Sure, the original figures have been changed. We talked to the witnesses, too. That girl in your office, the fellow that witnessed the street accident, and your watchman. I guess there isn't much doubt about what happened. There is none to my mind. Lambert must have accused Joe of theft. Perhaps he was even unwise enough to tell Joe about the letter he had left in my care. Lambert was a good man, a responsible man, but mentally a little slow. Yeah. 
The way I figured, Carson knew the game was up. He must have got the drop on Mr. Dean and held him up while he got set for a getaway. Oh, the safe was open and the stuff in your private box was scattered all over the place. I kept money for my personal use there. Sometimes fairly large sums. Joe knew it. I'd had a key made for him so that he could bring me cash from time to time when I was unable to get to the office. Well, I can understand Carson's death. That was an accident when they fought over the gun. What I don't get is why Lambert Dean ran out on us. I don't like shooting down innocent men. You mustn't blame yourself. You couldn't have known. As I said, Lambert was not quick. I suppose he thought he could not prove Joe had attacked him. Oh, we might not have either, without that letter. Yes, it's a fortunate thing I remembered that Joe had the key to my compartment. Of course, I removed the letter at once and took it home with me. A very fortunate thing. Otherwise, we might never have known what happened. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Sally Thorson, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Adventure, intrigue, mystery, romance, starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. Together in the sultry setting of tropical Havana and the mysterious islands of the Caribbean. Bold Venture. again, the magic names of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall bring you Bold Venture and a tale of mystery and intrigue. Give me another handful of confetti, sailor. Yeah. Street carnival really brings out the jazzy in you, doesn't it, Snake? <laughs> Why not? Where else can a fellow rid himself of the cares and toils of the day? Where else can he wear a funny hat? Well, he could wear it on the top of his head like the other funny fellow. What's the matter, Sailor? Are you jealous because I fandangled around his brim? In Cuba, that's the thing to do at a fiesta. The hat dance. With a beanie? Three propellers makes it daring. <laughs> you know, sometimes I don't know about you, Snake. Sometimes I can't figure it. Slate, uh, I was saying I can't figure you out. Yeah, I'll help you with your homework later. Right now, I want to concentrate on... Yeah, just as I thought. There are six of them. Six dancing girls on that platform. How'd you ever work it out? Simple. I counted their legs and divided by two. Is there any other way? Some fellows I know add a column of figures from the top. Uh... Hey, look, Sailor, the girls are throwing flowers at us fellas. Among other things. Now watch this catch, Sailor. 
Ah, what a snazzy shortstop was lost to the world when I chose the sea. So you made a shoestring catch of a paper camellia slate. I yawned. Performance oh. bored me, too, lady. Hand over the camellia shortstop. The pathetic little souvenir was meant for me. You kidding, Buster? I called for a fair catch. Uh, we were all dazzled by it. Let's not let it go to our head, huh? The little blossom. Pin it on my lapel, flower boy. Go shag your own flies, kid. This one got to impress you, huh? You impressed me. But not for long, huh, kid? Gosh. Hat dancers, fellows fighting over a paper flower. It's been a real fiesta slate. What do we do with the prone fellow? We just dance around him. Watch you don't trip over his chin. Come on, Quimby. Get in. Quick. Yeah. You must be out of your mind, Mr. Packard. I'm talking to you. I'm talking about your mind. I heard you. Making me meet you like this. The two of us together. Suppose the cops get your fast wink of us together. Nothing had happened. The police would shake us down, make clucking sounds, shake their heads and tell us to keep moving. We're blocking traffic. Yeah. Go ahead. Keep telling me. Look, Quimby, I set up the whole thing, didn't I? I said keep telling me. I had that clerk in the jewelry store believing I was really interested in that stone. I keep going in there for three weeks, every day. I couldn't make up my mind whether to buy it or not. I touched the dashboard with my nose. I bow, Mr. Packard. The clerk had the stone out yesterday. Then you came in and pulled a switch while I diverted him. So far, simple. Yeah, real, real. With my record and the cops knowing by this time that you were casing the place, all they have to do is find us together. Find us with a stone. No stone, Quimby. I didn't get it. What? But I gave it to Velma. I put it in that paper comedia. I gave it to her. Then she tossed it to you? She tossed it. A guy named Slate caught it. Slate? Slate Shannon? I guess. Trouble, Mr. Packard, if it's Slate Shannon. He's different? Maybe not. Maybe not at all. Slate Shannon. A guy lives, dies, just a guy. He can be taken care of. You got all your loot, Slate? Yeah, the camellia from the dancing girl, the cane from the guy who couldn't guess my weight. And the Cupid doll from the girl whose weight you could and did. <laughs> yeah. Now I've got a Cupid doll I can call my own. You can put her alongside that picnic ham you won at Venice Pier five years ago. Oh, this Cupid is... Hey, sailor, look. It's Pilar, the peddler. Hi, Pilar. Oh, Slate, it's two o'clock in the morning and I'm tired. You can sell your old clothes to Pilar some other time. You kidding? Pilar is my beloved. She and that old horse are among the fondest memories a fellow can cherish. Hey, tal, Pilar. How goes it with my old friend? Oh, oh, El Dobbin. Oh. Oh, it is Slate Shannon. With his hermosa senorita. The beautiful senorita. Tasting the moonlight. Make him go home, Pilar. I'm worn out. I've got something for you, Pilar. A kiss for an old peddler, perhaps, to bring back a faraway yesterday, when Pilar did not drive a junk car. Better than that, Pilar. A camellia for El Dobbin's hat. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't thank me, El Dobbin. It was nothing, really. Hey, look at my cupie. Oh, come on, Slate. <laughs> Bye, Pilar. Adios, senorita. Slate, my lover fellow. Get up, El Dobbin. Andale. Ah, that Pilar. If I was only 40 years older. You may be by the time we get home. Please come on. Sailor, tonight I've lived. I've danced in the streets, met an old love. No, oh, you're just the Havana Flash. That's what you are. Hey, wait a minute, Sailor. There's a guy crooking a finger at me from a doorway. You lost, friend? No, I am very much at home, senor. It is you who are lost. And that gun is for showing me the way, huh? If you wish it. If you do not, I will settle for a paper camellia. The one that was went for me at the fiesta. My beloved Mia Alma, a minute for me. Can I help it if you're awkward and butterfingers? We will not discuss my personality. 
The camellia. Por favor. Sure. Sure, I've got it right here. You say something? I was... Oh! Ah, I was wrong. You didn't say a thing. Slate, what happened? Why did you hit him over the head with the doll? Pointed a gun at me and wanted a camellia. Hey, hey, that's the second flower lover I've had to fight for a camellia. Now, don't get fat on it. There might be a third. Let's get out of here. King, did you get him? Yes, Mr. Slate. A whole dollar's worth. A whole bouquet. I'll wrap them. Thanks. Taylor, come here. What do you want? What are you looking so sheepish about? I bought you something. A bouquet of camellias. Here. Like them? Gee. And they're artificial, too. What girl wouldn't go out of her mind over a bunch of artificial flowers? I thought you'd like them. They're to make up for last night. I'll put them on my dresser. King, will you go into my room and empty the water out of the vase? I wouldn't want these blossoms to get wet. <laughs> I will, Lady Sailor. But it is not whether a gift is... Now look, King, if she doesn't want them... Slate Shannon. I threw you a flower last night, Slate Shannon. Care to come over to my place and pull petals? Why not? I got nothing to keep me here. Well, I'm glad. The Castillo Apartments, 4B. Ask for me, for Velma. You can't miss me. I'll be all that's there. Going someplace, Slate? Be back in a... Uh, I'll be back. Some guy trying to sell me insurance. Mm. Tell her you're only interested in a short-term policy. Huh, dear? Buenos dias, Slate Shannon. Hello. Your name, Velma? Uh-huh. Come on in. You like my place? Comfy. Well, then, why don't you get that way? All right. Uh, one of these days, I'm, I'm going to get myself a sofa like this. What for? You can use mine any time you want. Here. I'll slide the hassock under your feet. You feel like talking? Not especially. I could just sit here like this and fall asleep. I'll rock you to sleep if you want. <laughs> Velma, we reach the stage in our great romance when a guy is forced to ask a question. I hate to louse up this deathless love of ours, but if I just let myself go like this, you think I'm a, well, I don't know what, maybe a cad even, and you wouldn't want... Look, Slade, I, I, you know why I wanted to see you. No, no, I don't. Go ahead, break it to me. Well, you caught a paper camellia at the carnival. Oh, oh, you like the way I shag flies, huh? I want that camellia. Are you kidding? Do you have it with you? You sure you're not kidding? If you don't have it, I'll go back to your place with you and get it. You need a camellia to make you happy, kid? That's right, yeah. I want to look good for you. I want to put it in my curly hair. Look, baby, it's not your hair that's curly, it's your head. A fond farewell to you. All right, get out of here. You and your fat grin, out. You don't know what you just bought yourself. Gee, and I I thought I'd get out of here with at least that hassock. Well, that's the way it's got to be. So long, Velma. Hi, Mr. Slate. Hello, King. Where's Sailor? In her room, making herself the loveliest for you. The way a good girl should. Mind if I ask you something, Mr. Slate? Sure, go right ahead. Where have you been? Um, horseback riding. <laughs> Must have been a tall, blonde horse, Mr. Slate. Left some hair on your lapel. Where did you... Slate, come here. Something's happened. Why? What's the matter? Look, I'm my dresser. I'm looking. You mean my picture in the frame? Why don't you dust it once in a while? I'm talking about camellias, the ones you gave me. I put them right here on my dresser. Oh, where are they? I'm trying to tell you. They're gone. Someone came in through that window and took them while I was out. A camellia heist. Ah, this is something new in the annals of crime. Suddenly all of Havana's gone berserk over paper flowers. What would anyone want with artificial flowers? Yeah, that suddenly worries me, too. Because I've heard there are times when they're used at cheap funerals.
adventure. Our stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. And the second act of our story. When a girl throws flowers, it's time to duck, unless you're a darling of lady luck. I offer this advice, I offer it for free, it comes to you gratis, courtesy of me. Two men get clobbered so far to date, for a paper camellia by Mr. Slate. As if it's worth it, I'll tell you that, the flower now reposes on a horse's hat. (laughs) <laughs> and that's just where it's going to stay. Have you ever thought about it, Mr. Slate, that maybe there's something sinister about that paper camellia? Something strange, as if it were touched by dark kisses, as if some fingers of evil... King, uh, have you ever considered a saying the role of Hamlet, the unhappy prince? I was just wondering why somebody stole those flowers out of a sailor's room. A gentleman is ringing for service at the desk, Mr. Slate. Yeah, Sorry, mister, no more rooms. We're full up. Well, Mr. Slate, we got 16 rooms. 17. Mr. Greeley ran out on us this morning, leaving us a suitcase full of interlocking, no mortar necessary bricks. I don't like that guy's looks. Besides, he's wearing a chameleon in his lapel, and I've had enough camellias for one day. Let me handle this. Your name is Shannon, isn't it? That's right. I can't help who recommended you, friend. No rooms. We're not taking any reservations. That's fine. I'd like to see a lad make a living. So I'll make this real short. I was going to ask you to. You got a camellia that looks like this, only in paper? Why? Because then you'd win first prize. One thousand bucks. Because I did what? Hey, don't I know you? The light was bad last night at the fiesta, but I could... That's right. You slugged me. So I just now forgot it. And I just now set a grand for the camellia. You got it? The last camellia I had was stolen out of this lady's room. Even for a thousand, you say that. Because that's the way it was. If it wasn't, get somebody to shed a tear over you. So long, Shannon. What's the matter, killer? You run out of bullets? Your boyfriend, Velma. He can't ever cry on your shoulder anymore. Why'd you kill him? Ricardo wouldn't double-cross you. Yeah, I remember. His dying words were how he wouldn't double-cross me. What'll yours be, Velma, dear? He tried to tell you. He didn't steal that camellia from Shannon's girl. The poor guy. All he was trying to do was make the time of day with me. And you told him, Ricardo, bring me a jewel. Bring me a ruby. It'll light up the sky for us. Isn't that what you told the dead lover boy? You've had a big day, killer. Why don't you go someplace and die dreaming about it? The ruby, Velma. Give it to me. I haven't got it. I haven't got it. I threw it away. The night of the street dance. I threw it to you. You forgot I was there. You forgot it wasn't me you tossed the posy to. I'm sorry, dear. You're grieving for the dead. That's what makes you forgetful, huh? (laughs) Is it my fault that Shannon caught it? Is it my fault we can't get it away from him? You can't get it away from him. A sweet, unspoiled, girly girl like you, and you can't take a paper flower from a man. I tried. Ricardo tried. You tried. How come you flipped it, killer? And I made it so two and two for you, dear. Plant the ruby in the flower, I said. Toss it to me while dancing. And nobody knows how a poor little jewel got lost. How simple it was. Well, you changed all that, killer. The boy lying on the floor says you changed it. Get the ruby, Velma, dear. Or for you and the boy, I'll arrange a two-body grave. Here, look at this picture, Senor Shannon. Senorita. Uh, no, he's not the one, Inspector LaSalle. Well, let me see, Slate. I said he wasn't the one. What do you have to look at a picture for? Because I like to look at pictures. No, that's not the man who offered a thousand dollars. Here, look at this photograph. This man will probably not... Uh... Yeah, that's him. Let's see. That's him, all right, Inspector. Hmm, what you say is very interesting. Because this is a man who has no record on the blotter of the police. 
Well, how did he get his picture in the pile with these thugs? This is a man whose name is Fred Packard. He is not a hundred percent thief. He is a suspected thief. A thief of what? Of a ruby of inestimable worth. This we think. This we do not know. Now, uh, permit me, Senor Shannon. Here is another picture. Have you seen this man ever? Uh, no, I don't think so. Senorita? No, I haven't. Why? This is a man named Quimby. We suspect he was in complicity with Senor Packard in the theft of the ruby. Again, we have no proof. I've got some advice for you, Inspector. And this advice is... Pick up this guy, Quinby. <laughs> that is already done. He languishes on an open charge in an empty cell. We give him questions, however, receive no answers. Keep at it, LaSalle. I think I can deliver this whole thing to you, Ruby and all. Come on, sailor. Come on, he says. Come on where? To knock on a door. To get back some junk. <laughs> junk someplace else. Pilar the peddler is closed for business. Open up, Pilar. It's Slate and Sailor. Let's watch that billing, huh, kid? Sailor and Slate, Pilar. Aha! It is my very godmothers. Come into the junk pile of Pilar. <laughs> You're a doll, honey. Wouldn't patronize any other junk dealer. <laughs> you have come to give me more souvenirs for El Dobin, huh? Take something away, Pilar. We want the camellia I pinned to your horse's hat. The camellia? I, I gave it to the viejo, the old man Cortez. Who? Cortez, the junk man. All day he competes with me. At night he courts me. Plays old bottles under my window. <laughs> Last night he was so beautiful, I threw him the paper camellia. And where do we find this beautiful man? Oh, in his little tin shack on Calle Rosa. Ah, you should hear how he plays those bottles. It makes a woman shit. Look, Slate, through the window. The old man's asleep. With a grin on his face and the camellia on his... Yeah. I told you that Pilar is a wonderful woman. Here, Sailor, I'll hoist you in. What? We don't want to wake the old man out of a dream he may never have again. Come on, I'll hoist you through the window. Just take the flower out of his ear and kiss him goodnight. Okay. How are you? I got the flower, Slate. Did you kiss him? Yeah. You know, he kissed back. Why, that sly old junk man. Come on, sailor. Get back to the jeep. When did you put a photoelectric cell on the jeep door, Slate? Don't worry your pretty head how doors open, dear. Just get in. You and Shannon. All right, flower lover. If you have trouble starting, I'll use this gun as a choke. Get going, Shannon. <laughs> This is a pretty boat you got, Shannon. The Bold Venture, huh? Pretty name. Yeah, I don't think I've got enough gas to get you to Key West, Packard. You have. It's been taken care of. You're on the boat, both of you. Mr. Packard. What do you want? Would you give a girl a peep at your ruby? Uh, just take my word for it. It was in the camellia. It has a perfect star. It weighs 35 carats, and it's flawless. Okay, Shannon, start her up. You just about have this all figured, haven't you, Shannon? Sure. The cops are scratching at your back. Me too. What? Don't turn around, Shannon. You make a good shield. Velma, what do you want? What are you doing on this boat? I heard you give orders to gas up this boat. You didn't think you were going to run out on me, did you? Slate, who's that girl breathing on the back of your neck? Velma? Sailor. Sailor? Velma. Hi, Velma. I don't want to be a cat, dearie, but your gun's showing. Does it show to you, too, Fred? Look, I was going to send for you once I got to Key West. Sure, sure you were. What are you going to do now that you'll never get to Key West? Velma, don't be crazy. Listen to me. Fred! Fred!
Fred, come back here. Fred. I'll kill him. He won't get away. I'll, I'll let go of me. I'll take that gun, Thelma. He'll get away. He'll swim. Give it to me. Yeah. Here, sailor, cover her. Let him go, Slate. The cops will pick him up. Maybe, maybe not. He's headed for that breakwater. If he makes it, maybe nobody will pick him up. Keep your eyes on my shoes. That Velma's a tricky one. Packard! Packard, you, you won't make it. I'll make it. There's an undertow at that breakwater. Okay, Packard. Back to the boat, Packard. You're crazy. I said back. We're both drowned. Maybe. Let's go under and see. Uh. Taylor. Taylor, throw me a line. All right. Uh. Uh, how do you feel, Packard? Just get me aboard. I saved your life. Aren't you going to say thanks? No? Haul us in, sailor. Hold tight, Slate. I'll drag you home. Bless you. <laughs> Bless you. Stop saying that. I've got a cold swimming around in that cold ocean. Here, I made you something. Drink it. What is it? Well, it's good for fellas with a cold. Go ahead, drink it. Drink it all down. All right. What was that? A fish broth. A fish broth? Uh huh. A little haddock, a pinch of rock cod, dash of swordfish. Where'd you get a remedy like that? I invented it. Fish never catch cold, and they live in the ocean. Genius. Didn't you like that remedy? Try this one. Cut it out, sailor. I've got a cold. Cut it out. Did you like that? Nice, huh? <gasps> it's you. Bless you. <gasps> it's you. Bless you. Now so I've got a cold, too. What have we got to worry about? Come here, Slate. And so our two stars, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, have brought to a close our latest Bold Venture story. Special music was composed and conducted by David Rose. May we invite you to listen again next week at this time for another exciting adventure starring Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall together in Bold Venture. He condescends to visit the lonely Henry Rice. Aren't you afraid your friends will look out and uh, find out about this, Blackie? I'll take my chances with my friends, Rice. But I'm not going to take a kicking around from you. I'm kicking you around? You know what you're doing. You're framing a murder on my friend Shorty. Oh, terribly unfair of me, isn't it? You know what it is. An out-and-out frame. The police are looking for evidence on the murder of that fellow Ashley. And you have phony evidence that makes it look as if Shorty killed him. So I do, so I do. A cigarette lighter, I think, with Shorty's initials on it. And Shorty's fingerprints on it, too. And it was found at the scene of Ashley's murder. I know, I know. I made sure it would be found there. I've got it, you know. Yes, for now. But I'm getting it back. 
Shorty has a record. If the police connect him with Ashley's death, Shorty's as good as dead himself. Yes, he will be, won't he? <laughs> ah, it looks as if your friend Shorty will go to the chair for murder, and you, the great Boston Black, he won't be able to do anything about it. I might. I doubt it. Unpleasant position you're in, Blackie, but very pleasant for me. Look, I'll give you 10000 for that, Lighty. Not interested. Making you miserable is worth ten times ten thousand. Then what will you take for the lighter? Nothing. You see, I have everything, Blackie. Everything. Even you in a jam. Uh, look. You're an art collector, aren't you? Yes, of a sort. Of the sort who'd like the Abbott painting in his collection? Well, now you're getting interesting. But the Abbott is not for sale, Blackie. It's in the City Art Gallery and, uh, under heavy guard. I know. But if you promise to give me Shorty's lighter, I'll get that Abbott for you. You will? How? I'll steal it. That's absolutely impossible. You let me worry about that. You can't do it, Blackie. You can't do it. Can't I? It's four o'clock in the afternoon now. By nine o'clock tonight... I'll have stolen that painting. And now, back to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. Look in the left-hand top drawer of my bureau, will you, Mary? I think you'll find a razor blade with a handle. All right. Should be right in the front of the drawer. See it? Uh, yeah, I have it. Here. Thanks. Blackie, why are you collecting all this stuff? I can't tell you, Mary. Why not? Because in the first place you wouldn't like it, and in the place that ties for first you wouldn't believe it. Mm. Now, let's see if I have everything in this bag. Well, you have a razor blade with a handle, you have a knife, rubber gloves, and adhesive tape. That's everything you asked for so far. Then I guess I have everything I need. Now all I have to do is close the case. There. And be on my way. So long. Blackie, what are you going to do? Is it something wrong? Who, me? Do something wrong? Mary. Yes, you do something wrong, Blackie. Mary, you've hurt my feelings. All I'm going to do is get Shorty out of a jam. With a knife, a razor blade, adhesive tape, and a pair of rubber gloves? Yes. What have they got to do with getting Shorty out of a jam? A lot. And you're asking a lot of questions. I'm not getting any answers. Oh, Blackie, please tell me where you're going. I'll worry myself sick. Oh, all right. I'm going to the city art galleries. With a knife, a... And a razor blade, adhesive tape, and a pair of rubber gloves. I'm going to steal the Abbott painting. You are going to do what? Steal the Abbott painting and give it to Henry Rice. Oh, Blackie, you're not. But I am. And don't worry. As soon as he gives me Shorty's cigarette lighter, I'm going to see that the painting goes right back to the gallery. Well, I should think so, but that's not what worries me. It's how you're going to steal it. There are steel doors and steel shutters on the windows of that gallery, and, and, and there are men with guns everywhere. Oh, darling, I don't know how you can possibly steal the Abbott. Don't you, Mary? Well, don't feel too badly about it. Ask a million people and they'll tell you it can't be done. But ask me, and I'll say it can. Come in. Inspector Faraday. Yeah, Rollins? Pick up your telephone. <laughs> There's a little surprise waiting for you on the other end of the line. Now, who is it? Little Red Riding Hood? No, no. Rollins, you've been around Blackie too much. No kidding, Inspector Faraday. Somebody very interesting wants to talk to you. Yeah? And it's funny that you mention Blackie because he wants to talk to you about Blackie. Yeah? Who is it? Pick up your phone and see. All right, I'll pick it up. But, Rollins, if this is your idea of a joke, I'll give you an idea of what it's like to be pounding a beat. Hello? Hello, Inspector Faraday. This is Henry Rice. Henry Rice? Yes, you remember me, of course. Remember you? Rice, if it takes me a hundred years, I'm going to get... I'm so glad to see you remember me and still hold me in such high esteem. Hold you in high esteem. I'll high esteem you. I'm going to hold you for murder. Why, how you love me. But I didn't call you to have you boost my ego. I thought perhaps you'd like to know something about your friend Boston Blackie. I know all I want to know about him. Oh, but you don't, Inspector, you don't. You've always wanted to send Blackie to the same iron-covered cottage you have for me, but you've never been able to prove anything against him. I will someday. Really? Well, Inspector, there, this is that day. Yeah? What are you talking about? Blackie and what he's going to do tonight. 
going to steal the Abbott painting from the city art gallery. He's what? You heard me, Faraday. Yes, I heard you. But I don't believe you. I'm not asking you to believe me. I just wanted you to know that the painting was to be stolen. And yet you couldn't keep Blackie from getting it. Have a pleasant night, Inspector. Listen, Rice. I... Now, wasn't that sort of a surprise, Inspector? Oh, you're still here, Rollins? Yeah, it was a big surprise. And guess what he wanted? What? To tell me Blackie is trying to steal the Abbott painting from the city art gallery tonight. Trying to steal the Abbott? <laughs> oh, no. Get that, Rollins. Rice thinks I'm dumb enough to fall for that. Yeah, you'd have to be dumb to fall for it. Not even Blackie could break into the city gallery, much less break out of it with the Abbott painting. <laughs> oh, no. yeah, not even Blackie. Why, that painting is, that painting is so heavily guarded that... <laughs> so heavily guarded that... Rollins, stop laughing and get me a squad car. If Blackie's going to steal the Abbott, what are we laughing about? No, Inspector Faraday, the gallery isn't closed. We're open till nine tonight. I see, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, then you still have your regular number of guards on duty, huh? Oh, oh, yes, of course, of course. Even though there are a few people in the gallery this late, it's, it's almost closing time. And nothing's missing? <laughs> well, believe me, this place wouldn't be so quiet if anything were missing. <laughs> Much less the Abbott painting you thought was going to be stolen tonight. I didn't think it was going to be stolen, Mr. Lawrence. I just heard a rumor that somebody was after it, and I came down here to check. Just routine. Well, I, I certainly appreciate your interest in my gallery, Inspector. Oh, well, uh, may I show you around? No, thanks. I have to get back to headquarters. Sorry if I had you worried about your Abbott painting, uh, Mr. Lawrence. Oh, I don't ever worry about it, Inspector. <laughs> it's the most heavily guarded painting in my gallery. Why, even... Not even... <laughs> well, what was that? Sounds like someone broke a window on the front part of the gallery. Yes, and there was a scream in that gallery there, too. Come on. I think we'd better have a look over there. Yes, I think we'd better... Here, what happened here? What happened? I don't know, Mr. Lawrence. I just standing here, and all of a sudden, the window behind me broke. Someone must have thrown a stone in from the outside. No, sir. Nothing fell in here. I'd say someone in here threw something out the window. Well, did you see anyone throw anything? No, sir. None of these people here threw anything. Must have been thrown by someone standing where I couldn't see them, sir. Mr. Lawrence! Mr. Lawrence! Here comes another one of your guards, Mr. Lawrence. Yes, yes, and from the Abbott Gallery, too. Mr. Lawrence! Mr. Lawrence! All of a sudden, the lights went out. When I turned them on, the Abbott painting was missing. Well, what? turn in the alarm quickly. Tom's gone to turn it on already. Well, throw the switch that locks the doors and the window shutters. All taken care of, Mr. Lawrence. Yeah, yeah, there goes the alarm. Oh, dear, the Abbott's stolen. I, I, I can't believe it. I can, Mr. Lawrence. Round up everybody in the place. Don't let anybody out. I want to question everybody. Even though I know the guy who stole your painting. <laughs> All right, Blackie. I have questioned and searched everybody in the place, including you. And no one has the painting. Where is it? You did the questioning and the searching. You tell me where it is. That painting's been cut out of its frame. You cut it out and got rid of it. Now, how did you get it out of here? The painting is missing? You know very well it is. Because you stole it. You can prove that, of course. No, I can't prove it. But you're here. I got a tip you'd steal it and the painting is missing. That's all I need to know. Oh, no, Faraday. You also need to know where the painting is. And until you know that, you can't say I stole it. All right, all right. I can't say you stole it. But I can think it. You can what? Think? You can think it. Faraday, you couldn't think your way out of a revolving door. Uh, Tell me something. Uh, there was a commotion in the other end of the gallery just before the painting was stolen. What was that? Oh, somebody threw something out of a window. The painting, maybe? No, it was just a stone. I thought maybe it had the painting wrapped around it or something. But a cop on the street saw it fall. That was just a stone. You're sure? Yeah, that was part of the thief's scheme. To create a commotion in another part of the gallery so he could come in here, turn out the light, and grab the abbot. Oh, yes. Very clever idea. It was your idea. And I know it. But can you prove it? No, I can't prove it. Then, of course, I can go. Yes, you can go. But when I find that painting, Blackie, your friends will find you in jail. Oh, good morning, Mary. Come on in. You better let me come in. Have you seen the morning paper? No. What have I done now? You've stolen the Abbott painting. Oh, that's not news. That's old stuff. I did that last night. Yes, but how did you do it, Blackie? The way it was guarded, with even Inspector Faraday there. Oh, just genius, that's all. Just sort of an... There's a phone call for you, genius. <laughs> Thanks. Hello. Good morning, Blackie. 
Blackie. This is Henry Rice. Oh, Henry. Good morning. Yes, isn't it, though? And I see in the papers where you had a good night. Oh, fair. <laughs> you got the habit, Blackie. How did you do it? How did you do the impossible? It wasn't easy, Rice. I just made it look that way. <laughs> And now, back to Boston Blackie. Blackie's friend, Shorty, is being framed for the murder of a man named Ashley. Gang leader Henry Rice, who hates both Blackie and Shorty, has the phonied evidence against Shorty, and in order to get it, Blackie promises to steal the valuable and heavily guarded Abbott painting. The morning papers announce that the painting has been stolen. And as we return to our story, Blackie is asking Henry Rice to keep his part of the bargain. All right, Rice. I stole the painting for you. Where's the cigarette lighter with Shorty's fingerprints on it? Where's the painting, Blackie? I'll deliver it. I'll surrender the lighter on delivery of the painting. Oh, no. I don't trust you. You crossed me. You tipped off Faraday that I was going to steal the Abbott. But I got the painting for you just the same. Give me the lighter and I'll deliver the painting. <laughs> Fair enough. Here it is. Thanks. Now, uh, when do I get the painting? In a little while. But tell me something. What did you call Faraday and tell him I was going to steal the Abbott if you wanted the painting so much? To tell you the truth, Blackie, much as I wanted that Abbott, I didn't much care whether you got the painting or Faraday got you. No? No. You see, it's hard for me to decide which I do most. Like that painting or dislike you. <laughs> Faraday speaking. Hello, Inspector. This is your old pal, Blackie. Listen, you. I don't want to talk to you until you're ready to tell me what you did with that painting. And then I'm going to talk to you through bars. You mean they're putting you in a cage? I'll cage you, Blackie. What do you want? I want you to meet me at the City Art Gallery so I can give you the Abbott painting. I wanted you in on this, too, Mr. Lawrence. Uh... In case Blackie's just pulling another fast one. I, uh, I don't know too much uh, about pictures. Well, I'm glad you called me in, Inspector Faraday. The Abbott was stolen from this room. Oh, uh, Blackie, uh, how did you do it? And where is the Abbott now? One thing at a time, Mr. Lawrence. You can see how I stole the painting. There's the frame for it, still there on the wall, empty. Yes, you cut the picture out of its frame. That's obvious. But uh, when, how did you do it without anyone seeing you? Well, that was the easiest part of it. I waited until there was no one here, then caused that commotion outside. While everybody was in the front hall of the gallery, you had time enough to cut the abbot out of its frame, roll it up, and take it away. Yes, but not very far. Come on. The abbot's in the next room. Taped to the back of another picture. Oh, thank heavens, man. I I thought we'd seen the last of the abbot forever. Uh, Where? Which picture? Right there. The painting of the two children. Hey. Hey, it's gone. It was hanging there last night. Blackie. We sold that painting out a half hour ago. What? Yes, yes, to a man named named Smith. Uh, Smith from Kansas City. Smith from Kansas City, huh? I know who that is, all right. An old friend of mine. See you fellas later. Oh, no, Blackie, you're not going anywhere. This is another one of your tricks. You're coming to... Not to jail, Faraday. At least not with this gun in my hand. Uh, A gun? Oh, good heavens, why... Good heavens, Mr. Lawrence? Uh Uh-uh. Goodbye. Mary, this is Blackie. Oh, hello, Blackie. Did you give the painting back to Inspector Faraday the way you promised? I tried to, Mary, but I couldn't. It's gone. Gone? Sold to a man named Smith from Kansas City for $250. Oh, Blackie, no. No is right, Mary. I think I know who has it, and it's not John Smith, and he's not from Kansas City. All right, who has it? A man who seems to like to play tag. And, Mary, if you don't mind, I'd like you to get into the game. I don't see any reason for this call of yours, Blackie. As you can see, I am Smith of Kansas City, and uh, I have what I want. You mean you're Henry Rice of New York, and you think you have what you want. (laughs) Oh, 
Then what is that painting hanging on the wall behind my desk? Two very lovely children. Recognize it? Yes, that's the painting I taped the abbot to. Surprised? Frankly, I am. I didn't think you were smart enough to figure out how I'd steal it. But I was smart enough, wasn't I? I arrived at your method of stealing it by the simple process of elimination, my dear Blackie. You see, it couldn't be taken out of the gallery, and so when I heard it was missing, I knew it must still be in the gallery. And so I looked, and so I found it. Oh, fine. Is the abbot still taped to the back of that painting on your wall? Uh, not quite. You'll never find the abbot, I can assure you. Even if I did find it, Rice, I wouldn't be finding the abbot. No? No. If you knew anything about art at all, you'd know the painting I stole for you was a phony. I don't believe it. Look at it closely and you'll see. Come on, we'll look at it together and I'll prove it to you. Ha <laughs> no, 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 Blackie. You can be more clever than that, really. I can look at the painting myself and tell whether or not it's authentic. Then go ahead, look at it. And have you followed me to it? Oh, no, 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 no. Then you're going to spend the rest of your days with a phony painting. But that's not my worry. You know, Blackie, you've aroused my curiosity. I hate to think I've been cheated, but I think you'd better stay here while I go look at it, if you don't mind. I do mind. What was the buzzer for? You'll see. Now, there. Turn around and look at the reason for the buzzer. Come in, Max. Yeah, boy, sure. Whew. Where did you find a guy this big? In a redwood forest? <laughs> Rather overgrown youngster, isn't he? Uh, Max, I have to run out a minute. Do you think you could uh, persuade this fellow to remain here and quietly until I return? Oh, sure, boss. I got a friend here in my pocket could convince him like this. <laughs> Some convincer, huh, boss? That's good work, Max. <laughs> that should keep him asleep for a little while. I'll be back in a few minutes. Hey, hey you know something, boss? What? I like to hit guys on the head. It does something to me. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> oh you come too now, huh? Good. I'll let you get up, and then I'll hit you again with my blackjack. Oh, oh hi, boss. You're back, huh? Yeah. Oh. Hi. Hello, Bryce. You see the painting? Yes, and it's authentic, all right. Huh? Never mind, you wouldn't understand, Max. Blackie, your trick, alas, didn't work. Well, uh, you can't blame a guy for trying, can you? <laughs> no. You'll never find the abbot, Blackie. You know, I've outsmarted you at every turn. I feel rather good about that. I'll get that painting back. You'll never even see it again. Now, don't you envy me, Blackie. I have the Abbott painting. I'm free and clear of any suspicion. But the police are looking for you, and you don't even know where I've hidden the painting. Well, now, I think you've done everything you can for me, Blackie. You may go now. Well, thanks for something, anyway. No hard feelings, Blackie. Here, I'll make amends by taking you to the top of the steps. Well, here we are, Blackie. Just one flight down, and you're in the street. And I suppose you think out on my feet, too. <laughs> I trust not. You'll need to be rather nimble to sidestep the police. Don't forget, they're looking for you. Thanks for the warning. Don't mention it. <laughs> Good girl, Mary. You're here right on time. Did everything work all right? Perfectly. I did just what you told me on the phone. I waited outside Rice's office door, then I followed him down the steps, and from then on I didn't let him out of my sight till he went into another building. But, um, where's the abbot? You show me the building Rice went into, and I'll show you the abbot. <laughs> this is the door he went into when you followed him, Mary? Yes, Blackie. Ah, this is a warehouse. But, warehouse, a palace. This is where Rice hid the abbot. Yeah, but it's such a big warehouse. We'll find it. Come on, let's go in. Say, the door's unlocked. That's good. No, that's bad. Means there's probably a guard around here somewhere. Mm. Shh. Well, this seems to be nothing but an ante room. Um, there's another door there. Should we try that one? Uh-huh, come on. But quietly. Don't worry. No. Shh. I hear footsteps. Yes, and I see the man who's making them. 
Oh, oh, I see something else, too. This is a gambling casino. It's empty now, but Rice must use this place every night. Uh-huh. And here comes Mr. Footsteps. We'll have to take care of him before we do anything else. I hope he isn't as big as that match you were telling me about. No, he isn't, but he's got a gun. Be quiet or we'll be telling the angels about him. You're so right. Shh, here he comes. Hey, you. Thanks for turning your chin. Why, Blackie, you hit him only once, you selfish. Not even a second sock for me. Mary, I would gladly trade that second sock for a second sight that would help me find the abbot. the painting over there, Blackie? No, Mary. But I may Woo! find it under this table, Sam. Well, I have torn things apart till I'm exhausted. It's the last place I'm going to look. Well, look over the old places again. We may have missed something. Oh, dear. Well, it's not here. I'm going to rest a minute. Uh, I'll rest in a minute. Mm. Uh, not here. I'll try this. Over here, maybe under this table. Nope, nothing here. I'll try over there. Mind if I play a little roulette while you look? No, go ahead. I love roulette. When it's for fun. I love looking for things when I can find them. Uh-oh. Red and even. The situation here is black and odd. <laughs> oh, gosh, I guess rice has us fooled completely. Oh, no, Black, you'll find it. Want to quit for a while and, uh, say a little roulette? No, stranger. I'm start thinking again. I, I'm sure if Rice came here, the painting is in here. Red and even. Let's see where the little ball stops this time. I wish it would stop on the painting if I... That's it. What? Stand back, Mary. That roulette wheel is turned for the last time. What are you going to do? Take that table leg here and... Smash the roulette wheel. Oh, golly. In a million pieces... And I was just about to spend it and make a fortune. Mary, we found a fortune. Look under what's left of the wheel. Well, uh, looks like a roll of canvas. Here, look at it. When I take it out and unroll it, look. The painting! Yes, the painting, Mary. And suddenly the whole picture is changed. Well, Blanky, so you went through all the trouble of stealing the abbot just because of Shorty's lighter. Yes, and now Shorty has his lighter, and the art gallery has its abbot, and everybody is happy, I suppose. Well, I'm not happy. Why didn't you tell me Rice was framing Shorty and let me get that lighter from him? Because by the time you'd have cleared Shorty, he'd have been sent to the electric chair. Shorty was innocent. Of course he was. If you're unhappy because I didn't let you help clear Shorty, I'm unhappy because Henry Rice was the cause of all this, and he's going free. Oh, no, he isn't. You've arrested him? What for? Running a gambling joint? No, we couldn't prove that. But the D.A. has a great case against him, Blackie. And all because Rice made you steal that painting. But you can't say Rice stole the painting. I did. Yes, you stole it, Blackie. But who got it after you stole it? Well, Rice did. Uh Uh-huh. I'm beginning to see a little flaw in Rice's master plan. And what a flaw. You didn't actually steal the abbot. Technically, all you did was move it from one room to another. So that clears you. I'm sorry to say, but the painting was taken out of the gallery, so Rice goes to jail for receiving stolen property. Good work, Faraday. This all started with Shorty's cigarette lighter, but it looks like Rice met his match.
Agdad. Martinique. Singapore. At all the places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you will find Steve Mitchell on another dangerous assignment. The National Broadcasting Company presents the first in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Steve. Hmm. You're going to run this pretty little boat right onto the rocks if you don't put your hands on the wheels. Uh-uh. Automatic pilot. W5, oh. WRS, <laughs> calling w 2 I should have known you'd have one of those on your boat. <laughs> so help me. First time in my life I've ever used it, Evelyn. Eloise. Hello, sure, sure. Mm. W5, WRS, calling W2BYR. Steve. Mm. Why don't you turn that radio off, hmm? I never should have turned it on. What's all that W stuff? Hmm? Who's that silly woman trying to get, anyway? Oh, W5, me. WRS, what? calling W2BYR. That's the ship to shore operator. <laughs> Brother, you know them all. What does she want with you? I'm afraid I know. <laughs> well, I guess I better answer before they send the Coast Guard. <clears throat> W5, WRS, from W2BYR. Go ahead. Stand by, W2BYR. I have a call for you. Go ahead. This is Ruth, Steve. The commissioner wants to see you right away. Over. Now, look, Ruth. I said only call me in an emergency. Over. The commissioner says this is an emergency. Over. But I'm in the middle of a big deal, Ruth. I'm tied up. Over. Just a minute, Steve. He says untie her and get into the office. But tell him... Oh, okay. I'll come back. Out. Eloise, I'm afraid... And for this, I broke another day. Now, look, Eloise, I'm sorry. So what do I do? I go out and buy a new sunsuit. And it's a very nice sunsuit. I even fry some chicken for the first time in my life. I fry some chicken. But this probably won't take long. What am I supposed to do in the meantime? And what am I going to do with all that fried chicken? Uh, well, keep it on ice for me, huh? Hello, Commissioner. Steve, I trust you concluded your big deal satisfactorily. Uh, <coughs> well, I... Uh-huh. <laughs> Steve, ever hear of the Throp Foundation? Throp Foundation? Sure. That's the private charity that's been sending a lot of relief shipments to Europe. Right. They've done quite a job over there. Tons of food and medical supplies. Yeah, that's the outfit. What about them? Their last three shipments to Sicily have been stolen. Oh, uh, you mean off the boat? No, from the foundation's warehouse in Messina, Sicily. I see. We've been instructed to get to the bottom of it. As usual, you'll pose as a foreign correspondent. Ruth has your credentials in order. Okay. On the surface, your assignment will be to write a story about the stolen shipments. Actually, I want you to find out who's been stealing those shipments. And to be frank, Steve, I'm sending you into a pretty nasty situation over there. What do you mean? The Throp Foundation has had two men working on this case... One of them has been missing for two weeks. Mm. What about the other one? Oh, they found him all right. His throat had been cut. Well, that's reassuring. We're sending you because we think you can take care of yourself and handle the danger. When do you want me to leave? Good. As soon as possible. Now, if you need help or information once you get to Sicily, contact Emilio Donati in Messina. Who's Emilio Donati? He runs a bar in Messina. We think he's a friend of ours. Okay. There's just uh, one more thing I should warn you about, Steve. You know, you're making this assignment sound real attractive, Commissioner. (laughs) What is it? I guess you've heard of the Sicilian bandit they call Lorenzo. Yeah, who hasn't? He's got the whole countryside terrorized. Steve, I don't know whether he has anything to do with all this or not, but if he has, now watch yourself. Yep, 
Huh? Looks like I got a real honey this time. You did. But it's vital to us that those relief shipments get through. Trouble usually starts from empty stomachs. Yeah. That's all. You've got your assignment, Steve. Your plane leaves in two hours. Good luck. Eduardo, this is Dino speaking. The American just landed. See? Report it to the chief at once. Senor, a taxi, huh? You want a taxi, senor? Yeah. Hey, uh, look, driver, you know your way around Messini pretty well, huh? But sure. I live here most of my life, senor. At the age of three, I was brought here from Palermo. So I know every house, every street, every building, every bar. Yeah, every... yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know your city. Now, take me to the Trop Foundation Warehouse. Again? Trop Foundation Warehouse. You know where it is? Trop? No, no. Trop. It's a... Ah, well, never mind. Just take me to the Rienzi Hotel. I'm sure you must have heard of that. Why, <laughs> sure. I'm going to put your baggage in the car, senor. Hello. <clears throat> Sorry I'm late. Hmm? <laughs> You're not late. You're just in time. I heard you inquiring for the Throp Foundation, so you must be Ralph Gillette. I'm Helen Collier. I was supposed to meet you here at the airport, and I... Uh, look, I'm afraid there's been a mistake. My name's not Gillette. It's Mitchell. Steve Mitchell. Oh, oh, I I thought you were the one I was supposed to meet. I'm sorry. <laughs> Believe me, I'm sorry, too. Couldn't we just pretend I was? I'm afraid Mr. Archer wouldn't understand. <laughs> Already I don't like Mr. Archer. Don't even know him. Who is he? My boss. He's in charge of the Foundation's office here in Messina. Oh, wait a minute. Do you work for the Throp Foundation? Mm-hmm. Mr. Archer's been expecting a new man to fly down from Rome, uh, Mr. Gillette. I thought you were he. Oh. I wonder if you'd tell me where the foundation office is. I'm a foreign correspondent, and I'd like an interview with your boss. Oh, well, I could go with you and show you where it is, because it doesn't look like Mr. Gillette is on the plane anyway. Fine. I have a cab over here. You say you're a foreign correspondent. I suppose you want to do a story on the stolen relief shipments. Yep. Well, good luck. Mr. Archer doesn't want any publicity about it. Mm-hmm. It would have an adverse effect on donations from the States. Oh, well, here we are. Uh, pardon us, gentlemen. Uh, si, senor. Eduardo, out of the man's way. Of course, your pardon, senor. Well, I'll see if I can get some kind of a statement from him. Are there just the two of you in the Messina office? Yes, right now. There were three of us. <laughs> Paul Wainwright was the third, but he... Well, he... Got fired a few days ago. At the Hotel Rienzi, no? No. Trop Foundation. Tropa? Tropa? Oh, Via Delgada. Oh, si, senorina. Hey, you must have the magic touch. Uh, this Paul Wainwright, he was fired by Mr. Archer? Yes, three days ago. Senor, you ready, huh? Si. <laughs> Did you hear what the signorina told the driver? Si, Eduardo. Via Delgada. That is the address of the Throp Foundation. I will report it. You follow the American. Mr. Mitchell, you must understand my position. It's not that I don't want to cooperate with you and your press association, but at the same... The uh, stolen shipments are news, Mr. Archer, and news is my job. Well, I know all that, but just stop and think what's going to happen if the news spreads around back in the States. Our donations would probably stop coming in. We think it's vital that these shipments continue. I see. Well, in that case, could you give me an off-the-record statement about it? Mm, I might, if I were sure it would be treated as such. I'll make a deal with you. We won't break the story unless or until the thieves are rounded up. Hmm. Well, all right. I guess that's fair enough. There have been three shipments stolen, right? Yes, from our warehouse. It's right downstairs. Yes, I noticed it as I came up. Did you have anyone guarding the shipments? Of course. We kept doubling the guard, but each time they were overpowered. Mm -hmm. Sounds like the thieves have a pretty large outfit. Yes, apparently they do. I suppose you've heard of the bandit they call Lorenzo. Oh, certainly. Everybody in Sicily's heard of him. He's got the whole country terrorized. He's supposed to have a hideout up in the mountains. Uh, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Mitchell. That Lorenzo's men could have stolen the shipments. 
I thought of that right away myself. Well, it's possible, isn't it? Yes, it's possible. Personally, I don't think Lorenzo had anything to do with it. With Lorenzo's reputation what it is, it would be relatively easy for someone else to make it look as if Lorenzo had done it. That's an interesting thought. Incidentally, you fired one of your men a few days ago, didn't you? Paul Wainwright? That is something that I'd rather not discuss. Oh? Of course, I don't want to persecute the man just because some of his actions appeared vaguely suspicious to me. I, uh, I have no proof of anything at all. I see. Well, thanks for the information. I'll see you later. You wish a table, senor? Hmm? Oh, yeah. Please. Right here. Hmm. Thanks. I am Carlotta. What will you have? Beer. But it is after dark. It's time to drink wine. <laughs> Emily Post may not like it, but I still want beer. Anything you wish. I will bring it. <laughs> Look, uh, is the boss in, Carlotta? Emilio Tomati. See, si, he's here. Why? I like the scenery. I might set up a charge account. <laughs> Where is he? Uh, the fat one. Over at the bar. I will tell him to come over. No, no, no never Hello, mind. Sir. I'll go over there. Uh, see, si, see, si, I'm coming. Emilio Donati? Eh? So I'm called, Signor. I uh, told a friend of mine in the States I'd say hello to you. So? I know many people in the States, Signor. I'm pretty sure you'll know my friend, the Commissioner. Commissioner? Yeah. I think you're expecting me. I'm Steve Mitchell. A name can be used by anyone, Signor. Here. Yeah. You recognize the handwriting? Ah, see, si. You are Steve Mitchell. Mm-hmm. Well, how can I help? I'm working on the theft of the relief shipments. Yeah, I thought that would be it. No, that's a very bad thing, Steve. There are so many people are hungry here in Sicily. Yeah. Uh, look, a fellow named Paul Wainwright was fired from the Throp Foundation a few days ago, and Archer acts like he thinks... Wainwright's involved in the theft. Paul Wainwright. I know who he is. I'd like to talk to him. Can you arrange it? See, si. In an hour or two, I will send the word for him to come to the back room of my bar off the alley. We can talk to him there. Order after 11. Wainwright ought to be showing up pretty soon, hadn't he? See, si. He should have been here by now, Steve. There's another lead I want to run down, too, Emilio. Hmm? Do you have any idea where the bandit Lorenzo's headquarters are? Oh, si. In the mountains to the west over here. Think you could furnish me a guide? A, a guide? Yeah. Just to get me into the general area. After that, I'll go it alone and do a little reconnoitering undercover. Steve, you must not try a thing like that. Look, it's the quickest way of proving whether Lorenzo's involved in these thefts or not. If he is... He's probably got a lot of the supplies hidden away in those mountains. My, his men would capture you. He has lookouts all over the mountains. Well, just last month, an entire division went up there and... Sure, they... sure, that's the point. There were so many Lorenzo's men spotted them easy. But one man alone in the brush could be hard to find. My Steve, Lorenzo has a small army of cutthroats up there. They are fanatically loyal to him. Can you get me a guide? My, look, the danger, you must realize the danger. Yeah, yeah. Lorenzo isn't stupid enough to kill an American correspondent. Ah, uh-huh. that must be Paul Wainwright. Oh, come in, uh, Senor Wainwright. No thanks. Look, Donati, and you too, whatever your name is. There's a waste of time. We've got nothing to talk about. Oh, Wainwright. Uh, knife in the back. Emilio, get out of the light. Get down. Yeah. Someone's running down the alley. Don't follow him, Steve. Huh? It may be a trap. There may be others waiting in the dark. Yeah, I guess you're right. Wainwright, see, uh, he's a dead, Steve. Now perhaps you realize that there's a real danger here for you. They know you are not a correspondent. Do you still wish a guide? I'll be waiting in room 23, Rienze Hotel. All right. I will send a man over. Signor Mitchell? Yeah. Who are you? Casella. Casella? 
That's supposed to mean something to me. Emilio Donati said be to you. Oh, oh, you're the guide. Si, signor. I am to conduct you to the mountain where Lorenzo and his band are hiding. Oh, Emilio didn't lose any time, did he? It was thought best to travel at night, so that we may be in the mountains before the sun comes up. Yeah, I guess that would be best. We will drive to the foot of the mountains by car. Then we will use horses on the trails. It is all arranged. Good. When do you want to start? As soon as possible. Okay, let's go. Hey, pretty narrow trail up here, Casella. Uh, si, senor. About time for sunrise, isn't it? But a few more minutes and it will be light. Hmm. You say, you think Lorenzo's hiding out somewhere on that mountain up there ahead of us? Si, uh, that is what I have heard. Okay, let's stop here a minute. I'll go it alone from here, Casella. There's no point in your going any farther. Thanks very much. Si, senor. You're right. There is no point in going any farther. Put your hands in front of you. What? Do as I say, senor. I am going to tie your hands. Look, what is this anyway? Hey, wait a minute. You're one of Lorenzo's men. So true, senor. It will do you no good to resist. Do not try to escape. There is a man blocking your trail. See? He has a gun. Okay, I'll try it through you. Stop! Come on! Stop! I'm coming through! Eduardo, quick! Come and help me! Eduardo, help! Okay, Casella. That's for the double cross, Bob. Senor, I have a gun! I said, stop! Uh, okay. Looks like you win. Good. Now I tell you. Hold your hands up. Okay. Here's one of oh. All right, uh, senor. I will lose the, the gun. This uh, way. Uh, 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 so, senor Mitchell. Casella, are you all right? See, si, I, I think so. Except my nose. It is bleeding. Fool, you deserve it. Come, we'll take the American to Lorenzo. He's coming to Eduardo. Go tell Lorenzo. See? Si. Oh. oh, Casella. See, si, Casella. This is for the bloody nose you gave me, senor. Well, thanks. Looks like I got taken for the well-known ride. I thought Emilio Donato was a friend. <laughs> Sometimes it is difficult to know who your friends are. You're so right. Uh, here, here is Lorenzo now. Well, Senor Mitchell, you're feeling better now, huh? Not much. <laughs> Welcome to my camp. Thanks. So you're Lorenzo. See, si, I have that honor. Honor? Of course. Hmm. Where are we? Walk with me and I will show you. As you see, you're on top of a mountain. This is my headquarters. Mm -hmm. Hey, you can see a hundred miles from here. See, si, this is why I choose this place. But where are the guards? Guards? <laughs> you are not my prisoner, you are my guest. Mm -hmm. But see, below us, my men are camped there. Is it not a reassuring sight? Hey, that looks like a small army. 120 patriots. <laughs> patriots, you call them? Of course, they serve Lorenzo. <laughs> Got a pretty good opinion of yourself, huh? <laughs> I am one of the most brilliant men I have ever met. Really? <laughs> you know, you don't talk like you've spent your whole life in these mountains. Oh, I have, as you say, been around. I attended a university in Italy for two years. But you came back to this. How come? A sense of duty, senor. I rub the rich and give to the poor. Yeah? That sounds pretty, Lorenzo. But are you sure it's not just because you're a thief at heart? <laughs> you are shrewd, senor. Well, why not? From my experience in the world, I have learned that one must look out for oneself. Oh? Consider the recent war. Nobody won it. Consider the peace. Again, nobody wins it. Everyone quarrels and fights. Now, is it not much more clever to take what one wants, to be concerned only with oneself? You know, your kind of thinking isn't helping things any. Yeah, perhaps not, but it is profitable to me. And, senor, this conversation is pleasant, but I still do not understand why you were so anxious to spy on my camp. No? You ever hear of the Throp Foundation? No. What is it, senor? A relief outfit that's been shipping food and medical supplies here to Sicily. Oh? Does this concern me? That's what I'm wondering. 
At least three shipments have been stolen from a warehouse in Messina. <laughs> and of course you think that I stole them. It's a pretty good bet. Well, I am sorry to disappoint you, senor, but as you see, there are no supplies here. Look around you. I have nothing to hide. No? Uh, it is my fate, senor. Whenever a crime is committed in Sicily, I am immediately accused. I suppose I should feel flattered. It has often occurred to me that the police must find me very convenient. How so? Uh, it would be most embarrassing for them if I were captured. Then they would have no one to blame for all their unsolved crimes. Well, I'm sorry you made this trip for nothing, senor. Well, if you've got nothing to hide, how come you went to so much trouble to capture me? I was told you wanted to see Lorenzo. So I thought I would make it easy. You were very rough with my men, senor. But uh, no matter. We will be friends. And you will go back to America and tell everyone what a gracious host is Lorenzo. Oh, huh? you want a press agent, huh? <laughs> hey, wait a minute. Huh? That girl coming up the trail, she looks awfully familiar. Oh, her name is Carlotta. Yeah, yeah, now I recognize her. She works at Emilio Donati's bar. Si. <laughs> Everything's starting to add up. I am afraid Carlotta is not very happy with me at present. No? She has been very useful to me in the past, but she is so uh, possessive. She is very upset to learn that there had been another woman here. There, you see how she sulks? I believe she thinks that she is punishing me. Ah, Carlotta, my dear. Oh, speak to me, Lorenzo. Do not speak to me. You climbed up here to tell me that. I am true with you. You have not been true to me. Oh, you are not very flattering, my dear. Of course I have not been true to you. That would be to deprive others. Oh. Good for nothing, you. <laughs> I think I'd better leave you here to take out your temper on the American. I have other affairs to look after. The beast. I lie for him. I steal for him. Uh, maybe you ought to pick your friends a little more carefully. So, you're the one that put the bee on me at Donati's, huh? You had Lorenzo send that phony guide to my room. Treat me this way after all I do for him. Oh, the beast. I do not think you would treat me that way. Huh? I think if you were my friend, you would treat me nice. Now, look. Would you like to be Carlotta's friend? It's okay with me if you're trying to make Lorenzo jealous, but use somebody else. Kiss me. They cut it out. Come on, come on. Kiss me. Hey. You like it? Well, under other circumstances, maybe. Right now, no. You should not have done that, Carlotta. Lorenzo, Perhaps look. that will show you you cannot treat me as you have. If you do not want me, there are others who do. Uh, you are such a child, Carlotta. I am afraid this presents a problem. Look, there's no problem. I've got no interest in Carlotta, believe me. Oh, I'm aware of that. But some of my men there below may have seen her kiss you, senor, and that is the problem. I must not allow anything to shake their confidence in me. The appearance is everything. No, it is not Carlotta I am thinking about. She is nothing. Oh, dog, that you should talk about me like that. What if I were to tell the American about... Shut up, Carlotta. Wait a minute. What did you say, Carlotta? Then you would wish you had not treated me that way. I told you to keep your mouth shut. Oh. I will tell. Carlotta! On the other side of the mountain is a cave. Lorenzo has hidden the relief shipments there. Oh, well, people. Lorenzo, so you've got nothing to hide. No, indeed, I have no choice, senor. Carlotta, give me your scarf. You are going to fight with the knives over me. Fool, to think it is you I am considering. Hey, look, how let's consider me for a minute. I did not intend to kill you, senor, but as you see, now I must. Here, take this knife. Now, wait a minute. Put the end of this scarf between your teeth. Huh? There, as I do the other end. Oh, what so, fool? now we circle slowly. Hey, look, let's call this foolishness, will you? Do not hold the knife that way. Huh? Use the underhand grip. Do you know nothing at all about knife fighting? As much as I want to know. Not for the last time. I am sorry. Defend yourself. Okay, you ask for it. <clears throat> you twist the knife from my hand. Yeah. You may know knife fighting, but you're pretty sad on judo. <clears throat> oh, Lorenzo! You killed Lorenzo! Just a rabbit punch, lady. Won't even leave a scar. So long. Dog of a dog! Oh, God. Carissimo. Oh. He has killed you. Oh. Oh, Lorenzo. Lorenzo. Will you stop that silly babbling? Lorenzo. You are all right. See? Except the back of my neck. I will tell your men to go after him. No, this is a personal matter. They might find it hard to understand how the American escaped from me. I will go after him alone. I will go with you. You will wait here, Carlotta. 
They will attend to you when I return. Lorenzo! I may be gone until dark, because if I do not find the American, then there is someone in Messina I must talk to. Now get me my horse. Oh, boy, my wind is shot. Maybe it's the altitude. Hey, the horse. Ahead of me somewhere. I better play it safe. Hey, Donati! What? Over here, Emilio. Steve, Steve Mitchell, you are safe. Yeah. I sent a guide to your room the first thing this morning. He said you were gone. Yeah, one of Lorenzo's men got there first. Your waiter, Carlotta, tipped them off about me. Carlotta? Yeah. Think that horse of yours can carry both of us? Ma, Lorenzo's men, they will be after you. Yeah, yeah, that's a good reason for not hanging around here any longer. All right, come. I, I'm going to help you up. Wait, listen. That horse is coming. Come on, get your horse into the brush here. Uh, uh, Cover up his nose so he won't whinny. Lorenzo, he's alone. Yeah, heading towards Messina, too. Look, I have a gun. We can capture him. No, no, not yet, Emilio. Come on. We'll give him the lead, then follow him into Messina. It's possible he's got more on his mind than just finding me. If so, I want to know what it is. Lorenzo. Your arch. Why, you, you fool, coming here to the foundation office. My secretary will be back any minute. The American escaped. What? How could he? We will not go into that. Oh, you stupid fool. You've ruined everything. Mitchell must know all about the stolen shipments now. See, he knows I stole them, but he does not know that you are involved, Archer. He might as well. We're through now, Lorenzo. Through. And all because of your stupidity. Do not talk that way to me, Archer. I planned it so well. Even when Paul Wainwright became suspicious, I fired him. Then I had his mouth shut permanently. And now you've ruined it, you blundering half-breed. You keep your mouth shut. This will help you. Lorenzo, I'll kill you. This gun is quicker than your knife. Well, Lorenzo and Archer, <laughs> the gold dust twins. Mitchell. <laughs> Very neat. So you two did work it together, huh? You're, you're wrong, Mitchell. I, I've just captured a notorious bandit. Huh? Uh, you lying dog. It was you who arranged me. Get, hey. get back, get back, Mitchell. Give me that. Gun. That gun's safer with me, Archer. Uh, you, you've got nothing on me. <laughs> you mean because Lorenzo can't talk? If you want to put it that way. There's one witness you overlooked, Archer. Carlotta. Yeah. When she finds out you killed Lorenzo, she'll sing plenty, and it's a song you're not going to like. Well, did you send your report to the commissioner, Steve? Yeah, I called him. He said the Throp Foundation had sent a new man over to head up the office here. Well, and now you can relax for a few days. We, we're we going to eat and drink and have a good time. You will have such a food as you never tasted. Scalopini, escarole, a peach, I, I, peach I, 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 that I, melts in I, your that, mouth. That sounds fine, Emilio, but I, I think I'll be heading back to the States. But what's the hurry? Well, someone back there is keeping some fried chicken on ice for me. Well, it would... It, it, Fried chicken? Yeah. It's got to be eaten on a boat, too. Steve, I don't understand. What's so special about the eating of fried chicken on a boat? Well, you see, she's... Uh, not the chicken, that is, I... Oh, well, just take my word for it, huh? So long, Emilio. just heard the first in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy and written by Bob Wright. This program was directed by Bill Carn with music by Bruce Ashley. Be with us again next week at this same time when Brian Donlevy, as Steve Mitchell, embarks on another Dangerous Assignment. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Presents Gail Storm and John Howard.
From Hollywood, the Mutual Broadcasting System, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents UFO, starring John Howard. And now, here is your hostess, Gail Storm. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, UFO, starring John Howard as Bill Cullen. The following story is pure fiction. It poses a challenge that neither we nor our children may ever have to face. But if we should, if the make-believe problem in tonight's drama were actually forced upon us in the next five or ten or twenty years, it's no exaggeration to say that the way in which we meet it may determine the fate of the world. The initials UFO are the official United States Air Force abbreviation for the words... Unidentified flying object. Bill? Am I late? <clears throat> no, they haven't started yet. I was checking my bags. Any idea what it's all about? I don't even have a hunch. This is quite a turnout. Say, isn't that Rubikoff over there? Nobody else. Looks naked without his bodyguard. Mr. Collette. <laughs> well, Dr. Passy, glad to see you. What is this meeting for? Do you know? No, not a thing. Whatever it is, it's international. Oh, do you know Mr. Rogers? How do you do? Uh, Dr. Passy? Oh, I thought you two knew each other. I have not had the pleasure. Are you with the British delegation, Mr. Rogers? No, just a meteorologist. Enchanté. Perhaps you can penetrate some of the fog surrounding this I meeting. don't know any more than you do, Doctor. Looks to me like we're some sort of a U.N. subcommittee. Uh, why were we brought all the way to Washington to meet at an air terminal of all places? Your guess is as good as mine. Did you see the clearance list? They are checking against our passes. Not very closely. Why? The authorizing signatures at the bottom are those of the chief representatives on the Security Council. Well, all of them? Every one. What do you make of that? Gentlemen, gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? Who is the American officer? You know him? No. <laughs> you make yourself... I wonder why the Air Force is in on this. He looks familiar. There should be enough seats to go around. Well, say, doctor, isn't that the French air attaché up on the platform? So it is. Uh, Colonel Dupuis. Mm, a couple of RAF chips, too. We're running a little behind schedule, gentlemen. Can I have your attention, please? <clears throat> Each of you was privately notified by your various governments early last week that you might be asked to leave New York and possibly this country on a moment's notice. Is there anyone present who was not so notified? Very well. In a few minutes, at 2100 hours to be exact, you will board one of three transport planes now waiting on the runways. Your destination, top secret. Now, each of you is an expert of one sort or another, a diplomat, a linguist, a scientist... And each of you may be called upon to exert his talents to the utmost before this mission is completed. Uh, Major, uh, Major. Yes, Dr. Passy. Uh, what you have just said is very flattering, but uh, now I'm speaking only for the diplomats, and I hope that no one here will take offense at what I'm about to say, but it is a fact that we are not what you call top-level representatives of our various governments. <laughs> at least I know I am not. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true, Dr. Passy. But you were chosen, each by your own country, for the very reason that your opposite numbers, the ones with whom you'll be attempting to establish diplomatic, scientific, and cultural relations, will not themselves be heads of state, or at least it has so been reasoned. You'll receive a complete briefing en route to the rendezvous point. Rendezvous point? Yes, Mr. Cullen. We here are permitted to tell you two things. The general nature and area of the rendezvous point, an uncharted island somewhere in the Pacific. Well, who is it we're to rendezvous with? Can't you tell us that? We would if we could, but we've been able to communicate with them only in a tentative and very unsatisfactory way. And we aren't even certain they'll keep the rendezvous, although, of course, we have high hopes. Who are they, a bunch of cannibals? <laughs> we hope not. It would make your task almost insuperable. All right, you can't tell us who they are, but what's the other thing you can tell us? Where they're from. And I should emphasize that while our intelligence on this point is incomplete, 
We have no doubt of its basic authenticity. Well, that's something, anyhow. I hope you continue to think so. The representatives that your various governments have selected you to make contact with on the Pacific Island are from outer space. I still can't believe it. I know, Rogers, I know. And yet here we are in the stateroom of a jetliner streaking through the night, 20,000 feet above cities like Cleveland and Chicago, at a speed of over 600 miles an hour. And 50 years ago, who would have believed that? <laughs> yes, yes, I, ex- I expect that's the way to look at it. <laughs> I say, they, they've been a long time briefing Callum and the others, what? Well, our turn will come soon. I... I wonder what's the approach to these creatures. What, what, what's expected of us? It's hard to say. Oh, Colin. Oh, Rogers, Dr. Passy. Well, I see you have company. Mr. Rubikoff, you know the doctor. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, and this is Mr. Clement Rogers. Rogers, how do you do? Mr. Peter Rubikoff of the Soviet Union. I'm glad to know you. We've got all the data on these mimeographed forms. Now, Rubikoff and I'll brief you from here on. Rubikoff and you? Well, we, we are the team chiefs. Yes. <laughs> Sit down, Rogers, and I'll explain the whole thing. They're breaking the contact group into teams of five and six men. Fourteen teams, all told. You mean each team will operate separately in trying to meet these uh, visitors? Well, not unless it becomes absolutely necessary. But apparently they want to have the organization fluid enough for that, just in case. Well, did they give you any, any orientation, any background on this? Or do we just have to go in feet first? <laughs> yes, they gave us a good deal. Oh, uh, Rubicott, do you have that report? Oh, I think I do. Yes, here. Yeah, this is a duplicate of a secret report submitted to the Security Council about a month ago. Yeah? Well, uh, with your permission, I will summarize the salient points. Oh, yeah? wait. Hmm. Well, you can both read the thing later if you want to. No, no, go ahead, Mr. Rubicott. Well, uh, this report traces very briefly, of course, the history of reported sightings of unidentified flying objects all over the world since 1944. Now, during many of these sightings, especially in the United States, the flying objects were picked up on radar. Yeah, you remember how that stuff used to make the papers all the time, and then they just stopped printing it. Yes. And the reason that they stopped was because it had become impossible to dismiss the sightings as, uh, oh, perhaps hallucinations or light reflections. Yes. That's, that's why the air intelligence people decided to use a combination of radio and radar as a method of primary contact with the unidentified objects. Yeah, well, what do you mean that's why? Uh, had they come to some conclusion about the sources? Well, what well, really see, happened... Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> excuse no, me. No, 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 not at all. You go ahead. Well, you see, Rogers, one night a few years ago, a traffic control group in Washington was tracking what looked like a saucer flight over the Capitol. An airline pilot coming in sighted the saucers and called the field. They gave him a fix from the blips they were getting on radar. The minute traffic control radioed the position of the saucers to the airline pilot, the whole formation he'd been watching, about six pairs of orange and green lights, took off and were out of sight in less than five seconds. You mean the the saucers somehow heard their radio message and understood it? Yes. Exactly so. Well, uh, do they transmit any signals of their own? Well, apparently not. Or at least they haven't sent out anything we can receive. Of course, there's a good chance that those particular saucers were just ranging devices. You mean with no humans inside them? Yes, exactly. Remote control is something like that. But the point made here in the evaluation is that whoever does control them, from however far off, realizes we pick them up on radar. Yes, and and also... Excuse me. Sure. And this is the key to the entire contact apparatus that we are to use. They have given us ample evidence that our radio signals are reaching them. That's how the rendezvous point was chosen. You mean the saucers helped select the site? That is our understanding. But how? Well, we were told that there's a radar team on each of these three jetliners. And as soon as we get out over the Pacific, they're going to give us a demonstration. This team's been selected to participate. A demonstration of what? Well, what Rubikar said a minute ago about whoever it is that controls the saucers. But what is it that the demonstration purports to prove? Simply that they know that we know they're watching us. darken the compartment so that all of you can get a clear view of the radar scope to my left. 
Since we left Washington eight hours ago, we've been in direct touch by radio telephone with four radar monitoring stations around the world. One in Liverpool, one in Marseille, one in New York, one in Moscow. And now will the members of the Orange team go to the bank of telephones along the left wall of the cabin? Yeah, that's us. What are we supposed to do? We'll just get on the wire, I think. You will find that the phones are numbered from one to four. Dr. Parsi, will you pick up phone number one? Say hello and identify yourself, please. Of course. Hello? This is Dr. Jules Passy. What? Je suis Dr. Jules Passy. Qui? À Marseille. Oui, très bien. I am in contact with the station of Marseille. They say they are ready. Very well, Doctor. In a moment, I'll ask you to say to your countrymen, you may begin to transmit the radio signal. During the time of the signal's transmission, which will be amplified over this speaker so that all of us can hear it in the cabin, I would ask everyone to keep his eyes on the radar scope up front here. Are you ready, Doctor? Ready. All right. Tell your man to start transmitting. Hello? Comment se transmettez le signal de radio? Now watch. The radio operator in Marseille will send out ten separate and distinct signals, and he'll stop. A few seconds after he's finished, a series of blips should appear on the radar screen. I want you all to count them. There they are, in the upper right-hand quadrant. Yes, but, but, but what's making the blips? I think you'll find there are two, four, six, nine, yes, ten, ten blips. Exactly the same as the number of radio signals that were sent out by the operator. But what are they? Well, before we tell you that, Doctor... You'll be good enough to inquire of the operator in Marseille if they've picked up any blips on their radar, and if so, how many? Of course. Sur la radar, vous voyez, sont-ils des signals? Combien? Merci. Yes, the same number, ten. Thank you. You can hang up now, doctor. Au revoir, monsieur bien. Oh, Major, would you be good enough to tell us what those blips represent? Well, they're a flight of saucers, one for each blip. Using measurements taken on the scope, we estimate their distance from us to be about 60 miles. Well, what was the operator over in Marseille, see? Another flight of exactly the same size. The Marseille call number is 10. Uh, but the blips that we are seeing now, does that mean that they too are picking up the radio transmission from Marseille? Either that or it's been relayed to them by another saucer flight over that area. Right now, for example, although the Moscow call number is 8... There will be ten blips on the radar scope in Moscow. It's the saucer's way of telling us they know Marseille is the only station now transmitting to them. Well, then they must know that our three jetliners are part of the picture, too. Otherwise, why the blips from just 60 miles away? We expected this. They seem to know everything. Oh, no, it's changing. Hey, look, yeah. on their radar scope, some of the blips are moving There's off. five, six, seven. There's only three left. What do you make of it? Just a minute, please. Hello? Yes, yes, go ahead. Huh? From all four points. Well, hold on a moment. What is it, Major? Each of the four monitoring stations report that the number of blips they're tracking has dropped to three. Same as us. Just a second. No? But well, we're still getting them on our scope. Three, about 60 miles off. All right, we'll let you know if anything happens. What's up? They've dropped off the other four scopes completely. We're the only one picking up any saucer blips at all. Major? Yes, Mr. Cullen? I've got a hunch what it might mean. It's just a guess. Well, let's hear it. Well, you told us earlier that although the saucers had helped to select the rendezvous point using the number code, you still weren't sure they'd show up. That's right. Well, could it be they might want to change it at the last minute to make sure we don't pull a fast one? I suppose it's possible. What's your idea? Well, our party's made up of three jetliners, and they're showing up three blips on this radar scope. That's right. Maybe they're trying to tell us to follow them. The other planes, Bill. One of the radar chaps told me they'd turned back. They're responsible for the disappearance of the two blips. That seems to be what the sources wanted. Uh, I wonder what's next. Major tells me this island was a staging area for Australian troops during the Second World War. Yeah, rather a large one, too. Part of the New Guinea group. You haven't said much, Rubikoff. What do you think they've got up their sleeves? Oh, I don't know. But I don't trust them. <laughs> I've always wondered... 
Whom do you trust? Oh, here we go. We're coming in. Yeah, this is starting to get gray in the east. Almost morning. Look, on the scope. What? The last blip we were following. It's gone. Maybe the sources aren't willing to make a daylight appearance. But it is at their insistence that we are landing here. I guess the only thing to do is to make ourselves comfortable on this island until nightfall. Leave the next move up to them. Oh, Bill. Yes? What time do you have? Oh, a few minutes till midnight. How far do you think we have walked? Oh, perhaps five miles. Colin. Yes? Contact the base again. Obviously, we have lost our bearings. We're still going due north by my compass. Will you be kind enough to contact the base? We should have seen them by now. All right. Well, Rogers, can I have the walkie-talkie? Oh, here you are. Thanks. Orange leader to contact base. Orange leader to contact base. Contact base to orange leader. Go ahead. We've been moving due north for almost three hours now. It doesn't. Haven't seen a thing. What's your position? We're still in the brush. Anything from the two other teams? We called them back to the base. How come? More blip messages from the saucers. Apparently they want to make personal contact with the smallest group available. That's you, fellas. Well, we haven't seen a thing. No lights, nothing. Can you see the Kyobe Ridge from where you are? Yes, it's just a few hundred yards ahead of us. The west end of it's almost a plateau. A saucer could put down there if it wanted to. All right, we'll try it. Good luck. When you get there, give us a call. Major Reeves out. So, the others they sent back. Yes. And we are to be the guinea pigs. I don't believe I have ever felt so helpless in my life. Any special instructions? No, I guess the original ones still stand. No hostility. Do everything possible to convince them of our friendly intentions. Friendly intentions? What's troubling you, Rubikoff? Well, they, they will take that as a sign of weakness. Let us be realistic, Mr. Rubikoff. Our sole hope of survival is that their intentions are friendly. Oh, nonsense. You honestly think that the Soviet Air Force, or any Air Force for that matter, would last ten minutes against the saucers in a shooting war? Yeah, but it might not come to a shooting war if we can scare them off. <laughs> I've got a feeling they won't scare very easily. Well, we should at least try. Gentlemen, the, the, the alternative is, is abject surrender. Why can't you people understand that peaceful relationships don't have anything to do with winning or losing? Why don't you understand that the threat of power... Is the key to peace. All right, Rubikoff, I have it. As soon as they land, you go up to them and say, Boo! <laughs> uh, you laugh. <laughs> we have conquered half of your world while you are laughing. Yes. But you never conquered the laughter. I should think you would have found a lesson in that. Sentimental rubbish. All right, uh, Rubikoff, knock it off, will you? What? This isn't a press conference. We've got work to do. Let's go. Uh, well, this seems to be it. That's about the highest point on the ridge, all right. I can see nothing in the nature of a plateau. Well, Reeves said it was near the west end. He seems to be about the center. Yeah. Let's take a look down that way. A beautiful night, what? Every star is out. There is no sign of aircraft. Well, you can't tell. They might not be running lights. Considering how fast they go, from 50 miles up, they could be down here in seconds. Uh, look down along the ridge on the other side. You see the lagoon? Yes. Quite a drop from here, about 200 feet. But doesn't it look peaceful in the moonlight? I must come around and take some pictures there tomorrow. Let's see how be my wife and I have... Listen. What? I hear it. Can you, can you see anything? No, but it doesn't sound far off. It... Seems to be the plateau just up ahead. But where's the noise coming from? I see it. Coming in over the edge of the cliff. Look, look. Yes. It's a saucer, all right. Perhaps they, they don't know that we are so close. I wouldn't bank on that. It seems to be stopping. Hovering there. Look. Along the edge. 
They've turned on a light. Maybe maybe we're supposed to signal them. They're blinking once, twice, three, four, five. Uh, why don't they land? Well, they probably want to make sure we're here. Let me take your flashlight, Rogers. Yeah. All right. We'll see what this does. One, two, three, four, five. Now they are starting again. One, two, three, four. All right. We'll send that back to them, too. I wonder if they are going to blink some more. No. No, they're going to land. By George, that's what they're doing. Tell me, how large would you judge that ship to be? Well, it's settling perhaps a hundred yards away. I would estimate possibly 30 feet in diameter. Be many, uh, many persons inside of it, then, huh? Uh, not more than three or four, I would imagine. Uh, comfortably, if they are comparable in size to us. Wait a minute. It's come to a stop. It's on the ground. What now? Uh, I don't see any doors or ports or. Well, I guess we just walk up to it with a big smile on our face and hope for the best. No, we don't. Rubikov, no, keep back. I'm warning what you. What have you got there? You will see when it goes off. It goes off. Rubikov, don't be a fool. It's you who are the fools. No, keep back. Why do you suppose these beings, whoever they are, have come here, huh? What, to pay us a visit? Rubikoff, listen to the me. The most probable reason, and you all know it, is that they are from some dying planet like Mars, which can no longer support human life, and they must find a new world to live on. Well, what if they are? At least they're peaceful. They haven't tried to attack us, and they could have. I suppose you would help them? Why not, if it were possible? Oh, that's very easy for you to say. You have more food than you can eat, more clothes than you can wear... What about my country and countries like China? Well, don't blame us for the way you've botched that. What? You killed your people's incentive to improve themselves. That's a lie. Accept it, Rubikov. Slaves won't work any harder than they have to. Ah, you don't understand any of you, but that doesn't matter. Now, get out of my way. You are really going to use that apparatus to destroy the saucer. And myself and all of you, if you don't keep back. You poor fool. No, I tell you, keep away, Fuss. You poor... Or Doctor, look out! Are you pushing him over the passage? Oh my! Oh, terrible! Oh. Just a just a moment ago, Passy was saying he'd come back here tomorrow and take some pictures. Look, Bill, the saucer. No. Yeah, they've turned the lights on again. Do you think they heard the explosion? Well, they must have. Look! The front part of the saucer is sliding open. Maybe they're coming out. If if, if they misinterpreted that explosion... Yeah, I know, they... I know. You couldn't very well blame them if they did. There go the lights again. One, two. Rogers, do you see any sign of life in that opening? No, no. Uh, it's not very brightly lighted either. Do you suppose they want us to come in? I don't... I don't know what else it can mean. Listen, Rogers, I don't think both of us should go. Oh, now, look no, here. No, 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 uh, really. If it's a trap, then we're both wiped out. You think they just might want some sort of sample man to to size us up? No. No, I don't really think they do, but since there's always a chance... You... you've great faith, haven't you, Bill? Well, I... I like to think I do. If these creatures have a heart and a mind, then... Well, then I know who created them, and... That's encouraging. What do you want me to do? Here, you take the walkie-talkie and get in touch with the base. Right now? No, as soon as I start up toward the saucer. And Rogers... Yes? If it seems that... That it's going wrong, don't come running or anything like that. The base should get a full report, and... If you get mixed up in this, they won't. You're the boss. Well, I... I'd better get moving. So long, Roger. Good luck. Orange to contact base. Orange to contact base. Contact base to Orange. Is that you, Cullen? No, it's Rogers. Now listen closely. We're on the plateau. The saucer has landed. It's scarcely a hundred yards from me. Cullen is approaching it alone. He's about halfway there now, flashing his torch as he goes. There are two lights along the leading edge of the saucer, and they've begun to blink again. A few moments ago, a section on the side of the saucer facing me slid open. I can't see the interior very well. It's dimly lighted, and there's no ramp leading up to the entryway. Cullen's going to have to climb up. It's just a foot or so as... Wait a minute. Someone or something has just appeared in the entryway. 
Cullen has seen it too. He stops. He's less than, I should judge, ten yards from the opening. In this light, I can't, I can't possibly be sure, but I, I, I think, I think it's a man. He's standing in the entryway. He, he beckons to Cullen in, in what seems to be at least a, a, a friendly manner. Cullen has started to move forward again. Now he's reached the saucer. He stops, looks up at the being, and he extends what I'm sure is a human arm to assist Cullen through the opening. I, I, I may be a bit premature, Major, but they're both standing there looking one another over in what seems a very civilized fashion, and I think, I think it's going to be all right. <laughs> Not too long ago, my husband took me and the children on a deep-sea fishing trip in one of those chartered fishing boats. It was a real experience for me, even if I didn't catch anything. And you can be sure that the children loved every minute of it. But I remember that one of the highlights of the trip for me was when we had a chance to visit one of those lonely lighthouses that you'll find at various spots along our coasts. You can picture the kind I mean. Well, anyway, this one was like a great white finger set off from the mainland and perched on what I would guess was a rock shoal. The boat that brought us alongside brought newspapers and provision. The lighthouse keeper was, of course, grateful for these, but what really pleased him most was just our little visit. We didn't have much to say, nothing startling or original anyway, but what delighted him was that we were there saying it. Every once in a while now, I remember that lighthouse keeper and... I can't help but think that in that incident was a parallel related to prayer. Our prayers are visits to the great celestial lighthouse keeper who makes his perpetual light to shine down upon us. It doesn't matter much what we say. It's the fact that we are saying it, remembering him for remembering us. Family theater again reminds you, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed UFO, starring John Howard. Gail Storm was your hostess. Others in our cast were Lawrence Dobkin, Vic Perrin... Lou Krugman, and Richard Peel. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the Mutual Network, which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our Family Theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of Family Theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when Family Theater will present Stay Up for the Sunrise, starring Cameron Mitchell. Preston Foster will be your host. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network, This is Mutual, the radio network for all America. W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Oh, I'd like to get my hands on that cup that got me through the shoulder last night. Too bad it was through the shoulder, Mr. Crane. It should have been through your heart. You know, I like you. I like my women with a lot of spirit. I may just take you with me when I make my break from here. You'll have to kill me first. Oh, company. 
come in and keep your hands right on that tray. I'd hate to have to shoot a beautiful girl like you. I brought up some coffee. That's thoughtful of you. Keep your hands in the air and stay away from me. Don't take any chances, Sandra. The Swede would rather shoot you than not. Rogue speaking. That little scene takes me back to a night a couple of months ago. The night I met some scared people in a seaside mansion. In just a minute, I'm going to tell you the story of the House of Fear. But first, here's Jim Doyle. Just talking about a grand product like Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream isn't really enough. We can tell you what a cool, solid comfort shave it gives, but you won't really know what this comfort is until you use Fitch's No Brush. The very instant you spread this rich, smooth cream on your face, you can tell the difference. You see, it contains a special skin conditioner ingredient that immediately lubricates your skin. Even men with super-sensitive skin find that the skin conditioner ingredient keeps their faces from feeling irritated. Then, when you start to shave, you'll find how easily your razor glides along, even against the grain of a tough beard. After you've finished... Your face will feel cool and refreshed, and you'll know what we mean when we say Fitch's No Brush gives a solid comfort shave. You men who prefer a lather cream will like Fitch's Brush Cream. It gives an abundant, dense lather that stays moist all during the shave. It doesn't become dry and make your face feel parched and uncomfortable. Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream come in generous 25 and 50 cent sizes. Try it for real shaving comfort. Thank you, Jim. And now, I'd like to go on with my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. Remember that scene you just heard? Well, one day a couple of months ago, I was in my office playing a bit of gin rummy with Herb Heidi, the bookie from the cigar store in the lobby, when Mr. J. McDonald called from the uh, Great Western Insurance Company. I knew what he wanted. I'd read the morning papers. I hated to leave the game because uh, I was winning for some reason, known only to Herb Heidi who plays cards with all the warm human abandon of an addy machine. But I have learned to love a cash case like a bookie loves a losing horse, and uh, Great Western Insurance is a good client. So I picked up my $2.35 winnings and made tracks for the plush offices of Mr. J. McDonald. Sit down, Mr. Rogue. I have a case I want to discuss with you. Well, thank you. Uh, what's on the fire, Mr. McDonald? I suppose you read of the theft of the Somaliland diamond from the home of James E. Lee? Oh, sure, sure. Last night during a party given by his granddaughter, Sandra Lee. That much I know. The Great Western had that diamond covered, Mr. Rogue. It was insured for $50,000. $50,000. No kidding. Mm, well, that's a lot of money. Must have been some diamond. We're offering $5,000 reward for the recovery of the stone. It's one of the largest in existence. Well, uh, bring me up to date a little, will you? It was a slip crane job, wasn't it? The papers used his name. That's right. Three members of the family identified him from Rogue's Gallery Pictures. There's no doubt that he was the man. He had an accomplice, but we have no line on him at all. And all you want me to do is pinch Crane and get the uh, Somaliland diamond back, right? Yes. Mm. Crane left the Lee mansion in a yellow convertible sedan which the police found wrecked between the Lee estate and Los Angeles. There was blood on the seat, and it's thought that either Crane or his accomplice was wounded. They're believed to be here in the Los Angeles area. Huh? They haven't made any attempt to run the police blockade. Okay, Mr. McDonald, if he's here in this town, I'll have him. Well, that's all the information I have for you, Rogue. I've had our auditor make you out a check for $1,000. Oh? That's your retainer. Oh. And, of course, if you do manage to recover the diamond, there will be another $4,000 due you. Oh, oh, huh? Thanks. And here are your credentials identifying you as our investigator. And now, Mr. Uh, Rogue... Remember, you're... I'm not promising anything. Oh, yes, there is one more thing. The Lee family has been extremely uncooperative today. Extremely so. 
They practically refuse to talk with either the newspapers or the police. Well, how do you figure that? I mean, uh, what do you suppose is their angle? That is what we are paying you to discover, Mr. Rogue. It was about five in the afternoon when I took off the Lee Mansion, which was a show place up the coast about 20 miles. Old Man Lee is, uh, is an eccentric millionaire. His picture is always in the Rodegavir section with his two granddaughters, Sandra and Virginia, who live with him. A heavy fog billowed in about ten minutes before I reached the Lee house and drove, I drove the rest of the way by air. And by the time I pulled up at the house, my windshield was colored like the side of a battleship and was just about as easy to see through. So I parked in the circular driveway and ran up on the huge front porch. Yes? Richard Rogue, uh, I want to see Mr. Lee, please. I'm sorry, Monsieur Lee is not in. Hmm. Well, then I'd like to see Miss Sandra Lee, then. I'm sorry, Miss Sandra is not in. Oh? Huh? Well, I'll just take a look. Oh, no, no, you cannot come in. Oh, you could be wrong, dear. There. Mm-hmm. I'm in. Who is it, Marie? This man is trying to force his way in, Monsieur Lee. Oh, good evening, Mr. Lee. I hope you remember me. Richard Rogue? Oh, the detective. Of course. Thank you very much, Marie. Come into the study, Mr. Rogue. I, uh, hope you don't think I'm a heathen walking in here like this, Mr. Lee. It's my business, you know. I I had to see you. Oh, I suppose so. It's about that darn Somaliland diamond. I tell you, Mr. Rogue, we've just been pestered to death all day long about that robbery. I finally had to tell the police and the newspaper people to go away and let me alone. Well, I, I don't like to be a pest, but... Uh, oh, we have another guest, Sandra, my dear. The detective, Richard Rogue. Mr. Rogue, I'd like you to meet my granddaughter, Sandra Lee. We've met, Grant. And, Mr. Rogue, I'd like to introduce you to John Wood. He's a house guest. I'm very happy to know you, Mr. Wood. Thank you. I suppose you're here to question us about the Somaliland diamond. Well, that's, uh, it's my job, Miss Lee. I suppose it is. Now, now, we Sandra, don't... please. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Grant, stop fidgeting. We're terribly tired of talking about the robbery, Mr. Rogue. We've talked with the police and reporters by the dozens, and... Well, there's just not anything left to say. You must understand, Rogue, that Mr. Lee has been driven to the verge of a breakdown by this affair. Can't you give your information from the police? No, no, I can't. You know, I can see why you're tired of explaining what happened, but I'm in a little different position than the newspaper boys. I represent the insurance company. and They had that diamond covered for $50,000, and naturally they're quite interested in knowing the facts of the case. I assure you, Mr. Rogue that I have no intention of filing a claim against the insurance company. Oh? No intention at all. I just don't want to hear any more about the diamond or the robbery. But, Mr. Lee... Oh, please, Mr. Rogue. It's Graham's own business if he wants to take the loss, isn't it? Well, yes, I suppose it is, but it's a little unusual. And I don't think he should make any such decision under the present circumstances. It's easy to see that you're all upset and jittery, but... uh, And with good reason, really, Mr. Rogue. Mr. Lee has not been well. Couldn't you talk with him tomorrow? No, I'm, uh, I'm sure you won't mind, Mr. Lee, if I have a chair here in front of the fireplace. It's, no. Well, it's a terrible night out. Had a tough drive the last few miles. Fog is awful. Yes, I have noticed that the fog is in a little heavier than usual tonight. It's depressing, isn't it? Fog on top of everything else. Oh, Mr. Rogue, I'm so upset. Maybe you'd better start back to town, Mr. Rogue. It'll be slow going in this fog. What's the matter with you, Miss Lee? You're not the hysterical type. Will you please leave, Mr. Rogue? No. I'm an investigator, and I've got a job to do. I'd be a lousy investigator if I didn't try to get to the bottom of this situation. Who are you protecting? What are you afraid of? Are you accusing us of complicity in the disappearance of that diamond? I don't even know you, Mr. Wood. I'm talking to the Lees. I'm not accusing them of anything. Look, Mr. Lee, crime is my business. I know how to deal with crime and criminals. Why don't you tell me what's on your mind, Mr. Lee? I'm sorry, Mr. Rogue. But as far as I and and my family are concerned... The theft of the Somaliland diamond is a closed matter. I have my reasons now. Please go. Yes, you... You can't do any good staying here. Where's your other granddaughter, Mr. Lee? Where's Virginia? She's returned to her school in the city. Oh, I see. Oh, Grant, please, make now, it Now, now, dear. I'm sure Mr. Rogue will be going. Did you ring, monsieur? Yes, Marie. Will you please show Mr. Rogue to the door? Okay, okay, okay. But uh, if you ever feel like you need any help in whatever it is that's forcing you to act like this, Mr. Lee, call me, will you? I'll be waiting for your call. Yes. Yes, I will. I'm sorry, Mr. Rogue. Good night. Good night. 
Good night, Miss Lee and Mr. Wood. Good night. Good night. This way, monsieur. Monsieur Roque, you are the detective? Yes, that's right. There are strange things going on in this house, Monsieur Roque. There is much trouble. Ah? Yeah. Can you tell me about it, Marie? Oh, well, I... Marie? Uh, yes, Monsieur Wood? Mr. Lee wants to see you in the library. Good night, Mr. Roque. As I got in my car and sneaked down the hill through the fog, I told myself I was wasting my time. That I was looking for a man named Slip Crane, the jewel thief. And that I had no business getting mixed up in the family affairs of the Lees. <clears throat> there was a filling station and general store at the spot where the highway joined the private road that led up to the Lee estate. Sam's filling station for you and your car. I stopped in there for a sandwich and a cup of coffee. Great night to be driving around, mister. Yeah, yeah, it is. Hey, uh, give me a slice of that pumpkin pie, will you? Why, sure. Here you are. Just came down the hill from the Lee house, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, sir, there was plenty of excitement around here last night. Yep, cops all over the place. Newspaper men. Best business have done in years. The whole district is still full of cops. They've thrown up a roadblock in every direction. Hey, you policeman? After a fashion. You working on the case? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That must have been some diamond. Mm. You know, those Lees are nice people. The old man's a little fidgety, but the rest of them are swell people. Well, he's all right, too. Yes, sir, nice guy. You know them? Know them? Why, sure know them. Known them all for years. The kids, Sandra, Virginia, have been eating my hamburgers ever since they was old enough to toddle down here. Yeah? You know what school Virginia goes to up in the city? Why, sure. Same one Sandra used to go to. Hmm. Uh, let me see, uh, Mrs. Whipple School. Oh, well, thanks. Hey, uh, what's the toll charge to call the city? Uh, two bits for the first three minutes. There's a phone booth right over there. Thank you. Yes, sir, those little Lee girls are the salt of the earth. I've known them for ten years, I guess. Knew their daddy well, too. Went to school with him. He's a colonel now, an eagle colonel in Washington. A big shot. Hello, operator. Please get me Briargate 63645 in the city. Mrs. Whipple, school for girls. Hattie Smith on duty. Oh, hello. I, uh, I would like to speak with Virginia Lee, please. Miss Lee? Why, I'm sure she isn't here. She's at her grandfather's home up the coast. Oh, she is? Are you sure? Oh, yes. Uh, just a minute. Miss Lee is home, isn't she? Yes, Miss Lee is not expected back until Monday morning. Thank you. Get your party? Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, give me another cup of coffee, will you, Sam? Why, sure. Oh, uh, tell me, Sam, uh, I know the whole Lee family except Virginia. She's only about 14, isn't she? Jenny? Oh, no. No, she's 19 or 20. Mm. 20, I think. She's a wild one, that youngster. She's all for having fun. Nothing at all like her sister, Sandra. Oh, oh. Well, I guess I'll be on my way. Can't sit here all night. Now, don't envy your drive, none. Better take it easy in that fog. It was all as plain as the nose on an anteater's face now. They told me Virginia was back at her school. She wasn't. Sam told me Virginia was a wild one. I knew Slip Crane. He was a smoothie. So, one and one makes two, and these two were Virginia Lee and Slip Crane. She'd run away with him. That's why the old man didn't want the case followed any further. That's why he was willing to take the loss rather than have the police arrest his daughter with Slip Crane. When they caught him for the theft of the Somaliland diamond. I got in my jalopy and drove back to the Lee estate. I wanted to have a talk with that maid, Marie. I parked at the turn in the driveway and walked through the fog toward the servant's cottage at the rear of the main house. I could see a halo of light back there pointing its fingers through the haze. I headed for it across the lawn. I heard a movement behind me and then... Oh. Oh, I caught my dream train for cloud eight. And who was waiting for me there? 
was my alter enemy, Ugor. <laughs> In trouble again, eh, Rogi? What happened, Midget? <laughs> you got hit on the head. <laughs> As usual. No, who hit me? I didn't see them. <laughs> it's a wonder you've lived so long, Rogi. Dumb as you are. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. It was the Dane that hit me, wasn't it? <laughs> was it? I remember the perfume. I remember getting a sniff of it just as you let me have it. <laughs> That's you, Chief. Sniffing when you should have been ducking. <laughs> oh, oh, my head. Oh, you'd think I'd get used to this, but I, I don't, do I? <laughs> you know, Rogie, you haven't time to talk with me tonight. Get back downstairs. <laughs> oh, just let me rest a while, will you? Oh, can't. Over the side with you. Please, don't push me, please. I'm tired. Over you go. Come on. You got some trouble to straighten up down there. Over you go. Over the side. Look out. Look out. Oh, here I go again. I began to come to... I could hear voices fading in and out. I couldn't focus my mind's eye on them, but I listened without quite knowing what it was all about. Oh, oh, Miss Rogue. Please, please, wake up. Sandra, don't move. I see you and I have you covered. All right. I'm not moving, Mr. Wood. What are you doing? Who's that lying there? It's Richard Rogue, the detective. Oh, Rogue, huh? What happened to him? I, I knocked him out with his poker. I thought it was you. You followed me when I left the house, huh? Yes. I was going to try to kill you. Really? How interesting. Instead of that, you fixed it, so I'll have to kill Richard Rogue. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you that one of Hollywood's foremost hairstylists remarked recently that most women do not shampoo their hair often enough. She pointed out that movie stars' hair is frequently shampooed every day because they know that beautiful hair must be kept sparkling clean at all times. Now, you're probably thinking, isn't it hard on hair to wash it so often? Doesn't it become dry and difficult to manage? The answer is no, not if you use Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo. Thousands of women in the United States and Canada have found they can wash their hair as often as they like with this shampoo, and their hair is always soft lustrous and easy to set. Fitch's saponified shampoo does not dry the hair because it's made from mild coconut and vegetable oils. These pure natural oils are kind to your hair. It makes swirls of rich, fragrant lather that rinses out completely, for Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent. Just rinse with plain water, and the rinsing agent goes to work to remove all remaining particles from your hair leaving it soft and full of natural highlights. You can get a generous six-ounce bottle of Fitch's saponified shampoo for 50 cents and the economical 16-ounce size for one dollar. Use it often to keep your hair shining and lovely. Now back to Rogue's Gallery. Richard Rogue is telling our story. I was telling you about the time the Somaliland diamond was stolen from the home of wealthy old gem collector James E. Lee. The insurance company put me on the case, and I went out to Lee's secluded country mansion, but uh, got no place. He wouldn't even talk to me about the robbery. I left, uh, picked up a few more clues, and returned. I was walking across the lawn in a pea soup fog when I was knocked unconscious by Sandra Lee, the old man's granddaughter. And when I returned to consciousness, I I played possum and listened to the conversation between Sandra and uh, John Wood, a mysterious house guest of the Lees. So you followed me when I left the house, huh? Yes. I was going to try to kill you. Instead of that, you fixed it so I have to kill Rogue. Do you think that would be smart? He doesn't know anything. No? Come on, help me carry him into the house. There's a certain permanence about being killed that made me act deader than a ghost town on Monday night. 
I was as limp as a wet sock when they picked me up and carried me into the house. Wood, uh, who was a very strange house guest, lifted the rod out of my shoulder holster before they laid me out on the divan in the study. Old Mr. Lee was very upset when he saw me. He, he immediately started patting my hands while Wood poured some very good brandy down my throat. I was in no hurry to face facts, but eventually I figured that one more sip of brandy would be overdoing it, so I snapped out of it. He's coming out of it. Oh, mm, oh what happened to me? Oh, my head. Oh, dear, I knew something like this would happen. I hit you. I didn't know who you were. You should know better than to be caught prowling around the lawn up here after what happened last night. Yeah, yeah, I suppose you're right. Uh, what did you hit me with? A poker. Oh, Sandra. I don't know what your father would say. What were you doing on the lawn at this time of night, Rogue? You're lucky you didn't get shot, you know that? Yeah, yeah, I suppose I am. Oh, well, I, I didn't think of that. Uh, could I have another drink of that brandy? It makes me forget my headache. Of course, Mr. Rogue. Oh. Here you are. Uh, thanks, yeah. <sighs> yeah. <clears throat> oh, that's uh, strong. And You know, Mr. Lee, I, I came back to tell you uh, I've got the deal figured. What do you mean? I mean, well, Mr. Lee, you told me that your other granddaughter, Virginia, had gone, gone back to her school. Yes. I called Mrs. Whipple's school and found out she wasn't due back until Monday. Yes? Oh, you called the school. She wasn't there. That's right. So right away, I knew why you were so anxious to get me to drop the case today. You've got it all figured out, haven't you, Rogue? Sure. I'm right, aren't I? Virginia, your granddaughter eloped with a thief. That's right, isn't it, Mr. Lee? I uh, guess we might as well admit it to you, Rogue. Nothing else we can do. Is there, Mr. Lee? No, I, I guess not. Now, that's not for publication, you know, Rogue. We'll make it worth your while to forget it. Won't we, Mr. Lee? Why, of course. If you say so, Mr. Wood, I it, mean... Uh, it'll cost you. Uh, I'm not in business for my health. For a thousand bucks, I forget what I know. That will be satisfactory. <laughs> You're something of a louse, aren't you, Rogue? <laughs> something. You can call me a louse if you'll give me that grand. You got that much in the house, Mr. Lee? I believe I have, in the safe. You want me to get it for you, Gramps? We might as well get Mr. Rogue paid off and out of here. No, that's the kind of talk I like to hear. Yes, Sandra. Will you get it for me, dear? So that's what you came back for. The shakedown. <laughs> you private dicks are all alike. For the first time since I'd been carried into the house, Wood was loosening up. My attempt at a shakedown had sold him on the fact that I was just a chiseler, and I could see the hand he had on that gun in his coat pocket relax a little. That brandy had given me a transfusion, and I was feeling all of my faculties falling back into place. I was tense as the E string on a Heifetz fiddle, and just as ready to play when I saw Sandra sneak in the door and grab up that poker she'd used so effectively on me. I figured it was my move. So I started to get up. I wanted to get Wood concentrating on me. Oh, you know, uh, you know, I have, uh, I think I've got a concussion. My, my head is spinning like a top. Look, uh, is this skin broken, Wood? I don't know and I don't care. Well, you can look, can't you? Come here. Better take it easy, Rogue. You're in no shape to make any sudden moves. No, I, I just want to see if I can sit up. That's all now. Look out! Take it, Sandra! I've got his gun arm. Let go of that! Ooh. Oh, nice work, Sandra. Get his gun? Sure. He's got one of mine, too, that I want back. Sandra, how could you dare with Virginia? I had to do it, Graham. Give me a belt, will you, Mr. Lee? I want to use it to tie up this character's legs. He's one of the men who stole my diamond. He was with that crane man. They worked together. Here, I, I'm, a, I'm still a little confused. Sandra. Yes? Give me a handkerchief, will you? I want to gag our friend. Incidentally... I was conscious when you explained to him that you knocked me silly by mistake. Please, we must get to Virginia. Poor Virginia. We will, Gramps, we will. Just leave it to us. Where is Virginia? She's upstairs, with Crane holding five this morning. What? Well, here, here. Fill it in a little. What happened? These men came back here last I'll night, Miss... Uh, you mean Crane and Wood robbed you and then came back here and hid up after they wrecked their car and couldn't get through the police blockade? Yes. Crane was wounded. They waited until the police were gone about five this morning, then they came in. Hmm. They kidnapped Virginia and held her in a room. Crane stayed with her and Wood made us introduce him to the police and newspaper man all morning. Okay. House guest. Okay, okay. Now, this guy's all taken care of. Let's go get Crane. Where is he? He's in one of the front suites, upstairs. In a room that has windows out onto the porch? Yes. Um, the first window at this end of the porch. All right, now listen. In exactly five minutes, 
You knock on the door to that room, right? This sounds dangerous. I shinnied up the pillar at the far end of the porch, looked my rod over to see that it was in good working order, and then I inched over to the window of the room where Crane was holding Virginia. Virginia was tied in a chair. Crane was babying a bloody shoulder. I could hear them talking. Oh, I'd like to get my hands on that cop that got me in the shoulder last night. Too bad it was through the shoulder, Mr. Crane. It should have been through your heart. You know, I like you. I like my women with a lot of spirit. I may just take you with me when I make my break from here. You'll have to kill me first. Oh, company. Come in and keep your hands right on that tray. I'd hate to have to shoot a beautiful girl like you. I brought up some coffee. That's thoughtful of you. Keep your hands in the air and stay away from me. Don't take any chances, Sandra. This thing would rather shoot you than not. Drop that gun, Crane. My next shot goes right through your back collar button. Well, he dropped it. And that's about the end of the story, except that I took the uh, Somaliland diamond from him and won the five grand reward, which I, uh, which I spent on Sandra Lee during the next few months. I thought some of asking her to marry me. And believe me, I, I think she was all in the mood to give her the nod. No, no, really, really. But I thought better of it and stayed single, making me one of those select eligible young men who has never made the same mistake once. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Did you uh, miss the murder in tonight's story, or do you think we can get along without one once in a while? Ray Buffum wrote tonight's yarn. Leith Stevens composed, composed and conducted the music, and D. Engelbach produced and directed don't forget to tune in again next Thursday night. We're going to present an exciting story about a horse, a jockey, and a murder. We call it Last Race. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening, and good night, all. Now, here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time. Uh, oh, and by the way, be sure to see Dick Powell in his newest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. And as I was saying, don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station... When you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug and toilet goods counter, barber, or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Checks, rice checks, and good hot Ralston present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Ori, commander in chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed adventure, Buzz and Happy are exploring a deserted city on the planet Saturn. As they enter a room filled with precious gems, a stealthy figure slinks to the door and aims a ray gun at them. Look out, Commander. He's got a ray gun. He's firing. Quick, Cap, run down that passage. Keep going, Happy. He's right behind us. It's dark in here. He won't be able to see us. Uh-oh. Commander, it's a dead-end passage. We're trapped. 
We'll be back in just a moment with today's Space Patrol story, The Forgotten City. It's the serial of the future, the real space serial. The serial that's different from any other serial in the universe. The serial you see on Commander Corey's own breakfast table. Delicious Rice Chex. The cereal with a flavor like no other flavor in all the universe. Delicious Rice Chex. Crisp shredded rice spun in that modern bite-sized design for easy eating. Delicious Rice Chex. A real space cereal. Gang, those bite-sized biscuits have space inside so they can fill up with milk or cream. Try Rice Chex today. The only bite-sized rice cereal in the universe. Rice Chex. The only official Space Patrol rice cereal, Rice Chex. The super cereal that helps to supercharge you. Rice Chex. At your grocer's in the brand new red and white checkerboard package. With Buzz Corey or Cadet Happy on the outside and the magic space picture on the inside. Rice Chex. Rice Chex. Rice Chex. Rice Chex. Rice Chex. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, The Forgotten City. Buzz and Happy are flying low over the Sender Mountains on the planet Saturn, searching for a trace of a meteorology specialist, believed to have crashed in his atmosphere ship in the rugged region. So far, their spacephone receiver has failed to pick up a signal from the automatic transmitter carried by the scientist, Byron Stearns. Professor Stern's transmitter must have finally conked out, Commander. According to Space Control, Saturn, we're very close to the point from which the signal came. Now watch a view scope, Hap. We may be able to spot the wreckage. It must have been a pretty good crash to knock out that automatic transmitter. Well, let's hope Stern's had time to get a spacesuit. The ship's hull was smashed. He couldn't survive very long in this part of Saturn. Well, what was it he was trying to tell Space Control just before the emergency transmitter cut on? Well, there was a lot of interference, Happy. Almost like a jamming signal, according to Space Control. The operator thought Stearns was telling him about sighting another atmosphere ship making close passes at him. Stunting or on a lab ship? Uh, if we can prove stunting was responsible for whatever happened to Professor Stearns, some pilot will be grounded permanently. Now, if he saw Professor Stearns was in trouble, he probably got away from this area as fast as he could. We may not be able to trail him. Uh, we'll see. If that was the case, the pilot was further negligent in not notifying space control that the lab ship was in trouble. He'll just keep searching. The last signal from the professor's emergency transmitter tells us that his ship was grounded. I hope he didn't end up in one of those narrow ravines. Well, there's a chance he might have landed on the other side of the mountain range. We'll round that peak and circle back. Commander, am I having hallucinations? What do you mean? Well, I was sure we were 100 DUs from the nearest city, but isn't that an atmosphere shell way up there on that mountain? Well, it certainly is. And it's no hallucination. That's the Dome of Rubeck. Rubeck? Yes, Rubeck, the forgotten city of Saturn. Well, what's it doing out there in the Sindar range? It was built centuries ago by one of Saturn's first space pioneers, a man named Lucian Rubeck. It's the last remaining privately owned city in the solar system. It doesn't look very big by modern standards. Still, it's pretty impressive, stuck way up there in the mountains. It's been deserted for nearly a hundred years, Happy. Lucian Rubeck's descendants lived there for several generations, and they gradually drifted away to the largest cities on the planet. The forgotten city. I'd like to visit it sometime. It's pretty interesting. I understand it may be reopened by the government as a museum or put to some other use. That is, if none of the surviving Rubeck family object. Well, why should they object? They, they are using the place. Technically, it's still their property. The government's legal staff has been trying to locate the Rubeck heirs, if any are still alive. Space Control Saturn calling Commander Corey aboard Terra 5. Space Control Saturn calling Commander Corey. Corey here, go ahead. A commander of a space patrol ship has located uh, Professor Stearns. Is he all right? Oh, yes, sir. He was wearing a space suit and wandering around in the Vulcan range. Dazed and shaken. The Vulcan range? That's a hundred DUs from the Sendar region. Uh, yes, sir. The automatic transmitter could have been out of adjustment. I'm glad he's been found. Did he say how he crashed? He wasn't able to give much information, Commander. And we haven't found the wreckage of his ship. Where is he now? He's being brought to Saturn City Hospital. He's under the care of a space surgeon in the patrol ship. Withdraw all patrols except a squadron in the Vulcan range. And proceed with the search till Stern's ship is found. Yes, Commander. Hurry out. Well, that's rather strange, isn't it, sir? About Stern showing up in the Vulcan range? Yes, sir. Well, he was probably confused about his exact location. The important thing is he's safe. Yeah, and very lucky. His best bet would have been to stay with the wrecked ship instead of wandering through the mountains. We'll give Stern's a chance to recover from his ordeal before we question him. In the meantime, are you still curious about the forgotten city? Yes, sir. Then get out our spacesuits. We'll land outside the dome and do a little investigating. Here's the lock control 
old switch. Hey, that doesn't look so ancient. Cinderium. Just as shiny as if it had been installed yesterday. I hope the power's still on. We'll know in a minute. I'll open the switch housing. Let's see. Where's the inside control? Oh, here we are. Well, so far, so good. Now, let's try the inner lock and go into Rubex City. Once you get inside the dome, this city really looks big. A hundred years ago, Rubex City was one of the most important settlements on Saturn, Happy. Yeah, and now it's completely deserted. Hap, check your atmosphere indicator. Yes, sir. Say, that's funny. According to the indicator, the city's air is fit to breathe after a hundred years. And then we can open the faceplates of our helmets. <sighs> See, the air is really fresh. How do you account for that, Commander? Well, there are two explanations. The dome is so well constructed that none of the poisonous Saturn air has leaked in, or else the atmosphere washing plant is still in operation. After a hundred years? Well, it wouldn't have to work very often. Everything inside the city shell to use up the air. Yeah, that's right. Smoking rockets, this is some city. Look at that tower up there. Oh, Rubeck Tower. Lucian Rubeck designed it himself. He had his headquarters on the top floor. And now Rubeck is a ghost city. Completely deserted. Yeah. Makes you realize how impermanent human beings are. Uh-oh. What is it, sir? W what'd you find? A small bottle lying on the sidewalk. Oh. Probably thrown there by one of the last people to leave Rubeck. It's a medicine bottle. Space sickness formula CH-12. And whoever threw it there hasn't been troubled with space sickness for a hundred years. I'm not so sure. This is a new formula, Happy. Hasn't been on the market more than six months. What? Keep your eyes open, Hap. Evidently, Rubeck City isn't as deserted as we thought. Come in. Orlana. There are visitors in the city. I know, Shefka. I've been watching them from the tower room. They're space patrolmen. What are they doing here? we got to get rid of them. Don't get excited, Shefka. By their casual attitude, they must think the city's deserted. But no one ever comes here. They must know something. If they suspected what we're using the city for, they'd have brought more men with them. Let them snoop around. It isn't likely they'll come up here. But suppose Graken comes back while they're here. I've contacted Graken by space phone. He'll keep away from the city until the space patrolmen leave. Did he get rid of the lab ship pilot? Yes. Turn him loose in the Vulcan Mountains. Pilot's already been picked up. Suppose he tells them he was shut down near Rubak. Oh, he's in a very dazed, confused condition. Graken saw to that. Space patrol will assume the pilot was mistaken. Besides, you removed all trace of the wreckage of his ship. Yes, and I destroyed the automatic transmitter. Then there's nothing to worry about. But Orlana, the space patrol men in the city... I know why they're here. The government's getting ready to take over Rubeck. We'll have to leave before they find the stolen jewels and space credits we hidden here. They won't search the city when they find out I'm the great-great-granddaughter of Lucian Rubeck. What? You are a descendant of Lucian Rubeck? No, of course not. But I can convince the government I am. I'm having special documents forged in Saturn City right now. I'll be able to convince the most skeptical attorney that I'm really the only living legal heir to Rubeck City. Mm, I hope so. But I still don't like the idea of those space patrolmen snooping around. Let them snoop. And don't interfere, understand? Hey, this is some building, Commander. Yes, Happy. Rubeck spent a fortune on this one building alone. Here's the elevator, sir. Shall we go up to the tower? We could get a real good look at the city from there. Just a minute, Happy. Look at the carvings on this door. I'll bet anything Lucian Rubeck had this imported from the planet Earth. Mm-hmm. The looks of it, the door was taken from an ancient oriental temple. From a deserted city on Earth to a deserted city on Saturn. Mm -hmm. It's a massive handle. You don't see metal work of this kind anymore, Happy. I wonder where this door leads. Commander... There's a light on in there. Mm, flashed on automatically when I opened the door. Let's have a look. We'll go up to the tower later. Yes, sir. Say, this must have been Lucian Rubeck's treasure room. It's amazing. Look at those gold and silver goblets and old-fashioned candlesticks. And look, an ancient platinum electric lampstand. I thought Rubeck's descendants had cleaned out everything of value from the city, but apparently I was wrong. 
Imagine all this stuff sitting here for hundreds of years and and with no lock on the door. Well, what a minute, Happy. This object isn't a hundred years old. Why, it's a model spaceship, studded with jewels. Yes, yeah, and a very recent model, too. Look at it. Diamonds and rubies. Happy, listen. I heard a sound at the door. Uh-oh. Somebody's out there. Look out, Commander. There's a man with a ray gun. Hold your fire. We're space patrolmen. That's why I am shooting. Quick, Happy, down this passage. Quick. You aren't going to escape that way. Keep going, Happy. He's right behind us. Yes, sir. Stock in here. He won't be able to see us. Well, Commander, it's a dead-end passage. We're trapped. That's right. You're trapped. And I'm going to wait right here and pick you off. One at a time. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. Hi, gang. Captain Dick Tufeld speaking from the planet Earth. Doing a man on the street broadcast this morning. Going to see what some of these kids here on Earth think about the three official Space Patrol breakfast cereals. Now, here's a sharp-looking lad. Say there, what'd you say the very first time you tried bite-sized wheat checks? I said, mmm. <laughs> and here's another fine-looking chap. Son, what did you say the very first time you tried bite-sized rice checks? I said, and here's still another youngster. Tell me, what's your opinion of Instant Ralston, the hot super cereal made of rich whole wheat? Man, oh man, oh man, oh man. Try them yourself, gang. You'll say the very same thing. Mm-hmm. Man, oh man, oh man. Yes, get them today, boys and girls. Rice checks, wheat checks, good hot Ralston. And remember, checks now have a brand new package with Buzz Courier, Cadet Happy on the outside, and the magic space picture on the inside. And now, back to Space Patrol and the adventure of a forgotten city. Buzz and Happy were searching for an atmosphere ship crashed in the cinder mountains of Saturn near the deserted city of Rubeck. After learning from Space Control that the missing pilot has been found a hundred DUs away, Buzz and Happy decided to visit the deserted city. They entered the atmosphere shell without any trouble, but unknown to the space patrolman, Rubeck is being used by a woman named Orlana as a hideout for stolen jewels. While Buzz and Happy were examining a treasure room in the base of a tower, they were fired upon by Orlana's henchman, Shefka. Now Shefka has them cornered in a darkened passage and is waiting to shoot them with his ray gun. Happy. Yes, sir. He can't see us. Lie down flat on the floor and make a scuffling noise with your boots. When he fires at the place he thinks you are, I'll rush him. Yes, sir. Don't try to sneak up on me. I can hear every move you make. I warned you. I'll take that ray gun. Have you got him, sir? No, stay down, Happy. He broke loose after him, Happy. Yes, sir. There he goes through that door. He's locked that door on us. We're in a spot. It's opening, sir. After him, quickly. He's in the elevator, Commander. Come out of there. Oh, he's going up to the tower. He'll take the stairs. Come on, Happy. Shefka, you fool. You blundering fool. But they were in the treasure room. Had the base of the tower. What if they were? I could have explained everything that's there. I'm going to have a difficult time now after your idiotic interference. I'm sorry, Orlana. I only did what I thought was best. Attacking space patrolmen. They'd never have known anyone was in the city if you'd obeyed my orders. What are we going to do now? I'll have to face them and make an explanation. They're probably searching the tower now. If you get me another gun, I could still fight them off. No. Get in the next room and contact Graken. Tell him to come in whether the space patrol ship's outside the shell or not. I thought that... You've done all the thinking you're going to do. From now on, just do what I tell you. If I can explain our presence here, I can explain Graken. If the space patrol's skeptical... Oh, Graken's a good man to have around. Yes. Uh, Graken can handle them. If you keep your mouth shut, we won't need Graken. Now go on, make that space phone call. Yes, Orlana. I'll go out and look for our visit. This is the top floor of the tower, sir. Yeah. Now be careful, Happy. We'll search every room. I'll wait till I get my hands on that character. Shap, hold it. Huh? There's someone on the other side of that door. Oh, there you are. I was hoping I'd find you. We're looking for someone, too. Oh, you mean Shefka, my assistant. He told me what happened. I'm terribly sorry. Where is he? I want to talk to him. Well, please step in here. He'll be right out. Thanks. Come on, Happy. Yes, sir. I'm Commander Corey of the Space Patrol. And I'm Orlana Rubek. Rubek? 
Then you're related to the Lucian Rubeck who built this city. Yes, that's right. He was my great-great-grandfather. I was under the impression that the city was deserted. Well, I came here a few months ago with a couple of servants. Shefka, the, the man who fired at you, has been with the family for years. Does he always treat visitors so cordially? Oh, really, I'm awfully sorry about that. Shefka has a great sense of loyalty. He thinks his chief duty is to protect me. So why do you live here in this deserted city? Well, I'm not surprised that you're curious... But the explanation's very simple. I'm writing a book about my family. And you like to work in the solitude, huh? Yes, it's a great inspiration to work right here in Rubeck City, where so much of Saturn's history was made. And, two, there are many ancient records and family documents right at hand. I see. I suppose that you can prove that you're a member of the Rubeck family. Oh, naturally. I can refer you to some influential people in Saturn City. Fine. Now, would you bring your servant out here, please? Well, yes. I'll be only a moment. Well, sir, what do you think? I don't know. I guess writing a book is as good an explanation for being here as any. As a matter of fact, a book about the Rubex would no doubt be very popular, but we'll see. Hey, Commander, look at this plastic folder. It was on the desk. Let me see. Looks like a official identification folder. Happy, this is Byron Stern's ID folder. What? The lab ship pilot? Yes. He was found in the Vulcan Mountains. His identification folder is here in Rubex City. Wow. How could his... She's coming back. Act as though nothing happened. Oh, here he is, Commander. This is Shefka. Hey, Commander Corey, please accept my apology. I was greatly in the wrong. I acted from a mistaken sense of duty. If you thought we were intruders, there'd be some excuse. But have you forgotten that you seemed to accept the fact that we were space patrolmen at the time? Well, I... I acted on impulse, Commander. Again, I am sorry. All right, Shefka. Uh, Miss Rubeck. Yes, Commander. I was just telling Cadet Happy that a book on the Rubeck family ought to be very popular. Well, I hope so, Commander. I'd like to look over the first few chapters of your manuscript. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm merely in the note-gathering stage right now. There's really nothing down in manuscript form that anyone could read but myself. I see. Then would you show me around the tower? I imagine you must have a lot of family curios. Well, uh, is this an official search, Commander? No, I don't have a warrant, but if you object to an informal tour... Oh, no, no, not at all. Uh, Chef can I be delighted to show you around. Judging by a few items, Happy and I saw down below, this ought to be very interesting. Well, I think you've seen just about every room in the tower, Commander. How about that room over there? Oh, that's just a closet for uh, cleaning supplies. Would you mind opening it? Well, really, Commander, I... Or I, uh, I could come back with a warrant and a squad of patrolmen. Very well, if you insist. But there's really nothing in there. Unlock it, Shefka. But Orlana... Open it, Shefka. All right. Wow. Well, some real old family heirlooms. Stacks of space credits. And brand new... All that money in a closet for cleaning supplies? I suppose it is rather odd. But then here in this deserted city, one place is as good as another. I'd like to ask you something, Miss Rubeck. How do you happen to have an identification holder belonging to a space patrol scientist named Byron Stearns? Byron Stearns? Uh, I don't understand. Stearns was reported in trouble in this area, then was rescued in the Vulcan Mountain region. I'm waiting for an explanation, Miss Rubeck. Break and get some. Yes, Olana. Look out, Commander. <coughs> that takes care of the big one. Now for you, my smaller uh, friend. Take your big mitt off me. Quit struggling or I'll break your arm. Ow! That's better. I'll help uh, you, Graken. Get away, Shapka. I can handle them. You got here just in time, Graken. What are they doing here? They just wandered in. But they know about that lab ship pilot. They found his identification folder. Then we'd better take care of them for good. I don't want any slip-ups this time, Graken. You better let me take care of it. He fumbled the last one. Don't listen to him, Arana. I can fix them. Hold still, Cadet. Ow! Oh! My shoulder! You'd better oh. hold still. Graken's capable of breaking you in two. Yeah. And Chef got two if he doesn't keep his mouth shut. That's enough of that, Graken. I need both of you. You see, you big Venus buffalo. Chef got Stop break... that bickering! Watch those two space patrolmen. It's Graken's fault we're in this mess. He left the lab ship's pilot's folder in your office. That's enough of that, Shafka. If it hadn't been for your stupid behavior, these men would never have known we were here. Well, what did he do, Arlana? Doesn't matter. Just hold on to that cadet. Hold still, cadet, or I'll fix you like I did the other fellow. The other fellow is Commander Corey. 
the commander-in-chief of the Space Patrol. Oh? <laughs> oh, what do you think of that? I have knocked out the great Commander Corey. <laughs> That's just fine, Graken. Uh, but I've got more work for you to do. Oh, uh, yes. You and Schaefer could get rid of the commander's ship. Schaefer could take the ship far away from here and hide it securely. Mm. Graken, you'll take my ship and bring Schaefer back. Mm. Very well. But first, we've got to dispose of Corey and the cadet. I don't want any trace of them in case Rubeck City is searched by the Space Patrol. There's a room in the sub-basement of the tower. Seal them in there, Graken. The room behind the stairs. Yes. And make sure you seal the door up completely. I don't want anyone to suspect that there's even a room there. You leave it to me, Orlana. Shefka, you help Graken take these two down to the sub-basement. Yes, Orlana. All right, go ahead, Graken. Orlana, what did Shefka do while I was gone? To, to bring the space patrolman here, huh? You just follow my orders, Graken. And Shefka, don't stand there with that smug look on your face. Both of you report to me when you're ready to hide the commander. 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 Uh, yes, Happy. We've got to do something quick. Where are we? In a room in the sub-basement of the tower. Orlana has one of her men sealing us up in here. Then they're going to get rid of our spaceship so nobody will come looking for it. That, that big bruiser is out there. See, you can see him through the window. Is there anything in this room we can use as a weapon? No, sir, I checked. All there is, there's well, some old books and filing cases... There's Graken grinning in here at us. He's getting ready to seal over the window. He's a monster of a man. He certainly is. He carried me down here under one arm. What are we going to do, sir? Well, if we only get him to open the door for a moment. But whatever we do, we've got to do it quickly. I don't see what we can do, sir. The door's locked and practically sealed. And and when Graken and Shefka get rid of Terra 5, nobody will ever even come down here looking for us. Where is Shefka? Up on the surface level, I think, waiting for Graken. I don't think those two like each other. They both seem to go out of their way to make the other look stupid in front of Orlana. Well, they do, huh? Yeah, Graken kept asking questions about what went on while he was away. I got the impression he wasn't very smart, but he's awfully inquisitive. And suspicious, perhaps. You'll see how curious he really is. Let's go to work in those books and filing cabinets, Happy. Huh? You take the files, act as though you've found something about Greg and point at him. Pretend we've found some information about him. Oh, I get it. As though Orlana had a secret file on her henchman here at Rubeck. That's the idea. If we can arouse Graken's curiosity, we might have a chance to get out of here. Is he watching us, Happy? He sure is. He stopped cementing up the door and he's gawking in through the window. Point at him again and laugh. As though we had a great joke on him. It doesn't matter what you say. Point at the files, too. Yes, sir. <laughs> hey, what a dope this Graken is. You know, he's just about dumb enough to tear down that concrete and, and open the door and find out what we're doing in here. Keep it up, Happy. We've got him going. Yeah. Hey, look at that big, dumb face. He's just aching to know what we found in here in the files, Commander. <laughs> Commander, I think he's going to open the door. All right. Ignore him for a moment. Act very interested in the files. Here he comes. Hey, what have you got in there? Nothing. Oh, don't try to fool me. I've been watching you through the door. What does it say about me and Files? Why would there be anything about you in here, Graken? There's something in there. I know it. Some lies Shefka told Alana. Oh, sure. That's it. Shefka's up there now laughing at me. He figures he's tricked me into sealing up evidence against myself right where he can get his hands on him when he needs it. Graken, there's nothing in these files about you. Get out of the way. You can't fool Corey. Well, I guess that's right. Corey, you can't. Uh, got him, Commander? Uh, uh, oh! Uh, right, hold me, will you? Now, Corey. No, now, you, Graken. <laughs> Happy. Yes, sir. Hey, Commander, you're not breaking cold. Yeah. Let's get out of here before he comes to. Shefka, hasn't Graken finished sealing up that room yet? No, Orlana. But I could have done it in half the time. That clumsy oaf. We've got to get Corey's ship away from Rubeck City right away. While Graken and I are gone... You might hide the stolen money and jewels just in case the space patrol squad comes here. It's a good idea. We won't take any chances. Go down to the sub-basement and see what's taking Graken so long. I'm afraid that Graken got a little too curious, Alana. Corey! Shifka, do something! Come back here, Shifka boy! Get him, Happy. Uh, let go of me! Come on, Shifka. I've got him, Commander. Uh, take Shifka's ray gun. Go down and bring Graken up here. Yes, sir. Oh, Commander, while I'm down there, shall I, uh, shall I bring up some of those files? What for? Well, sir, I just thought that uh, Orlana might really decide to write a book about Rubeck, because, uh, well, after all, now she's going to have plenty of time on her hands. Ah! <laughs> a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure follows in just a moment. 
It's a fire, a four-alarm blaze on Terra. But hey, what's the matter with that atomic fire control jet car? Oh, too bad. It's trying to get along on ordinary fuel. But wait, that fire control officer's filling the tank up with super fuel. Wow! Listen to that fire control jet car go now. It's supercharged, that's what. Supercharged with super fuel. Yes, sir, boys and girls, to really get going, the answer is super fuel. That's why Buzz Corey eats a good breakfast with the super cereals that help to supercharge you. Rice Chex and Wheat Chex. Ah, there's a couple of really swell-tasting cereals. And both of them have that modern, bite-sized design for easy eating. So, gang, get a quick start in the morning like Buzz Corey does. Eat a good breakfast with a checkerboard super cereal and get supercharged. Get them today. Rice Chex. And Wheat checks in the grand new packages with Buzz Courier Cadet Happy on the outside and the magic space picture on the inside. And now, an exciting action preview of next week's Space Troll Adventure. Buzz and Happy are searching for a saboteur in the vat room of a plastics factory on Jupiter. Cautiously, they duck under pipes of hot gas feeding into the vats. All right, Happy. Keep your ray gun ready. Yes, sir. Ow! Drover was right about these pipes being hot. Right, careful. I'll be behind this one. Let's try number two. Wow! What was that? One of the pipes has exploded. Blew a valve, probably. Smoking rockets feel that heat. I... I... <coughs> Hat... Hat... Come on. we got to get out of here. <coughs> my... my throat, I can't breathe. It's the gas in the broken pipe. That gas is poison. Be sure to be with us next Saturday for the exciting story, The Vanishing Lake, when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again bring you Space Patrol! Special bulletin for boys and girls in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and Knoxville, Tennessee. Buzz Corey's own space battle cruiser, the Ralston Rocket, will be in your area next week. Don't miss it. The Ralston Rocket. Space Patrol, an original Mike Moser production starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston and directed by Larry Robertson. Other players were Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, Virginia Hewitt, and Stephen Robertson. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Wheat Checks, Rice Checks, and Good Hot Ralston again present the new exciting Space Patrol. Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. Space Patrol comes to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Instant Ralston and regular Ralston. The hot whole wheat cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of Space Patrol! In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, Buzz and Happy are in the refrigeration control compartment of their spaceship on a flight to Venus. The air is rapidly leaking from their ship, and then they discover a giant worm clinging to the wall of the ship. Take this bar and knock it loose, Happy. Yes, sir. It won't come loose. It's as hard as metal. You're right. That's what it eats. It's feeding on the endurium bulkhead. That's how the air is escaping. Smoking rockets, Commander. It's eating clear through the hull. We'll suffocate. We'll return in just a moment with today's exciting Space Patrol adventure, The Iron Eaters of Planet X. Space Patrollers, have you entered the sensational Name the Planet contest yet? Well, you better hurry. Time's going fast, and you don't want to be left out. So hurry up and go with Mom or Dad to your Weatherbird shoe store for your free coin album and contest entry blank. Right, the Weatherbird Shoe Man will give you a swell coin album with three super-colored space coins inside, plus the entry blank on which you write your name for Planet X. Yes, you just named that tremendous new planet 5,000 times bigger than Earth. 
and your name for Planet X can win you the giant rocket clubhouse on wheels or one of the 1,750 other big prizes. Now, just imagine, gang, a 35-foot-long, 10,000-pound rocket clubhouse on wheels with a big, honest-to-goodness motor truck to pull it. And inside the rocket clubhouse are built-in bunks, lockers, electric lights, cooking equipment, all sorts of things for real space patrol living for you and your pals. And don't forget, the space patroller who wins the rocket clubhouse will also win the big motor truck and $1,500 cash. But don't wait, gang. Get started now on winning the Rocket Clubhouse or one of the 1,750 other swell prizes. Hurry to your Weatherbird shoe store now and enter the Name the Planet contest today. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, the Iron Eaters of Planet X. For weeks now, there has been no major crime along the space lanes. Days have passed since a space patrol ship has reported even so much as the sighting of spacecraft approaching or leaving Planet X. Patrol ships ordered in close to the giant planet have made swift, daring scanning flights over known installations and have returned with identical reports. No new or suspicious activity. But still, Commander Corey holds firmly to his policy of constant vigilance. And then one day, a patrol ship space phones a report that justifies the commander's alertness. In the central office on the planet Terra, Buzz hands a copy of the report to Cadet Hatton. Hmm. Atomic radiations traced to sector J-14, planet X. Nuclear reactor in full operation. Two power radiation towers focused southeast and south. Wow. That's why things have been so quiet, Happy. Yeah, Baccarati's in his own backyard cooking up trouble. That nuclear reactor, he can cook up plenty. I wonder what he's using it for. Take a look at this map of planet X. Those thin green lines show where Baccarati's beaming the power from his reactor. One beam goes toward his biggest spaceship plant. The other is aimed toward a mining region. You see what that means? He can speed up production of spaceships and war materials. Exactly. Well, then we'd better put that reactor out of operation quick. Well, that part is fairly simple. A cosmic bomb would take care of that, but... We have reason to believe that eight of the most brilliant nuclear scientists of the United Planets are at that plant. Captured by Baccarati, huh? Yes. Even an attempt to capture that plant by a land attack would endanger them. That's right. He sure got us stymied. For the present. What we need is a way of creating a panic at that reactor plant. A panic that will completely disorganize Baccarati's men, and yet won't appear to be caused by the space patrol. It's a big order. There's a man on Venus who may be able to help us. An expert on mass psychology named Professor Bullo. He's unable to come to Terra because of an illness, so we're going to Venus. Well, why couldn't you just... Why couldn't I space a phone him? This is a matter I want to keep completely secret. Yeah, with Baccarati's spies still around, he might intercept a space phone message. Right. Let's get over to the spaceport supply depot, Ham. Oh, your appointment with uh, Bert Gant. Mm-hmm. He's a new civilian supervisor in the ship's supplies section. It's just a courtesy call, but it might help him to let him know that Space Patrol understands his problems. Well, he'll probably have plenty. The last man in that job couldn't take it after this trouble with Baccarati started. Mm-hmm. Bert Gant's a younger man, Hap. Let's hope he's a capable one. On the monster Planet X, Prince Baccarati glares at a controlled panel. The chair in which he sits looks strangely out of place. Massive and gaudy, it looks more like the throne of an oriental potentate who ruled on Earth 15 centuries ago. Regally, Baccarati turns as his chief advisor, Dr. Malengro, enters the tower room and bows before him. Good news, Your Highness. Two more power relay towers are in operation. At this rate, Your Excellency's castle will soon be lighted by your reactor plant thousands of miles away. That's not important right now. That power is for factories and mines. I must have spaceships, hundreds of them, enough to conquer Commander Corey's space patrol. Of course, Your Highness. But perhaps Corey won't be alive to witness your glorious victory over his ships. Oh, then our little presents from the Iron Mountain are on their way. Well on their way. They were routed to Terra by way of Neptune. By the time they reach Terra, they will look like a routine shipment of supplies. Oh, uh, the ships they're carried in, they have adequate refrigeration? Yes, sire. Your agent on Terra has arranged every detail. Well, there must be no mistake. Our little surprise must be in Corey's ship the next time he blasts off. Oh, uh, the agent on Terra, tell him to contact me by spacophone. What's his name? Gant, Your Highness. Bert Gant.
In an office of the Spaceport Supply Depot on Terra, Buzz Corey and Cadet Happy are having a friendly chat with the new civilian supervisor on the murmur of a battery of auditing machines. Yeah, I'll be blasting off for Venus in a few hours. You'll be working closely with the supervisor at Venus City Spaceport. I'd like to have you come along and meet him. Go with you? Yes, I don't intend to be away long. But uh, I, I, I'm just getting into the swing of things here. Uh, to leave now... It... Oh, I know how you feel, but from past experience, I know that first-hand knowledge of the situation on Venus will make your work much easier here. Commander, this is wonderful. I, I'd like nothing better. But the fact is, my doctor has cautioned me about space flights while I'm under treatment. Well, that's different. Nothing serious, I hope. Oh, a temporary condition. I had a minor operation a few weeks ago. Well, some other time, then. Could that happen? I will get out of here now, Mr. Gant, and let you get back to work. Several hours later, in his private living quarters, Bert Gant tunes a spaceophone transmitter to a rarely used frequency, then clicks on a scrambler circuit. Using a code name for even greater secrecy, he finally makes contact with a man who sits in a throne-like chair on a planet billions of miles away. Triangle reporting to your highness. Make it quick, Triangle. I don't want them getting a fix on your location. Corey is blasted off. Were the crates from Iron Mountain aboard? Yes, your highness. The refrigeration system will fail an hour after blastoff. And then the contents of those crates will go to work. He'll never reach Venus. Triangle out. Nearly two hours out of Terra, Commander Corey and Cadet Happy are working their way aft with the ship on automatic control. Happy, stripped to the waist and covered with grease, is wiping the perspiration from his forehead with the back of his hand. It's not just in supply compartment three, sir. Refrigeration's cutting out all over the ship. Now you're telling me. The hull is reflecting back quite a bit of the heat into space, but it's pouring through the viewports. I thought I could fix it in a jiffy, but it's a lot more serious than a blown fuse or a stuck relay. Now let's take a look at the connections in a terminal box. Say, the trouble might be in there at that. Well, the cover's bolted on. Hap, hand me a wrench. Yes, sir. Let's see, I left it lying right there on the floor near... Well, put rings around my head and call me Saturn. Look at this. You call that a wrench? What's the handle of it, or part of the handle? Don't tell me you broke an endurium wrench. Who, me? Let me see that. Oh, yes, sir. Looks as though it had been cut with an Atomo torch. But who'd cut a wrench? Uh, besides, there's nobody else aboard to cut it. We'll worry about it later. Give me a wrench out of the tool kit. Is that around here? Well, yes, sir. I had it right over here. The tool kit's gone. Hey, Commander, I know you think I'm space-happy, but it's true. I lugged it in here and, and set it down. Somebody must be aboard. A stowaway. Hey, we'd better search... Hold it, Happy. Look down there. Aren't those the plastic handles of some of the tools? Smoking rockets. That's what they are, all right. I think you're right about a stowaway. Then he made the reefer system conk out. Wait till I get my hands on him. Commander, what's that? Under in the bulkhead. It looks like a big welt on the metal. Yeah, but, Commander, it's moving. Uh, I think I saw it move. You're right. It's crawling along like a... like a worm. A gigantic worm. Where did that thing come from? A worm as long as your arm. Well, there's another one. Lower down on the other bulkhead. I know. Hey. Our stowaway brought them aboard to keep us interested while he wrecked the ship. No, Hap. These are the stowaways. Huh? Look at the metal bulkhead. It's pitted where they crawled. But, sir, that's endurium. How could a worm make any impression on a sheet of endurium? Because that's what they eat. What? That and other metals. That's what's happened to the tools. Hap, get that rod. Yes, sir. Here it is, sir. We can knock them off with that. It's coming loose, sir. There, now get the other one. It won't, it won't come loose. It's... Stuck tight. Hey, wait, Hap. Lean close to it and listen. It's feeding. Feeding on the metal bulkhead. Yes. I've got to shut this compartment off in a hurry before this thing eats a bigger hole. Yes, sir. Now, let's get forward and boost the oxygen supply. Commander, look. Out there in the corridor. There are dozens of them. All our air's escaping. We're too late. They've eaten through the hull. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. You have 1,750 chances to win in the Name the Planet contest. 
Wright's Face Patrollers. 1,750 chances to win a wonderful prize, like a Schwinn bicycle, for example. 750 Schwinn Varsity Bicycles are being given away. Schwinn, the lightweight bike. Plenty sharp looking, plenty rugged, with three-speed gear shift and two-wheel handbrakes. And listen, you have a thousand chances to win a beautiful Space Patrol wristwatch or a super-powered autosonic rifle, a streamlined outer space helmet, or a valuable Space Patrol emergency kit. And remember, every Space Patroller can get a free prize. Just have Mom or Dad go with you to your Weatherbird shoe store for your free space coin album. Now, inside it, you'll find your Name the Planet contest entry blank and free space coins. Terrific coins, big as a half dollar, with designs of planets on them in starlight silver. So good-looking, you'll want to get more and build a real space coin collection. And here's how. Inside every new package of good, hot Ralston, you'll find another swell space coin to add to your album. And outside of every new hot Ralston package, directions for entering the contest in case there's no Weatherbird shoe store near you. Look for the package with a picture of the commander or cadet happy on the front. So go to your Weatherbird shoe store for your free coin album, get a package of good hot Ralston with a free space coin, and enter the Name the Planet contest now. And now back to our Space Patrol adventure, the Iron Eaters of Planet X. While Buzz and Happy are on a trip to Venus, their refrigeration system fails. The interior of the spaceship rapidly becomes stifling because of the sun's heat absorbed by the hull. As they attempt to locate the cause of the trouble in their ship's cooling system, they discover two enormous worm-like creatures, literally feeding on the endurium bulkhead of the ship. They seal off that compartment, but find dozens more of the metal-devouring worms in the corridor. Now, with air rapidly escaping into space, they stagger toward the forward end of the ship, gasping for breath. Seal off this section, Hap. Help me with the door. Yes, sir. There's another worm in the bulkhead over your head. Here's the spacesuit locker. We'd better get into our spacesuits before that one eats through the hull. Here, Hap, get into it quick. Yes, sir. The worm dropped to the deck. Hey, look at that hole. All the air will be gone before we can get our suits on. I'll press my spacesuit tight against the hole. That'll stop the leak till you get into your suit. Then you do the same for me. Yes, sir. Fighting against blacking out from lack of oxygen, Happy struggles into his spacesuit. Then, revived by the air supply within the suit, he holds his gloved hand over the hole in the ship while Buzz dons his suit. A few moments later, Buzz is at the controls of the ship, correcting their vector toward Venus. Happy returns from an inspection back aft, smiling through the faceplate of his spacesuit. Commander, I got great news. What do you think? Those worms are all dead. Uh, we can seal up the holes in the ship and cut on the air supply. All right, Hap. We'll seal up the holes, but we'll keep the air turned off until just before entering the Venus atmosphere. Yes, sir. But why? For two reasons. With no air in the ship, the interior is now as cold as outer space. And that's a bonus with our refrigeration system out of order. Yes, sir. Uh, but what's the second reason? The worms. How do you know they're dead? Well... They died when the air left the ship. Perhaps it was the cold that affected them. If we make the ship warm again by bringing the air up to normal pressure, they might thaw out. Let's keep it cold. Uh, but, sir, what makes you think it's low temperature rather than lack of air that stopped them? Uh, it may be a coincidence, but isn't it strange that we should have this mysterious trouble with our cooling system on the very same trip that those weird metal-eating monsters show up? Wow. How did they get aboard the ship? And what did happen to our cooling system that wouldn't register on our electronic trouble indicator? Then you think they were already frozen when they were put aboard? And someone planned the failure of our refrigeration system to revive the worms. But who could have done it? Now, we might have a clue after Professor Erskine examines these creatures. Professor Erskine? Of Venus University. He's an authority on planetary zoology. He can examine the worms while I'm at the hospital talking to Professor Bullo. Hours later, Happy sits in an office at Venus City Space Patrol headquarters, anxiously awaiting the commander's return from his conference with Professor Bullo, the expert on mass psychology. At last, the door opens. Oh, commander, did the professor come up with an idea? Uh, can he tell us how to disorganize that reactor plant? We can't expect miracles, Happy. Before he can come up with a practical plan, he's got to know about conditions on Planet X. Uh, I'd better luck with the other professor, though, the zoologist. Oh, you talked to him, too? Yes. Professor Erskine examined our metal eating pets. He had to dissect them with an Atomo torch. I'm not surprised. The systems are designed to transform metallic substances into nourishing chemical compounds. They're not like the living creatures we're familiar with. They aren't dependent on plants to transform minerals into food. Are any of the worms still alive? Yes, they revived. 
They're safely sealed in old-fashioned wooden boxes. They won't eat anything that was once alive in the sense that we know it. No meat, fish, plants, or trees. Uh, uh, Just nice, juicy, endurium wrenches and tender spaceships. The professor is sure their basic food is iron ore. They can be lifted with a magnet. But where do they come from? He doesn't know. He refuses even to guess. Well, Well, if he doesn't know, who does? We do. The professor eliminated all the planets but one. Planet X. Right. But but how did they get in the ship? Who put them there? We're blasting off for Terra immediately, Happy. There's someone there I want to talk to. Someone I think can answer those questions. Meantime, in Prince Baccarati's castle, His Highness is receiving an urgent space of own message from Terra. Unscrambled, a frantic voice is earnestly pleading. Something went wrong, Your Highness. Corey is still alive. He's coming back to Terra. I've already heard the news triangle from my agents on Venus. Question me. He probably suspects me as it is. If he gives me a brainograph test, he'll know everything. You've got to protect me. Ah, don't worry. Corey will never question you. I'll order one of my other agents on Terra to take care of you. His name is Bruger. Now, don't worry. Thank you, Your Highness. Thank you. Baccarati out. Yes. Bruger will take good care of Bird Ghent. The incompetent bungler. Back on Terra in his private quarters, Bert Gant paces the floor nervously. In a corner is a bag packed with a few belongings. At the sound of footsteps outside his room, he stops pacing, eyes staring wildly at the door. And then... Who is it? Bruger, open up. Oh, you've come. Wonderful. I've been worried. My bags are all packed. I'm ready to go. Put it down, Gant. You aren't going anywhere. But but his highness said you would take care of me. That's right. With this. No. No, don't don't shoot me. This is all a mistake. Yeah. You made it. His highness doesn't like bunglers. Oh, you can't. Uh, There are other people in the building. They'll hear the gun. It's silent. Now lie down so you won't bounce. No. No, Bruger, Bruger, please. Drop it, Bruger. I said drop it. Oh, you came just in time. You came just in time. Do you know what he was going to do? Yes, I know, and I know why he was going to do it. What? What do you mean? Don't play innocent, Gant. You supervised the loading of my ship. You saw to it that those metal-eating worms were loaded in the refrigeration compartment in metal boxes. Really, I... I... You fixed the solenoids and the magnetic heating exchange pumps so they conked out. As the ship warmed up inside, the worms thawed and ate their way out. I didn't do it. Honestly, Commander... You had it done then, at Baccarati's orders. That's why you were afraid to come to Venus with me. You never had a minor operation. I had your record checked. I had to do it. Uh, Baccarati had something on me. Something that happened years ago. If it had come out, I could never have held a good job with the government. So you helped the man who's trying to destroy the government you work for. That's great logic, Gant. Now give it to me straight and fast. I'm in a hurry. Those worms came from Planet X, didn't they? Yes. Where on Planet X? From the Iron Mountain. It has a high percentage of iron ore. The worms are thick on it and in it. It's like an anthill. X is a big planet. Where is Iron Mountain? In sector L-15, about a hundred miles east of the Colossus River. Happy. Yes, sir. We'll see that Gant and Bruger are locked up. I'm a blast off for Planet X. First, we'll pick up some fishing tackle. Uh, fishing tackle, Yes, sir? several tons of steel netting. Now, let's get these fellows to headquarters. Many hours later, the Terra-5 soars over the surface of gigantic Planet X. No enemy ships challenge them because Baccarati's warning system, destroyed by Buzz and Happy on a previous foray, is still virtually useless. Mile after mile of the vast planet rolls under them. And then, finally, a barren peak looms blackly ahead against the sink sun. That must be Iron Mountain, sir. It checks with the grid coordinates. Lotus is not a growing thing for hundreds of miles, not even a weed. The metal-eating worms have this area all to themselves. They can have it. All right, Happen, we're going to cut our velocity and get ready to land at the base of the mountains. Open the bomb bay. Bomb bay open, sir. Lower the net. Cut on the cargo winches. That's enough. Now, when we land, that tangle of steel netting will be stretched out on the ground several feet behind the ship. Stand by to cut rockets. Standing by, sir. Cut rockets. 
for repeller, Ray. And what's to keep them from attacking the ship? The repeller, Ray. A half unit ought to keep them away. It won't lift the ship. I'm worried about the cables holding the net to the ship. Uh, those are steel, too. They are covered with thick plastic. It's organic material, not mineral. The worms won't touch those cables. Commander, they're crawling to the net already. It's almost as though they could smell it. We'll wait till they get a good haul, then we'll blast off. Within a few minutes, the heavy steel net is a mass of giant crawling creatures, eagerly devouring what to them is a rare delicacy. Finally, Buzz turns to Happy. You'll blast off now before they do much damage to the net. Cut on the rear magnetic beam. That'll hold them to the net. And also keep chewed up pieces of the net from falling. Yes, sir. You'll rise up several feet with the repeller ray, Hap, so the rocket blast won't ruin our dinner party. Fire rockets. Cut repeller ray. We'll go up several miles where it's good and cold. That'll put the worms quietly to sleep the way it did in our ship. I don't think we've lost any of them, sir. And we'll keep our velocity down fairly low so the net won't trail back into the rocket blast. Well, that means we won't reach the reactor plant until long after dark. Well, that's fine. Dr. Roddy's men won't be able to identify the ship. When it flies over and nothing happens, they'll assume it's a Planet X ship. High above Planet X, the Terra 5, with its strange cargo dangling beneath it, roars toward the nuclear reactor plant through the utter blackness. Then through the infrared viewscope, Happy sights two tall metal towers, rising several hundred yards from a group of massive buildings. There it is, sir. I'm going to fly as close to those towers as I can so the net won't have to fall far. Professor Eskin assures me that the worms are practically indestructible and have absolutely no sense of pain. Still, I'm going to make it as easy as possible. The net's just a few feet off the ground, sir. All right, Hap. I'm going to fire nose rockets and apply the repeller ray. For a couple of seconds, we'll be hovering right next to the towers. Be ready to release the net. Yes, sir. Cut it loose. All clear, sir. Let's get away from here. And so, with a burst of speed, the spaceship leaves the reactor plant far behind. Then, using a row of hills to the east as a shield, returns and lands to wait developments. If the ship has alarmed the personnel at the reactor plant, there's no sign. Hours pass. Then, in the dim light of dawn, black lumps on the ground begin to move. The chill of outer space is leaving their bodies, and they awake. They munch contentedly on strands of the steel net, as though it were soft spaghetti. Soon, the net is gone and they crawl toward the Endurium Towers. There is no hurry, no greedy scrambling. There is food for all, tons of it. The towers continue to radiate their tremendous invisible energy across Planet X, and in the growing light on top of the hill, Buzz and Happy watch. Then suddenly, Happy exclaims, Wow! See that flash of light? The worms have not a cross brace in one of the towers. It fell and cut through a heavy power line from the generators. Hey, the crew is coming out of the buildings now. Yeah, streaming out. Hey, look at them scatter. And no wonder the towers are buckled. The men are in no danger, but they don't know it. There go the towers. That mob doesn't know what to make of it. But, sir, a few of them are running toward this hill. They must have seen us. Yes, and so did the rest of them. They're heading the other way, toward the river. Scared to death, I guess. Happy. How many men do you count running toward the hill? Well, let's see. You... One, two, three, eight. That's what I got. Those are the men we came for, Happy. The atomic experts Baccarati abducted. Let's go down and meet them, Hap. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, Commander, I've always heard that a worm turns, uh, but I never expected to see a worm do anybody a good turn. <laughs> <laughs> That's my cadet. <laughs> An action preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure in just a moment. Space Patrollers, this is Commander Corey. I don't want you to miss the opportunity to win the giant rocket clubhouse or one of the other big prizes. But you'll have to hurry. Go with Mother or Dad to your Weatherbird shoe store for your free space coin album and contest entry blank. If the Weatherbird man has run out of albums, ask him to get you one. Then you get a package of hot Ralston with the free space coin inside. Remember, see your Weatherbird shoe dealer 
Get some hot Ralston and enter the Name the Planet contest today. And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Appy are in a scientist's laboratory on the planet Venus, bound hand and foot by Prince Baccarati. As they struggle to free themselves, a vacuum pump steadily draws air from a chamber containing a powerful chemical. Keep struggling, Happy. You've got to cut off that up before the chemical explodes. The cord is digging into my wrists. How much time have we got? It'll blow up when the indicator reaches one hundredth of an atmosphere pressure. A hundred? Well, the smoke and rocket is almost that right now. And the ropes are so tight I can hardly move. Be sure to join us again next week for the thrilling story, Cyclone in Outer Space, when Instant Ralston and Regular Ralston again present Space Patrol! Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Kemmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston, produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Mike Devery. Other players were Bela Kovach, Ken Mayer, and Norman Jolly. Dick Tufel speaking. Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday when Instant Ralston and regular Ralston again present Space Patrol! This is Dick Tufel in St. Louis reporting on the twin jet Air Force fighter, the McDonnell Voodoo XF-88A. In a moment, we'll hear from the noted test pilot who flies this plane, Phil Houghton. Speed of the voodoo is a military secret, but it's plenty fast. In span is 40 feet, length 55, weight 10 tons. And now, Phil Houghton, recorded this morning at Lambert Airfield. After seeing the voodoo, I guess you know why I like my job. There's one thing about it, though. A test pilot has to stay in good condition, get lots of sleep, and eat good, healthy food. That's why I like rice checks and wheat checks for breakfast. They've got plenty of energy in them, and they really taste swell. I think you'll like them, too. No other cereal, puffed or flaked, contains so much nourishment in such concentrated bite-sized form. Do as Phil Houghton, J. Ray Donahue, Jr., and other top test pilots do. Make your cereals rice checks and wheat checks. Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network. Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Connie, I'm glad you called. Now, you'll have to count me out tonight, Angel. I'm all jammed up. Mm-hmm. Some boy I know is thinking of taking up murder for a career. Yeah, he figures with all the money involved, the least he can do is make a stab at it. This is Ed Hurley, he friends, inviting you on behalf of the Kraft Foods Company to listen to The Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novels. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now join him on the air when the Falcon solves the case of the happy hoodlum. Friends, before we join the Falcon for his latest adventure, I'd like to tell you how you can have sandwiches and snacks and appetizers and salad toppings more easily and quickly than ever. Just make them with any of the nine famous Kraft cheese spreads. Kraft cheese spreads are so smooth and easy to spread, and they're so good eating. There are creamy, mild-tasting ones and sharp-tasting varieties, too. All simply delicious. And, of course, all are of the finest quality because they are made by Kraft, a name that's been famous for years for top-quality foods. Try them, won't you? Tomorrow, get several of these handy, delicious Kraft cheese spreads. And now, the case of the happy hoodlum. It's late afternoon in New York, and a tall, thin man with a dirty trench coat walks up the steps of the Revere building. His name is Marty Kramer. 
Mr. Kramer has embarked on a mission where the chances are a million to one against him. Apparently, that doesn't bother him. He smiles as he takes the elevator down to the basement where the Revere Express Company has its headquarters. Then, still smiling, he marches down the hall to a door marked employees only and barges right in. Hey, just a second there, mister. Yeah? You don't work here. Do you? Yes. Good, then maybe you can help me out. Where do they keep the dough around here? Were you crazy? Don't tell me the stories I heard about this place aren't true. I saw a piece in the Sunday paper that said you always have two or three million on tap. Now, look, mister. No, you look, friend, because I got a little more than you what? have. That's right, it's a gun. And if you don't want a practical demonstration of how it works, you better take me to where they keep the dough. Okay, you're the doctor. Wait a minute. Where do you think you're going? You said you wanted to go into the bullion room, didn't you? That's right. Well, I've got to get my pass. They won't let me in without it. Where is it? In that drawer. Okay, open it slowly. And don't put your hand in there until I can see what you're doing. Hold it. What's that? Oh, that? Why, that's the signal for one of the drivers that a bank wants him for a pickup. You wouldn't try to kid me, would you, friend? So help me, it's the truth. All right, where's your pass? Right here. Now, which way do we go? Uh, down the hall. Okay, let's move. Say, uh, tell me something, mister. Yeah? That piece you read in the paper. What about it? Did it tell you how many armed guards we have in the joint? 68, wasn't it? That's right. And you expect to pick up an odd million and walk out without anyone bothering you. I'm doing it, ain't I? You haven't got the million yet. Just give me time, pal. Where do we go now? Uh, in here. That's where they get the shipments ready for the trucks. Okay, open the door. Now, don't forget, I'm right behind you. And I'm right behind you, mister. What? Just drop the gun, pally. You got him, Paul? Yeah, I got him. All right, Barney. Frisk him. Right. You don't have to do that. I'm clean. I know, but we don't believe in taking chances. I can see that. That drawer you opened was connected with an alarm, wasn't it? That's right. Real cute. What's your name, mister? Marty Kramer. You escaped from some lunatic asylum? You didn't think for a minute you'd walk in here and heist this place? Well, I guess I was over-optimistic, hmm? You're over something. Now, look, Kramer. What do you got up your sleeve? Not a thing. Ask your friend. He just frisked me. Don't be a wise guy. You're on the spot. So it would seem, wouldn't it? I don't get your angle. Angle? Yeah. You knew darn well you didn't have a prayer of getting away with this job. Now, why'd you do it? <laughs> As long as you put it on that basis, I'll tell you. Well, yeah. I, uh, I just wanted to prove to the kiddies that crime doesn't pay. Yeah? Oh. Hello, Mike. Sergeant Corbett. You gonna invite me in? I don't know why I should. Come on. Let me take your coat. No, thanks. I can't stay long. Oh. How about a little, um... What time is it? Five to six. You sure you're not five minutes slow? Come to think of it, I am. Good. Then I'm off duty. I'll have a short one. <laughs> What's on your mind, Sergeant? It's funny you should ask that. Why? If there is something on my mind... You read about that boy named Marty Kramer? Well, had to try to heist the Revere Express Company yesterday. Yeah. How do you figure it? Simple. He's crazy. No, he isn't. He's as sane as you are, if that means anything. Well, he certainly couldn't have believed he stood a chance of walking off with the loot. No, he wanted to get caught. Why? That's what bothers me. I can't make it out. Can you? Sergeant, what are you getting at? I'd like you to look in on Kramer. Are you out of your mind? I guess I am. You know, if you do this, there won't be a dime in it for you. You must think I'm as crazy as you are. I do. What do you say, Mike? Well, if everybody's going to act nuts, I might as well get into the act, too. Okay, I'll do it. All right, Kramer. Mike Waring's here. Mike Waring? Yeah. You have ten minutes, Mike. Thanks, Mac. Wait a minute, Buster. Who sent for you? Sergeant Corbett asked me to look in on you. My name is Mike Waring. You're the bird they call the Falcon? Mm -hmm. What do you want with me? Sergeant Corbett feels there's a lot more to your case than meets the eye. And I'm inclined to agree with him. Well, you're wrong. I tried to pull a job and I was caught. That's all there is to it. Uh-uh. There are too many things it leaves unexplained. Such as? Such as your background. Your name isn't really Marty Kramer. No? Then what is it? I don't know. All I could find out is that you came to New York six weeks ago. 
Where from? Nobody seems to know. Maybe I'm ashamed of my past. I don't see why. You have no criminal record that the police can discover. This was your first offense. Always the first time for everything. Uh, well, it goes deeper than that, Kramer. You weren't hard-pressed for cash, either. Well, how do you know? I went through your room, found this bank book there. Who gave you a license to go through my stuff? The police. There's 7,000 bucks in that account. Well, maybe that wasn't enough for me. Well, you certainly couldn't hope to pick up more at the Revere Express Company. A fella can try. Yeah, I know, but you didn't have your heart in it. The DA showed me the gun they took away from you up there. Yeah? Yeah. That thing couldn't hurt a fly. The firing pin was filed all the way down. You're out of your mind, Falcon. Now, don't tell me that. I saw the gun. Well, if the pin was shot, I didn't know about it. You don't think I'd do anything as silly as that? I think you're doing something a lot sillier. Now, look, Kramer, you better start talking. Unless you level with me, they're really going to pop it to you. Why don't you mind your own business? Can I help it if I'm nosy? Well, maybe this will cure you. Oh, Mike! What's going on in there? Nothing. I'm all right, Mac. What's the idea, Kramer? I'm just settling accounts with my friend here. That was the down payment, Waring. If you insist on working for me in the future, you can expect a lot more. This is Ed Hurley here again, friends. Say, I'd like to tell you how you can get compliments from the small fry. Next time the children want something to eat between meals, set out their favorite crispy crackers and a glass or two of Kraft pineapple cheese spread. One of the nine famous Kraft cheese spreads. Then watch those youngsters go to it. Watch how their faces light up when they taste this delightfully mild cheese spread that's filled through and through with juicy bits of sweet sun-ripened pineapple. Mmm. -hmm. Kraft pineapple cheese spread is delicious. And it's smooth, too, for wonderfully easy spreading. And you know it's a snack the whole family can enjoy often. Because like all the Kraft cheese spreads, it's a wholesome dairy food made from only the finest ingredients. It's a good idea to have several glasses of Kraft cheese spreads on hand always for a grand variety of snacks. Try Kraft relish cheese spread, Kraft olive pimento cheese spread, Kraft pimento cheese spread. In fact, all nine delicious varieties. Look for them at your grocer's tomorrow. They come in bright, new, tulip-pattern drinking glasses in a choice of four gay colors. Now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. A week has passed since Mike Waring had his little talk with Marty Kramer. Apparently, it didn't do any good. For the next day, Kramer pleaded guilty to armed robbery and was sentenced to Sing Sing. Now, as we find him, he's making his grand entrance. Come on, Kramer. Hey, Bailey. Bailey. Uh, wake up. You got company. Uh, what's the matter? I want you to meet your new roommate. His name is Marty Kramer. Oh. Oh, hiya, pal. Hi. If there's anything you want, Mr. Kramer, just ring. We have 24-hour service here. Well, thanks a lot, McGraw, but I wouldn't think of disturbing you boys. Well, make yourself at home, Kramer. Thanks. My name's Bailey. Yeah, I know. I heard a lot about you. I've heard a couple of things about you, too. Have you? Yeah, a fellow was telling me in the yard today that a falcon was working for you. How come he couldn't get you off? Maybe I didn't want him to, Bailey. I don't dig you, pal. Maybe I wanted to spend some time up here. Why would anybody in his right mind want to do that? It's a long story. Well, that's okay. I got ten years more to save. Yeah. Want a butt? Yeah. Help yourself. Thanks. Very yeah, much. You see, um, there's a guy up here that I wanted to see. Well, you certainly took the hard way, Kramer. Well, five years ago, this guy was partners with my old man. My old man was a schnook. He trusted everybody. That was his mistake. One night, his partner cleaned him out and then put a match to the place. When the insurance dicks came over to investigate, this guy took a powder and my father was left holding the bag. Well, what happened? Well, he couldn't stand the disgrace, so he blew his brains out. Tough. Yeah. Anyway, I promised myself that I'd make it up to the old boy. I've been looking for his partner ever since. You find him? Yep. Through a private eye. A falcon? No, another guy. He told me my party was serving time in Sing Sing. That's why I arranged to visit here. What's his party's name? Bailey. Huh? Oh, now, isn't that a coincidence? Just the same as yours. Where are you from, Bailey? 
Uh, Los Angeles. Well, that's funny. So was this guy I was telling you about. Cut it out, Kramer. You don't remember me, do you, friend? No. Of course, I didn't call myself Kramer in those days. Now, look, you. Stay away from me. Hey, Mac! McGraw! You're gonna going to get it, down, Bailey. Man? I've waited five long years for this. Let go of me! You I better go, go Kramer. Go right after I squeeze the life out of him. No, me. you don't. Uh, let me go. Let come go. on, come on. Break it up. Cut it out to breaking my arm. Then behave. Uh, you okay, Bailey? Yeah. I think so. Leave me alone with him for one minute. One minute, that's all I ask. What you're asking for is a stiff dose of solitary. All right, Kramer. Let's go. I'll go away. There's nobody here. Yeah. That you, Mike? Who the devil is this? Now, that's no way to talk to an old friend. Well, this wouldn't be Sergeant Corbett, would it? Why not? You realize it's three o'clock in the morning? You're slow. I got a quarter after. Look, if your purpose is to annoy me, you're succeeding very well. Got a little news item I thought you might be interested in. Remember our friend, Marty Kramer? Yeah, sure. What about him? I just got word from Sing Sing. He tried to kill his cellmate, a boy named Bailey. Oh, so that's why he wanted to go to jail. What do you mean? Well, obviously, this whole idea was a plot on the part of Kramer to get his hands on Bailey. Maybe. I kind of doubt it, though. I got a hunch we haven't heard the last of our friend, Mr. Kramer. Don't ask me why. I just got a hunch. So you can imagine how I felt, Logan. A couple of seconds more and it would have been all over. Instead, the guard had to break it up. How long did you keep you in solitary, Kramer? A week. Was it bad? It'll be worth it if I can get my hands on Bailey again. Forget it. There's not a chance. That's why I transferred you in here with me. I'll work it somehow. What you got against Bailey anyway? Ah, oh, never mind. Come on. I won't give you away. There's something you did to my old man five years ago. Wait a minute. What's the matter? You got the wrong guy. Oh, no, I haven't. When did you say this happened? Five years ago in L.A. Well, that proves it. Bailey's been in here since 1940. What are you trying to give me? What's well, the truth, Kramer? Someone give you a bum steer. This ain't the same Bailey. You're lying. Okay, don't believe me, but I saw his record myself. I used to help around the warden's office when I first came here in 45. Well, that's true. I did all this for nothing. You ought to be glad you didn't kill him. I got to get out of here, Logan. You kidding? Don't you understand? This was all a mistake. That's tough, pal, but can't be helped. Let me out! Let me out! Pipe down there, Kramer. Make you want another session in solitary. I got to speak to the warden. Okay, I'll make an appointment. Cut it out, Kramer. It won't do you no good. I got to get out of here, Logan. Sure, sure. If I can't do it any other way, I'm going to make a break. Don't be a chump. I tell you, I can do it. Are you with me? You just sound enough to hear yourself talk? No, I tell you, I can do it. How? Is there anyone outside you can count on for help? No. Aren't you married? No. I got a girl in Jersey. How about her? How do you think I got in here in the first place? Uh, she squeal on you? That's what a couple of people would like me to believe. I was running the biggest gambling joint in town till Martha got friendly with Philip Hernandez. Phil Hernandez? One of my competitors. He and Martha got awful chummy. Well, that doesn't mean she sold you out. It does when you add to, to it the fact that that's how we met originally. Only this boy she fingered was some character from Chicago and he was married to her. And the more I think of it, the more I'd like to ask Miss Martha Pierce a couple of questions. What do you say, Logan? Do you want in? What's the deal? Tonight, after roll call, one of us will pretend we're sick. When the guard comes in to investigate, we'll take care of him. With what? With this. Hey, where'd you get that hunk of lead? When I was in solitary, I noticed one of the water pipes was loose. I didn't think anyone would mind if I borrowed it. Yeah, they're bound to find out it's gone. Sure, the next time they throw someone in solitary, but that may be days. And we'll use it tonight. All right, Logan, here he comes. Start moaning. Yeah. Uh, oh. That's the ticket, pal. Keep it up. Oh. What's the trouble there? Uh, I don't know, Mac. Something's the matter with Logan. Uh, Stand back from the door, Kramer. I'm coming in. Uh, it's appendicitis. Uh, Logan. Logan. Uh, Where does it hurt? Uh, right. Right here. Oh, I better get the doc. Okay, Kramer, now. What the... Hello, 
Martha. Philip, what are you doing here? You heard the news. What news? There was a flash on the radio at 10.30. Your ex-boyfriend, he broke out of jail. Logan? Yes, he and a man named Marty Kramer. <laughs> well, what do you know? I know we better do something. Don't tell me you're frightened, Philip. Well, there's no point in taking chances. You know the kind of guy Logan is? Suppose you leave Mr. Logan to me. But maybe he'd think I made you squeal on him. Well, didn't you? No. It was all your idea, Martha. Remember, I didn't want you to do it. Aren't you the brave boy? Well, it's your fault. I was satisfied with the way things were. But no, you had big ideas. This is the first time I heard you complain. Well, I didn't know You don't know a lot of things. Now, listen, Phil. If Logan knew about us, we would have heard from him before this. But maybe somebody tell him now. Then all he's got are suspicions. And I can talk him out of them. I've done it before. You think he is in New York already? Well, if he is, he must be with his friend Kramer. You got any idea where they can be? Maybe. Where? Never mind. What you don't know can't hurt you. Tell me where, Martha. Let's go, Philip. You're, you're hurting me. Well, I think... <laughs> You're going to regret that, Mr. Hernandez. I'm sorry, Martha. I, I, I didn't mean it. It's just that I worry about Logan, so... You shouldn't, Phil. I've got a feeling Mr. Logan is the least of your worries. <laughs> Kramer. Yeah. This time, Waring, I've got a gun with a perfectly good firing pin. Now turn off that light so I can come out from behind these drapes. Okay. Now stay where you are until I switch on this lamp. Just as you say. All right, sit down. How'd you get in here, Kramer? Through that fire escape window. Oh. Now listen, Waring, i got to talk to you. You've got to help me. You must be out of your mind. I wouldn't be surprised if you were right. I was crazy to do what I did. You mean break out of jail? No, break in. What are you raving about? I wanted them to send me to Sing Sing because there was a man named Bailey there that I thought was responsible for my father's suicide. So that's why you tried that phony holdup at the Revere Express Company, huh? Yeah. When I got to the pen, it was the wrong guy. I realized how ridiculous the whole idea was. I could have told you that in the first place. What am I going to do, Mike? Why'd you crash out? I told you I wanted to see you. You could have sent me a letter. I was rattled. I didn't think of it. Well, you've got to give yourself up. No. Look, at your only chance, Kramer. Fortunately, that guard you slugged wasn't badly hurt. What do you think they'll do to me? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. But I'd gamble you won't even have to serve out your original sentence, providing... Uh, providing what? We take Logan back with us. No, no, I won't rat on him. Don't be a fool, Kramer. Logan's dangerous. He's got a record as long as your arm. Now, don't be a chump. If the positions were reversed, he'd sell you out in five minutes. Now, what do you say? Okay, Waring. Call a cab. I'll take you to him. All right, Marty. Where is he? The next floor. Whose place is it? Belongs to Logan. He owns the building. Yeah, that's pretty convenient. Does he know you went to see me? No. I told him I was going to get some grub. Hold it. This it? Yeah. You better let me go in first. I'll give you the high sign when it's okay for you to come in. Right. Logan? Logan, I'm back. Hey, Logan, where the... Di- Waring? Yeah, what's the matter? What's the trouble? Oh, never mind, I see him. He isn't moving. A few people do when they're dead. All right, Kramer, what do you got to say for yourself? <laughs> story. Now, what am I going to do? First, you're going to get a grip on yourself. You're absolutely no help to me this way. Now, come on, help me turn him no, over. No, I can't touch him. Oh. You're the man who's going to kill for revenge. Well, I didn't know they looked like this. What did you expect? Well, judging by the signs, I'd say Logan got it around a quarter to ten. Where were you at that time? Waiting for you in your apartment. Oh. Look, Mike, how will this affect my chances on the appeal? Not a bit of everything you say stands up. Cops couldn't possibly hang this on you. Well, they could try. You got a motive? No, but... There are no buts about it. Especially if we can deliver the right party to them. Now, when you left Logan to go to my place, did he say anything about expecting anyone? No. Well, somebody must have known he was here. Someone who had a key to this dive. Now, who could that be? I don't know. 
Now, come on, Kramer. You must have heard Logan mention some name. No, I tell you. All he ever told me was he had a girl in Jersey. Remember her name? No. You've got to. He only mentioned her once or twice. Well, for Pete's sake, man, think. Your life may depend on it. Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah, it was Martha. Martha Pierce. Phil Hernandez girl? Who's he? Big gambler in town. Yeah, I think you're right. Logan told me this Martha dame sold him out to one of his competitors. All right, Kramer, you stay here. I'll be back as fast as I can. This is Ed Hurley here again, friends. Sounds like Kramer gave Mike a lead to the killer, doesn't it? Right now, though, I'd like to give you a lead to nine kinds of wonderful eating. That's right, I said nine. Because I'm talking about the delicious Kraft cheese spreads that come in nine grand varieties. There are delightfully mild-tasting ones like Kraft pineapple cheese spread, Kraft relish spread, and Kraft olive pimento cheese spread. And there are sharp-tasting kinds, too, such as Kraft cheese and bacon spread, Roca brand cheese spread, and hearty Kraft Limburger cheese spread. They're all delicious. All wholesome dairy products, and all so handy for making quick, easy snacks and sandwiches. Always keep your refrigerator stocked with several of the nine delicious Kraft cheese spreads. And now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. Thirty minutes have passed since the discovery of the body of George Logan by Mike Waring and Marty Kramer. And now as we find the Falcon, he's knocking at the door of his first lead. Yes? Martha Pierce? Well, that's right. I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all, honey. But if you're going to show me your brushes, you might as well come in. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm afraid I left my sample case at home. What's your name, Hanson? Mike Waring. I think I've heard that somewhere before. Could be. I'm a private detective, Miss Pierce. My friends call me Martha. Well, I'll bet you've got a thousand of them. Listen, Mr. Waring... No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I take it back. You couldn't have more than 999. What's that supposed to mean? You just lost one of your best. Who? George Logan. Oh, don't tell me. Yes, he's dead. Poor Logan. I knew the excitement of breaking out would be too much for him. He had a bad heart. Yes, well, that knife someone stuck in his back didn't help matters any either. Incidentally, where can I find Philip Hernandez? You're wasting your time, honey. He isn't in New York. He took the midnight plane to Chicago. Mm, well, that must make it awfully dull for you. Mm. How have you been keeping yourself occupied? Now, come, Mr. Waring. Surely you don't suspect me of killing Logan. No, of course not. I was just curious, that's all. Uh, well, when Phil told me about the news flash he heard about Logan breaking out, I thought it called for a celebration. So I went to the Hawk Club. Where undoubtedly you were seen by a hundred different people. At the very least. Well, that makes a very handsome alibi, Martha. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> All right, Angel, I'll be seeing you. Oh, must you go? Yes, but don't worry, I'll be back. And it may be sooner than you think. Who's there? It's all right, Kramer, it's only me, Mike Waring. Oh, just a second, How'd you make out, Waring? I didn't. You couldn't get a thing out of her? No. My girlfriend Martha's got an alibi. Claims she spent the entire evening at the Hawk Club. Well? Well, I was down there and everyone bears her out. And it must have been a new boyfriend who killed Logan. No, I'm much more inclined to suspect it was her old one. Who? You. I don't understand. Oh, sure you do. You're a pretty smart boy, Kramer. That was a beautiful plan you worked out to get Logan. What are you talking about? You went up to Sing Sing to find somebody, only his name wasn't Bailey, it was Logan. That business of your old man's suicide was so much tripe. Logan took Martha away from you, and that's why you had it in for him. You got rocks in your head. If Logan was the one I was after, why didn't I kill him when we were in the same cell? Because you were sure to go to the chair. This way you felt confident you'd get away with it. The authorities up there thought Bailey was the one you were after. As far as they knew, you had no connection with Logan. It was just a coincidence that you broke out together and someone killed him. <laughs> now, you played it very smart, Kramer. Obviously, it wasn't smart enough. You caught on. Uh, well, it wasn't your fault. Sometimes the fates conspire against you. You see, you broke out of stir at 8.30. So? So the news of the break wasn't released over the air until two hours later. The first flash came at 10.30. Well? Well, Logan was murdered at quarter to ten. 
Three quarters of an hour before either Martha or Phil Hernandez could possibly have known he escaped. That's where your frame fell down. It's too bad you made that mistake. We can't all be as clever as you, Waring. Speaking of bonus, you made a pretty bad one yourself. I don't see where. You shouldn't have come back here. Why not? You forget that I still have this gun. Oh, no, I haven't. <laughs> Sergeant! What? Hiya, Kramer. Don't bother turning around. Just drop the rod. Come on, drop it. Well, did you hear enough, Sergeant? Plenty. Okay, Kramer, let's be moving. I'll make this up to you, Waring. Oh, don't bother. No, I owe you plenty. You don't owe me a thing, friend. After all, if it hadn't been for you, I never would have met Martha. What? Mm -hmm. Take him away, Sergeant. I have work to do. This is the season for hearty breakfasts. Hot cakes, hot toast, hot rolls, waffles... And the spread that adds extra goodness to every bite is parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Yes, parquet is the margarine millions prefer to any other because it tastes so good. And it tastes so good because it's always fresh. In states where the law permits, get yellow parquet in its new Flavor Saver aluminum foil wrap. Elsewhere, get parquet in the regular package or handy color quick bag. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft. The case of the substitute target. The case of the substitute target. That's the title of next week's adventure of the Falcon, when Mike Waring learns that just because a fellow has a head on his shoulders is no sign he's going to be able to keep it there. So be sure to listen at the same time next week to another exciting adventure of the Falcon brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company. The adventures of the Falcon are based on the famous character created by Drexel Drake, produced by Bernard L. Schubert, written today by Eugene Wang, and directed by Richard Lewis. Music was by Arlo. Les Damon was starred as the Falcon with Ken Lynch as Sergeant Corbett. Be sure to hear The Great Gildersleeve next Wednesday evening over most of these stations. In next Wednesday's broadcast, Gildy comes face to face with an hilarious problem and solves it in a way that will keep you laughing for days. Remember the show, the time, and the place, The Great Gildersleeve next Wednesday evening over most of these stations. Check your newspaper for time of broadcast. This is Ed Hurley, he's speaking for the Kraft Foods Company. Hear Martha Ray and Jimmy Durante on the big show today on NBC. Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, Highway of Escape. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the heart of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Frances Block was never meant for the desert, but fate put her there set her down solidly in the center of an expanse of creosote brush and Joshua trees, cactus and hot, dry sand. At a scrubby little group of nondescript shacks, huddled in the shade of a few scraggly umbrella trees. Known to the truck drivers passing through on Highway 441 as the Duncan Wells Tourist Camp. Just Francis and Pete Crawford, her stepfather. For her, it was a prison. For him... It was a living and the only one he knew. It was on a particularly hot day in July that she decided she couldn't stand it any longer. On a Sunday morning when the temperature stood at 90 degrees at 8 o'clock. And Francis knew there was always more money than usual in the cash register on Sunday morning. 
five, ten, eleven, fifty, twelve, twenty-five, fifty, eighty-five, twelve, eighty-five. Oh. Morning. Oh, uh, hello. You open for business? Uh, not yet. Kind of early. Hmm? Not even gasoline? The pump's locked. Hmm. How far is the next town? Seventeen miles. It's a Warrell. Okay, I can make it, I guess. Hmm? Thanks a lot. You better get going. Um, just a second. Yeah? You, uh, going through to... I mean, uh... Los Angeles, yeah. Do there by noon. Can you take me? Huh? I've got to get out of here this morning. Right now. Oh, come on. You could take me if you wanted to, couldn't you? No, I, I'd like to, but... Oh, please. Look, I'll give you five dollars. Yeah, sorry, sister. There's company rules. No riders. I'd lose my job. Oh, they'll never know. Look, mister, you don't know what it means. It's life and death. Yeah? Yeah. It's life and death. Death if I stay here in this... This... This prison. Oh. I can't take it any longer, you see? You've got to take me away. You've got to. Hey, what's the matter? You sick or something? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sick. Look, look, I'll make it ten dollars. Ten dollars to Los Angeles. Yeah, but... That leaves me only, uh, two eighty-five. My bag's right there. It's all packed. I won't tell the company. They'll never know. See? Just you and me will know, and I'll get off in Los Angeles. Well, for ten bucks, you can take the train. Oh, no, there's no trains here. Just trucks. Guys like you. There's a train from the next town, ain't there? Yeah. Yeah, how about that? You can take me to the next town. That's all. Just in the next town. Well, uh, I don't know. I... Good morning, Francis. Oh, there's a little lady here uh, wants to ride into town with me. Sorry, mister. She's made a mistake. I have not. I'm going, you hear? No, Francis. You're not going. You can't stop me, Pete. You can't stop me. I'm not going to stay here. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Well, uh, look, uh, mister, maybe uh, maybe you two better talk this over. I, I just thought I'd run into so wild, but... Uh... She gets this away ever so often. She'll get over it. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll see you on the way back, maybe. Huh? Yeah. So long. Uh, Oh. You did it again, you filthy... No, 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 there, Francis. I know how you feel, gal. This ain't no place for a young filly like you. But can't you see? There ain't nothing else I can do. Ever since your ma died, you I... You killed her. That's what you did. Francis, that's an awful thing to say. Just the same as if you shot her with a gun. Bringing her off to this godforsaken hole. Making her work when it was so hot she couldn't breathe. Well, you're not doing it to me, do you hear? Now, wait a minute. You ain't talking to me like that. Oh, no. Well, listen, you dirty desert rat. I've had all of you I'm going to take, and I'm getting out of here today. This morning. In five minutes if a car comes. You're still my stepdaughter, Francis. Until you're 21, I'm afeard I'm doing the deciding. Oh, now, come on. You just trot on back to the cabin and lay down for a while. You'll feel better in no time. Get away from me. You'll understand about your ma someday. I know this place ain't much of a spread, but it was ours, and we built it together. Come on. I said get away from me. Please, Francis, just this once. For me. All right, Pete. Wait a minute now. Put that knife down, Francis. You ain't in no condition to... All right. You ask for it. Friends, have you picked up your free federal use stamp protector yet at your signal gasoline dealers? The deadline has already passed, you know, for getting your new use stamp on your windshield. And since that little stamp has to hang on your windshield for a whole year, you'll naturally want to protect it from moisture or scuffing so it won't peel off. That's why Signal Oil Company had these little use stamp protectors made up for you. They're smart-looking, transparent, and water-resistant, so you can wash right over them without affecting your use stamp. And, of course, they're free, one of the little extra services your signal dealer offers to keep your car looking its best. Unfortunately, like all things in wartime, the supply is limited this year. Since every car will be needing one, I'd suggest that you get yours without delay tomorrow, if possible... Just drive into any of the friendly stations displaying signals, yellow and black circle sign, and say, I'd like one of the use stamp protectors that was offered free on the Whistler. And now, back to the Whistler. He 
He's dead, Francis. It's over, and you're free now. You stare at him for a moment as he lies there on the floor in the middle of the small lunchroom, very still. For the first time in your life, you notice he has a kind face, a peaceful face. No look of fear on it. Just peace, deep, enduring peace. Yes, you're free now. You can leave any time you want to. Today, this morning, the next five minutes, if a car comes... You jump as a car pulls up out in front. Quickly, Francis. Move the body behind the counter before the driver comes in. That's it. Now take it easy. Just relax. He mustn't know. Hi, beautiful. How about a cup of java? Hey, what's the matter? Oh, nothing. Uh, coffee isn't made yet. Huh. A uh, cigarette? It's scarce these days. Uh, no. Well? What? Are you going to make it or shall I? Make what? A coffee. Say, are you sure nothing's the matter? Okay, something's the matter. I'm, I'm scared of my stepfather. Huh? He, he's horrible. I live here alone with him I can't stand it anymore. That's too bad. Oh, please. Please take me with you to Saguaro anyway. I won't be any trouble. Oh, now, now wait a minute. Hold everything there. Now, now, now take it easy. Where is your stepfather? He's, he's asleep in his cabin. He's drunk. He'll wake up. Yeah, I, I, I see. Yeah. You, um, you got any money? Twelve dollars. But I can work once I get to a big town. Oh, I don't know. Oh, please. Please. I've been driving all night. I was going to grab a little shut eye here for a no, few I hours. I've got to go now. He, he might wake up and he might. Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. Well, okay, come on. You know, after what you told me about that stepfather of yours, I got half a mind to go back and punch him in his nose. He's got no hold on you. Who does he think he is? Hey, listen. Let's do his thing right. Go back there and tell him right off. No, we can't. I'd like to anyway. I suppose it wouldn't do any good, only make trouble for you. Beats me, though, how any man can treat a gal as nice as you like that. You, uh, you are pretty, you know. Thanks. Hal. My name's Hal. Hi, Hal. What's yours? Francis. Oh, Francis, huh? Nice name. Uh, you hear that? What? The motor. Betsy doesn't like this heat any more than we do. How far are you going, Francis? Los Angeles. Yeah, it's a nice town. And um, we could have a lot of fun there. We? Yeah, hey, you and me. I um, wasn't going that far. You but... might change your mind, huh? I don't know, maybe. Los Angeles is a nice town, isn't it? Come on over. Oh. <laughs> there. That's better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Los Angeles is a great place. You know, I can get a couple of days off and... Uh-oh. What's that? Betsy means it this time. Hey, what was it? Uh, 17 miles of Saguaro from that camp? Yeah, but... Yeah, we've come five. Shorter to go back. I gotta get to a phone. Oh, no. No, now, you look, can't. Francis, don't worry about him. I'll be ready for him. No, but I can't go back. I'll, I'll walk. Now, you do nothing of the kind. Look, baby. All you need is someone to take care of you. And from now on, I'm the guy. You can't. Why can't I? Let me out. Told you to let me out. I don't want you to handle it. Stop the car. Stop it. Get hold of yourself, baby. Don't you trust me? No. I mean, yes, but... What about Los Angeles, John? Forget it's not. It's not you, I said. It's not you. Just don't ask me anymore. Stop That's the car. That's all I want to know. Just sit tight and let me handle everything. We made it. Now, where's the phone? On the wall by the door. Yeah. Well, what you gonna do, sit there? Yeah, I'll wait. I'll be sure you do. What do you mean? Eh, nothing. I guess I got the jumps, too. 
And don't worry about him. If he comes out, just let out a yell, and I'll be here in a second. Smile. <laughs> yeah, it's better. <laughs> you know, baby, I kind of like you. Keep that chin up. Yes, Francis, keep your chin up. You could use a little courage now, couldn't you? There's a chance he won't look behind the counter, just a bare chance. But if he does, there you are in a stalled automobile 20 miles from nowhere and not a car in sight. But wait a minute. Around the curve, a car. Hurry, Francis, you've got to stop it. Wait! Wait! What is it, Wesley? Take me to the next town. Hurry. Well, what's the matter? Uh, my uncle. It's my uncle. Something wrong? Yeah, yeah, he's hurt. Quick, I've got to get a doctor. Well, you're a mighty lucky young lady. I happen to be a doctor myself. Where is he? Oh, no. No, no, it's bad. It's, it's horrible. I don't want uh, you to... Now, you see... just let me decide that. Uh, here, I got my case. You take me to him. He... He's in the lunchroom. I, I'd better wait here. Yes, yes, I understand. You just relax now, and I'll take a look. It might not be as bad as you think. Just wait there in my car. Don't stand there like that, Francis. Do something. The car, his car. That's right. Hurry up. Faster, faster, 60, 70... Keep your eye on the center line, wavering like a snake between the wheels. Twelve miles now between you and the camp. Five miles to Sawaro. Seventy-five. Eighty. Almost lost it on that turn. The accelerator's down to the floor. Faster. Open your eyes, Francis. You can move. Open your eyes and crawl out of the car. You're okay. I'm okay. Better get off the road. Yeah. Take off cross country. I'll be watching. Watching the road. Cross country. down. Goodness sakes alive, a body can't hear himself think around here. Oh, oh, sorry, Matty. I don't know why in the world you keep that thing banging away night and day. Well, that's the dead blasted tubes. It gets louder and softer all of a sudden. A fella from Sorara coming up to fix her. Well, I ain't seen him. I should be here this afternoon. Think I'll go out and take a look around. Jake Watson, you stay right in that chair. You've been a mighty sick man. Hey, Matty, Matty, look. What? They're coming up the walk. Well, where could she come from? Hey, she's sick. She almost fell. Uh, well, Dad, blast it, do something. Well, you stay right there. What's the matter, honey? Uh, I don't know. Oh, there now. Just take hold of my arm. Thanks. Ma, you look all tuckered out. Come in. Thanks. Now, don't talk. We'll just get you out of this hot sun. Uh. Wouldn't surprise me none to find you was in my sunstruck. No hat and all. Land sakes, whatever you doing walking around out here. Now, hush yourself, Jay. Can't you see the poor thing can't hardly walk? Let alone listening to you jabber. Now, there, now, you sit down there, and I'll get you a nice cool drink of milk. <clears throat> you been walking far, miss? Yeah. Any particular reason? Yeah. I cracked up my car. Any more questions? No, no, I just thought it might be peculiar you picked this time of day to go walking. I'm oh, sorry. Now, Jake, suppose you quit jabbering and let the poor girl rest a spell. She's about done in. Yeah, she's been in an accident. Car went off the road. Well, I declare. Ain't hurt none, are you? No. 
is tired. Well, here, you just lean back and take a good drink of milk. You'll feel better than a gypsy. Oh, there go them tubes again. Oh, turn it off. Yeah. yeah. Attention, please. Be on the lookout for a young woman in blue slacks and a yellow jacket, probably driving a Buick sedan, license number 8X43H7, about 5 feet 4 inches tall, blonde hair, name Francis Block, wanted in connection with the murder of Peter Crawford this morning at Duncan Wells. Lancey! Repeat. Hey, Attention. hey, that's you! Get out of my way! Oh, look out, Jake, she might have a gun. Hey, wait a minute, young lady. Let go of me! Oh. Hey, Maddie. Uh, Maddie. Four, two, she, she's gone. Oh, here. Here, let me help you off. Her? No. That's what we get for being good Christian. Hey, turn the radio off. Huh. A murderess. I knew there was something slick about that girl. That's all right. She won't get fur in this heat. Not in the desert. It's hot. Unbearably hot, 110 in the shade. You can't keep going much longer, Francis. Feet swollen and blistered, bruises that ache with every step you take. Three in the afternoon. You've been walking two hours since you left the farmhouse. 120 blazing minutes. Your head is full of sun, the flat horizon wavers, dust in your nose and throat. You've got to have water. Water from the clear, sparkling fountain in the square of Wilkins Corners, the little town ahead. You've got to take a chance. Maybe they haven't heard about you here in Wilkins Corners, Francis. Maybe they don't listen to their radios. Look at that sign down the street. Coffee, hamburgers. Take a chance. You may not get another one for a long time. Morning, miss. Uh, I'd like something to eat. Well, it's come to the right place. Hamburgers, hot dogs, barbecues, whole wheat, white, rye, apple, peach, boysenberry, cherry, lemon meringue, coffee, milk, and coke. Hamburger and white coffee. Hamburger. Hamburger. <sighs> Mustard, ketchup, or tomato sauce. Ketchup. Mm. You're right up. Pre-war service now. <laughs> We've reconverted. <laughs> yeah, hi, Billy. What you doing down in Swirl? Oh, mighty busy today. Barbecue and whole wheat and coffee. Special. Special. What you mean, busy? Why, well, I don't mean to tell me you ain't heard about the killing, huh? What killing? Well, sure. Found a man stabbed to death at Duncan Wells Tourist Camp. Yeah? Yeah, a guy who runs it named uh, Pete Crawford. No. Yeah, dead on a mackerel. Then the killer got away, they say. Sheriff's got posse out. Well, I'll be... Hey, late. Did you hear that? What? I killed over to Duncan Wells this morning. Pete Crawford. Well, you don't say. Yeah. You catch a killer? Nope. You better watch out. Might be serving him a meal long about now. <laughs> Mm, stabbed, was he? Yeah, with a bread knife. Yeah. Doc Lawton was coming down from Cactus Garden. Uh, he claims he talked with the killer. Well, why'd he nail him? Oh, uh, you know Doc, but scared of his own shadow. That's too bad. Yeah, it is. They say old Pete Crawford didn't have an enemy in the world. I mean, it's too bad Doc didn't do something. Oh. You know, the best time to nab a murderer is right after he's done his job. It surprised me none to see this thing end up as... Well, as another one of Sheriff Bradshaw's famous unsolved mysteries. Well, I don't know. You know. Murder's a funny thing. Ain't like going down to the feed store for a sack of barley. Takes planning, yeah. thinking. There's a thousand ways a killer can trip himself up. Oh, yeah. Just one false step along the way and it's all over. Yeah, well, maybe so. You know, I'd like to see that killer right now. <laughs> Probably pacing the floor somewhere, wondering if there was a slip-up. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be in old Doc Lawton's shoes, yeah. being the only witness. <laughs> Bet you the old boy's looking six ways before he leaves his house. Here you are, George. One hamburger. Yeah. Oh, there you are, miss. Hamburger on white. And I'll go get your... Co hey. Well, what's the matter? Now, where do you suppose she went? You forgot your hunger in a hurry, didn't you, Francis? A half minute more in that restaurant and it would have been all over. You're tired, worn out, but you can still think. A thousand ways you can trip up, make a false step, that's what he said. But you'll show them, won't you, Francis? First, get out of town and keep off the highways. Remember the sheriff's posse. The railroad, that's it. All the freight trains have to stop at that water tower a half mile out of town. Cross country again. 
through the brush under that blazing sun, keep away from the roads. And finally, the cool shade of the water tower with the drops splashing into a puddle there in the shade. You sit down and rest. Let your eyes close. Then... Someone's coming. Look, there's a piece of iron pipe in the corner. Remember where it is. Oh, beautiful. Hell. Thought you'd be here. They almost gave me the slip back there. What do you want? Gave you quite a run, didn't they? Hey, well, mind if I sit down? I got some talking to do. Mm. Yeah, it's better. <clears throat> nice and cool here. You know, maybe I'm a sucker, but I still think you're pretty nice. Beautiful, but dumb. Do you think you could get away with it? I don't know. I'm so tired. Yeah, I know you're tired, baby. Probably a little loony with a heat, too. No one in his right mind would have done what Shut you... Shut up! You don't have to rub it in. Now, listen to me. I can help you, see. I'm the only one who can help you get out of this. You haven't got a chance unless you play ball, understand? Help me. You! <laughs> Ow! Yeah. Sorry, baby. Maybe you'll listen to me. All right, Al. I'll listen to you. There's a way out of this. It's a short chance, but you'll have to take it. Wait a minute. Here comes a train. Get back there. It's afraid it'll have to stop. Then let me take a look. The pipe. If I can... No. I can't tell yet. Oh, wait a minute. Yep, yep, it's afraid of... So you were going to help me, were you? You didn't fool me. That's one mistake I didn't make. <laughs> Yes, Francis, you were careful. You could see through his offer to help, couldn't you? Now, no slips, Francis, no false steps. The train is stopped for water. You hide, trembling behind the shack at the water tower. Then as the train starts up, you grab the rung of the ladder on a passing car, up the side. Now across the top and down the side before anyone sees you. But wait... There's a guard on top moving toward you. Down the tops of the cars. Don't look back. Watch where you're going. No false steps, Francis. No false steps now. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, a word about today's pre-war bargain in gasoline mileage that's helping more and more wise Western drivers stretch their ration gas stamps. I'm talking about the good pre-war mileage you still get in Signal Go Farther Gasoline. Yes, it's true. You still go as far as before the war with Signal. And I'll tell you why. You see, the gasoline ingredients which you've heard are reserved for war are the very volatile, highest-octane components, such as isopentane. That's why Signal Oil Company frankly admits no gasoline today can give you all the pep and anti-knock performance you found in pre-war Signal gasoline, and which you'll enjoy again in even further improved Signal post-war gasoline. But when it comes to mileage, that's where Signal gasoline still shines. For today's Signal formula still contains not only all the high-energy components that gave pre-war Signal gasoline its superior mileage, but also new high-mileage hydrocarbons have been added. You can prove this for yourself by keeping track of your mileage. You'll find it's as true today as before the war. You do go farther with Signal gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. steps, Francis. That's what the man said. And you are going to be so careful. But then how could you tell what kind of a false step it might be? And now it's all over. 
And everyone knows the answer to the killing of your stepfather. Well, it's all cleaned up now. Found the murderer dead right there between the railroad tracks. Oh, terrible thing, terrible. Of course, without the doctor's testimony, they might never have known how it happened. The doctor? Sure, sure, according to the radio. Doctor says he went into the lunchroom and found that fellow leaning over Pete Crawford with a knife in his hand. Boy, the doc practically witnessed the murder. Then the girl didn't do it. Oh, I knew she was innocent, the poor little thing. Yep, yeah, yeah, she was innocent, all right. They figured the murderer was going to try to shut her up, too. That's why she had to defend herself with that piece of light lead pipe there. <laughs> Doggone it, he was already wanted in New Orleans for killing ten days ago. Terrible thing, terrible. Only one thing I can't figure. What's that? Well, after she got the murderer like she did, what do you suppose she was running away from? Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Eleanor Beeson, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with Signal Gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with Signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Parker, Johnny. Shorty Mutual. Oh, hi, Joe. What's on your mind? A gorgeous doll named Dolly McLean. Remember? Sure. The champagne dream girl. Yeah. Dancing darling of the roaring 20s. Uh, finally married Barnaby Cronin, didn't she? Right. And for a wedding present, he bought it the Circle of Fire. Oh, yeah. One of the five most beautiful necklaces in the world. Diamonds and emeralds. Worth a half a million. It's been lying in a bank vault for the last ten years since Barnaby died. We carry the insurance. So? She's coming out of seclusion, Johnny, giving a party. Just like the old days, she says. May go on for a week. Her last fling. And she's going to wear the circle of fire. Uh Uh-oh. Get the picture? Gallons of champagne, everything mixed up, crazy. And that old lady with a half million bucks around her neck. Target. You've got a problem, Joe. Johnny... We've got a problem. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Cronin matter. Item 1, $14.80, transportation to New York and to the apartment of America's one-time dream girl. One time, a long time ago. How do you do? I'm Johnny Dollar. I believe Mrs. Cronin is expecting me. I'm Mrs. Cronin, and yes, I am expecting you. Won't you come in? Oh, thanks. I did have butlers and maids and such for years, scads of them. But since Barnaby passed away, I've just hibernated, you might say. Oh, in here, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Ten years now in this same little apartment... As you can see, I've just been living like a little mouse. It looks very comfortable. Oh, I suppose it's comfortable enough, but... Oh, Sylvia, I'd forgotten you were still here. Mm Mm-hmm. 
But not for long, Mrs. Cronin. Oh, no. Please stay. We'll have some tea or sherry or something as, as soon as... Oh, you two, do you know each other? No, I'm afraid we don't. Oh, but of course not. How could you? Uh, Sylvia, this is Mr. Dollar. Miss Blake. How do you do, Miss Blake? Hello. Mr. Dollar's here to talk to me about, uh, well, something or other. I'm not quite sure what, as a matter of fact. It won't take but a few minutes. If uh, Miss Blake would excuse us. Sure. Go ahead. Have at it. Well, if you'll come this way, Mr. Dollar. Don't you leave now, Sylvia. Not a chance. I just spotted your bottle of tea. I'll have one or two with soda, if you don't mind. With soda? Oh, I see what you mean. You young people. In here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dollar. You by any chance, Johnny Dollar? Yeah, that's right. Uh, why, Miss Blake? Just wonder. Well, here's looking at you. And, brother, I wouldn't be in your shoes for a million dollars. No? How about half a million? That, I'll admit, might interest me. Well, shall we... After you, Mrs. Cronin. Thank you. Wonderful girl, a born comedian. Yeah, she's a scream. What is she, an actress? Oh, no, no, she writes things for magazines and things like that. Uh, sit down, Mr. Dollar. Uh, she came to interview me one time. That's how I met her. I see. She wrote a piece about my necklace. The Circle of Fire. Sylvia Blake. Oh, sure. Articles about gems, famous stones, jewel robberies. That's her. Oh, she's fascinated by the subject. She's coming to my party. Oh. Uh, why don't you come to my party, Mr. Dollar? Fine. I'd love to. In fact, that's why I'm here. Oh? Uh, Joe Parker over at Surety Mutual is kind of worried about this party, Mrs. Cronin. He's afraid you might invite people like me. What? I mean, people you don't know. You're a detective. Um... In a way. I told Joseph how I felt about that. He's not going to send any detectives around snooping into things, spying on my guests, wearing the hats in the house. Huh? Oh, not that you're like that, of course. But it's the principle of the thing. Well, wouldn't you have a better time at your party if you knew you were safe? Mr. Dollar, it was at a party that Barnaby gave me the Circle of Fire. Our wedding reception. There were over 2,000 guests. A thousand of them invited. And we danced. Oh, we danced all night. And the necklace was beautiful. And I was beautiful. Back then. True, but... And then afterward, at four o'clock in the morning, we drove through the park in a hansom. Just the two of us. And the driver, of course. And I wore the circle. And I was safe, Mr. Dollar. I was perfectly safe. Maybe you were just lucky that night. Barnaby was so wonderful. And he could make living so wonderful. Well, I don't doubt it. He was probably a man who could manage things pretty skillfully. He was running two railroads in a bank all at the same time. Then I imagine he had no trouble arranging for your safety without even letting you know about it. You mean guards all around? It's possible. Yes, it is. He was like that. He never wanted anything to worry me. All right, Mr. Dollar. You win. Good. But it's only because of one reason. I like you, and I want you at my party. Thank you, Mrs. Cronin. Oh, you're going to love every minute of it. It's up in the Adirondacks, our old summer place. Uh, Joseph told you, I suppose. Yes, he did. Mrs. Cronin. And the people I've invited, hundreds, literally, people I knew in the old days. Of course, a lot of them won't come, but, you know, it was strange. So many of the letters came back undelivered. Mrs. Cronin. Oh, Sylvia, I didn't hear you come here. I'm the sneaky type. You've got a visitor. Says he's an old friend. Really? Well, I suppose I'd better see you. Uh, you'll excuse me, Mr. Dollar. Sure, go ahead. You and Sylvia talk to each other. I, uh, brung the bottle in case you're interested. Short on the soda. Right. She's on a cloud by herself. Of course, some of the invites to the party were undelivered. Those beautiful people had a habit of dying young. Say when. When? Who's the visitor? I'll guess with you. Looks like an overgrown leprechaun. Said his name was Shorty Weber. Shorty Weber? You know him? I know of him. An old-time song and dance man, among other things. She probably worked in a show with him back in those dear dead days. Anyway, he's got an invite clutched in his sweaty little palm. Another free loader, I suppose. Aren't we all? I am, yes. Not you, though. You're working your way. 
Isn't that what you're doing, one way or another? Meaning? A magazine article, just in case. Written right on the spot. Attempted theft of the circle of fire. Clever jewel Why do you say attempted? I'm working my way, remember? Sure, I remember. But it won't be attempted, Johnny. Somebody's going to get that necklace before the weekend is over. I'll bet on it. Would you care to name any names? Pick a name off the guest list. Any name. Suppose I pick Sylvia Blake. You're the detective. You've dug up and written up every big-time jewel theft over the last 50 years. You're bugged on the subject. Obsessed with beautiful gems. Fits my personality. I'm rather beautiful, too, in a brittle and glittering sort of way. Don't you think so, Johnny? I think you work pretty hard at that tough act. Maybe. And I think you'd give your right arm to own that necklace. Going after that would really be going for the big one. Going for broke. And somebody will do it, Johnny. Wait and see. She left a few minutes later with the bottle under her arm and a chip on her shoulder. With the girl gone and the scotch gone, there seemed to be no point in me hanging around any longer. So I went looking for Mrs. Cronin to say goodbye. I didn't find her, but I did find her caller, Shorty Weber. He didn't hear me come into the room. He was too busy. He was hunched over Mrs. Cronin's writing desk going through her mail. You won't find it there, Shorty. Who's that? Hold it, Shorty. Don't try to reach for it. I, I, I wasn't going to. Honest, I wasn't. Turn around. Put your hands up against the wall. You, you got me all wrong. I okay, wasn't going to do it. Okay, relax. I was uh, just 38, coming... stub barrel, clip holster. Nice gun. It belongs to a friend of mine. Bad business, Shorty. An ex-con packing a gun. Oh, I guess you're Johnny Dollar. She said you was here. And I, I, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar, but you're wrong. Why, Dolly, uh, Mrs. Cronin... She's an old friend of mine. I tried to get her to marry me once over 30 years ago. A lot can happen in 30 years. Does she know you've served time in prison? Yeah. She thinks I was on tour, Europe and Australia. She never reads a paper or hears anything. Don't tell her, Mr. Dollar. Please don't. You know, it's quite a coincidence, Shorty. It was Jules that time. A big affair in New Orleans. And you were hired as an entertainer. A diamond bracelet, wasn't it? And you were caught cold. It's the only time in my life I've ever done anything like that. And I went again. Not, especially not to her. Why, I, I, I'm planning to look out for it at this party. That's why I bought the gun. And is that why you were going through a mail there? Yeah. I wanted to see who was coming. I learned things while I was doing time. I know how the word gets around in a big deal like this. There's a lot of wrong guys in this world. No argument, Shorty. Yeah, well, you met her. You, you, you know how she is. She's a babe in the woods on something like this. Did my ears be burning, or is it some other babe you mean? Not for me, Dolly. You're the only babe I ever could see. Oh, Shorty, you never give up. Oh, uh, do you two know each other? Uh, not exactly, but we found we had a mutual friend. A certain state prison warden. Oh, uh, how nice. Shorty's always doing benefits at those places. Uh, Dolly, yeah, uh, yeah, that was it. He did a benefit there. Oh, well, I'll bet you weren't over big. <laughs> well, you know. You're too modest, Shorty. Why they loved him, Mrs. Cronin. Hated to let him leave. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, speaking of leaving, uh, I got a shove now. Don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> it was crazy and corny and sad. The whole idea. I guess the sadness of it hit me when I was saying goodbye to Mrs. Cronin at the door. The gaiety slipped for a moment, and suddenly she was old and tired. And at the same time, she was a scared little girl. And then she said something strange, and the shivers ran up my back. Do you believe in premonitions, Johnny? Well, I have a hunch now and then. Well, whatever it is, it's the reason I'm doing this, having this party. One last fling, you might say, before it's too late. Oh, come now. You're still a young woman, Mrs. Cronin. No. I'm old, Johnny. I've been old for years, since Barnaby died. We loved each other so, but that's not what I mean. I've had this premonition lately. What sort of a premonition? That something awful, something terrible is going to happen to me.
There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a man who's afraid of his shadow, a girl who's afraid of nothing, and a stranger who strikes in the dark. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Jason Prell. Jason I Pre- manage Mrs. Cronin's trust fund. Oh, sure. We haven't met, of course, and I know that I'm overstepping the ordinary bounds of propriety, but I simply have to talk to you immediately, if possible. Well, can't it wait until train time? You're going with us up to a party in the Adirondacks, aren't you? Yes, I am, but it'll be too late then to make very much difference. Well, uh, maybe you could tell me the general idea of what you want. I understand Mrs. Cronin has authorized you to obtain the circle of fire from the bank and to keep it in your possession until she wears it at the party. Yeah, that's right. Don't do it. Leave the necklace where it is. Why? It's a long story, Mr. Dollar, and it goes a long way back. The whole thing is a lot more complicated than you realize. Well, I'm beginning to realize it. Just exactly what is it you're worried about? I'm worried about Mrs. Cronin's sanity. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, New York City, to the Home Office Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin matter. Expense account continued. Item four, a dollar and eighty cents. Taxi to the offices of the Daily Times Courier for a look at the morgue files on Mrs. Cronin. The clipping started with the year 1916, when a bright-eyed, wide-eyed kid named Dolly McLean danced her way out of the chorus lines of a two-bit musical and straight into the limelight of Broadway. One hit show after another. Hits just because she was in them. And parties, balls, social affairs. The dancing darling. A critic tagged it with a name in her first write-up, and the name stuck. So she danced. Danced away the mad, crazy years that followed World War I. And like everybody else, she lived it up. There were rumors of engagements, love affairs. The Baron this, count that, one after another. Shorty Weber was mentioned a few times. And Jason Prell was in from the beginning, as a promoter, though, a business manager, not as a lover. Her friends were mentioned, hundreds of them. Then Barnaby Cronin came into the file. Boy wonder of the business world, the golden prince. Engagement, marriage, and Barnaby's fabulous gift to his new bride, a half-million-dollar necklace of diamonds and emeralds, the circle of fire. Then Barnaby's sudden death, Mrs. Cronin's seclusion. End of file. Expense account item five, $24.30, transportation, hotel, and incidentals. 
and a taxi to the railway station to find the special coach Mrs. Cronin had chartered to haul her guests to the Adirondacks and to her Roaring Twenties weekend party. I purposely got there early, but one of the guests was even earlier. Mr. Dollar, wait. Hmm? You are Mr. Dollar, aren't you? That's right, but I Prell, don't think... Prell, Jason Prell. Oh. I thought you might come down early to meet the bank messengers. Thank heaven you did. Well, I'm afraid I don't... Dollar, see. I've known Dolly McLean and Mrs. Cronin for over 35 years. All that time, I've managed her business affairs, arranged her personal contacts, been like a father to her. Yeah, I've read the newspaper clippings. Well, uh, newspaper stories can be misleading sometimes. They build things up. Sensationalism. It's true, of course, that Dolly and I had some quarrels. Who doesn't? In spite of everything, I was still her best friend. Go on. I know Dolly, nor better than anybody else in the world. I know how she's gone downhill since Barnaby died, especially in the last year or so. And I know this whole idea is the worst possible thing she could do. Have you tried talking to her along that line? She won't listen. She's dead set on it. I'm hoping you can help. How? Point out to her how dangerous it is to go off into that isolated place with a piece of jewelry as valuable as a circle of fire. It's worth a fortune. Somebody's bound to try to steal it. I still don't get what you're driving at, Mr. Pro. But I just told you. It's the risk that's involved. To whom? Why, Mrs. Cronin, of course. She knows about the risk. She's willing to take it. She doesn't know what she's doing. Hey, you said something on the phone about her sanity. Are you trying to imply that no, she's... No, 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 no. Not, not yet. But she's not well. She's burned herself up back in those early years, and she hasn't much left. The only thing that keeps her going is... has a crazy kind of belief. Belief? Dolly believes in people. So do I, Mr. Perot. Well, yes, yes, of course. But Dolly's whole thinking hinges on it. All the people she knew back in the heyday, the people she calls her friends, in her book, they can do no wrong. She lived in a dream world, still does, like a fairy princess. But it never really existed. Things weren't like that back in those days, Mr. Dollar. So I've heard. Most of the people she thought of as friends were only trying to use her. Barnaby and I would block them off, take care of things when things had to be done, and let her go on living happily in her never-never land. And now, that's the only land she has to live in. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Why, some of those friends would cut their mother's throat for a tenth of the value of the circle of fire. Those are the guests she'll have at their party. Well, I've already been told once that somebody will steal that necklace before the weekend is over. Do you want to add your prediction? I think somebody will try. And that's all that's needed to start that dream world of hers falling apart and to make her face things the way they are. May I ask you a question, Mr. Prell? Oh, yes, of course. This trust fund you're managing that her husband left for her, just how big is the setup? Barnaby Cronin was a wealthy man, Mr. Dollar, but he had his ups and downs like every business investor... The capital is adequate for her support, but not much more. Is the necklace a part of the trust capital? It's her own personal property. Otherwise, I could have prevented it from being taken from the bank. You have complete control of the trust, then? Yes. Barnaby knew that she had no understanding of business matters. I see. She's old, Mr. Dollar. Older than her years. And tired. All that keeps her alive is her belief in the past. Yeah. Her dream world. Where everybody loves her and protects her. Where she's still a dancing darling. And if that dream world is destroyed, she'll be destroyed along with it. Now phone the bank, Mr. Dollar. Ask them not to bring that necklace here. I'm afraid they think I was crazy. Why? Because I've got it with me, Mr. Prell. I picked it up myself two hours ago. Then heaven help us all. The convention coach Mrs. Cronin had charted for the run to the Adirondacks was arranged with a long aisle of individual staterooms and a main lounge area at one end. It could accommodate 50 people. But when the train pulled out, there were only six of us in the coach. Six. Out of the hundreds of friends she'd had in the old days when she was in the big time and on top. And even out of the six, three of us were new acquaintances. People who hadn't known her back when. I was there, of course, because I'd been hired to be there to protect her fabulous necklace. And Sylvia Blake, still playing it tough and cynical, was probably hoping for a magazine article. Or hoping for something. But the third newcomer, there was the question mark. Oh, I think this whole thing is just too exciting for words. Don't you think it's too exciting for words? Well, I... Uh... I know who you are, of course. You're Mr. Johnny Dollar, and you're supposed to protect those fabulous jewels. And I'm Laura Dean. And I think we ought to call each other Laura and Johnny, because after all, it's a party, isn't it? Up till now, I was having doubts... You're, uh, obviously not one of Mrs. Cronin's friends from the old days. Oh, no, I just met her back there at the station. You what? 
Well, I talked to her on the phone, of course. She sent an invitation to my aunt, who was a very dear friend of hers. Only they hadn't seen each other for years, and she didn't know my aunt had passed on over a year ago. So I phoned her and told her, told Mrs. Cronin, I mean. And she said for me to come to the party, she'd like to meet me. And I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Yeah, well, uh... Johnny, do you think they'll really have champagne in bathtubs like they used to back in her time? If they do, it'll get awful wet out. There are only six of us to drink it. Oh, gosh, I don't see how you can call six people a party. Well, the thing is, we'll all be in there trying hard. <laughs> now you're joking me. I'll bet you are fun at a party. Oh, where do you see the act I do with a lampshade? Who did you say your aunt was? I don't think I said who. When do they start serving the champagne, Johnny? When they see the whites of your eyes. Oh, that's cute. I like that. Thanks. Now, about your aunt. Oh, poor old soul. She'd have loved this, too. You ought to hear about some of the parties she and Mrs. Cronin used to go to. Yeah, I imagine. They well, used uh... to go every place together back in those days. The newspapers called them the Siamese Twins. The Siamese... Siamese Twins. That was just an expression. Fritzy like... Morell. Is that what you're saying? That you're Fritzy Morell's niece? Sure. Did you know her, Johnny? No, I never met her. Oh, you'd have liked her. She was a lot of fun. Loved a party. Gosh, I thought there'd be no people like this. She kept babbling on, and I listened to her and tried to figure her out. The chatter was smokescreen. Underneath it, she was cool, sharp, and shrewd. I didn't know what she was up to, nor why she was here. But I did know one thing. Fritzy Morell had died about a year ago, true enough. But she'd left no surviving family and no niece. Laura Dean was a liar. I hadn't seen Mrs. Cronin since we pulled out of the station. She'd greeted us, then gone right to her stateroom and stayed there. And when I saw Jason Prell come hurrying from that direction, I could read the look on his face even before he reached me. Mr. Dollar, please. Mrs. Cronin? Yes, go to her at once. What is it? What's wrong? She was suddenly taken ill. Very ill. Hurry. Mrs. Cronin. Right now. Oh. It was just nerves. I've had it before. My doctor in New York gave me some tablets to take whenever... Are these the tablets? This bottle here? Yes. You know what they are, Johnny? Uh, yeah, I know. All right. So he does say it's my heart. But he's wrong. It's just nerves. Yeah, sure. That's not why I sent for you, Johnny. You have the necklace? Yeah. Want to see it? No. I'll wait until it's time to wear it. Johnny, I've written something here. I'm going to sign it, and I want you to sign as a witness. Well, uh, all right. Unless you'd rather have Jason Pro. Mm, Jason would argue about it. There. Now you sign. There you are. Keep it for me. (laughs) Do you mind if I know what I've signed? Of course not. Read it if you like. In the event of my death, I, Dolly Cronin, being of sound mind, bequeath the necklace known as the Circle of Fire to Sylvia Blake. Sylvia loves jewels. She'll appreciate it. Yeah, I imagine she will. She's not to know about this, you understand, because... Of course, it'll be years before she gets it. Oh, sure it will. Now, you'd better try to get some sleep. I'm going to. And thanks, Johnny. It was nothing. You know something? I was heartbroken when they didn't show up at the station. All my old friends. But I've been lying here thinking, and I've finally figured it out. Oh? They all went on ahead. They'll be waiting at the house. They're trying to surprise me. Don't you think so, Johnny? I said, yes, I thought so. But I was lying because I didn't think so. But she was still a dancing darling, and she had that way about her. You wanted to protect her. I didn't go back to the lounge. I walked down the corridor to my stateroom. It was night by then, and the corridor was only dimly lit. My stateroom was dark. When I opened the door, I caught a bare flash of movement too late. When I came to, minutes later, I was lying on my stateroom floor, blood seeping from a cut in my head. I felt in my inside pocket for the bulky leather case that had held the necklace. It was gone.
There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, an old love and an old hate. And violence breaks out at midnight. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hello. Dollar? You the Mr. Dollar that's been trying to phone me? Is this Dr. Bigby? That's exactly who it is, and I'm very busy right Look, now. Look, Dr. Bigby, I want you to come out here just as soon as possible. It's the old Cronin Summer Place, about five miles up the river from where... Oh, I know where it is, I know. What are you doing up there? The house has been closed for years. Mrs. Cronin opened it up for a party this weekend, but she was taken ill on the train coming up, and I want... Is Dolly out there? Yes, yeah, she's the one I want you to look at. So she's back. After all these years, she's come back. She had a prescription from her doctor in New York, but she's taken the last of it. It's apparently her heart. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I'm very busy tonight. Yo, what? Much too busy, and then there's a storm coming up, and I have a patient someplace, I think. Now, wait a second. If you're a friend of Dolly's, uh, Mrs. Cronin's, do one thing. Take her back to New York. Now. Tonight. Get her out of here. Fast. Before it's too late. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar at Wells Falls, New York, to the home office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin matter. A half-million-dollar necklace. Expense account continued. Item 7, $5.40, taxi. I figured I'd find Dr. Bigby in one of the local pubs. But I covered them all in about 30 minutes. No sale. And unfortunately, Bigby was the only doctor in Wells Falls. Worse, the local druggist couldn't fill Mrs. Cronin's prescription. The nearest chance was Tupper Lake, 25 miles away. Back out at the Cronin place, I turned the taxi over to Jason Prell, Mrs. Cronin's business advisor, and he took off for Tupper Lake to look for the medicine. Then I went looking for Mrs. Atherton, a village woman who had been housekeeping on the estate since the place was built. I found her in the kitchen. Storm's brewing up, coming out of the mountains. It'll hit us before morning. They always come in the night. I guess you've seen a lot of storms in these hills, Mrs. Atherton. Lived here all my life, never been out of them. It's Miss Atherton, not Mrs. Oh. She's the Mrs. up in the bed, even if she is a widow. Little Dolly, Mrs. Cronin, till death do us part. Did you know Barnaby Cronin, Miss Atherton? Yes, I knew him. Of course I knew him. I worked here. Oh, yes, you were here then. What kind of a man was he? Like any other man. Not according to Dolly, Mrs. Cronin. She apparently worshipped him. Still does, in fact. Dolly's always worshipping something. Everybody was always worshipping her. She had us all dancing to her tune and without even trying. You knew her back then? She was born and raised here in the village. I thought everybody knew that. No, that's what I missed. Well, we used to work together, waiting tables at the summer hotels around here. 
That's where Jason Prell saw her. Told her she ought to be on Broadway. She left the town the next week. Didn't come back again till after she and Barnaby was married. And she got him to spend a fortune to build this place for her. Well, I guess he had the fortune to spend. Oh, yes. She married well. Count on Dolly for that. Always got whatever she wanted and never even had to ask. Things were just given to her, always. Yeah, probably so. But she's been pretty generous herself. Like uh, keeping you on here, for instance, when the house has been closed up for years with nobody using it. Oh, she's the dancing darling, all right, right to the end. Well, now, if you'll excuse uh, me... There was something else I wanted to ask you, Miss Atherton. I'm not one to talk ordinarily, but you got me started. Well, this is not about Mrs. Cronin, at least not directly. She was taken ill on the train. I don't think it's serious, but I wanted a doctor to look her over. The only one in the village seems to be a man by the name of Bigby. Bigby? He's the coroner here, but he's not a doctor. No? Oh, not anymore. Still calls himself one, but he lost his license ten years ago. He's a drunken sot. Yeah, I kind of figured. But he sobered up fast when I told him on the phone that the patient was Mrs. Cronin. He refused to come out, told me to get her away from here fast, and then he hung up on me. Forget him. He couldn't do her any good. But I'd, I'd like to know why he acted that way. Do you happen to know any reason? Bigby is a drunk. Who knows what his reasons are? I thought you might. Better ask him. What difference does it make anyway? He can't help her. Nobody can. What do you mean? She's come back finally. For the first time in all these years. Took sick on the train. That wasn't any surprise to her. She knew it was going to happen. Well, I guess she halfway knew. She knew. It's like with an animal. When it's hurt or sick and it comes home to die, and that's what she's done. She's come home to die. No, I think you're wrong there, Miss Atherton. I don't think she's anywhere near that sick. Barnaby didn't think so either, when he came back here to die. Barnaby died here? Yes, in this very house. A heart attack, it was called. He came up on the afternoon train and... Hmm. That's strange. It was the same kind of night. A storm like tonight. Strange how things move in patterns. Were you here with him, Miss Atherton? Barnaby died alone. And the doctor? Bigby? Miss Atherton, was the doctor... Uh Oh, I'm sorry, I was thinking. The bridges were washed out. Bigby didn't get here till the next morning. Wouldn't have mattered. He couldn't have done anything. Nobody could have. When it's time for a thing to be done, it's done. Nobody can stop it. Nobody. It was a strange evening. Ominous and oppressive, with a feel of violence in the air. Even the house itself added to the feeling. Furnished lavishly in a style 30 years forgotten, it seemed garish now, old and tired and lonesome. Like Mrs. Cronin herself, who'd planned a grand party for all her old friends and instead lay ill and alone in the bedroom upstairs. The queen gave a party and nobody came. All dressed up, no place to go. Yeah, gloomy evening. Jason Prell came back from Tupper Lake with a medicine. Miss Atherton served a dinner of sorts, served it in silence, and we were left to our own devices. Five guests and a mansion built for a hundred. Prell stayed pretty much to himself. Lovely Laura Dean, with that air of knowing innocence, and veigled Shorty Weber into teaching her some of his old dance routines. And they cranked up an old phonograph in the music room. And me, I just stood at an open window and watched the rain come down and tried to think. That's the perfect touch. It's exactly what the evening needed. That music? Ah, Sylvia. Really cornball, isn't it? (laughs) No, no, Johnny. I I meant the thunderstorm. An isolated old mansion. Fabulous necklace of diamonds and emeralds. Weird housekeeper. A hostess lying ill. And now rain. Shades of a house of usher. That'll make a good lead for your magazine story. I should have stayed in New York and just written it, not lived it. Oh, I thought you were the big take-a-chance girl, Miss Blake. Danger, mystery, adventure. Don't those things appeal to you? Maybe. Is there any of that lying around somewhere? There may be, before the night's over. Well, all I can see at the moment is sheer boredom. 
You have to know where to look. In the bottom of that scotch glass, for instance? Oh, <laughs> just killing time. Oh. Uh, I've been wanting to uh, ask you, Johnny. How'd you get that cut on your head? Uh, it's a long story. It happened on the train. I know that. You didn't have it when we left. A sudden stop. I fell over my suitcase. Sure you did. Backwards. Huh? It's on the back of your head. Somebody made a try for it, didn't they? On the train coming up. Well, I don't know what they were trying for. It wasn't time to ask. Maybe they even got it. That's the way you were betting, wasn't it? That it wouldn't be just an attempt. That somebody was going to get it and get away with it. Did they? Is that what happened? Is it gone? All right, just stand there and grin, then. Oh, rain. I'm going back to the city tomorrow. You are? Well, don't smother me with your pleading. <laughs> no, stick around, Sylvia. Things may get better, including the music. You know, in a way, I hope somebody did get the circle of fire. Why? What good is that fabulous necklace doing her now, lying up there? She's had everything she ever wanted. Life's been too easy on her. She doesn't deserve it. She ought to lose it. Her life or the necklace? The necklace, of course. You know, for reasons I can't go into, I think you'll be sorry you said that someday. Sorry? Why? She's a woman who's had everything. You're pretty pretty, aren't you? Hurt and afraid. Am I? You feel something big may have passed you by, and you put up that tight, bright front for protection. But inside, you're tied in knots. And what is your recommendation, Doctor? A man, perhaps? That's the usual advice. Now, you said it. I didn't. Well, you're a man, Johnny. Why don't you smooch with me? It'd be a way of passing the evening, killing time. All right. What are you... Johnny, wait! Johnny, what? Why did you do it? Because you wanted me to, I... and because I wanted to. Adventure, mystery, danger. Who's bored? Who's going back to the city? Those doctors are right. Dollar, could I talk to you for a minute? Why not, Shorty? What's on your mind? I don't know exactly why you call us all together in it here. It was Mrs. Cronin's idea. She set it up with me earlier. Well, it ain't got nothing to do with what I want to say. You, 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 you seen me in a bad light there yesterday at Dolly's apartment. Well... Well, you found a gun in me. You know about my record. It made it look bad. I, I know it did. But so help me, Mr. Dollar. Everything I told you was the gospel truth. Yeah. I'd break my arm before I'd do anything to harm Dolly in the least bit. You see... I've been in love with that woman for 35 years. I'd like to broke my heart when she married Barnaby. But I always knew I didn't have no chance right from the start. She was up there, big, somebody. Me, I was a nobody. But I'd still die for her any time. That's all, Mr. Dollar. I just wanted you to know. They were all there, gathered around the big dining table, watching me and waiting. Mrs. Cronin had asked me to arrange it. She said that was the main reason they'd come, and she didn't want to disappoint them. I told them that. And then I took the circle of fire from my pocket and laid it on the table. They all reacted in different ways. Laura Dean gave a gasp, and her eyes opened wide. And Sylvia... Look at it. Just look at it. Sylvia Blake was fascinated, hypnotized. Yeah, you should have seen it on her back in the old days. It sparkled even twice as much. Hmm. So that's what this is all about. It's only jewelry. I've seen it before. But there was one special reaction I was looking for, and I got it. Jason Prell's face went white. Who could imagine anything so beautiful? Mr. Prell, you seem surprised. I wasn't carrying the necklace in its case, the case you stole from me on the train. What? I was carrying it loose in my pocket. What did you do? Throw the case off the train without even bothering... It's running away! Prell! I went after him, but he'd already disappeared somewhere down the hall. He knew the layout of the house, and I didn't. I searched the different rooms quickly as I passed, but there was no sign of him. He couldn't have reached the floors above, but he might have gone down toward the game room and lower halls. I eased my gun from its holster and started slowly down the stairs. And at that moment, every light in the house went out. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a white lie, a bullet from the darkness, and death comes in out of the rain. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hello, Sheriff. I can't hear you for the storm. We were cut off before. Hello? Is that you, Sheriff? I said... Hello? You get cut off again, Mr. Dollar? Not this time, Shorty. Somebody cut the wire. The phone's dead. Then we got no way of getting white out. No way of getting help. No, not at the moment. And he's out there in the dark somewhere. He's got a gun and there's no telling what he may try and do. Shorty, get away from that window. Well, we know where he is now and what he intends. Because he just made a try at it. What are you going to do about him? Only thing I can do, Shorty, go get him before he gets me. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar at the Cronin Estate, Wells Falls, New York, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin matter. Protection of a half-million-dollar necklace. Expense account continued. Item 10, $135, one tweed sport jacket to be purchased on my return. Both lapels and one shoulder ripped by a bullet. Also one pair of slacks to match. Destroyed a few minutes later in the mud, slush, and underbrush in the grounds of the Cronin place while pursuing a suspect who'd already tried twice to kill me and who made a third go at it when I stepped out of the side door of the house. Sorry, away from the door, quick. Whew, boy, that was close. Yeah. He can see the door opening, but he can't see us. Not in this mess. He's desperate. He's shooting blind. Look, Shorty. Yeah? Why don't you go on back in the house? There's no reason for you taking chances like this. You're taking them? With me, it's a job of work. I get paid for it. I told you earlier how I felt about Dolly, I mean. I don't know what Jason Prell's game is, Mr. Dollar. But if it's against her, then I'm against him. I'm staying. All right, it's up to you. Thanks for giving me my gun back. Emergency, that's all. You've got a prison record, Shorty. You know what it means if you're caught with a gun. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> hey, good. I figured Prell would give himself away if he kept that up. I got him spotted now. Where? At the base of that tall pine, a little to the left. Watch for it, the next flash of lightning. There, yeah, yeah, now I see it. I know the one you mean. Then stay here and keep him pinned down. It's a good spot. You've got cover from the wall of the terrace there. What are you going to do? Circle around and come up beside him. Just throw a shot at the base of that pine tree now and then. Keep him tied down. Keep him busy. You got it? Right. And good luck. I left the shelter of the house and started edging through the shrubbery. The undergrowth was a regular jungle. It would have been impossible to slip up on Prell without his hearing if it hadn't been for the storm. Shorty Weber fired now and then at the pine tree. And twice Prell fired an answer. Jason Prell, so-called friend of old Mrs. Cronin, knew I had him tagged. At first, I'd been guessing mainly, but he didn't know it. And he'd lost his head and made the guess prove out. And now he was apparently ready to risk murder or death rather than face a prison term. I was within 30 feet of him. He hadn't heard a sound. He was still firing at Shorty over on the terrace. His back was turned partly toward me. He didn't know I was near, so I leveled my gun. Get your hands up, Prell. Drop that gun. You covered. He whirled, peering into the darkness of the bushes, trying to see me. He knew I was close, but he couldn't tell where. 
He raised his gun, started to turn, and... I'm not quite certain what happened next. The light was bad, and I could hardly see him. Whether he stumbled accidentally or... Or what is something I'll never know. All I know is that when I walked over to him, he was dead. He was no good, Mr. Dollar. I always thought so, but Dolly swore by me at her fool. What about Barnaby, her husband? He couldn't stand Prelate first. Later, they got us tickets, thieves. Yeah. Well, it's a mess, Shorty, a real mess. Old things that should have stayed dead and buried on the bottom, they're all coming to the surface now. Tell me something, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? What about Dolly? Is this thing going to kick back on her? Will she get hurt by it? Yeah, Shorty, I'm afraid she will. Pretty badly. It was deep into the night, edging toward dawn, when I got back to the house. I changed out of my wet clothes, went to the game room, and got Dolly's necklace from under a chair cushion. I'd stuck it there when Prell had pulled the main switch and put the lights out. Then I went upstairs to look in on Dolly Cronin, quietly, just to check. But it didn't work out that way. Johnny, is that you? Yeah. I didn't mean to wake you. Oh, you didn't. I've been awake most of the night. Come on in, Johnny. All right. How are you feeling? Oh, just fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. Good. Isn't Laura Dean a nice girl? Huh? Yes, she is. And I'm glad she came. Company for you, Johnny. Oh, yeah. Quite a storm we had, wasn't it? Oh, it was beautiful. All that lightning, wind, the thunder. Oh, I haven't seen such a beautiful storm since I was little. Johnny, thought I heard shots a while ago. Shots? Outdoors. Off toward the woods somewhere. Oh, it might have been lightning, thunder. Sounded like a gun. Like somebody shooting. Well, sound plays funny tricks up here in the mountains. Uh, I guess so, but... Well, I've been thinking back over the past so much that makes the present a little unreal. I'm afraid the past is about all I have left now. Now, don't be so quick to sell this future of yours short. You've got a lot of years yet, good years. Well, I had a lot of good years. Good friends, good times, a good life. And best of all was Barnaby. You loved him very much, didn't you, Mrs. Cronin? I worshipped him. He was perfect. He never did a wrong thing in his life. Now that he's gone, is the one fine memory I always cling to. Oh, if I didn't have that, well, I, I just couldn't go on. Well, then let's hope you never lose that memory. Of course, there were other good friends, too, over the years. Like Jason Prell. Hmm. He is so quiet. And withdrawn, it takes a long time to get to know him. But he's been such a good friend to me. So patient with all this silly ignorance of mine about business problems. Yes, I'm sure he has. I just don't know what I'd do without him. Yeah. Now, don't you think you'd better get some sleep? In a little while. You know, Johnny, it's funny how things work out. In what way? I was born and grew up Right here in this village. Yes, your housekeeper, Miss Atherton, told me the two of you were girls together. We were inseparable. Like I said, I grew up here and then I went away. And Barnaby and I came back and built this house. And we went away again. There were always so many places to go. New things to do. It's a big world, isn't it? And finally Barnaby came back for the last time. And died here. All alone, poor boy. And now I've come back. The place where I was born. Everything finally comes home. Doesn't it, Johnny? Yes, nearly always. I'm very tired. I think I will sleep now. Be good for you. The necklace, Johnny. Do you have it with you? I sure do. Here you are. 
It's so beautiful. And so many memories. All so long ago. Put it on me, will you, Johnny? Of course. Raise up now. Just a little. There. How do I look? Sweet enough to kiss. Well... Nice. You go to sleep now. Yes, sir. I'll only look at the necklace for one minute only. Then I'll take my pills and go to sleep. And then I'll dream up a dream. A great big dream. Good night. Dancing, darling. It's been a long time since anyone called me that. A long, long time. Good night, Johnny. Thank you. I left her and went downstairs and rustled myself a pot of coffee. I sat down by an east window and drank it cup after cup and watched the morning sun come up. Dream a big dream. Well, before many more hours, she was going to need a big dream. There was no way of keeping it from her, all of it. The fact that Jason Prell was dead, shot. That he'd attempted murder and tried to steal a necklace. And worst of all, that her beloved Barnaby had probably been as big a crook as Prell. Is it all right if the girl who can't sleep sits this one out with you? Sure. Pull up a chair, Laura. Like some coffee? Just black, thank you. I guess it wouldn't do much good to ask you what's been going on around here all night. Something has? Like I said, I guess it wouldn't do much good. Here's your coffee. Oh, thanks. That's how I found you, just followed the smell of this coffee. Good. I guess if I said I heard somebody shooting up the place during the storm, you'd just say, really? Never use the word. And I guess if I showed you that broken window over there, you'd say maybe a pigeon flew in. Might, if I happen to think of it. I'm sorry all this kept you awake. Oh, don't apologize. I probably wouldn't have slept anyway. Why not? Guilty conscience? Don't be silly. I didn't even do it. Do what? Whatever it is I'm supposed to feel guilty about. Lying is what I had in mind at the moment. Oh, I do that all the time, but I never feel guilty about it. I just call it making up things. Like claiming you were the niece of Fritzy Morell, (laughs) Mrs. Cronin's oldest friend. Gosh. Worked out my windpipe. Like claiming you're Fritzy Morell's niece. Mostly I drink tea, but you already had the coffee Like claiming you're Fritzy... All right, all right. How'd you find out? Nothing very spectacular. She just didn't have a niece. I wasn't sure. But I thought she must. Everybody her age has at least one niece. What was the idea? Well? Well, I lived in the same rooming house she did. She liked me. Talked to me a lot before she died last year. So when the invitation came last week, I got the idea of going as her niece. I didn't mean any harm by it. I just wanted to go to the party. All right, relax. That's about the way I figured it. Well, it turned out to be quite a party, didn't it? I hope I never see another one like this as... Johnny. Johnny, what's wrong with her? It was Miss Atherton. I got up slowly from my chair as she walked toward us and then stopped a few feet from the table. Her eyes were fixed on something far away and the look on her face was strange and grim. I think I knew even before she spoke... Mrs. Cronin is dead. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the questions and the answers for the living and the dead. The final payoff... And fate itself plays the last trump. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.
From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Bigby here. Dr. Bigby. I'm asking you for the second time now to come out to the Cronin place. I told you last night, Mr. Dollar. The circumstances are different now, a lot different. We don't need a doctor. We need a coroner. A coroner? Where are you calling from? The operator told me the phone out there was out of order. It is. I'm at a forestry station a mile down the road. Jason Prell cut the wires last night before he was killed. Jason killed? Shot to death during the storm. So that's how he ended up. It took a long time, but everything finally comes home. Yes, Mrs. Cronin said the same thing an hour or so before she died. Dolly, too. Her heart, Mr. Dollar? In a way, maybe. The dancing darling. Finally at rest. She... What do you mean, in a way? Dr. Bigby, Mrs. Cronin was murdered. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar at the Cronin Estate, Wells Falls, New York, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin Matter. Expense account, final page. Item 13, 10 cents. A half pack of cigarettes I left with a farmer who gave me a lift back from the forestry station. The price of my own feelings at the moment would have been lower. About eight cents lower, in fact. I brewed another pot of coffee and sat down to wait for Bigby. But this time I laced the coffee with brandy. The sun was up by then, clear of the horizon, bringing a bright new morning and a brand new day. The storm was long over, and the world sparkled and danced. But too much of the night was still with me, and the past still too much alive. And yet, maybe Dolly Cronin was better off. She was a part of that past now, where friends were always true. Every minute of life was even more wonderful than the last one. And where she was still and forever, the dancing darling. Good morning, Johnny. Oh, hi, Sylvia. I'm in the coffee business this morning. How about it? Please. Mm. Having yours with cream, I see. Yeah, bad night. Shall I make yours the same way? Right. I had a bad night, too. Thanks. Hmm. You look real beat, Johnny. Couldn't be any beater. Something pretty terrible happened last night, didn't it? Yes. Jason Prell is dead. Oh. And Dolly Cronin is dead. Oh, no. I loved her, Johnny. I didn't mean what I said last night about life always having been too easy for her, and you were right. It was just being frustrated, tied in knots and covering up. I loved her. She was sweet. Yeah, she was quite a girl. She had something, I don't know. She had love. She loved people, and they loved her in return. Maybe so. Anyway, I guess this belongs to you now. The necklace? The circle of fire? What do you mean it belongs to me? She made a will last night. I witnessed it. She left the necklace to you. I just can't believe it. Johnny, can I... Can I put it on? Why not? It's yours. She wanted you to have it. You look good in it. I just can't believe it, Johnny. Well, before you get carried away too far, maybe you'd better brace yourself. Oh, it's not mine after all. Oh, it's yours, all right. But it's not real. What? It's a good copy, worth maybe four or five hundred dollars, but that's all. Well, I... I I, I don't understand. It's so well known. The, The circle of fire, it's been written up over and over. Yeah, from old records. But nobody's really examined it for years, since before Barnaby Cronin died. It's been locked up in a bank vault until I took it out. Was there ever a real one? Yes, originally. But it was broken up and disposed of years ago. Jason Prell knew it. Was in on the substitution, I suppose. That's why I was so desperate to steal it from me and get rid of it before I found out it was a copy. He knew that if that deal came to light, it would call attention to some of his other activities, worse ones. What do you mean? Prell had complete charge of Mrs. Cronin's estate. He told me it was worth practically nothing. But according to records I saw in New York, it amounted to over a million dollars in the beginning. He was stealing her blind all these years. Oh, it was easy. She was alone in the world, knew nothing about business. She trusted him, thought he was her friend. She trusted everybody, much too much. Well, she sure trusted the wrong ones, including her husband. Barnaby? Sure. 
What do you think disposed of the necklace and slipped her a copy after making such a big deal out of his fabulous wedding gift? A phony. And she worshipped him. The king. In her book, the man who could do no wrong. Well, in the business book, he didn't do much else but wrong. According to the records, most of his deals were pretty shady. Especially after he and Prell teamed up. Yes, Miss Atherton? Dr. Bigby is here to see you. All right, show me. Mr. Dollar. I wouldn't believe too much of what he says. He's a chronic drunk. Yes, I remember you telling me. Show him in. Yes, sir. Well. I was just thinking, Johnny. Mrs. Cronin didn't know any of this, I assume. No. She was safe in her dream world. And she thought she was giving me the real necklace. That's right. It's crazy. And kind of wonderful, isn't it? Just like that, she gave me something she thought was worth a half a million dollars. Just because I was nice to her and liked her. You know something, Johnny? What? I'm just as glad it is a copy. It's beautiful and and I love wearing it. I'd have been scared of the real one. And I'll always remember that, like that dream world of hers... She thought it was real. One more question left, but a big one. The question of murder. And I already had the answer. I was sure of it. And I knew there was nothing I could do about it. Dr. Bigby was a man under 60, but he looked years older. A harried man, tired and worn. He sat down for a moment and we talked. And I began to realize that here was another man who'd been under Dolly Cronin's spell. And who was shocked and hurt by her dying. It was a remarkable thing and a difficult one to explain, Mr. Dollar. Like many another, I suppose, I often wondered why I felt the way I did about her. It was a a sort of magic she had. Yeah, I know. Even as a girl here in the village, she had that same power and had it without knowing it. Everybody loved her. No, not quite everybody. At least one person didn't. Yes, you mentioned on the phone the word murder. That's right, Dr. Bigby. Who killed her? A man we can't touch because he's already dead. Jason Prell. Well, he's done about everything else, I guess. I wouldn't put it past him. What do you base it on, Mr. Dollar? A bottle of pills. Prell supposedly went to Tupper's Lake last night and got a prescription filled for Mrs. Cronin. She took some of it this morning, an hour and a half before she died. There it is. I'd seen the bottle on the train coming up with a few tablets left on the same prescription. And these are different. Well, you're right on one count, Mr. Dollar. Those aren't what the prescription calls for. What do you mean, one count? I talked to the druggist at Tupper's Lake on the phone last night. He told me about Jason being in. All right, it still stands. He had the prescription filled and then changed the tablets, substituted these. It's possible. Would you happen to know what they are without having them analyzed? I've got a pretty good idea, but I'll wait until I've examined her before I'll say positively. Uh, Mr. Dollar... I'd like to explain why I wouldn't come out when you called me last night. Yeah, I wish you would. I'd been drinking. So I gathered. I'd been drinking that other time, too, and I'd made a mistake. I didn't want to make another one. Just what do you mean? When Barnaby Cronin died here, I signed the death certificate. Yes, I know. I hadn't treated him. He was dead when I came out. I called it a heart attack. I was drunk. And I was wrong. Barnaby was poisoned. Go on. I didn't suspect it until later. And then I was afraid to do anything about it. I'd signed that certificate and I knew it would break me. So I kept still. And I consoled myself with drink. And finally, it broke me. So the same end result was achieved. Look, Dr. Bigby, if Barnaby Cronin was here alone, then how was he poisoned? Alone? He wasn't alone. When he died, she was here with him. Mrs. Cronin? Of course not. Why do you think he was always making trips up here, always by himself? I didn't know he was. For years, every week or two, the whole village knew about it. She was here with him that night. She's the one who called me, asked me to protect her good name. She's the one who poisoned him. And now she's had another try with the same poison. But why? Ask her why. Ring for her and ask her. That won't be necessary. Well, I'll go on up and make my examination. Well, Miss Atherton, I'm asking, why? 
He was planning to break off our relation. He told me that night. She'd finally won. That silly little fool had finally won. But I didn't let her win. I killed him. You're confessing to murder, you know. It doesn't matter now. I've accomplished everything I meant to accomplish. So it was you who changed the tablets in her prescription bottle and substituted the poison? Of course. It was so easy. For once in my life, things were just as easy for me as they'd always been for her. Will you have the sheriff come out, Mr. Dollar? I'd like to make my confession. It's odd how things work out sometimes, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Mrs. Cronin said something like that last night. I was pretty certain when you showed me the tablets, but I wanted to make my examination first. What do you mean? After Barnaby died and I started to suspect Miss Atherton, I managed to steal the poison from her in order to analyze it. I substituted harmless tablets of the same general appearance. And those are what she's kept all these years? What she gave to Mrs. Cronin? That's right. They were perfectly harmless. But in that case... Dolly Cronin died from a heart condition. The tablets had nothing to do with it. In a sense, Dolly died the same way she lived. From natural causes. Expense account item 14, $83.90. Incidentals and transportation from Wells Falls back to Hartford. Expense account total, $263.30. End of account, end of report. Remarks? The insurance angle here seems a little muddy. Premiums were paid for years on an item that didn't exist. And yet, no claim was filed and none will be. So, well, I leave it to your legal eagles. Me, I'm beaten, tired. Maybe a little sad. I've come out of this with a kind of nostalgia. And for a time and place I never even knew. And I'm halfway in love with a girl back in that time and place. A girl I've never seen. (laughs) Oh, sure, I know. It's a dream world and a dream girl. And none of it exists. But it's too bad. I wish it did. Because she must have been a honey. A real sweetheart. A dancing darling. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, please, there'll be a new exciting story on Johnny Dollar beginning next Monday. Next week, the story of a man worth $50,000 who didn't have a cent to his name. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Shirley Mitchell, Vivi Janis, Barbara Fuller, Benny Rubin, John Daner, and Parley Bear. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking.
found it, Larry. Found it. You're not kidding, Bill. Are you sure? Positive. Don't get so excited you stop pumping air to me down here. Keep your helmet on. I'll keep pumping. You sure it's the sunken ship we're looking for? We were looking for the Argus, weren't we? Yeah, but make sure it has the gold in it before we get too excited. Okay. Here. Give me a little more line. Yeah. There's a big gap in her side I can look into and see right into the hold. Okay, but be careful. Don't get caught in the current and lose your footing. Just keep my lines tight, and I won't. Keep pumping air. I'll pump you enough air for a month if you find that gold. Just enough for now, I'll do. Well, Bill, what goes? You see anything yet? See anything? I can see everything. Larry, there's more gold here than I thought was in the whole world. You found it, huh? Sure did, Larry. We're rich. <laughs> you mean I'm rich. What are you talking about? You'll know in a minute. Pull on your tow line. Huh? Pull on it, Bill. Okay, but... <clears throat> hey, Larry, it's loose. Sure. <laughs> I got it loose. What's your idea? What? And here goes your airline, too, Bill. I'm cutting that. No, Larry, don't. No, you can't. You can't. I can't, huh? I already have. Oh, Larry, don't. I'm pulling out of here, but fast. As soon as I cut this phone line... Oh, Larry... So long, Bill, old pal. And now, on to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. just how you feel, Sarah. Your brother was a swell guy. And believe me, there was nothing I could do to save him. I, I'm sure there wasn't, Larry. Honest, there wasn't. I was pumping air to Bill when all of a sudden the phone went dead. Then I saw bubbles on the water, and when I pulled on the tow line, it was limp. Something underwater must have cut the lines. Yeah, I'm afraid that's what it was. Sarah, I want you to remember that Bill and I were partners. And Bill's death doesn't dissolve that partnership. You're in if I ever find that gold. No, I I wouldn't want it. It'd remind me too much of Bill. I think you'd better go now, Larry. I think I, I'd rather be alone right now. Yeah, sure, sure. Anything you say. Uh, well, uh, so long, Sarah. And, and I'm sorry. It's all right. Bye, Larry. Hey, goodbye. Bye, Larry. I'll be seeing you. Yeah, sure, sure, kid. So long. Oh, no. What are you bawling about, sis? Yeah, yeah, all right. Came in the back way so nobody would see me. Thanks for feeling so miserable when Larry told you I was dead. It's very complimentary. Bill, it really is you. You're alive. Yeah, I sure am, sis. And that was some story Larry told you about how I died. He thought you did die. What happened? What happened? Larry tried to kill me, and I'm alive now only because I'm a smart diver. I'm going to be just as smart a killer. Bill, don't talk like that. Why not? As far as anybody knows, I'm dead. So I'm going to kill the guy who tried to kill me. And I'm going to get away with it, too. Yes? Boston Blackie? Yes, again. May I come in? Yes, with a capital, why not? Thank you. Blackie, I... Uh, 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 don't tell me. You're in trouble. Oh, you know someone who's in trouble, and you've come to me for help. Yes, Blackie. It's my brother. Well, what's he done? Swindled, embezzled, or murdered? He hasn't done anything yet. But he's going to kill a man. He is? When? As soon as he finds him. And he's going to get away with it, too. That's a popular misconception, Miss... Uh, Miss... Uh... Bronson. Sarah Bronson. My brother's name is Bill. Bill Bronson the diver? Yes. Oh, now, wait a minute, Miss Bronson. Your brother died this morning. I heard it over the radio not an hour ago. My brother's very much alive, Blackie. And it's because everyone thinks he's dead that he thinks he can get away with murder. Well, I have a hunch he's right. Up to a point... Who was he going to kill? Larry Matthews, his partner. That wasn't an accident under the water this morning. Larry tried to kill Bill by cutting his lines. Uh-huh. So Bill wants to stay dead and get his revenge. I think you'd better go to the police, Miss Bronson. No, I don't dare. Why not? Bill's gone almost crazy after that experience this morning. He said he'd kill me if I went to the police. But he didn't say anything about going to you. I see. Well, I'll see what I can do for you. Whatever it is, you'll have to do it fast. Bill is... Excuse me. Hello. 
Hello, Blackie. This is Charlie Kingston. Oh, hello, Charlie. I'll call you back oh, in just a minute. I... Nothing serious, Blackie. I'm just keeping a promise I made to you. What promise? You know about never jumping into a new business deal without telling you what I've done. Well, uh, tell me about this one some other time, Charlie. Will you? I've got to keep a man named Larry Matthews from being killed. Did you say Larry Matthews? Yes. He's going to be killed. Good heavens, no. I, I won't have anyone murdered in any of my offices. What? He's downtown in my manager's office right now, and they just closed a deal for $100,000. What kind of a deal? A salvage job. I bought half interest in $2 million worth of gold, Matthews and Bronson, that dead diver found. I saw the chart myself. Look, Charlie, phone your manager and tell him to hold Matthews there. Bronson isn't dead. Matthews tried to kill him, and now the diver is out to kill Matthews. What? Well, I don't understand. Never mind what you don't understand. Phone your manager, tell him the whole story, and tell him to hold Matthews there. I'll get there myself as soon as I can. So that's what the score is, Mr. Matthews. Wait. Oh, excuse me. Uh, sure, Mr. Walton. Walton speaking. Oh, Henry, this is Charlie Kingston. Oh, yes, Mr. Kingston. Look, is Larry Matthews there? Yes, he is. Good. Keep him there. And don't let him leave your office under any circumstances. Uh, what's the matter? His life is in danger. Somebody's looking for him to kill him. Boston Black, he'll be down there in a few minutes to take over. Now, wait for him. All right, but I don't understand. Now, don't try. Wait till Blackie comes and get that chart from Matthews. I want that chart. Don't worry, Mr. Kingston. I'll get it for you. Bye. Goodbye. Anything wrong, Mr. Waltham? You look a little pale. Nothing much is wrong, I hope, Mr. Matthews. That was my boss, Mr. Kingston. He wants me to keep you here in my office until Boston Blackie gets here. Why? Why? Because your life is in danger. Huh? Mr. Matthews, do you know of anyone who's trying to kill you? No. No one in particular. <laughs> but I'm not surprised my life's in danger. Yours would be, too, if you owned something as valuable as that shot of mine. Yes, yes, I suppose so. Well, we'll own it soon. Mr. Kingston asked me to be sure to get it from you. Well, you've given me your check. Come on down to my house at the waterfront and I'll give you the check. Mr. Matthews, I can't let you leave this office. Mr. Kingston's orders. Well, if you want that shot, you'll come and get it now. I want to close this deal and get rid of that shot. Well, aren't you afraid to go out on the street? <laughs> I'll take my chances. I got a gun right here, see? Come on, I want to get this deal over with. All right, I'm going with you. Just a minute. Hey, what are you taking out of that drawer? My gun, Mr. Matthews. If you're in danger, I'm in danger, too. Here's my house. Wait till I unlock the door, Walton. Sure. Well, so far, so good. We haven't seen anyone who even looked as if he wanted to kill you. <laughs> That doesn't make me a bit unhappy. Now, come on in. Oh, wait, I'll turn on the light. There. Now, come on in. I'll get you the chart. Okay. I never had enough money for a safe, so I always uh, hit anything valuable under the floor. I see. Uh, this loose board here is uh, my safety deposit vault. Here. Here's your chart right here. I'll see if they can get any anything else now. Uh, Let's see how you turn out the light. I, oh, you dirty double crosser, Waltham. You, you got me, but maybe one of my bullets got you, too. Hi, Blackie. Hello, Mary. You know, I've been waiting in this office for you for one hour. Well, I got here as quickly as I could, but I wasn't worried. I knew Matthews would be safe as long as you were here. Well, I'm here, but Mr. Matthews isn't. What? I hope I won't have to tell you a dozen times. Mr. Matthews went out with Mr. Waltham. But didn't Kingston phone here until... Excuse me. Kingston Enterprises, good afternoon. Well, this is Mr. Kingston. Let me speak to Mr. Waltham again, will you? Mr. Waltham's out, Mr. Kingston. Oh, I see. Oh, did he leave with Mr. Matthews and a Boston Blackie? Boston Blackie? No, sir, I don't even know him. I'm Boston Blackie. If that's Kingston, I'd like to talk to him. Oh, Mr. Kingston, Blackie wants to talk to you. Oh, by all means. Here you are, Blackie. Thanks. Hello, Charlie. Uh, Blackie, what's the matter down there? Where's Waltham and Matthews? Well, that's just what I want to ask you. Didn't you phone Waltham and tell him to keep Matthews here? Yes, the minute I was through talking to you. Uh -huh. well, what is he? He isn't here now. What happened to you? And I hate to think what's going to... Uh, wait a minute, Blackie. Here's Waltham now. Good. Matthews with him? Uh, no. Uh, in good heavens, Blackie, Waltham's wounded. Badly? Uh, just a minute. Waltham, what happened to you? Here, I sit down here. I've been shot. I went with Matthews. I got shot. Well, Charlie. Look, sit down. Uh, yes, Charlie. Blackie, yes. Uh, if Waltham can talk, put him on the phone, will you? Uh, all right. Uh, just a minute. Uh, can you talk, Waltham? Yes, I think so. Good. Here, I'll hold the phone for you. It's Boston Blackie. He wants to talk to you. Waltham, can you hear me? Yes, Blackie. Where's Matthews? 
dead, I guess. I don't know. It happened too fast. Who shot you? I don't know. I couldn't see. It was too dark down there. Down where? In Matthew's house. We went there to get the chart showing where the gold ship was located. We were in the house when the lights went out. There, there were shots from the darkness. Matthews fell. I was hit, but I got away. Where's Matthews' house? On Wharf Street. Okay, I'll go down there and see what happened. Matthews still has the chart? Yes. Yes, he has. Well, maybe I can find it. Maybe I can find him. One thing I promise you, I'll find something. <laughs> Well, I can say one thing for Wharf Street, Mary. It's not pretty, but the sea hair is wonderful. Smells fishy to me. <laughs> so does this little situation we're in. Mm. Well, the man at the fruit stand said this is Matthew's house, 219. Hmm. I don't see any signs of excitement. Maybe Mr. Walsham dreamed up his story about mm. being shot. If he did, he dreamed up a bullet hole, too, Mary. And that's awfully realistic dreaming. Mm. Let's go in and see if we can find anything. All right. The lights are on inside. Let's have a look around. Okay. Search downstairs. There's nothing here. What's with you? Hey, Mary, that's Faraday. Hey, who is that? Keep looking, Rollins. I'm glad to see you with it. Blackie. You. Yes, Inspector. Me. And me, too. Uh, don't remind me. Blackie's bad enough. Bad enough, Faraday. You mean good enough, don't you? Good enough for what? To tell you what happened here. A guy named Larry Matthews was killed. That's what happened here. We found his body inside. I suppose you know who killed him. Sorry to disappoint you, Faraday, but yes, I do know who killed Matthews. It was his ex-partner, Bill Bronson, the diver. Oh, hum. Want to hear more? Keep talking. You don't know how stupid you sound. Listen, Bill Bronson's sister came to see you today, didn't she? Yes. And you told her to come to see me, didn't you? Yes, but she wouldn't do it. Well, she changed her mind. Uh, women do that, you know. So? So, Blackie, you think Bill Bronson killed Matthews, huh? I know he did. How do you like that? Well, an hour before Matthews was killed down here, a cop arrested Bill Bronson uptown. And he's been in jail since. How do you like that? And now, back to Boston Blackie. When Bill Bronson, diver, found a sunken ship with its long-lost cargo of gold... His partner, Larry Matthews, cut his air hose and lines and left him for dead. But Bronson miraculously lived and swore vengeance on Matthews. The diver's sister, knowing of her brother's plan, came to Blackie for help. But before Blackie could get to Matthews, someone else got to him with a gun. And it wasn't Bronson, because Bronson was in jail. As we return to our story, Henry Waltham, who was with Matthews when he was shot, was having a bullet wound dressed by a doctor. Still hurt, son? Yeah. Yes, it does, Doctor. Mm, you're lucky you're still alive. That bullet just missed puncturing your lung. Yeah. Yep. You'll have to take it easy for a while. Yeah. That dressing will do for now. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Doctor. Well, let's see how you respond to treatment before you thank me. Uh, here we are. Uh, what's your name, son? You... You have to know that? Yep. Okay. It's Waltham. Henry Waltham. Henry Waltham. Mm -hmm. And how did you get that bullet in you? I told you when I came in. It was an accident. I know. Now suppose you tell me the truth. Look, what's it to you how I got shot? You're a doctor, not a policeman. I know, but I have to report this to the police. What? You've got to report it? Oh, no. But it's the law. I'd lose my right to practice if I didn't... Well, you're going to lose a patient if you do. Lie down, son. You're still too weak to I'm get... I'm not too weak to get out of here. Oh, no, you don't. Oh, yes, I do. Here's something. Oh. Instead of your feet. Come back here, you. Come back. Oh, no. Operator, get me the police. I wonder when that diver's going to signal us, Blackie. He's been down there long enough to have found ten million dollars in gold. Well, I wish he'd find Waltham while he's at it, Charlie. Blackie, do you think Mr. Waltham killed Mr. Matthews? I don't know, Mary. Oh, Mr. Kingston! Mr. Kingston! Yes, Captain Arnold. The diver's found something down there, Mr. Kingston. Let's talk to you. Well, thank you, Captain Arnold. 
Uh, a couple of extra earphones, Blackie. You and Mary might like to listen in. Thanks, Charlie. Oh, I'd love to. Just wait till I get mine on. Uh, okay, then. This will be a great moment if he's found that gold. Uh, uh, hello down there. This is Charlie Kingston. Sorry, Mr. Kingston. No luck here either. But Captain Arnold said you'd found something. Yes, but not a ship full of gold. Just the end of the sandbar. And a drop-off so deep, my light won't hit the bottom of it. Well, I guess we're in the wrong place again. I'm afraid we are, Mr. Kingston. I wish you'd had a better look at that chart. I can't make many more dives today. I realize that. Well, uh, come up and try just once more, will you? Sure. Once more. Oh, uh, Captain Arnold... Yes, Mr. Kingston. Uh, have your men bring the diver up. He, we still haven't found the right place. Yes, sir. All right, men. Let's bring the diver topside. If the only thing's down there worth bringing up. Come I'm on, afraid you'll have to wait until you get that chart to find your gold, Charlie. But I may never get in black here. Remember, I only had a quick look at the chart. Oh, look, they're cranking the thing that brings the diver up. I'm going over there and watching some out of the water. Well, don't try to help anyone, Mary, or they may have to pull you out of the water, too. Okay, I'll be I think we'll try looking for the gold over there a few hundred yards. You're just wasting your time looking for it without that chart, Charlie. And I'm wasting my time out here, too. I ought to be looking for Waltham. You think he killed Matthews, do you? Well, I'm not sure. I'd hate to think that Waltham killed Matthews. You know, he said a third person entered the room just as the shooting started. I don't believe that story completely. That's why I want to find All Waltham. All right, men. The time is brought to the surface. Come aboard. Come on, better step aside, lady. Oh, I'm sorry, all right. Better come over here by us, Mary. Oh, stop. I wanted to watch him take the diver's helmet away. Yeah, he's going to go down again in another spot, Mary. Maybe you can watch then. Well, you can see him from right here now, Mary. Well, it isn't as good as being close, but... Oh, look, look, he's up on deck now. He looks like the man from Mars, doesn't he? <laughs> yes, he does. Woo! All right, men, stop the pump. We've got his helmet off. Well, Mary, you saw them take the helmet off. Blackie, well, he... look! Look, there's an awfully big launch, and it's heading right toward us. Good night. The fool doesn't see us. Hey. Oh, our engine's in time to get out of his hey. way. Captain Arnold! Captain Arnold! Hey. I see him, Mr. Kingston. He's going to crash into us. Hey. Hey. Hold on to me, Mary. Back! Follow the whistle! Cause we have that son of a in the What do we do? Yeah, everybody! It's your last time to swerve off! Yeah, it's not right here. Come here, Mary. Stay close to me. All right, I will! Is, is, is everybody all right? Well, I'm all wet. I think I'm all right. You all, all right, Blackie? Yes. I'm okay, but, but look, we're five or six miles from shore. I uh, I don't like this. See if anybody can grab a, a plank or something from the boat. Good idea. All your men all right, Arnold? Yes. Yes, Mr. Kingston. And here comes the launch. It looks like a police boat, too. See, it is a boat. Hello there. Hello. Save your breath, Charlie. I see it. They're swinging around to pick us up. Here they are. Here come the lifelines. They're ready to grab them. Okay. That's it. Here, Mary. You take this one. Oh, thanks. Well, look who's playing porpoise. If it isn't Boston Blackie. It's Faraday. <laughs> Call him in, boys. All but that good-looking one there. He looks undersized to me. Haul me up, Faraday, or I'll haul you in here with me. What? When you know I can't swim? <laughs> That's why I'd like to have you in here. Here, Blackie. I'm aboard now. I'll take this rope of mine. Thanks, Charlie. Are you ready? Ready. Come on. Uh, up you go. Uh, there you are. There. Oh, wow. Thanks, Charlie. You all right, Mary? Oh, sure. Just dripping a little, that's all. Well, there's some blankets in the cabin there, Miss Wesley. Better get into one right away. All right, I guess I better, thanks. I don't know what brought you out here, Faraday, but I'm glad something did. Well, I came out here just in time to see that guy Waltham ram your boat. Well, how didn't you, did you know it was Waltham, Faraday? Well, because a doctor reported treating his wound and told how Waltham slugged him and skipped out. Then the next report I got on Waltham was that he was seen getting into a power boat in the harbor. Oh, Inspector Faraday. Yeah, Rollins, what is it? Just got a radio message from shore, Inspector. Yeah? So what? So we don't have to look for Waltham anymore. He walked into the 18th Precinct Station and gave himself up. <laughs> so you think Waltham rammed us, Inspector? Uh, okay, okay, I was wrong. 
Uh, I suppose you know who rammed you. I have a rough idea, and I think if I see Bill Bronson, I can smooth it out. Bill Bronson? What could he have to do with this? He's still in jail. Good. Let's go down and see him before he's released. Uh, what makes you think he's going to be released? You're going to release him. He still doesn't know that his ex-partner Matthews is dead, and uh, Faraday, before you let him out of jail, I'm going to let you... Bad news for you, Bronson. I'm in jail, Blackie, and you say you have some bad news for me. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, but this isn't, Bronson. Hey, Faraday. You and Blackie got awful long faces. What's the matter? Your sister's dead, Bronson. Huh? Sarah's dead? Yes. Killed by the man who tried to kill you. Why, the dirty Matthews out. Wait, wait a minute. That won't do any good, Bronson. All we want you to do is give us all the information you can. We found your sister's bodies in Matthew's house. Do you know any reason why she would be down there? Yeah. Yeah, I know a reason, Blackie. Guess I'm it. What do you mean, you're it? Well, what am I in jail for? Because I said I was going out to kill Matthew for trying to kill me. Why? Well, I guess this went down there to kill him just to keep me from doing it. Only Matthew shot first. Yeah, the low down. And that's enough, enough of you. that, Bronson. Now, look. Your sister's dead just because you wanted to take the law into your own hands. Now, if you've learned your lesson, I'll let you go free. Yeah, I, I've learned my lesson, Inspector. All right. Go home and be a good boy. Because I don't want to have to teach it to you again. They let you out. Sarah, they told me you were dead. What? Yeah. Said Matthews killed you. I told him you went down there to kill him for me. You idiot, you stupid... Now, look, you don't have to get sore. I had no way of knowing that... I you... didn't have to get sore. I ought to kill you for what you've done to me. What have I done? What have you done? Because of you, you stupid fool, the police are going to be after me for murder. And why did I kill Matthews for you? You did not. It was your idea to kill him for the money and the charge. All right, it was my idea. And it was also my idea not to get caught. But you aren't caught yet. And I was tricked into saying that... Saying enough to send me to the electric chair. And everything was perfect, absolutely perfect, till you had opened your stupid mouth. Now, look, don't blame me all for this. Your plan wasn't perfect. Oh, wasn't it? Who'd ever guess I killed Matthews? Didn't I go to Blackie and warn him that you were going to kill Matthews? Didn't I go to the police and have them arrest you to keep Matthews alive? I know, I know all that. Oh, you know all that. Well, I know a lot more. After I took Matthew's chart, I risked my neck to keep Charlie Kingston from finding that gold. I rented a launch and rammed his boat. I did all that for us. And what did you do for me? Fall for a stupid trick. Now, look, I'll go back to the police and tell them I was lying about you wanting to kill Matthews. I'll... Let's well, just uh, now, Branson. We're right here. Come on in, Blackie. Police. Stand where you are, Branson. Uh, Rollins, go revive Miss Bronson. She's fainted. Yes, sir. Well, Faraday, happy now? Yeah, I'm happy, Blackie. I've got my killers. Sure you have. I made sure you would. Well, Inspector, you might as well take Bill Bronson downtown. He's so used to being underwater. Let's see if he's getting used to being under arrest. Uh, hello down there. Any luck, diver? I'm coming to the hull of a ship now, Mr. Kingston. I'll let you know in a minute. Good, good. Well, we'll know in a minute, Blackie, if Inspector Faraday got the right chart from Miss Bronson. Right. Walton feeling okay, Charlie? Yes, fine. But he feels like a fool for losing his head and running out on that doctor. He, he doesn't know what made him do it. Oh, I suppose he was afraid the police wouldn't believe his story about how Matthews was shot. Hello there, Mr. Kingston. Oh, it's the diver. Uh, yes, diver? I found it, Mr. Kingston. There's plenty of it. Oh, you found the gold? You bet I have. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Uh, Blackie, Mary, he, he found the gold. Wonderful. Well, that's fine, Joe. Well, aren't you excited? It's two million dollars in gold. I, I'm a rich man. You've been a rich man for years, Charlie. Just how rich can you get? After all, what difference does two million make to a man who already has 20 or 30? Do, do you know something, Blackie? What is it, Charlie? I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs>
The National Broadcasting Company brings you Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell in... Dangerous Assignment. Over here. Here I am with the boat. Swim over this way. Here, let me help you, I bought. Give me your hand. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Ah. You set the charge of natural glycerin? <laughs> Good. And no one saw you leave the ship? <laughs> on schedule. The ship goes to the bottom, and only the two of us know the location. <laughs> and now... Uh, wait. Wait, no. No, put down the knife. No! No, no, no! Oh. Three ships sunk in two weeks, Steve. And the last one cost the lives of six passengers. But, Commissioner, why send me halfway around the world just because three ships were sunk? Steve, those ships carried U.S. rehabilitation supplies. I see. Now, as usual, you'll pose as a foreign correspondent. Here's your press credential, Steve. Your passport and plane ticket. Ruth, did you say plane ticket? You take off in two hours. Now, look, I was figuring on a little deal. Uh, Can't it wait till tomorrow? No, it can't wait. And that's another thing, Steve. On this assignment, there's to be no women and no gambling. It's strictly business. Dangerous business. Okay, Commissioner. All right, Steve. Your first stop in Saigon is the Malayan Star Lines. The manager's name is Bravon. You've got your assignment. Get going. You've seen him in The Great McGinty, as Major Devereaux in Wake Island, as Trampas in The Virginian. Now, here is our star, Brian Donnelly, in another two-fisted portrayal as Steve Mitchell in Dangerous Assignment. The time now, the place, Saigon, inscrutable city of the Orient where the ancient and the modern rub elbows in the narrow, crowded streets. Saigon, city of intrigue, of shadows, of forgotten men, of danger. Mr. Brabant, I believe you're in charge of the Malay and Star Lines here in Saigon. That is correct, Monsieur... Mitchell, Steve Mitchell. I'm a foreign correspondent. I just flew in. I'd like an interview. There's not much of which to talk. Three ships of our line sail for Singapore. The first night out, an explosion, they're gone. Just like that, huh? We oui, just like that. Could uh, I take a look at the passenger list for those three ships? Certainly. I have them on my desk. Hmm. Thank you. You don't carry many passengers. Only a few. Any survivors? From the first sinking, none. From the third sinking, also none. How about the second? One. Who is it? An Englishman named Dixon, the cook. Is he around anywhere? I'd like to talk to him. Aran, tell the Englishman Dixon to come to my office. Most of your crews have been with the line quite a while. It is the exception rather than the rule, monsieur. Out here, one must take what men one can get. I see. What kind of cargo were your ships carrying? That is the mystifying part, monsieur. Here are the cargo lists. As you see, the Malay and Star Lines carry American rehabilitation supplies... Teakwood, spices, rubber, the usual. This uh, teakwood, I notice all of it comes from the same place. Yes, the plantation of Monsieur Surat. It is inland, up the Saigon River. Come in. You wanted to see me, Mr. Brevant? Uh, oui, yes. Uh, this gentleman is Monsieur Mitchell, a journalist. Nice to meet you, sir. Hi. Uh, Mr. Brevant tells me you're the only survivor from the second sinking. Oh, I'm the only one from any of them. That makes you pretty lucky, doesn't it? (laughs) Lucky ain't off of it. Look, uh, did you notice anything unusual aboard your ship before the explosion? Well, I was back aft, getting a breath of air before turning in, I was. And I noticed a silhouette of a small boat in the moonlight. Off our starboard beam, she was. And running without lights. Without lights? That's right. Anything else? 
I didn't have time to notice anything else, mister. Because just then there's a sheet of flame. The whole ship goes up in the air, and the next thing I know, I'm holding on to a spar in the water for dear life. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you any idea what your ship's position was when she went down? Near as I can figure, we was in shoal water close to Polo Condori. That is an island a hundred miles off the coast of Indochina, monsieur. But, of course, it is but a guess. We have no way of knowing the exact location. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for the information. I think it ought to make a good yarn. Do you intend to remain here in Saigon long? Well, that depends. I'd like to talk to Mr. Surratt, the plantation owner. Do you know where I might find him? There is a gambling casino just down the street, monsieur. If he is in Saigon, he will be there. Good. I'm beginning to feel lucky. I am certain you will not lack for games of chance in Saigon, monsieur. I personally find gambling a bore, but it would seem I am in the minority. Yeah, I guess you are. Well, thanks for the story. I'll see you around. Hmm. He's an inquisitive gent, ain't he, Mr. Brevon? Yes, he is indeed. Newspaper chap, is he? That is what he said. Dixon, tell Aran to answer my telephone for me. I'm going out for a while. Sixteen. Red. Event. Sorry, monsieur. You lose again. Look, this game is slow death. Haven't you got something with a little more action in it? And monsieur will perhaps prefer the dice table downstairs. That's a thought. Thanks. Oh! oh I beg your pardon. Oh, no, it is my fault, monsieur. <laughs> Let me pick up your chair. Oh, you are most kind, monsieur. It was very clumsy of me. As a matter of fact, I bumped into you deliberately. It was the only way I could think of to meet you. Monsieur has a ready wit. All bets down. If you're looking for something to tack on after the monsieur, it's Mitchell. Steve Mitchell. They call me Leanna, monsieur. They picked a nice name. Well, here are your chips. You pick up my chips and my luck with them. You must allow me to buy you a drink, huh? You see, I am superstitious. Good. So am I. And having a drink with you is suddenly a superstition of mine. <laughs> Let us go to the bar. Leanna. Leanna. Well, I should have known you wouldn't be alone. It is only my brother, monsieur. Oh, where are you going, Leanna? It is all right, Matihiga. I am sure the American will take good care of me. Uh, monsieur Steve Mitchell, my brother, Matik. Hello. Oh, your servant offended. Here, Matik, you play some of my chips now while we have our drink. Come along, see. You uh, live here in Saigon, Leanna? For the most part. But I am restless. I travel a lot. Tomorrow night I leave for Singapore. Oh, I guess my luck hasn't changed after all. I will not be gone long. How are you going to Singapore? I travel by tramp steamer. It is not so boring. Oh, not on the Malay Star Lines. Why, yes. Ah, here we are. <laughs> sort of crowded right here. Why don't we move down to the other end? Uh, there all is right. room here. I will move over. Oh, thank you. No trouble, sir. No trouble at all. What will you have, Stephen? Bourbon and... Hey. What is it? I just saw someone I know, Leona. Uh, excuse me just a minute. Of course. Be back in a minute. I will order the drink. Well, my dear. He seems interested in the Malayan star line, sir. You think he is involved? It is possible. Very well. I will proceed on that assumption. Boy, come here. We oui, with you? I want a message delivered for me. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Brevant. Huh? Oh, Monsieur Mitchell, is it not? Have you written your story yet? Not yet. I'm a little surprised to see you here at the casino. When we talked this afternoon, you told me gambling bored you. It does. But I do find interest in observing gamblers, Monsieur. Particularly when high stakes are involved. Oh? Monsieur, I congratulate you on the speed with which you have made yourself acquainted in Saigon. What do you mean? Did I not observe you conversing at the bar with Surat? Surratt? The stout gentleman. You mean the guy who was standing next to me, the one with the face like a toad? <laughs> Your description does not flatter him, but it is accurate. Hmm. Well, thanks, Surratt. I'll see you around. Undoubtedly, monsieur. I 
sorry I took so long, Leona. Oh, it is quite all right. Well, here is your drink. Thanks. Say, uh, what happened to the guy who was next to me here, the one who moved over to make room? Huh? Oh, I did not know, Steve. I was not noticing. Hmm. It's a rat. Is that his name? Yeah. Well, cheers. Cheers. We should meet you. Steve Mitchell. Over here, boy. You are a busy man, Steve. <laughs> I seem to be. Monsieur Mitchell? Yeah, what is it? Uh, you are wanted outside, monsieur. Oh, by whom? Oh, he not give name, monsieur. But he say, quite urgent. Okay, here. Oh, thank you, monsieur. Lana? I know, I know. You will be gone but a minute. Yes, I will wait for you. <laughs> Mitchell Effendi. Who are you? You are Steve Mitchell? What do you want, a calling card? Yeah, I'm Steve Mitchell. I suppose you tell me why you got me out here. I am Dalai. I suggest that we walk, Effendi. Oh. You always suggest with a gun, Dalai? When it is necessary, Effendi. Come. Mind telling me where we're going? Certainly not. Right around the corner here. And into the alley. Cozy in here. And dark, it can be. Wait a minute. Looks like we've got company in here. It is but my friend Banjak, Effendi. Oh, hello. What's the matter? Is he bashful? He cannot speak. His tongue was removed by force some years ago. But he is strong and willing. Banjak. Why, you... That... Reminder from Banjack will serve to open the conversation. Look, I don't know what this is all about. To be brief, Effendi, you have information which I require. The locations of the three sunken ships. The ships? You think I know where they were sunk? Banjack. Look. Perhaps that will refresh your memory. How can I tell you the location when I don't know them? Again, Banjack. I tell you, this wasn't going to do you any good. I don't know where those ships were sunk. Very well. If you intend to be stubborn, you may proceed, Banjak. I told you not to resist. Well, if you think I'm going to stand here and let this big ape make mince meat out of me. Very well, Effendi. It is a pity the Effendi bleeds so easily, Banjak. But I must not deprive you of extended enjoyment. You may kick him. I will tell you when to stop. The National Broadcasting Company is bringing you Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell in the second of an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment. The time, the next morning. The place, a luxuriously furnished bedroom in a spacious villa near Saigon, overlooking the sea. Oh. Ah. You are awake at last, Fendi. Ah, uh, you can call it that. Well, hey, wait a minute. You're Leona's brother, aren't you? Matik. Your servant, Fendi. Look, would you mind telling me how I got into this harem? <laughs> You are in the house of my sister, Liana. How did I get here? Well, Liana became worried when you did not return to the casino last night. We went outside to look for you and found you crawling out of the alley badly beaten. So we brought you home with us. You are all bloody. How do you feel now? All bloody? Hey, help me out of this mink lion cradle, will you? Oh, of course. Where are my pants? Hey, wait a minute. No, 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 no. It was I who put you to bed. And here are your pants. Thanks. Where's Liana? Swimming in the ocean. Come. You can see her out the window. Hey, she's quite a swimmer, isn't she? 
Does she always swim out that far? Oh, yes. Every morning. Well, I'm not that ambitious this morning, but a dip would do me good. Quiet. It's swimmer yourself. <laughs> Thanks. That water made me feel almost human again. Any cigarettes around here? Ah, uh, right here in my robe. Hey. Here you are. <laughs> hmm. You uh, you look much better than when we found you last night. You know, you've taken awfully good care of me, Liana. Why? Why? Oh, perhaps. Perhaps there have been. So many places, many times, many men in my life. And with me, it, there's always been the same. But then last night, I saw you. And I knew you were something different. How different? Hmm. Does, does that make your bruises feel better? It helps. You know... That's a kind of medicine I could get addicted to, Liana. Perhaps. Perhaps when I return from Singapore, there will be more time to become addicted. Maybe. When do you sail? A day tonight. On the Malayan Queen. I guess my luck's still no good. <laughs> okay, look, I gotta go back to my hotel and pick up a change of clothes. But anyway, I'll be down to see you off tonight. How'd you get in here? I am Surratt. I learned you were registered at this hotel, so I took the liberty of waiting here in your room. Quite a liberty, wasn't it? When occasion demands it, the courtesies must be omitted. What's the occasion? I will be brief. Mr. Mitchell, I will assume you are a man who is interested in money. That's a safe assumption, Surratt. I believe you're in possession of certain information which is of value to me. Here we go again. Sir? Look, you happen to know a couple of cutthroats named... Dylai and Ben Jack. Ben Jack's a big lug with no tongue. Dylai, Ben Jack, I have not had the pleasure of their acquaintance, sir. Oh, it's no pleasure, believe me. Sir? I'll skip it. Now, what's this about certain information I have? I will not waste words. Ten thousand American dollars for the location of the sunken ships. Ten thousand? Means a lot to you, doesn't it? You've been shipping teakwood on the Malay and Star Line, haven't you? From my plantation up the river, sir. It is a matter of record. I didn't know teakwood was that valuable. I repeat my offer. Ten thousand American dollars. Uh, I'll have to have a little time to think it over, Surratt. I cannot grant you much time, sir. I'm sailing tonight on the Malay and Queen. You have until 7.30 this evening. Okay. I will expect your answer before sailing time. Until then, good day, sir. Uh, Mr. Bravant, please. I am sorry, sir, but he's gone. Gone? Yes, sir, on a business trip. He is sailing in half an hour on the Malayan Queen. C could you get word to him that... Uh, uh, never mind, I'll call you back. Come in. Mitchell. Dixon, what's the matter? A uh, knife in me back. What happened? Malayan Queen, ready to sail. Yeah, I know. I saw someone go aboard that was on the other ship. You mean the ship that was sunk? Yes. Who was it? Followed me here and stabbed me. Who stabbed you? I... <sighs> Dixon! Dixon! Sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Mitchell, but I don't leave the bridge until we're out of the channel. That's okay, Captain. I'd like you to look at these credentials. They'll explain who I am and why I'm aboard your ship. Hmm. You're investigating the recent sinkings. Yes, Captain. 
A couple of people seem awfully interested in the location of those sunken ships. I'm kicking an idea around that maybe there was something pretty valuable aboard them. Hmm, what would it be? I don't know. Are you carrying the same sort of cargo on this ship that was on the others? Yes, as far as I know. Another shipment of teak wood from Surratt's plantation? There is. Also, some American rehabilitation supplies. Hmm. Tell me, could those rehabilitation supplies be salvaged after they were sunk? Oh, no, no. The water had ruined them. Hmm. Captain, suppose you wanted to sink a ship and recover something from it later. What? Where would you sink it? Well, I, I suppose in shallow water. Yeah. Now, what's the first shallow water we'll be passing through tonight? Well, let's see. We'll pass through the Diablo Shoals a little after midnight. Depth there is only 15 fathoms. I see. Is that the passenger list on your desk? Yes. Here. Yeah, looks like the gang's all here. Ravant, Liana, her brother Matik, and Surratt. Captain, I need your full cooperation. Why, certainly. What is it? I'd like you to order these four passengers to be in Brevant Stateroom three hours from now at 11 tonight. Brevant, I demand an explanation of this, being hauled up to your cabin like a common criminal. But, Monsieur Surat, I am as much in the dark as you. I do not think it necessary to point out that this may cost you my business, Brevant. If you would only tell us the reason for all this, Effendi Brevant. Matik, I'm sure there must be a good reason for all this. If we are but patient, we will learn what it is. Here is the man who is responsible, Monsieur Mitchell. Steve! Hello, Liana. Matik. Your servant, Effendi. Good evening, sir. Surat. Apparently you forgot our appointment, Mr. Mitchell. I didn't forget it. I had a couple of other things to take care of. Perhaps, sir, you'll be good enough to explain what this is all about. Sure, I'll explain. I'll make it short. I think one of you is responsible for the sinkings of those three ships. You are joking, Steve. Sorry, Liana. But, but to suggest that I could have anything to do with it. You're a good swimmer. I'm afraid I'll have to count you in. Oh, it is so ridiculous to think that I or my brother could be involved in such a thing. You make a serious charge against us, Effendi. I know. This is an insult to my long years of service on the line. Perhaps it is a serious charge as far as the others are concerned, Mr. Mitchell. But to suspect that I am involved is ridiculous. Much valuable teak wood of mine was sunk with those ships. Yeah. And maybe it's more valuable than I thought at first. What do you mean by that, sir? I'll let it ride for the time being, because I've got another piece of news for you. Of course, it isn't really news to one of you. What do you mean, Steve? There was a ship's cook named Dixon, survivor of one of the sinkings. Tonight, he saw one of you come aboard. He recognized you as being on that other ship. So whichever one of you it was, killed him to shut his mouth. I assure you, this is the first of these ships I have been aboard, sir, and also the last. One of you four is the killer and dynamiter. That person has a bomb planted on this ship and plans to dive overboard before the explosion. And that explosion is due for about midnight, 45 minutes from now. Steve, this is ridiculous. Is it? Just keep your eyes on that clock, all of you. Nobody's going to leave this cabin for the next 45 minutes. We're going to sweat it out together, just watching that minute hand creep around to midnight. Eleven thirty. Anyone feel like talking yet? Really, Mitchell? Really, what? Haven't Ravon? you carried this silly joke far enough, Steve? There is only one way to prove he is mistaken in his suspicions, Liana. That is to wait. Can't we get a little air into this cabin? It's so infernally hot. You know something, Surratt? It's going to get a lot hotter. Seven minutes to midnight. We reach shallow water in about ten minutes. That means ten minutes before the ship gets blown up. Anybody's tongue loosening up? Surratt? I demand to be released from this pest hole. Bravant? You must be insane. Liana? To think I once considered you... Yeah, to... yeah, save the romance. Matik, how about you? You feel like talking? When one knows nothing, one can say nothing, Effendi. Okay, keep watching that minute, hand. hmm? I can't stand this any longer. I've got to get out of here. You've got to let me go. So you're the one, Surratt. No, no, no. You must believe me. I would be the last one in the world to blow those ships up. Why? Surratt! There's, there's gold hidden in those crates of teak wood. Surratt, you fool. He was only bluffing. Now you have told him. You haven't told me enough. Keep talking. Oh, I, I, 
I have nothing more to say. Look, Surratt, three ships have been sunk on account of this. Now open up. Start talking. No, no. I... You better talk before I beat it out of you. Now spill it. All right, all right. During the war, an air raid, a ship carrying gold bullion steamed up the river to escape. But it was sunk near my plantation. I think I can take it from there. You recovered the gold, and this is the way you've been sneaking it out of Indochina, huh? Hidden in crates of teakwood? Yes, it was Liana's Shut idea. Shut up, Surat! But someone must have found out about the gold and has been sinking the ships. Yeah, in shallow water so they can get the gold later. Uh, Fendi Mitchell, now that we know Surat is guilty, you will please allow me to leave. I have a headache. Mitchell, it is almost midnight. Yeah, nobody's leaving until I find out who's mined this ship. But Fendi Mitchell, you I... keep looking at your watch, Matik. Why? Matik... Matik, what is the ma- Matik, you didn't. You did. You put the explosives on this ship, too. You were going to jump overboard and leave me here, you fool. Where'd you plant it, Matik? Where did you plant it? Let me out of here. You're not going anywhere. The nitroglycerin will explode in two minutes. Matik, you sank those ships. You and Liana betrayed me. Very well. Surratt, put that gun away. Surratt! 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 And for you, Liana. Grab that gun, Bravant. Wait, wait, wait. Matik, where's the night progressor and where is it? Oh. Surratt, you jughead, you killed the only man who knew where it was hidden. We've got a minute and 50 seconds to find that nitro. Genius. Any ideas, Bravant? Matik could not have put it below decks. Men are stationed all over the ship. It must be in this cabin. Come on. Come on. Locked. Get back, Bravant. Wait, wait. Take that side of the room. I'll take this. All right. It's got to be in here somewhere. It's going to be. There's nothing over here, Mitchell. Wait a minute. Listen. There's something kicking. Uh, yes, yes, I hear it. Under the bunk. Look, that black suitcase. Easy. Throw it overboard. Throw it overboard quick. Yeah, i got to get out of the way, Brabant. i got to get it over the rail. Hurry, Mitchell, hurry. Only a few seconds more will explode. Throw it as far as you can. You don't have to tell me that. Hit the deck. Uh, Mitchell. Are you all right, Mitchell? Yeah. Except that I'm about five years older, Captain. That was close. Yeah, too close. Probably buckled if you were the ship's plates. Yeah, well, you'd better put Surratt under arrest. You can turn him over to the authorities when the ship reaches port. Yeah. Chances of getting the gold that's already been sunk are pretty slim, but there's probably a lot of it still at Surratt's plantation. The government can check that. Mitchell, allow me to say I have never seen one so calm in the face of danger. All the time we were waiting in my cabin after I realized what your plan was, my heart was in my throat. You think mine wasn't? It was choking me. <laughs> uh, look at me, Bravant. I look like a fairly intelligent guy, don't I? Well, yes, of course. With a normal assortment of brains. Certainly. And a reasonable amount of common sense. But of course. And will you tell me something? What is it? Why did I ever get myself mixed up in a job like this? You have just heard the second in an exciting new adventure series, Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Dangerous Assignment is written by Bob Reif and directed by Bill Karn, with music by Bruce Ashley. Be with us again next week at this same time, when Brian Donlevy, starring as Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Family Theater presents Anne Blythe and Raymond Burr. Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Night Caller, starring Anne Blythe and Raymond Burr.
Family theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we're to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. Now to our transcribed drama, Night Caller, starring Anne Blythe as Nora and Raymond Burr as Clint. I couldn't sleep. Maybe it was the bright moonlight coming in through my window since the storm ended. Maybe it was just because I was all alone. Whatever the reason, I was still wide awake at 2.30. I got out of bed and went over to the window. Below me, far across the valley, the last of the storm clouds drifted quietly against a clear night sky. I could see some stars. I looked down the dark, winding driveway that led from the house to the road along the edge of the bluff. The motionless trees, the shaded surface of the mountainside... The white ribbon of highway all seemed deserted and very distant. I looked again at the luminous dial of the clock on my night table. 2.30 in Los Angeles. That would make it 4.30 in Chicago. I wish that I could pick up the phone and call long distance. Hello, Mom. Hello, Dad. Turns out your daughter's not a big girl after all. She's sleeping in your bedroom, but she's still afraid of the dark. Would you mind singing it asleep? Pick up the phone. I did get that far, just to see how it felt. But then I decided I should stop feeling sorry for myself. And not two seconds later, I saw the light flash on my ceiling was a car, slowly making its way up the driveway. I watched it pull up to the house and stop. A man got out. I'd never seen him or the car before. Maybe he was lost and wanted to use the phone. I didn't care. I wasn't going to let him in. I slipped into my bathrobe and started up the hall toward the vestibule. There wasn't a light on anywhere in the house. He'd think it was empty and go away. That's all he could do. When I got to the end of the hall, I stopped and peeked into the vestibule. Through one of the glass panels at the side of the front door, I could see him standing on the porch. I waited, expecting him to turn away and get back into his car, but instead he did something that made my blood freeze. What do you want? What the devil? Who are you? What do you mean breaking in here? Where are the lights? Get out. Quiet. Don't you come near me. Where's the light switch? Here it is. What do you want? I thought this place was empty. No. No, my, my parents are in there. They must be pretty heavy sleepers. You get out of here before I call the police. You're all alone, aren't you? Look. Look, I, I've got some money, about $30. You can have Has it. anyone else been here tonight? No. No, listen, I'll I'll give you the money. Take anything else you want. I promise I won't call the police. Where's the phone? The phone? You heard me. Uh, in the bedroom. Come on, show me. There. You want to stay out of trouble, keep your mouth shut. Hello? Who's calling? Yeah? Yeah, it's me. They already left, huh? That's not very smart. What if somebody else sees it from the highway? Okay, he's the boss. Yeah, I'll turn it on. No, 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 it went off like clockwork. Good enough, so long. Who was that? Friend of mine. Where do you turn on the porch light? Back in the vestibule? But how how did anyone know to call you here? Because I told him to. At the switch by the front door? Yes, look, How come you didn't go to Chicago with your folks? I changed my, my... Who told you they were in Chicago? Friend of mine. Who are you? What's this all about? Never mind what it's all about. Turn on that porch light. Aren't those headlights coming up the driveway? Yeah. Don't look so hopeful. 
They're friends of mine, too. Where's that door lead? To the den. Inside. What are you going to do? Stop asking so many questions and get in there. From inside the den, I could imagine him crossing the vestibule and opening the front door. I remember looking around the room and trying to decide whether I'd have a chance if I climbed out the window and made a run for it. But before I could make up my mind to do that, I... Come out here. But I... Come on, come on. You shouldn't let her see us. What's the difference? She'll never see us again. What do you want? How long are your parents going to be out of town? I don't know. Come on, we aren't fooling. I, I, I don't know, and until the weekend, anyhow... You got any relatives in L.A.? No, no, we just moved out from the Midwest last spring. You work? What's this all about? Answer him. Where do you work? The London Film Company in Hollywood. I'm an illustrator. Better have her call in there in the morning. Say she's sick. Call in? Yeah, you're going to have guests for the next few days. You can't stay here. Sure we can, honey. It'll be nice and cozy. But why here? Because we like it here. It's quiet. Not many people come around. You know, I, I'm beginning to wonder about this. Maybe we ought to clear out right now. Oh, forget it, kid. You're hot. Your picture will be all over the front page. Yeah, that was five years ago. I've lost a lot of weight. Shaved the mustache. Besides, we've got to wait for Frank. He could catch up to us. He knows the place. Look, cool down. That dough is not going to run away. Well, which is it? We stay, we go. We stay. Through tomorrow, anyhow. Uh, how you fix for groceries, lady? There's not much... Maybe in... take her out in the kitchen and see what you can find. Okay. Come on, honey. You want a hand getting your stuff out of the car? Yeah, might as well bring it in. Oh, I'm starved. You and me. Hey, it's a cute kitchen. I'm glad you like it. Now, don't be rude, honey. Don't be rude. Well, let's see what the icebox has to offer, huh? Oh, boy. Cold chicken. The police are after you, aren't they? Not us, dear. Just Clint. What did he do? Here, take the milk. He sprung himself. He what? Sprung himself. Went over the wall. Is this all the butter you got? Uh, y yes. He, you mean he escaped from jail? Yeah, that's what I mean. What was he in jail for? Armed robbery, five to ten. You know, he's younger than I expected. He's kind of cute, too. What? I thought you were good friends. We are now. You got any salt and pepper? On that shelf over the stove. You don't even know this man, and you helped him to break jail. We didn't help him. He did that all by himself. But you're helping him get away. We got our reasons, honey. How's the grub coming? It won't be long. Where's Clint? Putting the car away. Hey, how are you getting along with our hostess? All right. You shooting your mouth off? I didn't tell her anything she won't hear on the radio. Who says she's going to listen to the radio? What'd she tell you, lady? Nothing. N not a come thing. Come on, come on. I'll leave what... her alone. You already said his picture would be in the paper and about the dough. Anybody could figure he's on the run. That all she told you? That's all, really. Then you know we aren't fooling around. I know. Okay. Just don't forget it. What's that? It's Clint, the back door. Let him in. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Getting cold out. Get the car in all right? Yep. Now, come on, sit down. Let's see. We've got a lot of planning to do. In front of her? Later. You think I'm nuts? May, we're going to have to lock you two girls up in the bedroom tonight. What am I? Don't oh, give me any lip. That's what you're going to do. Come on, pass the chicken. I'm starved. <laughs> I sat there watching them eat. Clint let the others do most of the talking. Once or twice I realized he was looking at me, puzzled, but he didn't say anything. After May and I had finished the dishes, Clint and the other man locked us up for the night in my parents' bedroom. It was starting to get light when May sat down in the rocker next to the phone stand. I lay in bed watching her, pretending to drop off. The first time her eyes closed, it was only for a few moments. The next time, a little longer. Oh, I waited. It had to look right. By 6.35, she'd been asleep for almost ten minutes. I 
got out of bed as quietly as I could, tiptoed over to the phone stand and lifted the receiver from the hook. Uh, May stirred in her sleep. I, I stood there inches from her. Then she began to breathe evenly again. Hello. Hello, is this the police? What did you say? Hey, hey, is this the police? Hey, what are you two? Come to... Put down that phone. Police. Crazy kid. Give that phone to me. No. Oh, police. I'm let you talk on the Come phone. Come to you. Please. Give me no. that phone. Give me that phone. No. I'm to call no. Give me that phone. I'll drop it. Oh. All right, May. Hang that thing up and put it back on the table. I thought you were going to behave yourself. Well, you thought wrong. You fell asleep, huh, May? Just for a minute. A minute's all she needed. How come you didn't tell us the phone was in here? I forgot about it. It was a nice thing to forget. Don't make me any speeches. I forgot it, that's all. All right, all right. Take it easy, kid. Don't get excited. I'm plenty excited. I tell you, we ought to get out of here. Soon as Frank shows. What's so big with you and Frank? I'm the guy who has to do all the work on this. Look, he's your buddy, Clint. He stopped being my buddy when he sold half this mark to you. You needed the dough. It's what got you loose. All right, so now I'm loose. What do we need with him? What do we need with him? You think this is very smart to talk in front of the little lady? No dumber than sticking around here while the cops trace that call she just made. Nah, I don't think she got through to the cops. Why not? When I hung up the receiver, the number was still ringing. She probably got disconnected and you heard the dial tone. I know the dial tone. This was the number ringing. Then who was she talking to? Ask her. Oh, sure, that'll do. Look, Clint, even if she got the cops, they'd call back... They don't come running every time the phone rings. All right, but what if they come running this time? Then she'll answer the door and tell them it's all a mistake. Oh, that's brilliant. Look, look, kid. I got 15 grand tied up in this mark, and I'm not going anywhere until the guy I paid it to shows up. Use your head. Frank's no good to you from now on. You already know the bank, don't you? Shut up, will you? Well, that and my signature is all you need. You're talking too much. All right, I'm through talking. Wait for Frank as long as you want. I'm getting out of here. You're not going anywhere. Put that rod away. When I'm ready. Why, you chump. If that goes off pointed at me, you wind up with 50% of nothing. We'll worry about that when Frank gets here. You're going to be sorry for this. I'd rather be sorry than double-crossed. All right, get your hands up. Okay. Out into the hall. You too, lady. What are you going to do? You'll see when I do it. Look, you promised no rough stuff. I'm going to lock him up in the den for a while. Is that rough stuff... All right, go on. Get in there, both of you. I'm not going to forget this, mister. I'll give you something else not to forget. This thing is loaded. And I'll be watching the back of the house. So don't get any ideas about climbing out that window. Now make yourselves comfortable. Even though the window in the den faced west, there was enough... Gray early morning light coming through it for me to make out Clint's face. He slumped down in a chair by the window, staring out at the mountains. After a long time, he turned and looked at me. Hey. Hey, come over here, will you? I, I won't hurt you. Come over here by the window. What is it? Keep your voice down. You might be listening. Well... I... I've been trying to think of a way to get you out of here. Get me out of here? That's right. I'll give it to you all at once. I'm not an escaped convict. I'm a policeman. A policeman? Keep your voice down. Uh, what do you take me for? I... I take you for a girl who's going to be awfully sorry when that guy Frank shows up and finds out I'm not Clint Sanders. But May and that man she's with... Ward. A... Remember his name. Jerry Ward. They've never met Clint. They think I'm him because I said so and... Showed up at the right time. If you're not Sanders, where is he? Well, in the infirmary at the state penitentiary. He was shot last night trying to break out. He talked. Talked a lot. That's why I took his place. Talked about what? A bank job. A thing he went to prison for. They never recovered the money. It's almost 100000 They never tagged the brains behind it either. Who would that be? Frank? Well, we think so. We can't make it stick without the money. But you told May and, and Ward you knew where the money was. I told them they knew where the money was. It was just a hunch, but they took the bait. I, I figured Frank must have told them something for their 15000 Why didn't you tell me this when you broke in here last well, night? It wasn't times, and besides, I... 
I didn't know. I. You might have been a plant. I don't believe you. All right. All right. Why do you think I didn't tell Ward about the telephone being in the bedroom? You said you forgot it. Are you kidding? I wanted you to use it. I wanted to scare him out of here before Frank showed up so they'd lead me to the money. Have you any idea where it is? Sure. A safe deposit box in Mexico. Northern Mexico. That's all Clint would tell us. Then you really want to help me escape? Well, sure. I, I think we can swing it. Oh. Well, here. These are the keys to Ward's car. So far, he's forgotten he didn't get him back. Well, why don't I use your car? It's in the garage. Because it won't move. I took the plugs out. I I didn't want anyone chasing you. Besides, Ward's car is the, is the one I want the police to get. It's evidence. Probably got his prints all over it. Oh, all right, but how do I get to the garage? Well, I'll climb out this window and make a run for it toward the bluff. Oh, but Ward said he'd be watching the back That's of the... That's the idea. While he's busy trying to catch up with me, you'll have a clear field to the garage. What about me? I got a hunch she'll stick with Ward once the excitement starts. And you want me to go straight to the police? Fast as you can. Incidentally, you, you didn't happen to get through to them while you were on the phone, did you? No. Too bad. There's something I should tell you about that phone call. It, it was just a trick, an idea I had. What do you I mean, had... a trick? Well, when I heard you suggest I'd better call in to work this morning, I I realized you hadn't guessed about my... Well, you get along fine, aren't you? What's it to you? Nothing. I just happen to remember you've still got the keys to my car. Well, let's have them. You must be getting soft in the head. I gave them to you when I came in from the garage. Come on, wise guy. Let's have the keys. I tell you, I don't have them. Want me to answer that, honey? Yeah. If it's for the girl, tell them they got the wrong number. Search me if you don't believe it. Now, look, I haven't got those keys and neither is May. Are you going to hand them over or do have to get rough? Now, how can I hand them over if I don't have them? Honey, that was Frank. Oh, where'd he call from? Down at the gas station. He's on his way here now. Good. All right, wise guy, we'll forget about the keys until we see what Frank has to say about you. Um, you asked me to remind you. Huh? You know? Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, lady, what's the name of your boss down where you work? M- Mr. Harper. Charles Harper. Okay. Come on, both of you. We're going to make a little phone call. Don't tell me you're going to put her on the telephone. That's right. Oh, that's brilliant. What if she starts yelling again? She won't. What's the address of that place? London Film Company on Melrose. Look up the number, May. I think you're off your locker. Shut up. Here it is. London Films. Yeah. See? Hollywood 2, 1, 3. Okay. All right, lady, here's the deal. Last night, you twisted your ankle, see? That's nothing serious. But it's going to keep you off your feet a few days. And the reason you know it's nothing serious is because I'm a doctor. And I told you, just like I'll tell your boss, Harper, before you talk to him, savvy? Yes. And when you get on the line, you'll make uh, some, uh, you know, small talk with him. But don't get any smart ideas. I won't. Okay. Um, may I speak to Mr. Harper, please? Uh, Mr. Harper, I'm Dr. Walter Barnes. I'm calling in for one of your employees, Miss Wilkett. Uh, she had a little accident last night, turned her ankle. No, no, nothing serious, but I, I recommend that she keep her weight off it for a few days. E- yes, yes, she's right here. Wants to talk to you. Hold on. Okay. Don't try anything funny. Hello, Mr. Harper. This is Nora. Can you hear me all right? There seems to be something wrong with the connection. Oh, by the way, I called my folks in Chicago last night, long distance. I was just lonesome. I I wanted to hear their voices. What? What? Oh, yes, yes, I'm home. No, Dr... Barnes. Uh, Barnes. Dr. Barnes came over here. I called him. Yeah. Yes. Well, thanks, Mr. Harper. I'll take care of myself. 
Goodbye. Uh, very convincing. You're getting smart. It's more than I can say for you. Shut up. Why don't you quit swinging that rod around and get wise to yourself? This deal can't even get off the ground without me. It's Frank, honey. Let him in. Look, fella. Frank's going to think you're punchy if he comes in and sees you with that gun. Yeah? Yeah. That kind of stuff makes him nervous, so... Give me that thing. I go... Frank, give it to me. Oh, give it to me. What's going on here? You, get him up. Get him up. Who is this? Here. You don't know him? I never saw him before. Where's Clint? I knew there was something phony about him. He said he was Clint. You boneheads. He's a plant. Who's she? His girl? No, she lives here. Where's Clint, copper? Where is he? Same place he's been for the last five years. I knew something smelled about you. You're a genius. Shut up, both of you. May, you go out and start the car. What's the deal? We're getting out of here. That's the deal. And these two with us. What about the job? There isn't any job without Clint. Forget it. I'm not forgetting we gave you 15 grand. We'll settle that after we get out of here. Now straighten this joint up and get your stuff together. I want to be on the road in ten minutes. I had no way of knowing if the phone call had worked, but at least I felt sure that none of them suspected anything. Frank walked us from room to room at gunpoint while May and Ward went through the house gathering their things. It took longer than they expected. It was almost 9.30 when Frank herded us out through the front door. Still can't find your car keys? No. No, I still think he's got them. We looked all over the house. Frisco, you're wasting your time. It's our time. Frisco. No, nothing. How about her? I... I don't have them. Take a look, May. Well, <laughs> who'd have thought it? Little Miss Tremblechin. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's all right, Nora. Look, I'll make a deal with you guys. You got nothing to deal with. Sure I have. If you let her go, there's nothing we can tag you with. You're kidding? Not even a little. Technically, the only thing against you so far is housebreaking, and we can forget that. But if you put her into that car, that's abduction and the Lindbergh law. Get into that car. Oh, wait. Wait a minute. Let's hear this. What about Clint? What about Clint? He's still in jail. He can't get in trouble for aiding an escaped convict if he hasn't escaped. Uh, and what do you come in? Well, I go to the L.A. police and tell them who I am, a cop. Then I say it didn't work. Nobody showed up here. <laughs> who are you kidding? Was to keep the girl from talking. Common sense. She wants to get out of this alive. Well, who says she won't? Ask your friend what he's got in mind for us. Now, Frank, wait a minute. Shut up. I'll do the thinking. You will not. We didn't put up 15 grand to buy a murder rap. You bought into a deal that's gone sour. And it's going to get worse if we turn this cop Look, loose. Look, he hasn't got a thing on us. What about the bank job? That was you and Clint. Right the first time. That's why there isn't going to be any deal. Maybe you're clean as a whistle, but I'm filthy. Now get into the car. We started down the driveway toward the road. Oh, I scanned the stretch of highway leading along the bluff. There wasn't a sign of anyone in either direction. I looked back at Ward's car following us down the hill... Then I felt May press the gun into my side, and I saw she was yelling at me. Turn around! What's the matter with you, you deaf? Shut up back there. If we take this road left, where's it go, copper? Why, toward Sunland, I think. Well, that's as good as... May, give me that gun. What's wrong? Look! I never saw anything so beautiful in my life. It was two squad cars, one on each side of the driveway, parked along the inner edge of the bluff. There wasn't a shot fired, and after Ward and Frank and poor May had been taken into custody, I couldn't resist. I had to tell someone. You know, May was right. What do you mean? When she asked if I was deaf, that's just it. I am. I'm deaf as a post. You know, I... I knew there was something. I, I can read your lips, but I, I'm deaf. That's how my boss knew there was something fishy about the phone call. 
I never use the phone. I can't. Oh, I, I don't mind. I beg pardon? I don't mind. I'd rather talk to you in person anyhow. This is Anne Blythe again. Did you ever stop to think that one of the most perfect, the most beautiful forms of art is prayer? For art, whether it be painting, sculpture, the theater of any of the long established modes of expression, is only one form of man's attempt to reach perfection. The painter puts an image on canvas, perhaps the likeness of a mountain, or in modern art, a picture of his impression of the mountain. It's the same with a sculptor, except that he uses marble instead of canvas. In the theater, the actor whose portrayal of a fictitious or historical character is most perfect is considered the best actor. You see, art is an attempt to reach the infinite, the perfect. And that's why I say... Prayer is the greatest of the art forms. For in prayer, our dialogue is with God. And by it, we create a thing of beauty. We forge a bond between ourselves and God. And when we pray as families, the bond is strengthened by just that much. In the name of him who said, Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them. That's why Family Theater tells us week after week, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Hollywood Family Theater has brought you transcribed Night Caller, starring Anne Blythe and Raymond Burr. Others in our cast were Vivi Janis, John Daner, and Ben Cameron. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present The Pox, starring Tyrone Power. J. Carol Nash will be your host. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. adventure with Guy Madison as Wild Bill and Andy Devine, that's me, as his pal Jingles. Brought to you by the cereal you can eat out of the bowl or out of the box, the cereal with the sweetening already on it, Kellogg's Sugar Pops! Today, Kellogg's Sugar Pops, the cereal with the sweetening already on it, brings you Wild Bill Hickok, transcribed in Hollywood and starring Guy Madison as Wild Bill and Andy Devine as his pal Jingles. In just 30 seconds, you'll hear the exciting story, Dangerous Advice. 
Know when Kellogg's sugar corn pops taste best? Any time you eat them. They're wonderful with milk or cream for breakfast. And for a snack, nothing beats sugar corn pops. Because they're not just sugar-coated, they're shot with sugar. You get shot with sugar flavor in every bite. From a bowl, from a box, any time of day, sugar corn pops are best. So next time Mom goes shopping, let her know you want those shot with sugar Kellogg sugar corn pops. United States Marshal Wild Bill Hickok and his big deputy Jingles ran across many strange people in their work of upholding the law in the Old West. But one of the strangest they ever met was a mild-mannered little professor who soon had the two lawmen involved in dangerous advice. say is that this is a heck of a day to have to work, Bill Hickok. Jingles, any day is a bad day to work as far as you're concerned. Oh, you make it sound like I'm lazy or something. All I object to is working on a holiday. What holiday is this? It's my grandma Sadie's birthday. And ever since I can remember, the Jones family always took a holiday on her birthday. Well, I don't think the U.S. Marshal's office considers that a legal holiday, partner. Besides, with Jug Farrow and his gang shooting up the country, we'd have to work even if it was Christmas Day. What's that no good weasel done now, Bill? Oh, he and his gun hands pulled a raid on the bank in Cactus Junction. Shut up the bank manager and Sheriff Wilson. So, with the sheriff out of action, it's up to us to run down the varmint and put him in jail. That's about the size of it. And I don't know just where to start. Jug and his gang are holed up somewhere here in the mountains, but I don't know where. Yeah, we'll just start looking. Speaking of looking... Take a look at what's on the road up ahead of us. Yeah, I see it. An old-fashioned covered wagon. Yeah, I haven't seen a real prairie schooner like that for years, Bill. Wonder what it's doing way out here. Let's go find out. Get up there, Buckshot. Move along, Joker. You know, I thought most of the covered wagons went to California with the 49ers during the gold rush. Uh, Maybe one of them didn't find gold and he's coming back. The gold rush was 20 years ago, Jingles. Well, maybe he didn't give up very easy. Whoa, Joker, who? Easy, Buckshot. Who? Funny. Just sitting here with the horses hitched and nobody around. Maybe somebody's inside. It don't look like it. No. Nobody in here. Bill, we've discovered a mystery. Well, whoever's been driving this rig is around someplace. The horses are still warm. Hey, Bill, look there. That sign painted on the canvas. Yeah, wonder what that's all about. I'll read it to you. Horace Early Bird Advisory Service. Advice on any subject. Nominal fees. Advice guaranteed. I can read, Jingles. I just wonder what it means. It means Horace Early Bird is in the advice business. Well, Horace Early Bird is in a part of the country where giving too much advice can be very dangerous. Now, folks around here don't like to be told what to do. Now, I'm wondering what sort of a gent Mr. Early Bird is. I'm wondering where Mr. Early Bird is. Probably looking for a worm. Ha, 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 that's a dandy. <laughs> Hello there. Here I am. Bill. It's all right, Jingles. He's up on that rock above us. Hey, you gentlemen looking for advice or just... Oh, oh. No, we're not looking for advice. What was you doing up on that rock? Oh, my goodness, aren't you nosy? I was merely observing the countryside. I'm always observant. That's Horace Early Bird for you. (laughs) That's how I stored up the great fund of knowledge that I dispense in my business. Well, Wild Bill Hickok and Jingles is always observant, too. That's how we catch all the owl hoots that make up our business. Wild Bill Hickok? That must be you. That's right, Mr. Early Bird. I'm the U.S. Marshal around here. And I'm Jingles, his big old jolly deputy. <laughs> oh, say you are, aren't you? Big that... Is that all you? Since you're always observing, maybe you saw a few riders heading through this way. Yeah, we're looking for as mean a bunch of bank bandits as you ever saw. A bank bandit? Oh, my goodness. As a matter of fact, I did see a group of men, uh, three of them... To be precise, stopped and asked me for advice about the trail I'd just come over. 
Oh, yes, and they didn't pay me for my services. You're going to charge us for that bit of information? Oh, no, 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 no. It's my civic duty to offer assistance at no charge to officials of the law. Good. <laughs> We're getting it for free, Bill. Which way did these three riders go? Well, as a matter of fact, they left the trail and they headed back into that little canyon. You see that little canyon right there where the stream flows through? Uh, see, what's back in there? Nothing but a bunch of rocks and caves. Bill, that's Wilderness Canyon. That's an awful place to have to trail anybody. It sure is. There's a place for a bushwhacker to hide at every turn. Yeah, well, if you're going in there after them, let me give you some advice. Well, as long as we're getting it for nothing. Well, if I were you, Jingles, now let me see, what would I... Oh, yes, I'd move your left holster a little farther forward. Yes, that's right. And sit up, sit up straighter in the saddle. Yeah, uh, it looks to me like you're a little bit off balance. Uh... Oh, it does, huh? Well, it looks to me like you're a little unbalanced yourself. Now, I've been riding this way and carrying my guns this way for a long time. And I ain't had no trouble yet. Well, have it your own way. I only offer advice. My customers don't have to take it. Well, thanks anyway, Mr. Early Bird. Come on, Jingles. Let's head into Wilderness Canyon. Nerve of that little guy telling me how to ride and carry my gun. He just wanted to help, Jingle. Hey, let's pull up here a minute and have a look. We're getting into the steep part of the canyon. Yep, oh, Joker. Easy, Buckshot. Who am I? You're sure right about this canyon, Bill. Big rocks to hide behind wherever you look. Why, there could be one of Jug Farrell's gang on the other side of this boulder right here. Yeah, I suppose there could be. There's three of us, Hickok. Hmm? Get your hands up. Bill. Don't turn around. Each of us has got two guns pointing right at your back. Not much we can do, then. Get your hands up, Jingle. They're up. Somehow I got the feeling that things just ain't working out the way they should. Sugar corn pops hit the mark. Yes, sir, those shot with sugar golden puffs of corn are perfect first thing in the morning with a little milk or cream poured over them. No need to mess with a sugar bowl, remember, because the sweetening's already on them. Yep, better than you could do it yourself. Why, each and every golden nugget of corn is shot with sugar. And that makes sugar corn pops hit the mark at snack time, too, Wranglers. Like in the middle of the morning, after lunch, or when you're sitting listening to the radio or reading a good western. Mmm, that's mighty sweet eating. Sugar corn pops aren't just sugar coated, they're shot with sugar, so that you get shot with sugar flavor in every bite. And say, because it's such a swell cereal and snack, you'll need a large box of sugar corn pops. Tell Mom to look for the picture of Guy Madison or Andy Devine galloping his horse on the front of the package, and look for those magic words, shot with sugar. And she's sure to bring home those mmm, mmm. Kellogg's Sugar Corn Pops. Yippee! Sugar Pops. They're sugar-coated, taste so sweet. Just pour on some milk. Oh, boy, they're neat. Kellogg's Sugar Corn Pops. Sugar Pops are Pops. While Bill and Jingles had just ridden into Wilderness Canyon on the trail of the bank robbers when they stopped for a look at the rough country around them. Instantly, they were covered by the guns of Jug Farrow and his gang. Now make a move, Hickok, or I'll blow a hole right in your back. Get their guns, Dutch. Right, Jug. Money. you take your rope and tie them to that pine tree. Put one of them on each side, back to back. I am so tight they can't possibly get loose. You mean you got Wild Bill Hickok cold in front of your sights and you're letting him live? Shut up. I know what I'm doing. By the time he gets loose, we'll be so far gone he'll never catch us. But just in case we do get picked up sometime, I don't want Hickok's killing on my head. I'm glad to hear that, Farrell. I'm not doing you any favors. I just know what a lot of folks would do to me for killing you. Well, I feel a lot safer now. Get your hands back up. Look out for him, Farrell. Hold it. I said I didn't want to kill you. But if you make one move, I will. Let me give you a little careful, advice. Careful, Jingles, careful. You know you don't like anybody giving you advice. Oh, yeah, that's right. We've done enough talking. Finish tying him up, Bonnie. All done, Farrell. Now let's get out of here. 
As long as this smart star pack is still alive, I ain't riding easy. Yeah, sure, let's go. <laughs> I hope somebody comes along this trail a few days and finds you, Hickok. <laughs> Be too bad if you and Jingle starved to death. We'll get loose somehow. And when we do, look out. Me and Bill get you three sidewinders if we have to trail you to the North Pole. Well, let me give you a little advice, big boy. You keep that mouth of yours shut. Take it easy, Jingles. All right. Farrell, one of these days real soon, you're going to get paid for that slap. With interest. Bill, how are we going to get out of this one? I've been tied up before, but never like that Barney tied us up. Don't talk so much and keep pulling at those ropes. There might not be anybody along this trail for a month or more. I'm not sure I can last that long. I'm getting hungry already. Hold it a minute. But you just told me to keep pulling on the rope. Quiet, I hear something. So do I. A nice babbling brook that's just out of reach, and I'm thirsty. Jingles, will you be quiet for a minute? Oh. I think somebody's coming up the trail in a wagon. Hey, hey somebody is coming. I, I can hear it now. And look who it is. I can't look. I got my back tied up against this pine tree. You tell me. It's Horace Earlybird, the advice man, with his covered wagon. Oh, not him. Bill, Think what kind of advice he'll start giving out when he sees us trussed up here like a couple of Thanksgiving turkeys. Whoa, whoa there. Whoa, Shakespeare. Whoa, Bacon. What did he call them two horses, Bill? He called one Shakespeare and the other Bacon. Why don't he call them Bacon and Abe? Only a man with Early Bird's education would pick those two names, Jingles. Howdy, Mr. Early Bird. We're glad to see you. Oh, eh. Well, 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 oh, Marshal Hickok and Jingles, you seem to have gotten into a little trouble. But my advice to you is... When to... I want your advice, I'll pay for it. And please don't give me any more for free. Yeah. Now, cut that rope and get us out of there. Why, of course I will. I was just going to say that my advice would be to you. To, you could do a much better job of catching those bank robbers if you weren't tied to a tree. <laughs> now, there's an idea I never would have thought of. Yeah. There is a real smart suggestion, early bird, old boy. <laughs> yes. Now shut up and cut that rope. All right, all right. Thanks, early bird. I'm glad you came along. Let's dig out our guns out of the brush, Jingles, and hit the trail after those bandits. Oh, sure. Just as soon as I get my arms to working again. Oh, your arms. Oh, well, just a minute, Jingles. I'll show you a very good exercise to restore the circulation in your arms. If it's all the same to you, Early, I'll just swing them around like I always have. And I'll get my exercise thumping them bank bandits around when we catch up with them. When we do catch them, we'll have to be careful they don't play another trick on us like they did this time. Oh, yes, that's right. They'll be watching for you, won't they, Wild Bill? They sure will. Wherever they camp, they'll have a guard out on the trail. Oh, say, why not disguise yourselves and take them by surprise? Early bird, now you may be pretty smart. But how are you going to disguise me? Oh, oh yes, you do present a problem, Jingles, but, but I have an idea. Let's hear it. My advice to you... Well, here we go again. ...is to take my covered wagon and follow those men. I can bring your horses along behind you and stay out of sight. And when you come to their camp, you can drive right in before they discover who you are. <laughs> I'm going to say something I never thought I'd say. Oh, what's that, Jingles? Your advice sounds pretty good. Thank you. You're welcome. How about it, Bill? It might work at that. At least it's better than riding into another ambush. Well, come on, let's give it a try. Looks like we've caught up to them already, Jingles. I can see campfire smoke come out of those trees up ahead. Yeah, they probably figure we're still tied to that pine tree, and they ain't in too much of a hurry. Draw back inside the wagon, Jingles. You're too easy to spot. All right, but keep your eyes open. You said yourself they'll probably have a guard watching the trail. There's one right now, stepping out from behind that tree. All right, keep your head down. It's down. But he'll know who you are, won't he? Not till I get real close. By then, maybe, I can keep him from saying anything about it. Who, Team Woos? Who down there? What's he doing, Bill? I can't see. Waving a gun to stop him. Who there now? Who? Just keep them hands high, stranger. I'll find out who you are and where you're going with that rig. I don't figure that's any of your business. It's Hickok. That's right, but keep it a secret. I'm 
it coming, Bill. Hang on. Oh, I'm Bill, hang on his arm. I'll take that gun away from Hurry it up, Jingle. Two boy fires a shot and warns the other. Let go of that, you coyote. Ow, ow, ow. Ow, my ribs. I'll break it if you don't let go of that six gun. There it goes, Bill. It's all yours. Good work, Jingle. I don't need a gun for you. We'll see about that. Billy's going to yell. No, you don't. <laughs> That'll keep your mouth shut for a while. Blast you, Hickok. He's got a knife, I see it. Take it away from me, Bill. He'll kill you with that thing. Say, Panhandle, how'd you like our guests at the ranch this morning? Well, I thought they were powerful, nice young wranglers. And I sure did like the way they went after those Kellogg sugar corn pops for breakfast. I noticed they had two bowlfuls each. And say, I noticed, too, they knew our little jingle. Pops are sweeter, the taste is new, they're shot with sugar through and through. <laughs> you know, it's a fact. Sugar shooting makes Kellogg sugar corn pops so luscious. Yes, sir, these big golden pops of corn are shot with sugar through and through. Why, they're sweet and better than you could ever do with a spoon. Now, folks, enjoy Kellogg's sugar corn pops for breakfast. Just pour on milk or cream. Then have them as a snack any time of the day, after school, or when you're listening to your favorite radio programs. And don't forget, an average size bowl full of Kellogg's sugar corn pops gives you your full day's need of vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin, plus lots of other swell minerals and vitamins, too. So, partners, ask Mom to bring you home Kellogg's good sugar corn pops that are shot with sugar through and through. While Bill and Jingles, driving into the camp of the bank robbers in the borrowed covered wagon, managed to surprise the guard, he gave Wild Bill a terrific battle and finally pulled a knife on him. <laughs> Bill, get his knife. Try and get it, Hickok. I'll cut you up in little pieces. Not if you're out cold, you monk. Look out. Oh, wait. Bill, you scared me to death. Waiting in on a Jasper with a knife like that. I had to get him or he'd have got me, Jingle. All right, time up quick and let's get on into the camp before those other Jaspers get suspicious. This is the same coyote that tied us to the tree. I'm going to show him a few knots that are even better than his. Hurry it up. I hear horses coming. Where? Up the trail behind us. I didn't expect trouble from that way. I'm getting so I expect trouble from every direction. That's where it usually comes from. We'd better find out who it is, Jingles. Get behind the wagon and we'll surprise him. A little closer now. Hold on and get your hands up. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, Mr. Early Bird. Yes. Early old boy. You shouldn't have come sneaking up on people. You're liable to run into somebody that shoots first and says, hold it afterwards. Oh, well, I'm glad it was you two I ran into. Oh, how's the plan working out, Wild Bill? That's fine so far, but Jingles and I are too easily spotted. Oh, then let me offer a little advice. Go ahead. You'll do it anyhow. But let me drive the wagon on into camp while you and Jingles hide in the back. That might work. Leave our horses here and we'll give it a try. But be careful. Those two bandits get suspicious, they're going to shoot to kill. Early bird, old boy, how'd you happen to get into the advice business? Oh, I've always liked to tell people what to do, and finally I decided I might just well get paid for it. How's business been lately? Oh, it's not bad, Bill. Of course, I make mistakes now and then, of course. Uh, like the hen-pecked husband I advised last week. What did you advise him to do? I told him to talk right back to his wife. And if that didn't stop her, to slap her sassy face. Did he do it? Well, yes, he did. Uh, I'll have to go back and collect my fee one of these days uh, after he gets out of the hospital. Well, my advice to you is don't go back. You're healthy now. Why crowd your life? All right, partner. Get on. Stay out of sight. Oh, oh, yes. yes of course. Uh, we're coming to the camp now. And both men are watching me with their six guns drawn. We've got our guns ready, too. We can peek out from under the camp. Drive right on in, early bird. If they start anything, we'll finish it. Here, here, here they come. Get ready. We're all set. All in right there. Pull up. Here, whoa. Whoa there. Whoa. Here are the old geese we met down in the valley. 
But the idea of following us up through the canyon. Why, my friend, I'm not following you. I'm a wanderer. I'm just a gypsy at heart who goes wherever my fancy dictates. Get the fancy chatter and get down off that wagon. We want to take a look for ourselves. Yes, sir, if you come into this wagon, you're trespassing on private property. If you don't get down off of there, you're going to have a forty-five caliber slug trespassing on your wishbone. Oh, well, that's a mighty strong argument, so I'll get... Farrow, Hickok's in here. Shut him up, Jingles. Hey, cut! They got funny! Doc, early bird, get down! Let them have it! Blast them out of there! You got one, Bill. Farrow dove under the wagon. Come on, Jingles. There he is! Hold on, Farrow. You're not going anywhere. Cut it out. You can't fight with that broken arm, and I don't want to knock you out if I don't have to. All right, Hickok, you win. We should have knocked you off and we had to drop on you. Yeah, I suppose you should have, but I'm just as happy now that you decided not to. Good work, Marshal Hickok. Now, if I can just offer a little bit of advice. Early bird, old pal, old friend, old partner. You've been real helpful up to now, but please... No more advice. Well, I was just going to suggest that you take these three renegades to jail and lock them up. Well, I think Bill and me know how to do that, all right. If you really want to be helpful, I'll bet Farrow and his gang would appreciate some advice on how to keep from staying in the pokey for the next 20 years. <laughs> stars of Wild Bill Hickok, Guy Madison and Andy Devine. Thanks for being with us today, folks. We'll be back your way again this Friday. Yes, sir. And with another action-packed Wild Bill Hickok adventure story, plan to be with us, will you? So long, kid. See you Friday. Kids, they're very personally yours. Yes, Kellogg's wonderful variety pack contains ten personal portion boxes of Kellogg's cereals. Kellogg's Corn Flakes, Rice Krispies, Kellogg's Pep, and other favorites. Ten personal portion boxes extra fresh to you. Get Kellogg's variety pack with ten personal portion boxes of Kellogg's tasty cereals. Flaked, popped, shredded, and ready sweetened. Serials has brought you another exciting story of Wild Bill Hickok, starring Guy Madison and Andy Devine in person. Today's cast included Howard McNear, Lou Krugman, and Howard Culver. Our story was written and directed by Paul Pierce, music by Dick O'Rourke. This is a David Heyer production, transcribed in Hollywood. Now, this is Charlie Lyon... Speaking for Kellogg's, the greatest name in cereals. Reminding you to listen again on Friday, same time, same station, for another adventure of Wild Bill Hickok! The Johnson Wax Program with Fibber McGee and Molly. The makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat present Fibber McGee and Molly, written by Don Quinn with music by the King's Men and Billy Mills Orchestra. The show opens with I Struck a Match on the Moon.
Ladies, what's the most popular room in your house? Most people say the living room with the easy chair pulled up alongside the radio. But personally, I want to put my vote down for the kitchen. I spend more time in people's kitchens and in my own than anywhere else. I suppose the icebox has something to do with it. But whatever it is, the kitchen is a cozy room and deserves to be a cheerful one. And you can make it cheerful, too, without spending much money. Gay curtains at the window, fresh oilcloth, and Johnson's self-polishing glow coat on the floor. Glow coat not only gives linoleum floors sparkling beauty and keeps the colors as bright as new, but it protects them against wear, makes them last longer. And it does all this in addition to saving you hours of work. Because Glow Coat needs no rubbing or buffing. Just apply and let dry. Glow Coat does the rest. May I suggest that you add Johnson's self-polishing Glow Coat to your next shopping list. Well, a man can fool some of the people all the time, and all the people some of the time, and his wife almost none of the time. <laughs> so, so when our hero seems unusually gay and lighthearted, laughing at anything, his better half suspects the worst. In other words, when a guy doesn't grouse, his spouse smells a mouse. <laughs> and that's the way it is tonight with Fibber McGee and Molly. So when I seen Egghead Vanderveen there in front of Joe's tavern, I walks up to him. <laughs> Hi, Egghead, I says. What's cooking? <laughs> and he says, I am. He says, hey, just give me the hot foot. <laughs> well, see, that just about tore me asunder because Egghead is McGee. the kind of... <laughs> McGee! McGee! Kind... Huh? What's the matter with you? You're as merry as a grig over nothing. What's on your mind? On my mind? Why, why, why nothing, but let me tell you about Egghead. <laughs> so I says to Egghead... I, I don't <laughs> want to hear about Egghead. I want to know about you. You always act like this when you're covering up something. Look, did you mail that special delivery letter for me yesterday morning? Special delivery? Oh, that. Oh, don't give it a thought, Molly. But to get back to what I says to Egghead... Did you mail that letter? <laughs> Why, Molly, am I the kind of a guy who, when you tell him to do something you want done, don't mail it? <laughs> now, never mind that. I just asked you a simple question. Did you ever ask me to do anything that I wasn't only too glad to cooperate into doing it? No, sir. McGee, did you mail that letter? <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, the reason I wanted to know oh, is... Oh, but I'll do it right away. Wait till I, wait till I get my coat. As soon as I can run across the street, I'll But, do... McGee, now let me tell no, you... No, I'll do it. I should have done it yesterday. Sorry I forgot, but you you can consider the air and rectify. Wait a minute, McGee. That letter now is... I'll just dash across the street to the mailbox, Molly. I'll be right back. McGee, wait a minute. I didn't... Oh, dear. Sometimes I wonder why the government always puts the mailboxes on the corner where somebody else lives. <laughs> if I'd have had my way... Oh, hi, Gildersleeve. Hello, McGee. Hey, don't run across that pavement. Can't you see they've just... Ah, go bounce a meatball, you big ape. <laughs> I know what I'm doing. Hey, hey, what, what is this? Fresh car? Get out of there, McGee. They've just resurfaced that pavement. You get stuck. What do you mean, get stuck? I am stuck. Well, why didn't you warn me, you big dumbbell? Don't! Oh, I tried to, you little twerp. If you hadn't, ah, oh, there, Mrs. McGee. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. McGee, come out of that mess this minute. I can't. I, I can't pick up my feet. What is this, anyway, tar? No, it's a new patent paving material they're trying out. <laughs> you like it? <laughs> I love it. In fact, I'm stuck on it. <laughs> well, Dad, let it do something. Get me out of here. Can't you pull your feet up, dearie? Oh, wait. Let me try again. Oh, no, it's no use. The harder I try, the deeper I get in. You see, Mrs. McGee? <laughs> Confidentially, he sinks. <laughs> that rat at Gildersleeve, if you don't... Now, cut... now, 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 let's all keep calm and think this thing out. McGee, can you slip out of your shoes? Yeah, but I ain't gonna. I just had them half sold. <laughs> Come on, dearie, don't stand there arguing. You're attracting a crowd. Take your shoes off and start running. Okay, okay. Okay, here I come. 
Well, come on. Cat, I'm stuck again. Oh, dear. Take off your socks and start over. <laughs> okay, I'll try anything. <laughs> now. Well, what do I do now? Take off my feet? <laughs> Who shall I call, dearie? The street commissioner, the fire department, the police, or the gallop pole? What do you mean, the gallop pole? Well, you're the man on the street, all right. <laughs> What do we do, Mr. Gildersleeve? <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do, Mrs. McGee, but I'm going home and get my movie camera. By George, I've never seen anything so funny in my life. <laughs> Dad, why don't you stay where you darn are, Gildersleeve? <laughs> you big heel. Oh! <laughs> McGee, now, you mustn't call Mr. Gildersleeve a heel. Well, maybe not. But I'll bet he could have a lot of fun sliding down a shoehorn. <laughs> Anybody going to get me out of here? Oh, now, don't get excited, McGee. We'll do everything we can. Hello there, daughter. Hello, Gildersleeve. Hi, Johnny. What you doing? What do you think I'm doing, you old dodo? Tap dancing? <laughs> tap dancing, eh? You never told me he could tap dance, daughter. <laughs> Let's see you doing off to Buffalo, Johnny. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake, stop teasing him. Huh? He's in a terrible predicament. Hey, what's this all about, kids? What's he doing out there in the street, daughter? He's stuck in that fresh pavement, Mr. Old Timer. Do you know any way we can get him out? Sure. How? Look, get a couple of shovels, see? Then go down to the basement of your house, yeah. dig a tunnel till you get right under him, then dig up till you reach him and pull him down through. Oh, my goodness. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's silly. It ain't only silly, it's callous and cruel. Everybody making wise cracks while I stand here and suffer. Don't you realize this pavement material is getting harder every minute? Call somebody. Do something. But what do we do? How should I know? If you can't think of anything else, throw me a red and green lantern. I'll spend the rest of my life here as a traffic signal. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, Johnny. But that ain't the way you are, you heard it. <laughs> well, you heard it. One feller says, the telly feller says, says. But hey, this ain't any time for jokes, is it? Poor little Johnny out there, stuck in the tar. No, it certainly isn't. Of course not. Though, on the other hand, it, it might cheer him up. The way I heard it, one feller says, tell the feller, see, he says, I see where Groucho Marx is going to be a professor of humor at Harvard. Is that so, says tell the feller, where's Harpo going? To Wellesley? <laughs> I guess you got something there, old timer. Yeah. That Harpo is a great guy for blondes. <laughs> hey, what am I laughing at? Dad Rattle, get me out of here. Whoa. Do something, somebody. Whoa. Don't just stand there. Help! Help! <laughs>
What's that guy doing out there in the street? Advertising something? No, they say he got stuck in that fresh pavement. Mm. Well, if he saw they were going to pave the street, why didn't he get out of the way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they ought to put a rail around him and use him as a statue of a leading citizen. <laughs> hey, Molly. Molly. Yes, dearie, here I am. And here's a little footstool for you to sit on. <laughs> Catch it. Uh, much obliged. Is somebody coming to get me out of this? Who'd you call? Well, first, Mr. Gildersleeve and I called the Commissioner of Streets. Uh-huh. And he referred us to the uh, Department of Health. Department of Health? Yeah, he said it wasn't healthy to stand there in the street night and day. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did the Health Department say? Well, they referred us to the License Commissioner because they said you were making an exhibition of yourself. Uh-huh. Yeah, and the License Commissioner sent us to the Board of Education. Dad Braddock, what's the Board of Education got to do with this? Well, they said they teach you to stay off freshly paved streets. <laughs> but I tell you, we finally got to the right people, dearie. Huh? This is a new type of paving, and, and they're sending the inventor of it out. Oh, well, thank goodness, at last. Well, hey, what's in the mud? Can I have your autograph? Why, certainly, bud. Throw me your death certificate. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. Mr. Gildersleeve, if that man doesn't get here pretty soon, I don't know how... Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Uppington? Oh, how do you do, my dear? And Mr. Gildersleeve? Uh, good day, Abigail. Well, what on earth is the cause of this boisterous crowd, my dear? It's McGee, Abigail. He's stuck out there in the middle of the street. You see him? Well, really? How do... What did I... I mean, did he step on some chewing gum? <laughs> <laughs> and he just started to trot across a freshly paved street, the silly asphalt runner. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, we simply can't have your husband making a spectacle of himself. He's rolling the tune of the whole neighborhood. Ah, don't give me that Vassar Vaseline, dearie. <laughs> Next thing you'll get so exclusive, you'll want our fire department to have an unlisted phone number. Well, really, Mrs. McGee, I... Now, wait a minute, girls. I... Uh, hey, McGee. Ah. Uh, here's Mrs. Uppington. Oh. She wants you to get out of there. <laughs> she says you're lowering real estate values. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I am, eh? Abigail, you mean to stand there wobbling on your wedgies and accuse me of doing this on purpose? I really wouldn't know, Mr. McGee, but if you're posing as a personal investigator of paving material, I have a suggestion to make. Yeah, what's that? Did you ever hear of a certain place which is said to be paved with good intentions? You mean... Yes, and when you get through here, go there. Good day. <laughs> Hey, Molly, where's the guy who invented this stuff? When's he ever coming? Just as soon as they can get a hold of him, dearie. Just wait till I get hold of him. Hey, I'll hey, wait. what is all this? Hey, come here a minute, Fibber. No, you come here, Wilcox. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll no, come No, 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 Mr. Wilcox. You'll get stuck, too. Yeah, McGee is held tight in that new paving material, Hollow. Don't you set foot on it. Ah, oh, why didn't you let him come? He's always claimed he was a guy that would stick by his friends. <laughs> <laughs> Say, you're in a tough spot, pal. Can't you pull yourself loose? Who, me? Why, sure, Wilcox. I'm just standing here till the steam roller comes by. <laughs> then I'll lay down and get my pants pressed. <laughs> well, I can really sympathize with you, Fibber. Standing in that tar, you're typical of the stories I hear every day. What do you mean, typical? You're tired, aren't you? Sure, I'm tired. Well, but... so is every housewife in the world. <laughs> Tired of the everlasting scrubbing and cleaning and dusting. Tired of the dust and dirt and dampness. Tired of trying to keep house with old-fashioned, inefficient methods. That's why they all love Johnson's Wax. Because it cuts housework to a minimum and keeps floors and furniture shining and beautiful and protects them against wear and dirt. Get some today. Johnson's Wax for that hard feeling. Wilcox! What? You're fired! I am not. You didn't harm me, and you can't fire me. And I can prove it. How, Mr. Wilcox? I'm going to send the sponsor a war. Oh. <laughs> He'd spend more time listening to Pippa McGee and Molly and less to Lum and Abner. <laughs> hey, what am I ever going to get out of here? No, no, take it easy, little chum. Take it easy. We'll uh, just have to wait till the paving expert gets here. Don't you, little chum me, you big chump. <laughs> All you've done since I've been stuck here, standing around and crack wise. Is that so? Why, you ungrateful little grunion, you lippy little lizard. You wait till you get out of there, and I'll teach you a few manners. Go on, you couldn't teach a worm to squirm. 
you big oaf. Oop. By the time I get loose from here, I'll be in just the mood to kick you right in the teeth. And I don't care if they ain't paid for you. No. <laughs> now, now, now. For goodness sakes, boy, stop it. Well, I just dare him to come out here, that's all. I'll show him. You can't fight here. And huh? McGee, huh? you owe Mr. Gildersleeve an apology. He's done everything he could to get the city officials to come out here and get you loose. Yeah, and it's like most of his arrangements. Nothing happened. Yes, that's so. Yes, that's so. Why are you abbreviated anthropological aberration? Who's an abbreviated anthropological abbreviation? You are. He is not. I am too. You are not. Then make up your mind. <laughs> now stop this bickering, the both of you. Come on, Mr. Gildersleeve. Let's go call up the street commissioner again. Well, all right. Now, don't worry, little chum. <laughs> Hold tight. We'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, Rocky, and hurry back, Molly. All right, dearie. Uh, come on, Joe. Let's beat it. Yeah, he ain't gonna do nothing. No, he just stands there like a dope. Come yeah, on, Charlie. Yeah, Joe, on. <laughs> hey, hey, don't everybody leave. Somebody stay and talk to me. Hey, hey. Hmm. Hmm. That's that's a bad rat of luck. Why does everything have to happen to me? If I'd only mailed that letter to Molly's when I ought to have, this wouldn't have. Hi, Mister. Oh, I'm sorry, sis. I ain't got time to talk to you now. I'm in a hurry. Where are you going? Well, I'm going down to the... I'm going... I'm, say, come... come say, what do you want, sis? <laughs> what you doing out there in the street, mister? What you doing? Who's what you? I'm a... <laughs> I'm a scare sparrow. Hmm? I says I'm a scare sparrow. That's the same as a scarecrow, only I don't scare crows. I scare sparrows. <laughs> Why? Well, they make too much noise. They, they disturb the friend stands. What's a friend of Sam? Well, that's the kind of a thing that gets disturbed. It spells. Oh. I bet you can't scare the Whittycombs, I bet you. Well, uh, what's a Whittycomb? It's a little girl who doesn't believe that friend of Sam stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm glad you come along, sis. You cheer me up. No, you cheer me up. <laughs> you cheer me up first. All righty. Shall I tell you a story, hmm? Sure, sure. Tell me a story. How about Cinderella? Well, it ain't risque, is it? Hmm? What? Uh, never mind. Tell me about Cinderella. And take your time, sis. <laughs> I ain't going anywhere for a while. <laughs> All righty. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Cinderella, and she had a nasty old stepmother, and she went to a ball and lost her slipper, and the prince found it, and he married her, and they lived happily ever after. You want to hear another one? <laughs> Thanks. I, I I was going to ask for the one about Peter Rabbit, but the way you boil them down, it'll turn out to be awesome better. <laughs> I, can, I can recite poems, too, I bet you. You can? Hmm? I said you can? Can what? Cherries, and be sure you get all the pits out of them. <laughs> You're silly, mister. <laughs> I guess I am at that, sis. Well, I'll go ahead and recite something. All righty. This is going to be a dandy one, I bet you. The boy stood on the burning deck, mending a pair of socks. It roused his ire when the thread caught fire. Hot darn. <laughs> you don't mind, sis. I think that ought to conclude your benefit performance. You want to earn a nickel by running an errand for me? No. You don't? No, I want to earn a dime. <laughs> You're taking advantage of my desperation, sis. I'm going to report you to the labor board. Okay, it's a dime. Now, look. All right. Run down to Kramer's drugstore and have him throw me an evening paper. Mm -hmm. Then run over to my house and tell Mrs. McGee I want a little table and a deck of cards mm -hmm. so I can play solitaire. Oh, yes, and a portable radio. All righty. Shall I tell her anything else? Yes. What? I'm hungry. Oh, sure. <laughs> The King's Men sing the Little Brown Jug. My wife and I live all alone in a little log hut we call our own. We're so happy, warm and snug, as long as we have our little brown jug. Ha, 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 you and me, little brown jug, don't I love thee? Ha, 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 you and me, little brown jug, don't I love thee? When I am toiling on my farm, I carry a little brown jug under my arm. Sit me down in the shade of a tree and say, shoo fly, don't bother me. Ha, 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 you and me, little brown jug, don't I love thee? Ha, 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 you and me, little brown jug, don't I love thee? Little brown jug goes to 
my head and makes my nose a rosy red. In the dark it shines so bright, I never get lost on the blackest night. Ha, 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 you and me. Little brown jug, don't I love thee? Just we two, me and you, having a great big spree. My wife and me are as happy as a bug. We get along fine with a little brown jug. I beat her, she beats me. We love each other tenderly. Oh, oh you and me. Little brown jug, don't I love thee? In the winter time, you warm my toes. Every time I tip you up, down it goes. Oh, 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 you and me, little brown jug, don't I love thee? Have you had enough to eat now, McGee? Not quite. Toss me one more cookie. <laughs> Thanks. How about coffee, McGee? You want some more? No, thanks, Gildersleeve. You can pull in the hose now. Okay. <laughs> hey, when is this guy going to come to get me out of here? You mean the man who invented this paving material? <laughs> He's due any minute now, dearie. Just be patient. Are you terribly tired? I ain't as tired as I am disgusted. I'm disgusted and humiliated. <laughs> My feet are getting numb. This stuff is getting hard. Hey, did you call the city hall again? Yes, I did, dearie. Who'd you get? Mert. <laughs> Mert? <laughs> What'd she have to say? She said her cousin overturned his canoe yesterday. Yeah? Did he get drowned? No, he just got tired of paddling and overturned it to his brother. <laughs> overturned it to his brother. If that ain't the farthest fetch gag I ever heard. And me standing here helpless. Why, George, here he comes, McGee. It won't be long now. What? Who? It's the inventor of this paving material, McGee. He'll know how to get you loose, dearie. Make way there, please, folks. Let the man through. McGee, here's the expert. Oh, hi, bud. I'm glad to see you. Oh, hello. (laughs) Oh, my goodness, it's Wallace Wimple. Are you really the inventor of this pavement, Mr. Wimple? Yes, I am. And I'm (laughs) dreadfully sorry that your husband got stuck, Mrs. McGee. Just makes me miserable to think of it. What do you mean it makes you miserable? What do you think of me? I'd rather not stay in front of all these people. (laughs) Well, how do we get him out of there, Mr. Wimple? Well, Mrs. McGee, as I see it, the whole thing depends on a chemical analysis of the material. Maybe we can dissolve some of it around his feet. Well, that's the first sensible remark that's been made today. What is the chemical formula, Wimple? Oh, that's a secret, Mr. McGee. What do you mean it's a secret? That's what I mean. It's a secret. (laughs) Well, you know what the secret is, don't you? No, but my wife does. Your wife? What's she got to do with your invention? Well, (laughs) she's really the inventor. I'm only the one who saw the possibilities in it for paving material. Well, what was it in the first place? Her recipe for chocolate pudding. <laughs> the, the minute I... The, I'm sorry. I, the minute I tasted it, I said to her, I said, Cornelia, I said, this would make wonderful paving material. And what did she say? I don't know. Everything went black. Yeah. <laughs> but... But, but, but... Here's what we better do, Mr. McGee. I don't care what we better do, but let's do it. All righty. I'll go home and analyze this material and see how we can dissolve it around your feet. Will your wife give you the formula? If she won't, Mrs. McGee, we'll have to use air hammers and chop him loose. Fellas, you're getting awful close to my feet. Be patient now. You're nearly free, dearie. There you are, buddy. Sorry you got to go home with a hunk of pavement on each foot, but that's the best we could do. Now, I imagine you can soak that off with turpentine, McGee. <laughs> Come on, dearie. Come on. I'll take one arm and Mr. Gildersleeve the other one. Okay. Much obliged, fellas. 
All right, one side there, everybody. Uh, stand back, stand back now. Uh, can you walk, little chum? I think so. Let me try. Yeah. Yeah, I can manage. Boy, is this a relief. I thought I'd never get out of there. You know what the first thing is I'm going to do is, Molly, after I get these hunks of pavement off of my feet is? What, dearie? I'm going to run right out and mail that letter for you. Uh, give me the letter, dearie. No, sir. I started out to mail it, and by the seven sisters of Maud Kelly, I'm going to mail it. It's no use, dearie. That letter's no good now. What you mean? Who is it to? The street commissioner. My goodness, Mrs. McGee, uh, what did you want him to do? Pave the street in front of our house. Oh, <laughs> Bibber and Molly will be back in just a moment. Here's a question several people have asked me lately. Is Johnson's Glow Coat good for other kinds of floors besides linoleum? Yes, it most certainly is. It's good for painted or varnished wood floors and for floors covered with rubber or asphalt tile. Glow Coat gives all these floors a real coat of protection, enhances their beauty, makes cleaning easy. And it's just as easy to apply Glow Coat to these floors as it is to linoleum. When the floor is clean, apply Glow Coat with a cloth or long-handled Glow Coat applier and let it dry for 20 minutes. Glow Coat polishes itself without any rubbing or buffing. That's why it's called self-polishing. Most women find Glow Coat especially helpful in protecting their kitchen linoleum floors because these floors get more than average wear. Linoleum manufacturers themselves recommend this easy, no-rubbing method for keeping linoleum clean, making it last longer. Try Johnson's self-polishing glow coat on your floor. Is one of those of all the dead dreaded. If that wasn't the darn Who are you thing... talking about, McGee? Egghead Van Der Veen? No. Egghead McGee. <laughs> I'm disgusted. Making a receptacle of myself. Everybody jeering and pointing at me. And me squawking and hollering there like... Oh, hey. now stop fussing about it. It wasn't that bad. And anyway, I'll give you credit for one thing. What's that? It's the first time you ever put your foot in it and then opened your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Marlowe Wilcox, speaking for the makers of Johnson's Wax and Johnson's Self-Polishing Glow Coat, inviting you all to be with us again next Tuesday night. Good night. Mr. Jones, do you have that new kind of enamel that contains wax? Yes, indeed I have, and lots of my customers are buying it. Here it is, Johnson's Wax Enamel, and a wonderful enamel it is. See those 19 stunning colors, all selected by prominent decorators. Wax enamel gives a smoother finish and a more beautiful luster than any enamel I've ever handled. Not a harsh glare at all. And the wax in wax enamel gives it added protection against wear and makes it easier to clean. Here, here's a free color chart for you. Just try wax enamel on old furniture or on your bathroom or kitchen walls. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Squire of 79 Wistful Vista and his neighbor Gildersleeve are typical red-blooded Americans. They love all kinds of sports and exercise. For instance, here we meet these two sportsmen in an atmosphere of tense excitement, with masculine violence boiling just beneath the surface as they match their skill and wits in a battle for supremacy. Your move, Gildersleeve. Yes, I know. Oh, my, it's nice to see you two boys playing checkers peacefully together instead of fighting and bickering. Yes. (laughs) Well, I'm a peace-loving man, Mrs. McGee. And if my little chum and I can't get along together like any good friends, I'd... Here, here, what are you doing, McGee? What does it look like I'm doing? I'm jumping three of your men. There. There by winning the game. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> now, wait a minute, McGee. You missed two squares. Why, I never know such a thing. You did, too. I saw you. You moved from here to here to here. I did not. I moved from here to here to here to here. Didn't I, Molly? I'm sorry I wasn't looking. But I know McGee wouldn't cheat, Mr. Gildersleeve. I wish I was as sure of that as you are, Mr. <laughs> Now you wait a minute, Throckmorton. You, you cad. Who's a cad? You're a cad. No, on second thought, you ain't a cad. You're only a fliver. A broken down Model T fliver. Is that so? Yes, that is. Why are you indeterminate, little sand flea? Anybody that would cheat a checker. Don't you accuse me of cheating, you tub tummy ton of tog and flirm. Why, you little. What's tog and flirm? <laughs> That's the bait they use to catch renifers. Uh, what are renifers? What are renifers? What's the matter with you? Don't you know anything? By George, I'm going home. Well, I refuse to play checkers with any bullheaded little beetle brain like you, McGee. Okay, you big baby. Take your coaster wagon and go crying home to Mama. You can't take it. That's what's the matter with you. Well, uh, maybe I can take it. But I can ladle it out, McGee. <laughs> One more insulting remark from you, and I'll beat your brains out. If I can borrow a feather duster. <laughs> You'll beat my brains out. Why, you hollow-headed hippo, <laughs> you couldn't poke your way out of a hairnet. <laughs> All right, that's enough. Give me that checkerboard. Oh, but Molly, we, we, we can't quit now. We're, we're tied seven and seven. Oh, let us play just one more game, Mrs. McGee. We'll be quiet, won't we, little chum? <laughs> <laughs> we were just kidding. Well, all right then. Just one more game. <laughs> oh, that's fine. <laughs> and after this, I'll keep my eye on you, chum. Well, that's a... What do you mean? What for? So you won't cheat. Oh, so you still claim I cheated, do you? Now you listen to me, you overstuffed Be devil. Quiet. Be quiet, the both of you. And give me that checkerboard again. McGee, go upstairs and put on a clean shirt for dinner. And you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes? Go home. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Mrs. McGee. Go home. <laughs> Gee whiz, I didn't... You mean... heard what the lady says, Gildersleeve. Scram. I'll not have my home turned into a... Into a... Oh, well, I won't have it turned into. <laughs> I might have known this peace and quiet wouldn't last. Good night, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, good night. Good night, little chum. <laughs> Hey, look, Molly, we wasn't... Hey, what you doing? I'm wrapping this checkerboard up. Give me a piece of string. What you wrapping it up for? I'm going to give it away. Oh, now, wait a minute. Just because Gildersleeve and me get into a little argument now and then, shucks, that does us good. I know that. Well, then what's your idea? If it does two fighting men that much good, think what it will do for the army. <laughs> The army? What's the army? Sure, got? I read in the paper where the boys in camp are short on games and books and magazines. So I'm going to send them this checkerboard, yeah. thus helping the war department out there and peace department out here. <laughs> you still object, dearie? Well, no, I guess not. But but don't don't send the checkerboard. Just send, send them the Parcheesi outfit. <laughs> oh, I doubt if them dice would be used for Parcheesi. <laughs> Why don't you send that cribbage board of yours? You can't use it anymore. Why not? It's full of holes. Mm, termites. <laughs> Look, dearie, while we're at it, let's send a lot of things. They need books and magazines, too. That's a great idea, Molly. This house is getting all cluttered up with books anyway. Must be a half a dozen around here. <laughs> Look, McGee, I've got a great idea. Huh? Let's go see all our friends and collect a lot of games and books and magazines and send them to camp. Yeah, that's a swell idea, Molly, but look, please don't send my checkerboard. I and Gildersleeve are tied seven and seven, and we've got to play it off to see oh, who's champion. Oh, go on. Draw pennies or pitch straws for it. 
Now, come on. We'll call on everybody we know and get them to donate games and books. You, you still going to send my checkerboard? Definitely. Uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give up my ping-pong set instead. I'll throw in my wood-burning outfit, my model airplane kit, and the ship I'm building in the bottle. <laughs> No, we'll just send the checkerboard and the ping pong. Well, incidentally, you know how ping pong got its name? No. It was invented by two Chinese fellas, Fui Ping and Charlie Pong. <laughs> Why, how interesting. You still going to send my checkerboard? <laughs> yes, and uh, go get the ping pong set. You know where it is. Sure. Where? Right here in the hall plus. <laughs> Straighten out that closet one of these days. Isn't it wonderful how everybody is cooperating on this thing, dearie? Yep. Heavenly days, we must have a half a ton of books and games and magazines promised already. Yep, they'll never miss my checkerboard now. <laughs> So let's keep it, and I can play off the championship with Gildersleeve. Now, now, now. I thought we had that all settled. The checkerboard is going. Well, shucks, I don't know why you got to send my favorite stuff. You'd have sent my easy chair to the Army, too, if it hadn't had flat feet. <laughs> oh, for goodness sakes, anybody think your life depended on one measly little checker game? <laughs> Mine don't, but Gildersleeve's does. <laughs> It'll kill him if I win. <laughs> hey, here's Nick DePopolis' house. Let's see what he can give us. Well, uh, let me see. If he offers... Well, for scream's sake, Spitzer and Cupid, this is an unexpected aided pleasure. What's roasting? Huh? He means what's cooking, dearie. Oh. <laughs> Look, Mr. DePopolis, we're collecting games and books and magazines for the boys in camp. Now, what have you got that we can have? Hmm... Well, I don't think we have any games, Cupy, unless you can use some jigglesaw poodles. <laughs> oh, jigsaw puzzles are swell, Nick. Uh, how about books and magazines, though? Now you are beginning to talk sense with something to it. Oh. I am having a superfluity of books, and I'm happy to get rid of them. Oh, well, thanks, Mr. DePopolis. Send them over to our house, and we'll have a truck ready to take them out to camp. Yeah, why are you so glad to get rid of them, though, Nicholas? Oh, they're too hard on my eyes, Fizzer. Oh. oh, you read a lot, Mr. DePopolis? I don't read at all, Cupy. But my kids are always playing catch with them and hitting me in the face. <laughs> Yesterday, I'm getting smacked with Gone with the Wind, and for ten minutes, I'm hearing for who the bells are ringing. <laughs> Get a load of the brass knocker, Molly. You'd think anybody as well off as Uppington could afford a doorbell. <laughs> she probably thinks the quaint old knocker expresses her personality, McGee. <laughs> you mean she has a need for a knocker because she's knock-kneed? <laughs> Don't you get it? I says she uh, has... Ah, taint funny, McGee. <laughs> she would be in a bathing suit. <laughs> Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Uppington? Oh, how do you do, Mrs. McGee? And Mr. McGee? Good afternoon, Uppy. Where's your butler? Oh, you mean Snathers? Oh, I lost him last Saturday. Oh, oh hmm. that's too bad. You know, he always interested me in a strange way. How was that, Molly? Well, he had an expression on his face that reminded me of, uh, of, uh, well, I don't know exactly, but there was a look in his eye that, uh, uh, well, did you ever clean fish? <laughs> Where'd you happen to lose the old frozen puss, Uppy? <laughs> uh, Maeve is all very strange. Oh, yes, he was serving dinner, and the radio was broadcasting the Kentucky Derby, oh, the and dark. after Whirlaway had run the race, mm -hmm. Snathers picked up the strawberry shortcake, danced around a bit, and then said, Here, old girl, wear this for a mask. <laughs> and, and you know, the 
the first thing I knew, I was. <laughs> He's miraculous. <laughs> yes. Oh, dear. Well, I don't blame you for firing him, Abigail. Oh, but I didn't, my dear. He just quit. Oh, oh man, I wish there was some way to get him back. You mean to stand there with your velvet neck band full of Adam's apple and tell me you want that guy back? <laughs> Why, of course I do, Mr. McGee. Well, I don't understand it either, Mrs. Uppington. Why? Why, because through him I found how wonderful crushed strawberries and whipped cream are for the complexion. <laughs> I give up. Come on, Molly, let's Oh, get just on. a second, dear. You forgot what we came for. Oh, yes. The magazines for the boys in camp, remember? Yes. Oh, yes, of course. I have them right here, all ready for you. <laughs> oh, well, how did you know about it, Abigail? Oh, you told Mr. Gildersleeve, and he told his wife, and she mentioned it to the grocer, and he is Strictly a guy who tells everybody everything. <laughs> oh, boy, take a squint at these magazines, Molly. Nasty Confessions, Fantastic Mechanics, Bloodthirsty Heartthrobs, True House Detective Stories, Curvy Cutie Cartoons. Why, Abigail, I never knew you read this type of literature. Me? Well, really, Mr. McGee... These belong to the servants. Oh. I consider myself insulted. Well. And you'd realize that if you ever read these magazines from cover to cover, as I always do. I... Oh, what am I saying? What we want is games and books and magazines for the boys in camp. Yes, they're a little short of recreational supplies, Mr. Wilcox. I see. Well, I've got a croquet set that's hardly been used. No, you don't get the idea, Harlow. Not, nothing elaborate, elaborate like that. Just, just small stuff. Haven't you anything you can hold on your lap? Well, my secretary, Miss Clegg... Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Wilcox. Well, wait a minute. You wait a minute. I was going to say, my secretary, Miss Clegg, will go through my house and see what she can find. Oh. And you say you want a lot of books and magazines, too? That's the idea, Mr. Wilcox. Just send them over to our house and thank you very much. Oh, not at all. I was in the Army myself, and I know how it is. Oh, what, what was you in the Army, Wilcox? Well, <laughs> most of the time I was on kitchen police. As a matter of fact, I still am. Really? Uh, folks, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> Science has never discovered any way to keep flies out of the cream pitcher, moths out of bathing suits, and Wilcox out of sales talk. <laughs> <laughs> but we can dream, can't we? <laughs> okay, Wilcox, I'll go along with you. How come you're still on kitchen police? <laughs> Why, that's simple. I'm responsible for arresting the wear and tear and the cracking and warping of linoleum. Oh. But I don't use a nightstick and a revolver. I arrest them with Johnson's self-polishing glow coat, the marvelous polish that shines as it dries. Personally, I think that's very interesting. Go on, Mr. Wilcox. My pal. Try and stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Why, look, with Johnson's self-polishing glow coat, linoleum will last much, much longer. It'll retain the original beauty of pattern and color and save hours of tedious scrubbing. Glow coat requires no, <clears throat> no rubbing and no buffing. It shines itself in 20 minutes or less after applying. And you'll love the new feeling of cleanliness it gives your home. And as an old kitchen policeman, I can assure you that grime doesn't pay. Oh. oh. Wilcox, if I had your enthusiasm and you had my brains... We wouldn't be working for the Johnson Wax people. We wouldn't? No, we'd be the Johnson Wax oh. people. Come on. Yes, we're rounding up books and magazines and games to send out to the Army camp. Now, have you got anything for us? Well, now, I would just love to help you out, Mrs. McGee. But I wouldn't dare give anything away without consulting my wife. Well, go ahead and consult her, Wimple. Oh, I couldn't disturb her now, Mr. McGee. She's taking her music lessons. Oh. Does she sing, Mr. Wimple? No, she plays the... Well, wait. I'll open the door to the music room just a fraction, and we'll see her in action. 
Very talented, don't you think? <laughs> well, well, she certainly got what it takes. Yes, indeed. Now, if somebody would only take what she's got and throw it away, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'd get a little peace and quiet around here. Have you uh, protested, Mr. Wimple? Oh, many times, Mrs. McGee. I often say to her. Cornelia, I say, why don't you give up those drums and go back to your other hobby? What was her other hobby? Lion taming. <laughs> Heavenly days, lion taming. Yes, she uses our kitchen chairs, too. They're all scarred up with teeth marks. Oh. Believe me, that varnish tastes terrible. <laughs> My goodness, I, I don't know why I'm getting so personal. I'll send over whatever I can, Mrs. McGee. Well, thank you, Mr. Wimple. Oh, not at all. The boys in camp will sure appreciate it, Wimple. And I speak as one who knows. Old army man myself, you know. I belong to the home guard once. Oh. But my wife doesn't like me to have a gun around the house. Oh. She says I might accidentally shoot her sometime. <laughs> That woman is positively uncanny. <laughs> but, Mr. McGee, what were you in the Army? I was cook of Company C, Wallace, just like my father was before me. Son of a sea cook McGee, I was no doubt. <laughs> Son of a sea cook, McGee, celebrated in story and song as the super supervisor of the soup stove, the skillful scientific Samson of the sizzling steak skillet, and the snappy sergeant of the spud skinning squad, smooth as silk at supplying a seafood spree by subdividing a sardine into sufficient servants to satisfy six or seven small soldiers, smart as a city slicker at switching skinny shrimps into sleek and strong supermen by stuffing same with sausages, sandwiches, and similar succulent snacks, a Sturdy citizen at stock and stomach swimple, but let's hear the king's men singing something simple. Here, load these books in the truck, McGee. Load them in yourself, Gildersleeve. I'm busy. Why, you're not either, McGee. Huh? Mr. Gildersleeve and I have done almost all the work. Okay, yeah. okay. Hey, give me a hand with this ping pong outfit, Gildersleeve. Uh, certainly, Chum. Yeah. You take the table, and I'll take the balls and rackets. <laughs> Come on, now, boys. Let's hurry and get... Hello, kids. What's cooking? Oh, hi, old-timer. We're loading all these books and magazines and games and stuff into the truck. We're taking them to the soldiers. By the way, McGee, uh, do you know the way out there to the camp? No, not exactly. Hey, old-timer. Hey! Which is the best way to camp? Well, I always say the best way to camp is to pick out a piece of high ground near some running water, then pitch a tent... No, no. <laughs> what? No. Which is the best way to the army camp? Hey, oh, oh, that. Well, uh, daughter, best way is to drive out of town any direction till you see a soldier standing beside the road. Then you go whichever way his thumb is pointing. See? <laughs> now that's very intelligent. But I knew you could tell us, old timer. You got such a wise face. <laughs> <laughs> that's what everybody says, Johnny. It says I got a lot of intelligence in my face for my age. <laughs> yes, you got a lot of age in it, too. <laughs> yeah. It's your face that convinces me that a puss has nine lives. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, Throckmorton. But that ain't the way I heard it. <laughs> no, sir. The way I heard it, one fellow says, tell a fellow... Say, say, <laughs> you've been reading about that lady bullfighter down in Mexico? Yep, says the feller. Wonderful, ain't she? How'd she ever learn to dodge them wild animals? Dunno, says the first feller. 
But they say she used to be a cigarette girl in a nightclub. <laughs> get out of the way. Now, get out of the way while we finish loading this stuff, old It's man. all loaded, McGee. Oh. It is. And a wonderful lot of stuff, too. Now, who's going to drive? Oh, I am. Oh, wait a minute, McGee. Who was it that borrowed this truck? Whose idea was it to collect this stuff? Mine. You want to drive, Molly? No. Okay, okay I'll, I'll drive. I'll settle it, kids. I'll drive. Well, Mom. fine. Let's get going. Get in, boys. Come on. <laughs> Hey, not so fast, old-timers. Slow down. How do you do it? Yep. Why, take your foot off the accelerator. Where is it? Oh. <laughs> Heavenly days, didn't you ever drive a car before? No, but it's fun, ain't it? Oh. <laughs> Yes, I'm the morale and recreation officer, Captain Gordon. Uh, you're Mr. McGee? No, thank goodness this is Mr. McGee. Oh. <laughs> and this is my wife, Molly Cap. How do you do, I'm sure. Delighted, Mrs. McGee. And I wish to express the appreciation of our whole camp for the trouble you've gone to to get these recreational <laughs> facilities together for us. Where shall we unload them, Cap? Well, the men are already starting to unload the truck, Mr. McGee. The recreation house is right next door. Uh, by the way, I didn't meet this gentleman. What gentleman? There ain't any... Yes. Oh, this guy. <laughs> this is Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Cap Gordon, Throcky. Uh, how do you do, sir? <clears throat> and thank you also, Mr. Gildermorton. <laughs> you, uh, you don't know how much you people have contributed to the morale and well-being of our boys. A fine group of young men, and we have to see that they have fun, you know. Now, come on, Gildy. We better go help unload the stuff. Oh, oh yes. Uh, okay, McGee. Uh, see you later. Uh, certainly, certainly. Well, so you really think this was a good idea, do you, General? Splendid, Mrs. McGee. Splendid. A great thought. But uh, <clears throat> don't call me General. I'm only a captain. Oh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, when McGee was in the Army, he was only a sergeant. You know, two stripes on his sleeve. Uh, two stripes is a corporal. It is? Why, he always said you... Why, that little rascal in all these years, I believe... <laughs> well, come, Mrs. McGee. Let's go and see if the men have that truck unloaded, eh? All right. Well, that was fast work. The truck is empty. But where are McGee and Gildersleeve? I don't know. I, I say, my good fellow, did you see the two men who came with this truck? Sure did, Admiral. They went right in there. Said they had to finish up. Finish up? Oh, finish up on packing those things. Well, come on, Captain. Well, heavenly day. Okay, Gildersleeve, it's your move. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Bill and Molly will be back in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, while we had some fun with the idea of getting games and books and magazines together for the boys in camp, it is a good idea. They really need them, and they'll be glad to get them. They certainly do. So look around your house tonight and get a bundle of games and reading matter together for the boys. Just this is the time of year. NBC presents The Penny Singleton Show. On stage tonight from Hollywood, another of NBC's outstanding half-hour presentations, The Penny Singleton Show. Hello. Happy you're listening. A boy's best friend is his mother, but to Penny Williamson, a girl's best friend is her daughter. Penny, a young, attractive widow, has two, D.G., 13, and Sue, 8. And the other night, when she tiptoed quietly into their room, she found them sitting in bed in the dark, talking about her. We might as well face it, Sue. Mother's too innocent. 
Well, she doesn't know anything about man. She sure hasn't explained him very well to me. Well, that's just it. Why, when it comes to men, Mother's a babe in the woods. Why, why, something terrible could happen to her. Sure it could. Something awful terrible. What could happen to her, D.G.? <laughs> well, you're too young. You wouldn't even know what I was talking about. Aw, oh, tell me, D.G. Yes, for Pete's sake, tell her, D.G. The suspense is killing me. <laughs> Mother, what are you doing in here? I came in to make sure you two were asleep. Now scoot under those covers. Okay. Well, I was only saying... Good night, that... Sue. Mm. Night. Well, I was just saying that you're young Can and... it wait till morning, dear? Well, you're young and pretty and... Yes, in the morning, dear. Young and pretty and what? An attractive to men. Oh, I'm not. I mean, I... I am. Are we going to stay awake? <laughs> well, of course you're attractive to men, Mother. Well, you certainly know how to dress. Just take a look at the women on those fashion calendars. They have nothing on you. Well, thank you, dear. The women on the men's calendars have nothing on them either. <laughs> Said. Well, never mind what Margaret said. D.G., why all this sudden concern about me and men? Well, golly, Mother, you wouldn't want to marry one, would you? Oh, I don't know. I've always heard they make the best husbands. <laughs> <laughs> but suppose you suddenly decided to marry someone like, well, like Mr. Wiggins, your real estate partner. He's a man. He is? I mean, of course he is. <laughs> but I don't intend to marry Mr. Wiggins, so why worry about it? She's just sore because Tommy Trammell gave her the air. Oh. He did not. I'm just being aloof, that's all. I think we should all go up to Lake Panatog and be aloof for a week. Well, it's sweet of you to think of it, darling. But that costs money. But only five dollars a day. Special family rates. Golly, Mother, everybody goes away this time of the year, and even if it's only to Lake Panatog. And it's so romantic. Yeah. Frog hunting in the moonlight. <laughs> and they have tennis at the lodge and, and square dancing. And raccoons, too. Oh, please, Mother, please. Uh, Linda's going in the Sloans. And Tommy Trammell. Oh, Tommy Trammell. I guess we don't want to go then if that old Tommy Trammell's going. Oh, he's not old, Mother. He still shaves with his mother's manicure scissors. <laughs> All right, if you're going to make fun of him... Oh, but, D.G., darling, we're not making fun of him. Besides, I thought you were being aloof with Tommy. Well, that's just it. How can I be aloof if he's a hundred miles away? Well, I know, dear, but... Do you really want to go to Lake Padawag that badly? Oh, yes, Mother, more than anything. Well, I don't know exactly how we'll do it, but we'll do it. Oh, Mother, you're an angel, a perfect angel. Thank you, darling. In that case, I better go see if I can find an old miracle lying around. Miss Williamson, are you going to drink that tea or just stir it to death? Uh, uh, what? Oh, oh yes, uh, I was just thinking. No. Uh, well, look at the morning paper, Miss Williamson. Uh, no, thanks. Say, Margaret, how could I make an extra hundred dollars quickly? Oh, well, that's easy. You could, uh, um, well, why don't you, um, um, or if you just, uh, uh, would a dollar seventy-five help you, honey? I'm afraid not, Margaret. I promised the girls last night I'd take them up to Lake Padawag for a week. Oh, there's the place. Mm -hmm. Did you ever notice how romantic the moon is on water, Mrs. Williamson? Leonard Frybacker took me rowing in the park last night, and it was just beautiful. <laughs> rowing in the park does sound romantic, all right. Yeah. I can hardly move a muscle this morning. <laughs> oh, Margaret. Well, I don't know, but I've just got to find some way to pay for a week at Lake Padawan. Why don't you borrow a few dollars from your so-called partner, Mr. Wiggins? He just uses it to stuff his shoes. <laughs> no, thanks. I don't want to be obligated to Horace Wiggins. Besides, I think he must spend everything he makes on pills. He even has pills to take when he gets sick from taking pills. <laughs> oh, if you had the money this young what's-his-name in the paper has, you could go around the world twice without a transfer. Who's young what's-his-name? Well, his picture's right here in the paper. 
Let's see, I'll find it for you. All right, here it is. Randolph Donahue the Third. Donahue? The Peppermint King? His son. He's in town to buy property for his father's new peppermint factory. Boy, is he smooth. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. Tall, dark, and why do I get something like Leonard Frybacker? (laughs) Uh, Let me see that paper, Margaret. No, right here. That's him. Supposed to be quite a ladies' man. Mm, I know the type. He may be a man, but I doubt if they're ladies. He is kind of wolfy looking, isn't he? How can anything that beady-eyed make a living off of peppermint? (laughs) I wonder if... If what, Miss Williamson? If I could sell Mr. Randolph Donahue III that vacant property out near the box factory, I'd have more than enough for a week at Lake Padawag. Oh, not if Mr. Wiggins finds out you're going to use the extra bonus to go away for a week. Then all I have to do is to get to Mr. Donahue before Mr. Wiggins does. How? In my new red dress and hat. Miss Williamson, that dress that fits you like a... Certainly. The one with the slit up the... Yep. (laughs) And the top down to... Mrs. Williamson, you wouldn't dare. Oh, wouldn't I? There's more than one way to skin a cat, Margaret. (laughs) Yeah, but this cat's a wolf. (laughs) Then set out the traps. Little Red Riding Hood is going upstairs and slip into the bait. But, operator, I must speak to Mr. Donahue. It's important. Did you tell him it was Mr. Wiggins of Wiggins and Williamson? I told him, sir. Well, what did he say? He said he didn't care if you were Sam of Uncle and Sam. (laughs) But I tell you, it's important that I speak to Mr. Donahue. Morning, Horace. Oh, uh, why, 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 uh, yes, Aunt Prunella. (laughs) Yeah, yes, yeah, Aunt Prunella. I will, Aunt Prunella. (laughs) Goodbye, Aunt Prunella. (laughs) Who was that? Aunt Prunella? Yeah, well, yeah. Yes, sort of. Uh, What? Why, Penny, you look positively ravishing today. You mean different than I usually look? Uh, Well, no, I didn't mean that exactly, but you usually wear a a suit to the office. (laughs) And that dress, I mean, it's so, well, the, the, um... The skirt is, uh, and the top is too, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I, I, I think it's time for my green pill. <laughs> uh, care for green pill, pet? No, of course you don't. <laughs> I think you'd better push your eyeballs back in your head before they start rolling around the office. <laughs> Penny, dear, why won't you marry me and let me give you the things you should have? What, green pills? <laughs> if you like, anything your heart desires. Well, right now, my heart desires to make a deal so I can afford to take the girls up to Lake Padawag for a week. But, Penny, a whole week without you? Besides, how can you afford a week at Lake Padawag? Oh, uh, uh, well, I, I'm going to, um, to close a deal this morning. Deal? What kind of a deal? Oh, uh, uh, just a business deal. What kind of a business deal? Oh, you wouldn't be interested, Horace. Oh. I'm just going to sell that dirty old property out by the box factory. Oh, you're just going to sell that dirty old property out by the box factory? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a coincidence? <laughs> so am I. Oh. Well... I guess uh, I'd better get going then, I guess. Oh, wait. Well, I'll go with you, Penny. Oh. Well, toodaloo. I'm going this way. Well, toodaloo. So am I. (laughs) But uh, I'm going down to the Hotel Drake. So am I. Penny, Penny, wait a minute. What? Penny, are you by any chance going to see Randolph Donahue the third? Yes, I am. But you can't. I forbid it. I absolutely forbid it. You forbid it? <laughs> I should have known. So that's why you got all dressed up. So you could use your feminine wiles on him. Well, I forbid it, Penny. You do? Yes, I do. 
Horace. Yes, Penny? You know something? What? Last one down there is an old for sale sign. Penny, wait for me! Penny! Boy! Penny! Penny, don't pick up that phone. I certainly will pick up this phone. I got here first, and I'm going to call Mr. Donahue. He only got here first because my car stalled at that stoplight. That's what wins wars, Horace. Besides, do you know what kind of a man this Donahue is? No. How many kinds are there? Switchboard. Uh, Mr. Donahue, please. Mr. Donahue, just a moment, please. It's nothing but a ladies' man, Penny. A dallier, pure and simple. Maybe not so pure, but simple anyway. That's what he'll do. He'll dally with your affections. Good. My affections haven't been dallied with in years. <laughs> Penny, bite your tongue. Now, don't try to talk me out of the big half of this commission, Horace. I'm going to take D.G. and Sue to Lake Padawag for a week come Dilly Dally or Donahue. Hello. Uh, hello. Is this Mr. Donahue? Well, I must be in heaven. You sound like an angel. No, I'm... Oh, oh! I don't really. Oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> do, uh, do angels have names, Angel? Names? Mm. Mine's Penny Angel. I mean, mine's Penny Williamson. <laughs> of Williamson and Wiggins, real estate brokers. Wiggins and Williamson, if you don't mind. Real estate? I thought all women real estate brokers were baritones. <laughs> you sound like about, uh... Oh, something around uh, five foot two? Three. Eyes of blue. Green, bluish green. Oh. What's he want, a description of the property? <laughs> uh, about 112? Eleven. Tell him it's all out by the box factory. <laughs> uh, brunette, huh? Blonde. Oh. That doesn't sound like any property out by the box. <laughs> Look, Mr. Donahue, this is all very charming, but I have a prop... a business deal I'd like to talk over with you. Why, of course, Angel. Of course. Anytime you say. Well, how about right now? I'm down in the lobby. Lobby? Well, why didn't you say so, Angel? Standing down there in that cold, drafty old lobby. <laughs> Come on up to my room. Good, I'll be right... Up to your room? Sure, Angel. Room 612. Don't knock. I'll meet you at the elevator. Yes, but... But I... I, I, I can't. I, I mean, I... Well, I... Oh, dear. Don't louse up the deal, Penny. Don't louse up the deal. I'll go up. But if you go up, I won't be able to take the girls to Lake Padawag. Well, that's what wins wars, Penny, remember? <laughs> Angel. Are you still there, Angel? Yes, I'm still here. And Mr. Wiggins will be up there. Who? Goodbye. No, wait, Angel, Angel! All right, Horace, you win. Go on up and close the deal. <laughs> good, Penny, good. Oh, no hard feelings. No, oh, no, of course not, Horace. No hard feelings. I guess that washes up Deejee's week at Lake Padawag, though. Some angel I turned out to be. Oh, I imagine she'll still think so, Penny. Maybe so, Horace. But I'll bet I'm the first angel that ever muffed a miracle. Two of the Penny Singleton Show. Well, Penny has lost a chance to sell some very valuable property, so she won't be able to take her daughters, D.G. and Sue, to Lake Padawag for a vacation. And we can't blame her for feeling low as she starts to leave Donahue's hotel. Oh, miss. Pardon me, miss. Oh, uh, what? I just wanted to look at you. Oh, well, go right ahead and look. You seem to be enjoying yourself. Yes, those are feet. I have two, one left and one right. Oh, and, and those are legs. I also have two of those. And these are arms. Oh, excuse me. You're still on the legs. Ready? 
Oh, uh, uh, blonde hair. Huh? Oh, wait a minute. You're getting ahead of me. Uh, bluish green eyes. About 111. Five feet. Angel. Oh, you must be Randolph Donahue the third. All the other angels I know call me Randy. Mm-hmm. And their wings drop off five seconds later. Ah. So you're Miss Williamson, huh? Correction, please. I'm Mrs. Williamson. Oh. I'm a widow. Oh. What? I mean, uh, oh. Oh. Say, I just remembered. Where's Mr. Wiggins? He went up to your room to make a deal with you. Mr. Wiggins? Is that your partner's name? Yes. I wonder what's happened to Mr. Wiggins. Probably out in the cabbage patch with Mrs. Wiggins. He hates cabbage, and there is no Mrs. Wiggins. Well, don't worry, Angel. I know where he is at all times. You do? How? Well, all I have to do is watch the lights over the elevator. <laughs> I gave the operator five dollars to ride him up and down while I talked to you. Oh, please. Oh, please, you've got to get him out of there. Then we can all sit down and discuss this property he and I handle. How about dinner tonight, hmm? Uh, Mr. Donahue, you don't realize what this can do to Mr. Wiggins. He gets sick just looking at an up escalator. <laughs> Mr. Donahue, all I came down here for was to interest you in some property for your father's new factory. Good. We can talk about it over dinner. Now, please, stop the elevator and let Mr. Wiggins out. Dinner? You're the hungriest man I ever saw. <laughs> oh, all right, dinner. Now, will you let oh, Of course, sure. Come on. Uh, that's a promise, huh? That's a promise. Eight o'clock? With your appetite, I don't see how you can wait that long. Eight o'clock? Eight o'clock, yes. Oh, here comes the elevator now. Penny. Oh, oh Boris, you look terrible. I've been sick. <laughs> Still, Mrs. Williamson, I'm still fixing your hair. Oh, excuse me, Margaret. I thought you were finished. Oh, well, there I am now. Oh, boy, do you look gorgeous. Well, Mr. Donahue sees you in that dress. He'll just about take off and fly. That wouldn't surprise me. He had his motor running all morning. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, you don't think this dress is too, uh, well, too... Oh, of course not. Everybody's wearing them to something these days. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't back out now. If I get Mr. Donahue to buy that property tonight, we'll be off to Lake Padawan. Oh, you sell it. I've got all the faith in the world in you, Mrs. Williamson. Oh, thanks, Margaret. I wish I did. Penny, who? Where are you? Is that Ida Duncan? Oh, yes. Here comes old Ask Me No Questions. I'll tell you all I know. <laughs> Margaret, she'll hear you. I'm in here putting on some lipstick, Ida. Come on in. Oh, I've been looking all over for you, Penny. Penny, that dress. Like it? But that neckline. My dear, you're not going to wear that neckline. Why not? What's the use of having a neck if you can't show it? <laughs> Golly, Mother, you look simply terrific in that dress. Oh, I'll bet he'll like it. Uh, Penny, who will like it? Uh, thank you, D.G., dear. Sue, how do you like it? I don't care much for evening gowns. No pockets to carry lizards in. <laughs> Sue, stop shooting that pop gun in the house. Oh, oh, there he is. Who is? Do I look all right, Margaret? How's my hair? Is my lipstick on straight? Oh, well, you look fine, Mrs. Williamson. Much too good for him. For whom, Penny? Of course, if you don't want to tell me who this man is, <laughs> it's all right with me, uh, provided I find out. <laughs> uh, this man is Randolph Donahue the Third, And before you get any ideas, Ida, the reason I'm going out with Mr. Donahue is business. Strictly business. <laughs> you know you're an angel, angel? Why, Mr. Donahue... I'll bet you say that to all us angels. I'm serious. You dance too divinely for any mortal. And you dance too close for any comfort. <laughs> but I want to be close to you, angel. Well, if you were any closer, you'd be behind me. <laughs> Come on now. Why, I can't even breathe. We're going to discuss that property out by the box factory. Well, 
Come on, let's sit down and talk about it. Oh, why don't we talk about it out on the terrace, Angel? It's much cozier, huh? Uh, nothing doing. Oh. Now then, the property runs 1,500 feet Angel, along... Angel, who can keep their mind on 1,500 feet of plowed ground when there's you <laughs> and a moon? Uh... Now, wait a minute, Mr. Donahue. You're I... a very desirable creature, you know that? But I, I... Doesn't anything happen when I hold your hand in mine? No, 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 wait. Don't pull your hand away, Angel. <laughs> but I... I mean There's a moon really out on the are... terrace, Angel. Doesn't a moon do things to you? Well, yes. It makes me feel, well, warm and tender and affectionate. Well, but... I was beginning to think you weren't human. <laughs> well, after all, I am a woman. We're incurably romantic, you know. Oh, then a moon does do things to you, huh? Yes. A moon does do things to me, Mr. Donahue. It reminds me of a brisk autumn sky, a little white church under some elm trees, a honeymoon cottage overlooking the sea, a husband going away to war. Is that all a moon does to you, Angel? No. No, a moon also reminds me of Lake Padawag. <laughs> Lake Watawag? <laughs> oh, you wouldn't understand, Mr. Donahue. You see, you only think I'm an angel. I know two little girls who are sure of it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for a lovely evening, Mr. Donahue. Oh, but wait a minute, Angel. Aren't you even going to invite me in for a little uh, nightcap? I'm afraid the only nightcaps we have around here are milk and cookies. Uh, uh, milk and cookies? <laughs> well, sure. We get absolutely homogenized every night. <laughs> Good night, Mr. Donahue. I'll bring all the papers around in the morning and we'll close the deal for that property. Oh, but wait a minute. I haven't said definitely that I'd buy it, Angel. What? Yeah, well, I looked at it this afternoon. Seems to be just a thing, but, uh... Yeah, I think we ought to go in and talk about it. Oh, all right. <laughs> but just for a minute. Mm. Let's go in here in the living room and... <laughs> Good heavens, what was that? <laughs> why, why, it's Margaret. Margaret, Margaret, wake up. Who's Margaret? My housekeeper. Margaret! Does she always mm. sleep sitting on the stairs? <laughs> oh, no. Sometimes she lies down. <laughs> Margaret, wake up. <gasps> what? Oh! oh. Was I snoring? Uh, no, you were just breathing out loud. Why didn't you go to bed? Well, as soon did you want to know when you got home. All right, Margaret. You can tell them I'm home. Yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, Margaret, mm -hmm. what's the telephone doing off the hook? The telephone off the hook? Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, that's Mr. Wiggins. He wanted to know when you got home, too. <laughs> He's been sitting on the phone waiting for you. Oh, of all the ridiculous... Uh, excuse me, Mr. Donahue, I'd better talk to him. You go on in the living room. Sure, Angel. Good night, Horace. Oh, Penny, thank heavens you're home. Horace, what in the world are you doing? I've been listening to Margaret snore for the last half hour. <laughs> Sounded like a small boy taking a trombone lesson. Well, stop being so silly and go to bed. Penny, is it silly for me to worry about you when you're out with a man like Donahue? Are you sure you're not more worried about whether I sold him that property? You didn't close the deal, did you? No, not yet. <laughs> Good. That's a shame. <laughs> but I will before he leaves here. Well, better luck next to... Leaves? There? Yes, he's in the living room waiting to talk over the deal. Don't move. The man's a demon with women, Penny. Sit right where you are. Breathe deeply. You'll need your strength in case you have to struggle. I'll be right over. Horace, will you stop being... Don't worry, Penny. Old Horace will be right there. Goodbye. Horace! Horace! Old Horace! No! Oh. What's the trouble, Angel? Your wings are dragging. Uh, Mr. Donahue, I'm going to put my cards on the table. 
Will you or will you not take that property out by the box factory? Why, of course I will, Angel. Fine. I drew up the papers this afternoon. They're right here in my purse. Oh. Yeah. There. Sign right there. Here? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How's that? Well, I guess that takes care of Mr. Horace Wiggins. And all you need is to someone to take care of you, Angel. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Donahue. You need Donahue. a pair of strong arms around oh, you. Oh, um, I'm just as happy with them the way they are, hanging from my shoulders. <laughs> now, don't pull away from me, Angel. Uh, I... Please. Are you all right, Mrs. Uh, Williamson? Now I am, Margaret. Is that Mr. Casanova? Uh... <laughs> No, Sue, darling. This is Mr. Donahue. These are my two daughters, Dee Dee and Sue. Oh, Hi, hello, Dee Dee. Hello, Sue. You? Does that little one always carry a shotgun? Oh, that's just a pop gun. Oh. We were worried about your mother. Oh, but I'm all right, Dee Dee. Mr. Donahue and I were just signing a contract between us. Does that mean you're going to be my father? <laughs> Father? Uh, Mr. Donahue, you're turning white. Daddy. Oh, no. Mr. Donahue, you're turning green. Yippee, we got a man. <laughs> oh, I wish I was dead. Mr. Donahue, you're turning purple. You'd better pick a color and stick to it. I gotta get out of here. You need a doctor. If I stayed here, I'd need a lawyer. Good night, Mrs. Williamson. <laughs> Wish you got rid of him in a hurry. Yes, whose idea was that? Margaret. It sure did work, too. I'll say it did, Sue. And what's more, I got the deal before Mr. Wiggins did. Oh, say, that's right. Uh huh. Tomorrow we leave for Lake Padawan. Golly, Mother, really? Oh, you are an angel. Penny, open the door. It's me, old Horace. Oh. Uh oh, it's Mr. Wiggins. Another wolf on the doorstep. Why, he's not the wolf, Margaret. He's the goat. Penny Singleton will return in just a moment. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. show, which comes to you every Tuesday evening at this time, featured B. Benaderet, Hal March, Gerald Moore, Sarah Selby, Mary Lee Robb, and Sheila James. The music is composed and conducted by Von Dexter. The script is by Jack Crutcher and Doris Gilbert, directed by Ray Dietrich, and stars Penny Singleton. Good night. Keep well. And this is Hal Gibney inviting you to be with us again next Tuesday evening for the Penny Singleton Show, an NBC presentation. Good times on NBC.